talk about a guy who used to be a prince, Harry. And Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, this is Hoda interviewing um, Prince Harry at the Invictus Games and asking him about his situation, about him living in the U.S., about him wanting to go home. You obviously made a lot of news recently. You came home to the U.K. You saw your grandmother. How was that? It was great. It was really nice to see her. Be able to see her in some element of privacy was 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 nice. I haven't had a chance to go back to the U.K. Uh, for a couple of years, apart from those two times, one to for my grandfather's funeral and one for unveiling a statue of my mum. How did it feel being back? Um, being with her? Being with her, it was great. It was, it was just so nice to see her. You know, she's on, she's on great form. We always, she's always got a great sense of humour uh, with me and I'm just making sure that she's, you know, protected and got the, the right people around Well, you, you make... All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, he's almost a Ricky Gervais character now. Um, some element of privacy, and there's and there's what I will call a social status eye block, uh, which is which came from Chase's idea of somebody who who sh shields their eyes to kind of put that's exactly it to put themselves above uh, everybody else. Some element of privacy, um, and his head moves away from the conflict. So there's clearly this conflict there around the privacy, a reticence on the feelings of being back and then it was great being with her uh, lip retractions also uh, right at the end here's the most important thing disdain and contempt for the right people around her if you ever want to see a great image of disdain and contempt it's at the end of this clip chase what do you got on this one yeah, it's a shift to internal dialogue, which is his eyes are moving to indicate that he's rehearsing or going through what he's going to say. And there's hard stress and a mental struggle around the word privacy. You can see it clear as day here, but there's a contempt micro expression on top of that at the privacy topic. And you'll see the, the face like the kind of one sided smile. You'll see that there. And when she says, how did it feel being back with her? We have vocal hesitancy, a shift to internal dialogue, lip compression uh, and retraction, which is when we're withholding opinions or we're kind of holding some information back. There's question repetition. And when he's saying it's so nice to see her, there's a single shoulder shrug, which indicates that we lack typically uh, lack confidence in what we're saying. And I thought he said she's ungrateful. I thought those words came out. You can hear it in the clip. It's crystal clear to me. But when he's saying surrounded by the right people, a strong facial expression of contempt, like Mark was just saying, the appearance of this entire clip is strong emotions around privacy. I don't think the trip went well at all. These are behaviors that are reliable on their own. But when all of them stack up, just like we see here on a single topic, there's a massive increase in the likelihood that someone's being deceptive. And he's hinting that he's concerned that she's surrounded by bad people who are maybe influencing her perceptions in a way that he would like to change. Great. Yeah, I have a little bit different approach on that whole thing, but we all are about negativity around that right people around her let me let me give you one thing if hoda knew what i know or what you know what the four of us know this could have been a different interview because she asked him mm -hmm. a loaded question that basically says what does it feel like to be the person the harry formerly known as a prince and his eyes go down the internal conversation he's trying to work through it and she throws him a life ring and when she throws him that life ring and talks about the grandmother then his face lights up and he starts to talk there's contempt for sure when he has that smirk or, and there's actual amusement in his face when he says the right people around her. My guess is that's from some other conversation. That's, he's privy to a conversation where somebody said, well, the right people are around her and you're not the right kind of people or something. There's something in there. It's a reason you see that smirk in his face. But if she had known that he's going to internal conversation and that's a deep well he's digging into and let him go, we would have gotten a very different conversation. That's what I got. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think this answer was prepared. I think they uh, had time and said, here's what you're going to ask you, because it's lazy and almost monotone and has no emotion whatsoever in it, that first question. And I think he's probably been asked that question about 400 times since he's been back. And at the end of the clip, like you were saying, uh, uh, geez, was it Mark? I don't know. If, I don't know if it was Mark or Chase. OK, talking about the contempt. That's the that's the classic ver uh, expression of contempt. And it's one of the seven uh, universal 
uh, expressions that that um, were nailed down by Paul Ekman. Happiness, sadness, anger, fear, surprise, contempt, and disgust. Those are the big seven. And uh, we're, we're going to go to a, into a deep dive on those in Las Vegas at our event here in just a few weeks. You obviously made a lot of news recently. You came home to the UK. You saw your grandmother. How was that? It was great. It was really nice to see her. Be able to see her in some element of privacy was 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 nice. I haven't had a chance to go back to the UK uh, for a couple of years, apart from those two times, one to, to for my grandfather's funeral and one for unveiling a statue of my mum. How did it feel being back? Um, being with her? Being with her, it was great. It was it was just so nice to see her. You know, she's on she's on great form. We always she's always got a great sense of humour uh, with me, and I'm just making sure that she's you know protected and got the, the right people around. Well, her. you you make you make her laugh. That's what she always says. Uh, I, did you do it again? Uh, yes, yeah, I did. Uh, both <laughs> well, Megan and I had tea with her, so it was it was really nice to catch up with her. And you know, home home for me now is 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 you know for the time being, it's in, it's in the, it's in it's the in states. states, and it really and it feels that way as well. Does um, it? Yeah. It's, We've been welcomed with open arms, yeah. um, and it's got such a great community up in Santa Barbara. So, so you feel like good. that's home more for you? Yeah. Is that weird to say? No, but I'm sure it'll become a thing. You're grim. All right, Chase, what do you got? We see his eyes going down left again, which is a shift to talking to himself, rehearsing some lines. They probably went through this a lot. And just going through these lines and, and rehearsing it. And when he's saying it's, it was nice to catch up with her, I think we see an anger expression flash on the face very briefly, in my opinion. And when he's saying, walk, walk with open arms, uh, there's a super stress response. There. It's these big pacifying things on the legs there. You guys can talk about that. But biggest of all, there's a loss of language fluency. The fluency of his normal speech starts going away. It gets more difficult for him to talk. And that happens during deception for some people and just some fidgeting. But it's like she's asking, this is home for you. Weird deviation from his baseline behavior. There's a struggle with saying home for him. And he's saying it's not hard to say, but it needs to become a thing which is meaningless. Like the, the whole ending of that statement is meaningless. So all the avoidant behaviors here suggest that there's a similar situation. The visit was about the opposite of what we're actually hearing. The It's the opposite of all the words that we're hearing. That's all I got there. Scott? All right. Well, that first question about the making the queen laugh, we see his, his tongue jutting around, you know, flapping around the front part of his of his teeth, like circling around there. Quite often we see something like that. We see the teeth bite down on the tongue and that lets you know, or that usually denotes or indicates that person feels like they've gotten away with something. And when they do that, usually the head goes down, that chin goes down to the chest. And it's almost like you're getting it like that, like they're getting away with something. So when he says um, home for me for the time being is the States. You can hear his hands rubbing together. So that's starting that, starting an adapter there. And he's rocking back and forth. And that's another for, uh, form of adapting. And in that sentence, when he says, like you were saying, Chase, now there's, uh, um, when he says now, there's a micro expression, and it could be argued that it's, that's an expression of anger, or it could be uh, pain, but I'd lean toward anger, but it looks more like. Yeah, I, I'm going to go with, with anger on that one. And just after he says states, his grief muscle engages. So I think you're right, Chase. I don't think this went well for him at all in the, United, in, in the States. Um, and it went, I didn't think it, don't think it went well for him at home either, or at his old home either. So he says, we've been welcomed with open arms. He runs his hands down both his legs. And this is another self-soothing behavior. And this one's huge. I mean, it's it's really big. So I get the feeling he's starting to re regret the decision he made about separating himself from the um, the family, the royal family. It's starting to dawn on him that he's made a big mistake at this point. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, were in my interview, uh, I would dig into that welcome idea because that's a massive cluster of self-soothing. I'll take you through it in a moment. Were it my interview, though, I wouldn't get to interview him again because, you know, there is clearly a massively sore point on this. Why? So he does do the open arms gesture. Very, very good. But then hands come down, slap on there down the inside of the thighs, down towards the ankle to protect the, 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 
the delicate ankle joint there. We often, we've seen that in other interviews with him when he's talking about subjects which he doesn't really want to go to, touchy subjects, he'll go for his ankle. And then his hands come up and they fig leaf in front of him, in front of his primary sexual characteristics there. It's a huge stress indicator. I'd be right on top of that and I'd go, so Harry, like, tell me a little bit more about this welcome. Like, explain it to me. And I'd get him deep into that. Yeah, I'd never get another interview with him. Greg, what do you got on this one? I, I'm sure he'll never interview with me, but he's a 12-year-old to me. The way he the way he moves is not like, what is he, 35? I have no idea how old he is. You know, I don't keep up with the Royals quite as much. But I don't know how old he is, but this is young boy kind of body language. I mean, this is 12-year-old boys at camp kind of body language for me. Now, I'll also say he does a little bit of brows up in the center in the beginning. We associate that with sorrow, but he's also a ginger and he's in the sun. I know the pain. Trust me. I've, there are pictures where I look like eh, my eyes are all scrunched up because of it. Light colored eyes. And so I'll give him I'll give him an out for that. The, the for the time being, when he says for the time being to me, Scott, that's profound because that's the trigger to everything else that happens. All that adapting, that slamming his legs and that pushing those things down. Now, when we talk about adapters, people call things soothing maneuvers, adapters, whatever. But what you're in effect doing is making the unknown known, making the uncomfortable comfortable, because if you do something all the time and it becomes a habit, it comforts you. If you put people in a cage, those things come out even more. Animals do the same. He had a genuine smile at, did you make her laugh? That was good. I think he probably had a great visit with her. I think he's probably feeling some remorse as I look at this, that drop and rub. And then all of that stuff is 12 year old body language for discomfort. We don't know why. We don't have to know why. And then when he says the whole stuff about welcome, that's we see a lot of that clusters of body language. And he does this lips of disappointment kind of thing. And his shoulders go up like, so but what am I to do? I think this kind of sums up what we're seeing from him. You make her laugh. That's what she always says. Uh, I, did you do it again? Uh, yes, yeah, I did. Uh, both <laughs> Megan and I had tea with her. So it was, it was really nice to catch up with her. And, you know, home... Home for me now is 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 you know for the time being it's in, it's in the, it's in it's the states. states and it really and it feels that way as well. Does um, it? Yeah, and it's, we've been welcomed with open arms. Yeah. Um, and it's got such a great community up in Santa Barbara. So, so you feel like good. that's home more for you? Yeah. Is that weird to say? No, but I'm sure it'll become a thing. Your grim. What's the best thing about her? It's her sense of humor yeah. and her ability to see the, the humor in so many, so many mm -hmm. different things. We, we have a really special relationship. We talk about things that she can't talk about with anybody else. That. Um, so that's always a, a nice piece to it. But I think she's, I think after a certain age, you get bored of birthdays. You do? You think she's bored of her 96? She won't so. be bored of the Jubilee, will she? Uh, no. Okay. I don't think so. <laughs> she's, had a, she's had a few Jubilees now. So every, everyone's slightly, yeah. every, everyone is slightly different. But yeah. I think she, I'm sure she's looking Do you think you'll come? I don't know yet. There's lots of things with security uh, issues and everything else. So this is what I'm trying to do, trying to make it possible that, you know, I can get my kids to meet her. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I just have a few things. The brow tips are up again. This is a ginger in the sun. That's what it is. I can see it now because he's softening the impact on his eyes. Uh, he genuinely is happy in this. You can see his face engaging until he gets to this point about whether he will or will not come back. You can see that. And there's internal dialogue going on there as he figures out what he should say. I'm sure there's probably the party line. There's probably the line his brother or whoever the handlers have told him. Mark, I have a note right here that says, not overly sophisticated in his body language and messaging. Could use the work of Mark Bowden. <laughs> so if you're listening, Harry, and you need a coach, we know one that lives really close to you. You might want to call. Um, but then I see when he's talking about the effort required to get his children to his grandmother, there's absolute disdain there. There's disgust. There's all that lower face, all that disdain around the, the hurdles he has to go through to get these kids to the, to the grandmother. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I love this one. She can't talk about with anybody else. Stuff she can't talk about with anybody else. Listen to that else. There's massive vocal fry on that. It is so different. I'm going to say he's being utterly deceptive about she talks to him about stuff that she can't talk to anybody else about because of that vocal fry. It is so different. And then he goes, uh, so that's always a nice piece to it, but... 
Like, that means nothing. It's so unspecific. I would dig into that and I would go, well, specifically, I mean, I know you can't talk about your private conversations with Her Majesty, but give us the generalized area that she talks about with you that she cannot talk to anybody else. I would imagine he would be instantly in trouble uh, on that. Too unspecific. He's playing this idea of, of confident status against the right people. It's a status play throughout this. Chase, I managed to get in the word status for you there, but what do you got on this one? Thank you. Always appreciate a little status. These facial expressions from Hoda are bizarre, I think. I've never seen people make those facial expressions before in this interview, but let's talk about Harry. What is she saying? Or Harry says, talk about things that we can't talk about with anyone else Mark, I totally agree with you. I think this whole thing suggests some kind of special access and privilege that no one else uh, that no one else has. Implies maybe an element of trust above all the other children. Says uh, that's always a nice piece to it. Meaningless, hollow language there. But when he's saying, "I get my kids to meet her," right at the very end, there's a little bit of contempt, just kind of contempt on the face. All the behavior that we're seeing here in this little clip is showing a very difficult time, I think, coping with the loss of security and maybe a need to assert a degree of specialness because he's lost some kind of specialness, which I think he feels is now gone from his life. His behavioral response to the topic of security specifically suggests more than just physical protection and may lead to something deeper in terms of security that he feels is lacking in his life. I'm not going to go to pop psychology. I already did. So, uh, Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I, th I think you nailed it, though, man. He's 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 just struggling for relevance at this point because all he talks about is how, how important he is. They need security, and he talks to the queen like nobody else, and she talks to him like this is it's 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 over. It's done. When he went home, and he saw heard those people booing. So I think that's what's happened. Just just a struggle, just grasping his straws to be relevant at this point. What's the best thing about her? It's really her sense of humor yeah. and her ability to see the the humor in so many so many mm -hmm. different things. We we have a really special relationship. We talk about things that she can't talk about with anybody else. I love that. Um, so that's always a, a nice piece to it. But I think she's. I think after a certain age, you get bored of birthdays. You do? You think she's bored of her 96? She won't so. be bored of the Jubilee, will she? Uh, no. Okay. I don't think so. <laughs> she's, had a, she's had a few Jubilees now, so everyone's yeah. slightly, every, everyone is slightly different. But yeah. I think she, I'm sure she's looking Do you think to you'll come? I don't know yet. There's lots of things with security uh, issues and everything else. So this is what I'm trying to do, trying to make it possible that you know I can get my kids to meet her. All right. Thanks. This is a good one, fellas, and we'll see you next yeah. time. Today we're going to talk about Will Smith and the apology he's done on Instagram. Greg, wants to tell us about the videos we're going to watch? You know, there's not much more to talk about except for this is three months after he slapped Chris Rock at the Oscars and he's coming to do an apology. We'll see whether we believe him or not. Why didn't you apologize to Chris in your acceptance speech? Um, I was fogged out by that point. It's, 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 it's all fuzzy. I've reached out to Chris um, and the, mes the message that came back is that uh, he's not ready to talk. And when he is, he will reach out. Um, so I will, I will say to you, um, Chris, I apologize to you, uh, my behavior was unacceptable and i'm here whenever you're ready to talk all right chase you want to go first sure so he kind of reads the message in a really clinical way and i think this is potentially uh, reducing the feeling of accusatory speech internally uh, not necessarily shaping a narrative for us and this is my opinion as is this entire video our opinions uh, but he's very stiff here. And I think this is potentially anger or resistance. Uh, we see his lip tightening during this initial response. We see his lips get really tight there, which is well, usually resistance. And during this discussion about waiting for Chris to reach out, 
we see this kind of hand gesture and then some more pacifying or adapting with the thumbs here. You'll see that throughout. And the, the during the apologizing gesture, there's this knife hand that comes out. And we're seeing that at right at discussing the message that came in from Chris. And when he says my behavior, this is the farthest upward his lip goes for the entire video. And this might suggest some kind of disgust or disagreement. Uh, you can decide what he's disgusted with or disagreeing with. And the self-soothing behavior, you're going to see a whole lot of. The tension in the lips based on previous interviews, good thing we have a lot of videos of of him to go back and look at, suggests that there's some withholding there. But I don't think this is an indicator of deception here. It's probably a disagreement with timing, format, publicity. He was likely asked to do this by a production management team or somebody who is heavily invested uh, probably financially or socially in his image. Uh, that's all I got there. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think this is a pretty odd place for him to be doing an apology like this. There's so much going on in the room. It's distracting. I don't get that. I don't know. I, I, I'm sure Mark's got something to say about the psychology behind all that. But it's, there's so much going on in there. The colors he's wearing are these drab um, colors. The whole room looks, there's so much going on in there. I don't know if it's to distract or to make it look like he's distracted or got a lot going on or whatever. We see him using, when he's, when he's sitting there before he starts uh, asking the question that supposedly uh, people have asked, uh, we see those adapter, that adapter is hand squishing together like that a little bit. His behavior is odd. His diction is so good. If you turn the sound off, you can, you'll know what he's saying because he uses his whole mouth. It's almost, it, it, it's over the top. It's a little bit too much. So I'm under the impression he may be under some, uh, some kind of medication or something, maybe on something like that to help calm him down. Or maybe he's been on something like that since the, the whole thing happened. Um, but let's pay attention to that as we go through these. Let's pay attention to his diction, his eyebrow movement. And um, just his tone in general, because it's pre it's pretty solid all the way through, and we don't see much movement up in the, up in that brow, which is kind of odd as well. Um, he's so pronounced when he's reading the question that he looks angry at, at points. I'm not seeing true anger in there, but I'm seeing what looks like. I think it's just because the way he's he's shaping his mouth to say the words perfectly that it it looks he looks like he's angry. I think there are a lot of edits in this, as there probably should be, but they try to make it look, look like there aren't, because at one point his hands will be here, and then they'll be down to his sides when it cuts to the next uh, picture or the next shot of him. And when he says, uh, when he's talking about uh, Chris trying to reach out to him, he says, uh, when he is, he will reach out. It's when he does that little adapter there, a little scratch and the um and all that stuff. And uh, I don't think there's, I'm not seeing a lot of emotion. We may be seeing sadness or whatever. But it seems very somber and, and, and just almost a flat line of emotion at that point. And Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so I agree, uh, Scott. It's, it's heavily produced for an Internet apology. It's not the usual kind of um, iPhone job that, that often people put out. It's got some classic tropes in there. It, he's in white. It's a very white room. So there is that, that sense of purity going on there. Uh, there's some nice images, one of which you, you sent me, Scott, which is the book on his table, an art book by El Anatsui. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, Ghanese uh, artist who turns what we would usually ascribed to being junk, bits of plastic, bottle tops, into quite epic sculptures. So there's this idea of transform transforming the kind of the garbage into something quite new and quite beautiful. And there he is in this pristine stuff. He's Now, to your point, Chase, he's got his Westbrook cap on. Westbrook is, is the kind of holding company that he and his, his uh, ex-wife and there are other shareholders as well, and they own some quite important... Uh, collateral uh, properties. And so this is as much, um, I would say, an apology that's going out to us, the general public, as it is an apology that's going to hit the industry. So well-produced industry apology, as well as an internet apology going on. 
We've got up in the background there, um, the world is sick, love is the cure. Well, that's a really nice truism. I mean, is it sick? I mean, maybe, maybe not. Is love the cure? Possibly, possibly not. But it sounds pretty good. It looks pretty good. Great truism, great kind of motivational poster there up on the, on the wall, just in case we need something to latch onto, which isn't him and what he might have done wrong. And I think that's the point uh, of that, either consciously or unconsciously. Look, here's what happens in film production. Some of it is super conscious, and we hope it's usually super conscious. And some of it is, it, is kind of subconscious and unconscious, and just the work of, of artists doing what they feel is the right thing at the time. Uh, it's interesting, before this particular moment, if you watch the whole video, we have um, uh, a voiceover of just heavy sighs from Smith just breathing. So it's overly produced to give us this framework of heavy emotion before we even see him. This, this, this breathing of sorrow and depression even before we see him. So it's being framed beautifully for us. Um, we see him adapting with his with his thumbs. And you're right, Scott, this changes from time to time. There's some, some big edits in there. Uh, look, the main thing for me in terms of what his, his behavior is saying is he says, I was fogged out. It's all fuzzy to that, um, to that question. So he avoids it. See, it's that kind of, I don't quite remember why I did what I did. We're going to hear a different story a bit later on that doesn't quite match with that. So that's going to be interesting. I think what he's doing is avoiding the true feelings here uh, as to why he chose to say what he said. And I think we're going to see him avoid the true feelings because they won't play that well for the, for the audience. And we as the audience in the industry need to know that he has changed uh, his his personality a little bit on this whether he has or not that's a different thing he deflects that ball of a question and he knocks it very clearly into chris rock's court and kind of goes hey it's it's kind of up to him now to contact me i've done my bit greg what do you think yeah agreed you've covered most of it um i think the big one is what you said last mark he doesn't answer the question at all he says okay i, I tried to apologize after <clears throat> he doesn't say i didn't because because why? There's not an answer. So he has to just come up with something. He starts off milling his hands. That's an adapter. We say comforting moves. All adapters are comforting moves in some way because you're releasing nervous energy. But that answer where he does the weird lip thing is kind of in his baseline, if you go look at him. It's kind of amusement in his upper face and then that lip thing. I have a really good friend named Darren that I think does exactly that when he's amused before he starts to go back with an answer to people. I see it all the time. If you're watching, Darren, you know who you are. Um, that answer is in his baseline and that half smile thing is part of his persona. I think he's done it so many times, but he is uncomfortably touches his mouth. You're talking about that, Scott, when he starts to stroke the facial hair, that's an adapter to release nervous energy. And his eyes go down to the right. We associate with emotion when he says my at my behavior and you see Everybody's disgust will look different depending on bone structure, depending on the way your skin and your face is made. But you certainly see disgust, not just in his lips, Chase, I agree with you there, but also in his nose, up around the edges of his nose, you can see a rise in his face. I think he's disgusted with that. He's adapting constantly as he speaks. And one thing that I would point out, Scott, is culture matters. South Jersey, Philly, that over enunciating the way you speak is cultural very much part of that culture. I have friends who that mind you, and they're not aggressive, they're just talking to you, but that's the way they talk. I said to them before, if you talk to people where I live that way, you might be in the parking lot rolling around a little bit. So it just depends on culture in some cases, and I think that's part of his upbringing, part of who he is, maybe that's why he shows his teeth more. Um, the last couple of things I would say is what I see here is regret and apprehension. What's it about? Don't know. Don't know if it's regret about slapping Chris Rock, is it regret about a relationship with somebody that has gone south as a result of it, about his career? Don't know. But I do see regret. I do see apprehension. That's all I got. Why didn't you apologize to Chris in your acceptance speech? Um, I was fogged out by that point. It's, 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 it's all fuzzy. I've reached out to... Chris um, and the, mes the message that came back is that uh, he's not ready to talk. And when he is, he will 
reach out. Um, so I will, I will say to you, uh, Chris, I apologize to you. Uh, my behavior was unacceptable and I'm here whenever you're ready to talk. I, I want to apologize to Chris's mother. I saw an interview that Chris's mother did. And, you know, that was one of the things about that moment. I just didn't realize, and, you know, I wasn't thinking, but how many people got hurt in that moment. So I want to uh, apologize to Chris's mother. I want to apologize to uh, Chris's family, uh, specifically Tony Rock. You know, we had a great relationship. You know, Tony Rock was my man. Um, and uh, this, this, is, this is probably irreparable. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I like these uh, asymmetrical gestures that he does, wheeling around in his head there, kind of explaining the thoughts of chaos and confusion that were going on. And then we get uh, an eye block and the hands blocking as well um, to, show, um, to show his blindness there that he he can't kind of now see or couldn't see at the time what was really going on um i wasn't thinking he says and kind of double blocks there um very congruent i would say actually i mean this this feels like it's actually quite and looks like it it's quite truthful again in the in the environment around him interesting to see that mic there i mean i'd be interested scott whether you think that's the mic that's actually picking him up no i don't think he is i think he's got a really good quality uh, mic down yeah. here or a boom mic I'll look up for there. It. Yeah. So, so you know, my question becomes, Scott, is like, why the kind of almost SM58 in there? It's not an SM58, but it's close to it. Well, it's the icon of stand-up. It's the icon of rapping. It's the icon of pop. It's having that icon next to him um, or that, that would affiliate him with the person who he's kind of done wrong to and affiliate him with the industry. It's, it's, it's not necessary for it to be there. It's not doing the sound uh, on that one. Uh, Tony Rock was my man and we get this um, hand clap on there, giving the finality of that. Again, very, very congruent there. So I believe it's true what he's what he's saying here. Uh, but Chase, what, what do you think? What do you got on this one? Yeah, there's. I agree with you. There's some emotional accessing where his eyes go down into his right, to our left. And it's, it's more powerful here in an apology to the mother than in the, the apology to Chris. And that's something that's pretty noteworthy. And he mentions this video of, of her interview and shifts to emotional uh, accessing and stays there inside of that emotional eye movement to where we're accessing emotional memories is what that means. Uh, and he stays there for more than any other topic that he covers, which I think is, is a very key data point here. And when somebody apologizes, Here's three filters to look at that apology through. So number one is, do they mention their own behavior or is it vague? Do they actually talk about what they did or are they vaguing it out by just saying the words behavior or actions? Number two, do they communicate with some kind of sincerity? Does it look like a sincere apology? And number three, do they discuss how it impacted the person they're apologizing to? That's a big deal. And, these don't necessarily mean deception because there's a difference between truth and a genuine apology. Uh, they can definitely reveal a lot about an apology, though. So here we're seeing this vague mentions of behavior, no mention of how it affected the other person. And it appears to be sincere so far, like Mark, you were, you were just saying. And at least we aren't seeing deception indicators here. But keep in mind, there's a difference between uh, honesty, truth, facts, sincerity, stress, and then just lying. So there's a big difference here. So was it real? Was it fake? It depends on what definition you're using. Greg? Yeah, my, my gut says this is the reason for the apology, not Chris Rock, not Chris Rock at all. Yes, there's a part of it that's for us. There's also a part of it that is, if you listen to his words, he says, I wasn't thinking, but how many people got hurt? Not how many people I hurt when I did this. That's a crafty delivery of an apology. He's not apologizing to Chris Rock. He's apologizing for causing hurt to other people. 
He also will listen as we progress. He's going to talk more about us, us out here, not those people, us. So part of this is business, and we all know it. They're in a business where they have to be liked because you, we're going to spend our money on them. But if you watch him, I agree with you. He goes immediately when he says, mother, there's an emphatic head nod as he says that. And he shows um, some concern in his brow as he says, mother, and then those center tips of his brows go up. And we associate that with sorrow. He withdraws his lips and his mouth goes down. And you'll see him drop his head down to the right as well, like you talked about, and purse his lips after that. And that's in disappointment. I think we're seeing all of that. So I think that part's legitimate. When he talks about Tony Rock, you see his face light up up in this part not much in the lower face. So we associate that typically with amusement so or with happiness of the, about the person in the relationship. And then he says it may be gone. He drops that hand when he says, my man, you said it earlier, Mark, that drop, that drop emphatic. I think all this makes us think, yes, he came to the realization that he needed to apologize from a larger perspective to us and to bring up the mother and the brother and all that. This is not at all. This is not at all about Chris Rock, not at all. And we'll hear more later about why and what he feels. But <coughs> I believe the apology can be sincere and him still not be apologizing to Chris Rock. That's my point, Scott. All right, we're, we're seeing, like Mark was talking about, larger <clears throat> use of illustrators here. This is uh, so far the biggest we've seen. And that makes sense. He's trying to get a big point across. He's leading up to the part about his mom or about Chris's mom. That's why he does his hands like this to show. I think that's to show a group, you know, show what a, a circle or a big group of people is he's worried about um, fixing this for. Um, the mixing of the illustrators, I think that's supposed to, to give us the indication he's all mixed up and still mixed up, goes along with the room, which is all those different things. Like you were saying earlier, Mark, that microphone has nothing to do with what's going on there. I don't I don't know why that's there. I kept thinking about that, too. When he turns toward it, you don't hear a change at all. And I think you're right. He's either mic'd or you know he's got a, uh, something stuck in here or he's got, a, got one over him. Uh, his illustrators are correctly timed. Quite often we'll associate... Um, illustrators that don't land when they're supposed to land on the words with someone being insincere or deceptive and here i think they're on time and they look the way they should and um so far this is the most this is the most emotion we, we've seen but keep in mind and, and start paying attention to his eyes where they're looking because a lot of the times what he's doing i know he's got some notes down there he's checking because you can see his eyes go you can see him reading uh, going back and forth a little bit there. So he's checking his notes. He knows what these questions are. But I still think it's odd the way he's reading the questions so clearly and so perfectly. That's, a, again, why I think he may be on some kind of medication. Nothing wrong with that. He probably needs it at this point. But that's just the behavior I'm seeing. All right, we good? Yeah, all good. All right. Chase, man, you're leaning. It's just <laughs> lacking right now. <laughs> I, was, I want to apologize to Chris's mother. I saw an interview that Chris's mother did. And, you know, that was one of the things about that moment. I just didn't realize, and, you know, I wasn't thinking, but how many people got hurt in that moment. So I want to uh, apologize to Chris's mother. I want to apologize to uh, Chris's family. Uh, specifically Tony Rock, you know, we had a great relationship. You know, Tony Rock was my man. Um, and uh, this, this, is, this is probably irreparable. I spent the last three months um, replaying and understanding the nuances and, and the complexities of what happened in, in that moment. Um, and I'm not going to try to unpack all of that right now, but I can say to all of you, there is no part of me that thinks that was the right way to behave in that moment. There's no part of me that thinks that's the optimal way to handle a feeling of disrespect or, or insults. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this one's pretty quick for me. Um, there's a real tongue jut at three months. That's a tongue jut of the classic kind. You can see his lips part just a little and his tongue pushed through. That's distaste. Uh, so he's probably thinking, you know, 
why did I wait so long? That kind of thing. And so he's showing us that he has distaste in that case. This isn't me. It's bigger than me getting angry. I, he's going down a path of trying to say, it's not me. This is a much bigger thing. This is all about things that happen and people who behave in a bad way. And look, when he goes to no part of me thinks that this was the right way, look at that brow. Look at that brow. This is, I tell you all the time, little Johnny comes in and says, and the cat broke the cookie jar. That's that move. He's waiting for approval. The interesting piece is he only cast his eyes downright one time, and that's when that tongue jut comes out. And then he, Scott, does what we call in the True Crime Workshop. The romancer, he makes hard eye contact the rest of the time as if he's talking to an individual. That's the most emphatic thing he's done yet with that brow up. We've seen him moving it a good bit, but that's the most powerful use of the brow we've seen. And then when he say this isn't about this isn't about that. I say to all of you, this isn't about boom. That's damage control. Now I believe because his lips withdraw immediately after. Now I believed because he says it's disrespect or insult and a feeling of. I think now he's protecting something. Mark, whether it's a family relationship where he said you better go apologize or whether it's a manager who said you better go apologize. You're not going to work anymore or whether it's something else altogether. Something in his ego can't tell that, can't read his mind. But I don't think it's about Chris Rock at all. I think it's about us collectively and what we think of him not necessarily his mother or any of that uh scott what do you got all right and he's coming on like there are all these complexities and nuances to what he did he just lost his temper went there and slapped him that's it there's no, there are no he's this is the the part that really gets on my nerves because he's acting like there's so much going on he didn't understand and doesn't know why he did and all that i know why he did it you know why he did it and and that's where we're sitting. He's trying to make it look like there's all this going on, I guess, to fill up this, to get this thing he's making to get an apology for it, to apology for it, to get our forgiveness for him to do this. It's ridiculous. His cadence speeds up and slows down in here, and his diction becomes even sharper as, his, as he over illustrates everything he's talking about. So it seems to me so far this, the, this is the least um, sincere moment we've seen up to this point. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. There's there's also a logic drop in there as well, Scott, because if he spent the last three months, you know, looking at the nuance and unpacking it and, and really looking at that complexity of it, why is it still fogged and fuzzy? You can't have both. You can't have both things. Well, I think it's fogged and fuzzy because he doesn't want to tell us exactly what you said there, which is he got angry, he went up and he thwacked the guy. You know, and then afterwards went, oh, shouldn't have done that, should I? Yeah, it's probably not that complex. Yeah, there may be some all kinds of stuff that he can talk through with his therapist or friends or family. I, I totally understand that. But when it comes down to it, the basic emotion there is most likely anger, most likely just plain old anger being turned into aggression there, I would imagine. Anyway, he needs us to know that, you know, he's now moved forward. And so we get this really strong gesture of jumping over these hurdles or moving the walls forward. So he's a bigger person. He's taking up more space there. He really has moved on. And again, Greg, I agree. That's that's not really necessary for, for us, you know, normal people at home. That's for the industry to say, hey, you know, treat treat my commodities well treat treat my industry well he's got some important holdings and you know i'm ready to get back to work and i'm ready for you to be good investors in my company uh what is interesting for me though is that he does admit the feeling of being the feeling of being disrespected and of being insulted not a feeling of being insulted he was insulted so somebody insulted him he felt disrespected he got up he hit the guy. It's probably about that simple. Chase, Chase, you got you got to end more complex than that. What do you got? Now you guys got all the cool behavior stuff. So let's just break down the the linguistics side of this. He says you need to understand nuance and complexities. So that's his behavior. So the reasons for his behavior are nuanced and complex. Not the other person. Only for him. The other person didn't say those things on stage because it was nuanced and complex. That was just simple to understand. The aggressor is nuanced and complex. And he says, there's no part of me that thinks this was the right way to behave. This is distancing language. 
And when he says it was not the optimal way, we see this little thing here. Mark talks about this all the time. And this suggests that it wasn't bad. It, it wasn't the worst. He's just saying it's not the best. That's that's what that means. And the only mention of true negative behavior in, in this entire clip belongs to Chris Rock. It's disrespectful and insult. No distancing language whatsoever. It's directly negative, pointing at Chris Rock's behavior. Lots of shifts down to internal dialogue this way. This is where his eyes move down into his left. And the words he uses for his own behavior, let's just recap, are behavior, thing, and not optimal. Those are the three, as opposed to Chris Rock's behavior being disrespectful and insulting. So interesting way to, to phrase this from a linguistics point of view. I spent the last three months um, replaying and understanding the nuances and, and the complexities of what happened in, in that moment. Um, and I'm not going to try to unpack all of that right now, but I can say to all of you, there is no part of me that thinks that was the right way to behave in that moment. There's no part of me that thinks that's the optimal way to handle a feeling of disrespect or, or insults. After Jada rolled her eyes, did she tell you to do something? No. Um, it's like, you know, I'm, I made a choice on my own from my own experiences, from my history with Chris, Jada had nothing to do with it. Uh, I'm sorry, babe. Um, I'm gonna say sorry to my, my kids and, and my family for the heat that I brought on all of us. Um, to all my fellow nominees, you know, this is a community. It's like I won because you you voted for me, and it, it it really breaks my heart to have stolen and and tarnished tarnished your moment. Um, I can still see Quest Love's eyes. You know, it it happened on Quest Love's uh, award, and you know, it's like I'm I'm. I'm sorry really isn't sufficient. All right, I'll go first on this one. His voice tone completely changes here, obviously. And he's, this is different from any other type of apology I've, I've ever seen where somebody goes from this really sad thing to this thing where he's trying to, to look all cutesy and sound like the Will Smith that is in movies and, and stuff like that. It's, it's just really odd sound and to see him do that. But he adapts with, his, adapts with his hands through the whole reading of the question. He starts there like he did at the beginning. And then this whole trying to, to show how he was being a bad boy and it's okay because he's being, it's almost like he's saying, I'm being naughty or something like that. Just so cornball at that point he's doing it. And like Mark was saying earlier here, he contradicts himself from saying how fuzzy things were. He talks about how he remembers seeing Quest Love's eyes during that and how that made him feel bad. So he's remembering all these little details when he says it's all fuzzy and he doesn't remember anything. He's got all that stuff in his room. So it makes it look like there look like there's a lot going on. He's confused and everything. And then um, again, he's trying to um, I, I don't know. It just it just it's a, it's just a gross feeling to see him doing this. It didn't it, it's just such a off putting thing he's trying to pull off here. It makes me it makes me uneasy looking at him. I'm sure he's he's trying to be as honest as he possibly can because he's got to apologize, but it just seems so fake. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you. What we're seeing here is contempt in one part of this. I think he's slightly offended by this question. And I think laughing it off like this might be a sign at this point, uh, Jada being in charge of him, uh, is that he's very sensitive about and I know nothing about his life. Just the behavior we're seeing in this clip suggests that he's very sensitive about this point and needs to reassert how small of a deal it is and make it a smaller deal to reassert some kind of masculinity. Uh, when he says sorry to my kids and family, there's a mismatched illustrator. And Scott was just talking about this. 
it's my kids and my family. And then his hand, his hand goes down. You can see it perfectly and say sorry to my, my kids and, and my family for the heat that I brought on. And the heat that I brought on is what he's saying. But he's saying this about his family and people around him. But he's saying the heat that I brought on, he's pointing to himself. Uh, this could mean that he and his family are the, kind of the same. It could mean that he's thinking about just the heat that he brought on himself. Uh, I'll leave that up to you to decide. Greg? Yeah, a couple of things. Listen when he is talking about the nominees to his cadence. To all my fellow nominees, you know, this is a community. It's like I won because you you voted for me and it, it, it really breaks my heart. And then listen when he's talking about his family and whether or not Jada told him to do something. Jada had nothing to do with it. Uh, I'm sorry, babe. Um, I'm gonna say sorry to my, my kids and, and my family. Well, when he's talking about the nominees, that's kind of just rote. But when he's talking about her, everything slows down and he navigates the words very carefully. For me, that's the red flag because he doesn't do that very often. And he uses a mix of words. On my own, from my own experience with Chris, there's a cadence shift and a navigation. Ding, 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 something's up right there. What we know is that there is baggage with him and Jada Pinkett Smith and Chris Rock from past jokes. So that's part of the whole equation. As far as did she tell him to do something, she didn't have to, because remember, relationships are microcultures. And I guarantee you, every person who's married, if your wife or husband goes, that's a fight starter right there. And if they do that and then make eye contact with you, it's like, are you going to sit there? So did she make him do something? No, nobody can make you do anything with that signaling. But in a relationship, a lot of dynamic is going on. We can't see behind the curtain. Insiders to Hollywood will tell you all kinds of things, maybe people who know all these people, but we don't. What we're doing is working from here. He does that lower teeth exposed thing in a big way this time, Scott. And maybe it is anger, micro expression of anger. Maybe it's something not even micro, an expression of anger. Maybe it's just culture. But when he talks about that at the end of the my history with Chris, you see distaste or disapproval right there as he's talking about Jada had nothing to do with it. And then that uncharacteristic pause. For me, I would climb all over that because something's going on right in there. It doesn't make it feel like it's an apology. It's more of a trying to push off. Nobody made me do it. I did something wrong, but not actually even saying I did something wrong, not coming out and saying, look, I was a, if, if I were if I walked up and slapped somebody on stage, I would have probably come back and said, hey, I was a dumbass. It's, you know, I did something stupid. We're not hearing that. Does he feel some kind of remorse? Yeah. Does he feel remorse for slapping Chris Rock? Not sure that's true. That's what I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, uh, so I agree. Th this laugh that he that he does is very different from what we've seen elsewhere. And it just reminds me of stuff he'd do in The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. It is that kind of boyish absurdity around stuff. Now, it's not that that's not probably some part of him. He's a great performer, so he's always bringing out parts of him. But it's still relatively performative. It's still relatively, you kind of think, I think you're acting your way through this. You're performing your way through through this bit at this point. So, uh, you know, just as you were saying there, Scott, it, it really does stand out that bit as very, very different and causes some alarm bells. I'm sorry, babe, he says, and we see contempt at that point. Now, uh, is it contempt for her? Well, if, if it is contempt for her, then any relationship would be doomed. We know that from some some extraordinary um, uh, uh tests that were done where uh, in, in therapeutic sessions, if you saw one partner show contempt for the other, they ended up parting from each other. It was, it was you know, a really good call. Um, well, what we see is that his eyes go down as well. I would say in shame. So I think it's more likely not contempt for her. It's more likely some kind of contempt and shame for himself. And we'll, we'll hear about that a little bit later as well. Bitterness in the mouth, absolutely, when he talks about quest love. So some real kind of bitterness and pain that it happened around that particular great icon of, of music and, and culture as well. But interesting, I think we're starting to see the the contempt turned inwards, uh, and that's a, a, a very strong shame that we might 
you're starting to see here. Now, what's it really shame about? Yeah, as, as, as people have been saying, maybe it's not that much shame around Chris Rock, but shame around breaking the cultural norm for that particular industry and that particular environment. After Jada rolled her eyes, did she tell you to do something? No. Um, it's like, you know, I'm, I made a choice on my own from my own experiences, from my history with Chris. Jada had nothing to do with it. Uh, I'm sorry, babe. Um, I'm gonna say sorry to my, my kids and, and my family for the heat that I brought on all of us. Um, to all my fellow nominees, you know, this is a community. It's like I won because you, you voted for me. And it, it, it really breaks my heart to have stolen and, and tarnished, tarnished your moment. Um, I can still see Quest Love's eyes. You know, it, it happened on Quest Love's uh, award. And, you know, it's like I'm 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 sorry really isn't sufficient. What would you say to the people who looked up to you before the slap or people who expressed that you let them down? Um, so there's two things. One, um, disappointing people is my central trauma. Um, I hate when I let people down. Um, so it, it hurts. Uh, it hurts me psychologically and emotionally to know I didn't live up to uh, people's image and impression of me. And the work I'm trying to do is I am deeply remorseful and I'm trying to be remorseful without being ashamed of myself, right? I'm human and I made a mistake and I'm trying not to think of myself as a piece of um, So I would say to those people, I know it was confusing. I know it was shocking. Um, but I, I promise you, I am uh, deeply devoted and committed to putting light and love and joy into the world. And, you know, if you, if you hang on, I promise we'll be able to be friends again. All right, Chase, what do you got? I think this is the most honest clip so far. And he says... That's important uh, to feel remorse or, or he's communicating the message. It's important to feel remorse without changing or modifying your identity about a mistake. I think that's an important piece of advice for everybody. You can feel remorse without calling yourself names. The closed eyes here are different than what you see when someone's being smug or self-centered. And here's the, here's the difference. There's a downward head gaze. There's a lack of an eyebrow raise when you see people close their eyes and raise their eyebrows at the same time while they're talking. A whole different deal. And when you see Do someone it. who's smug, you'll see a head tilt and a head back while they're while they're explaining some of that stuff. Like if you ask someone why they just bought an electric car, they might say, well, you know, it's good for the environment. <laughs> and you'll see the head tilt, head back maneuver. But he's still reluctant to discuss his specific behavior. And throughout this clip, he's using pacifying adaptive behaviors. And there's some discomfort here and a need to feel some sort of control. And we've talked about this before uh, in the previous episode when we analyzed Will Smith. This was all about a feeling of a loss of control in your life typically sprouts up during key moments. And we'll talk about that maybe in a second. Uh, Mark, what do you got? 
Yeah, so there's a big piece of spin here for me, which he spins it into letting people down being his central trauma. Well, the question was about what do you want to say to people who feel let down, not, you know, that that's your central trauma. It, it was a very swift manoeuvre into now this being about him. So I, I think that's that's uh, purposeful so that it distracts from others pain around this and we can get into his trauma his pain and and feel for him because he wants to move us along in this drama because ultimately he wants to move us along he wants to move us into the next part of his career he's looking for a comeback and why not because you know people do deserve a comeback if they do the right things they deserve a comeback and people love a comeback you know, of course they do. It's it's great drama. So there's nothing wrong with this, but it's just like we know what you're doing. It's a it's a beautiful little spin maneuver there. Um I blocks there in, in shame and and staccato rhythm. And so I think we are getting some truthful pain around the the shame. Now the interesting thing here is this idea of kind of contempt being pushed upon himself and him being ashamed of himself. And he's saying, that's what I want to avoid. I want to avoid that shame about myself. That's, that's all good. I totally agree, Chase, that that would be, that could be devastating and could be, you know, uh, hugely depressing, you know, traumatically depressing if you do that. However, you do still have to show shame. In order to make a comeback, you still have to do an, an overt, very clear display of shame for the group, because if you don't, the group can't trust you. And so different cultures, different societies have different rituals that happen and customs that happen and ways that you do it. Families have ways that you do it. Your groups have ways that they do it. So, you know, in my mind, he really needs to get past this idea of it being his central trauma. It could be true or false, and I'm sure it's very, very true. So, okay, good. But he has to get past that and be able to show the industry, the people involved, the people he wronged, that sense of shame, or he won't, I think, get the comeback that he's looking for because it cannot be trusted. Uh, that's all I got on that one. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Yeah, this is two different stories entirely to me. The first is probably true where he's going through and he's telling you about his feelings and how he feels in this case. And often we use our eyes as barriers. We're closing our eyes to give us space as we're talking about something painful. We see it all the time in real life in people. So they'll tell you, and it was one of the worst experiences in my life that you expect. So he's giving you something that's internal. Then it changes. After he does that, he does all that adapting. And he goes into, and I'm going to jump ahead because we cover most of these things, but he goes into something in the interrogation room, red flags me immediately. And that's, he starts to talk about how he's feeling and his eyes drop down into his left and he is talking slowly and navigating. If I'm sitting here and I'm going to tell you all about how much I care about you, Scott, you know, you mean so much to me. And does that look right to, to anybody here? When you're talking about no. feelings, when you're trying to get information <laughs> out about feelings, when you're talking about something from your core, you, you're, if you're going to look down, you're going to look down to your right. Usually you'll make eye contact with somebody you're trying to give that information. So it's a BS indicator for me. And I feel like this is a packaged message. This last part is about a packaged message. Look, I'm a human being. Actually, honestly, I, a better apology you couldn't ask for. I'm a human being. I really screwed up. I did something stupid. That's what he should have said in the very beginning. What he's getting to is finally saying those words at the end of this entire thing, but he's doing it in a way that hedges. And, you know, Will Smith, if you're watching this, if you ever have to apologize again, just get to it quickly, because then all the rest is window dressing. People love you. They watch your movies. You could have come in and said, I made a mistake. I'm human. Boom. I, I w wish I hadn't waited three months. That's what this whole message says. Scott, what do you got? Once again, he's trying to make it look like he's reading this for the first time or hearing this question for the first time. So that makes me a little bit uneasy. And then what he's taught, what he's saying, this is just all therapy talk. This is this is exactly, I'm sure, whatever the therapist said to him. He's just spitting that back out because that's what he absorbed when they said, look, man, you know, this is normal. You're human. You're this. You're that. And that's the way humans do. And I'm sure he's just repeating that back out almost as a, as trying to um, reassure himself of of. That's what's going on at this point. I think he closes his eyes and he slows down because 
that's the part he wants to make sure he gets a, he gets across. That's the most important part to him uh, about how he has to correct his behavior and he's got to sell it at that point. So I'm pretty sure that's what that is. And I think this, I hate to say this part, but I, I, I don't, I mean, I'm sure he feels bad at some part of it, but I don't think he feels as bad as he's coming on that he feels as bad about at this point. That's me. All right. We good? Yeah. All right. What would you say to the people who looked up to you before the slap or people who expressed that you let them down? Um, so there's two things. One, um, disappointing people is my central trauma. Um, I hate when I let people down. Um, so it, it hurts. Uh, it hurts me psychologically and emotionally to know I didn't live up to uh, people's image and impression of me. And the work I'm trying to do is I am deeply remorseful and I'm trying to be remorseful without being ashamed of myself. All right. I'm human. And. I made a mistake and I'm trying not to think of myself as a piece of shit. Um, so I would say to those people, I know it was confusing. I know it was shocking, um, but I, I promise you, I am uh, deeply devoted and committed to putting light and love and joy into the world. And, you know, if you, if you hang on, I promise we'll be able to be friends again. All right, we'll still around the room and see what everybody's got to say as an overview. We'll take 30 seconds or less. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I think this is less a message for us people, film watchers at home. I think it's a message for the industry uh, in general, I would say. I think it's said best by that poster up the back of him. The world is is ill and love is the cure. Um, yeah, Will Smith is really nothing to do with any of the wrongs that have gone on. It's all about the world. Just showing, you know, love and light out there is going to solve everything. And we don't need to look at Will Smith anymore, anymore and kind of go, I think you just lost it, got angry. You couldn't control yourself. You did a bad thing. Um, he's trying to maneuver past that, I think. It's a bit of a shame uh, because it could be a simple, easy uh, apology at this point. Chase, what do you think? Yep. I think we're still seeing Will exhibiting some of these traits of somebody who's genuinely bringing, for most of his life, love and positive energy wherever he goes. And this often comes, these people like this often comes with the side of repressing a lot of negative emotions. You see this in people like Robin Williams, especially. And an exponential buildup of resentment tends to happen here. And when the resentment is also about control, one single event that shines a really bright light on a person's lack of control will cause all of that to escape sometimes very quickly and rapidly in one scenario. And I think that's what we saw a few months ago. And I think that's uh, what we're seeing the apology for. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, we don't know what's going on inside their relationship. We know that you know they've done all kinds of things and this red table interview and all that, and that probably creates a certain amount of stress. There's also this part that Chris Rock has made jokes about her in the past. I think, um, I forget the exact joke, but you can look it up. So there's baggage there, and I'm sure there's been behind the scenes something going on in relationships, microcultures and microcultures, and we don't know what goes on there. But almost guaranteed, if today your wife goes and then makes hard eye contact with you, you certainly will feel some urge to do something to correct the situation. This is not a good choice, especially considering where he was. But at the end of the day, this apology could have been very succinct, very simple. Hey, I made a mistake and I did something stupid and, but nothing simple. It's Hollywood. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I think we've got 
too many details that mean absolutely nothing in this. And I think it had to be, you can't just come on and say, hey, I'm sorry, and move along. He's got to add all this stuff to it. So I think we saw a lot of things being added to it. What he should have, in my opinion, what he should have said, came out and said, look, I got mad because he dissed my wife and I slapped him. Shouldn't have done it. Sorry I did it. Chris, I'm sorry, man. I called him, wouldn't talk to me. Hell, I wouldn't talk to me either for doing something like that. Embarrassed the squat out of him in front of the world uh, during the Oscars. That's horrible. I shouldn't have done it, man. That was, a, that was a bad mistake. That's crazy what happened. I shouldn't have done it. And then, boy, am I ever sorry. And that's it. That's what I think you should have said. And that's where, I, that's where I think I land on that. Is it too much in there? And he just should have said, hey, look, man, I'm sorry. And just what I said, and then moved on. All right. Are you good? Yeah. He can probably right. deep fake that apology that you just did there and put that out <laughs> next. Be perfect. I bet you somebody, you really somebody, somebody will do something, something with it. Deep faking it as we speak oh, right now. Oh, man. All right. All right, fellas. I think this is a good one. We'll see you next time. See you. Today we're going to talk about Amber Heard. This is part four. Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to watch. Yeah, guys, this is as close as we're going to get to live on anything. This is the first two hours of Cross, and this is Depp's attorneys taking her story apart. And if I have to tell you what this story is, you've probably been in a coma. And he tells you, you will not see my eyes again, doesn't he? Uh, yes, he does in that recording. And he kept that promise, hasn't he? As far as I know, he cannot look at me. He won't look at you, right, Mr. Heard? He can't. One of the first questions your counsel asked you on direct is, why are you here? Do you remember that? I do. Let's please play plaintiff exhibit 357A, which is already in evidence, Your Honor. Oh. And for the record, it's 2122 through 2140. That's your voice on that recording, right? Yes, it is. And you were speaking with Mr. Depp? Yes. And you said to Mr. Depp, quote, you can tell, you can please tell people that it was a fair fight and see what the jury and the judge think. Tell the world, Johnny, tell them Johnny Depp, I, Johnny Depp, a man, a victim too of domestic violence, end quote. That's what you said, right? I was saying it to the man who beat me up, yes. I thought it was preposterous. And the man you beat up numerous times. <laughs> right, Ms. Heard? I could never hurt Johnny. You're here in this courtroom because Mr. Depp finally told the world that he's a victim of domestic violence. I know that he is suing me um, and has sued other people or corporations that have said that as well. You didn't think he would tell the world he was a victim of domestic violence, did you? I found it hard to believe that he could or that he would do that considering the relationship he and I had. I, I thought it would be crazy for him to do so knowing what I know we lived through. Or as you said to him in that recording, who was going to believe that Johnny Depp, a man is a victim of domestic violence, right? With all due respect, I wasn't saying it because he's a man. I was saying it because he was a man who beat me up for five years. Mr. Depp is your victim, isn't he? <sighs> no, ma'am. All right, Greg, what do you got? So I'm going to be a little long winded on this one because there's so much here. Um, and then I promise I'll try to keep it as tight as I can. First of all, her head is like some kind of a switch. When she looks at the jury, this should tell you how involuntary a request for approval is. Doesn't mean you're lying, but when you raise your brow and you're trying to get approval, it simply means you want approval, whether you're lying or whether you're just trying to get somebody to agree with you. Every time she turns her head, it's like she's got a little switch right here. And when her jaw passes a certain break point, her forehead goes up as she looks at the jury. Doesn't happen as much when she's looking at the attorney, kind of interesting. Then when she gets to this place where she's saying that she's rejected and that he is denying her and that he's done with you, see her go down right eye movement, which we associate classically with, with emotional information. And then there's 
a whole lot of blink rate increase there where there's a flutter or a blink rate. She eye blocks and she does full on head avoidance as she's looking away from that attorney. This is the core issue. That denial of her is here. Then I see her go to legitimate sadness with a kind of a slack lower jaw and her head kind of leaned down. I'm not talking about when she's reading. I'm talking about when she's feeling all of this pressure. Remember, her baseline is that disdain thing, but she does some res resignation with her lip drawback when she hears herself saying these words. And then she never says, I didn't beat him up. She says, I couldn't hurt him. That might be the issue. I'm disappointed I couldn't hurt him. I could hit him as hard as I want. And then she goes back to it. She does that down her nose. Hard to like somebody who's looking down their nose at you. She does that. And then she turns her head away. She exhales an exasperation. And she says, I couldn't hurt him and does that one shoulder rise. I, maybe she equates that whole thing with, if I can't hurt you, then it's not domestic violence. When she does a lip compression, then she starts to navigate words. I'll leave it at that because there's so much. Else. One last thing. There's so much else here. When she says, no, ma'am, if you're not Southern, you probably associate that with her being polite. If you're Southern, Texas, you probably associate that with a emphatic. No, ma'am. No, sir. That's emphatic. That's the way people talk down here. Um, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, uh, not seeing Johnny's eyes. Let's look at that. In fact, let me just look on uh, Johnny Depp here. So there's been a lot of media speculation around why he's not up and why he's not getting eye contact and um, and a lot of media speculation that it's, he can't look his victim in the eye. And of course, what the uh, what the prosecution here do is is try to deal with that in this moment as well and bring up this tape where he says he's committed not to look her in the eyes and so they've reframed this idea of being antisocial into the idea of being committed to a cause which i think is a really good spin on that true or not i'm not quite sure well he says that anyway but but here's here's what i do know is that his eyes tend to be down because he's writing or sketching and both of those things are classic ways to keep your cognitive mind at the forefront and that primitive reptilian brain in the background so you don't get triggered emotionally by what's going on around you. So it's a, it's a class technique that I train other people in as well. If you're in an environment where you think you're going to get triggered by what's being said and uh, get emotional, just write down what people are saying, sketch out what people are saying. Now in the recording that we hear, I think it's interesting that Heard says, uh, I Johnny Depp, a man, uh, I am a victim too of d domestic violence. And he goes, yes. And how strong that yes is, good downward intonation, jumps in on that with a lot of power, a lot of exclamation. I think he's feeling at this point positive that that is the truth and, and seen by this. So, you know, good indicator there that he does truly believe that he is a victim of domestic violence. Now, at the same time, he doesn't deny the idea of I too am a victim of domestic violence. So once again, we don't hear a denial that he's any part of um, of domestic violence, and we don't have a denial from Amber Heard. But this is consistent with what we were talking about in the last video. Uh, nobody seems to <coughs> deny it in any way. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, they did a great job with these questions. I will say that. <clears throat> There's some of them that have problems, and we'll talk about that. But at the moment she's saying, I was saying it to the man that beat me up. There's immediate mouth closure following her answer, which suggests, especially with her baseline, uh, some stress or deception. And this is a calculated answer. And so she has a baseline in court here at the deposition of injecting data. And like I'll ask her a question about one thing, she'll inject data about something else. And the problem with thinking like a lawyer instead of a person who was victimized is that it comes out looking like a story or a, a pushed narrative. And right in the same moment, there's a complete absence of emotion that we saw initially in response to all these events. So when truthful people are on the stand, they will show the same emotion, whether being examined and during cross-examination, you'll still see the emotion there. And Right at the moment where we're, we're hearing, you didn't think he would tell the world he was a victim. There's a huge inhale followed by a postural retreat. Greg talked about the eye flutter. This is, these are stress behaviors is what we're looking at. And there's a missing perpetrator here. 
she's not talking about the severity of what happened to her or how bad this other person is. And this is more indicative of a made up story because it's focused on the suffering of the victim. And her shame about doing that, if it if this is deceptive, the shame of doing that softens the manufactured malice of the aggressor. So I'm ashamed of this. I'm just going to focus on my suffering and not make that person out to be the worst human being ever. The large exhale is probably due to this question being a little bad. This last question here. Uh, there's no anger. There's no confusion present here. Only the story, just the story. And what you're seeing here is not testimony of a victim. In, in my opinion, you're seeing delivery of a narrative, this constant looking to the jury to answer all of these questions is very strange. And you don't typically see that unless the person's more focused on a narrative than they are with their own suffering. So with her tendency to insert all this data that we just talked about, this is the part where we would see it right at the end. This is the part where the real truthful data would come in. And one of the diagnoses, I'm sorry for going long. I promise this is the only one I'm going to do this on. Uh, one of the diagnoses that she potentially received is, is revolving around histrionic personality disorder. And to help you unpack this as we go along, we're going to unpack eight or nine videos here. There's eight diagnostic criteria for histrionic personality disorder. In each one of these clips, I'll give you one. So verbatim from the diagnostic manual has a style of speech that is excessively impressionistic and lacking in detail. Strong opinions are expressed with dramatic flair, but underlying reasons are usually vague and diffuse without supporting facts and details. Straight out of the diagnostic manual. And we'll get another one next time. Scott, what do you got? All right. Oh, it's, when she's when it starts out, she looks right down the barrel of the camera. And I've never seen eye engagement this odd before in court. I mean, her eyes get real big and she's just bang, looks right down the barrel of the camera with her, with her mouth open. And we see those eye flutters or the eyelash flutters or the eyelid flutters. And that's, I think, deals with personal pain uh, because that that caught her off guard when she said, uh, uh, he said he would never, you'd never see his eyes again. So I never heard anything that cool before. And I don't think she has either. I mean, who, who's heard that? I mean, Greg said it was probably from a movie or something, but no, man, no. I, I, <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's pretty hardcore. When somebody talks, says something like that and you're not ready for it. So when she brings that up, I think it's a little bit embarrassing for her, but at the same time, I think it's a little bit painful for her. And when she says, as far as I know, he cannot look at me. She looks at him twice. I mean, she looks at him two times. So I think the attorney's playing hardball ball with her and it's got her upset and addled and they're going back and forth and it's sort of a contest to see who's who can be this the snarkiest and the smartest as it goes along. We see in all those uh, expressions that let us know she's um, trying to look like she's sad and trying to look like she's hopeless, all those things. And those are just attempts at those expressions. She's trying that really hard. So after the recording, when when uh, the attorney says, and the man you beat up, right, Miss Heard? Then her chin goes up, her head goes back, and that chin comes forward. And then she does that thing where she turns her head to the to the side and then blows out air. I've never seen somebody who wasn't lying when that chin went over there to, to the right or to the left, wherever it is, when it goes toward the shoulder. Usually it's that one shoulder shrug and the chin goes toward it. There are no absolutes, but every time I see that, I think that person, I go right to that, and I'm, I've been right every time when I've seen the head go to the side and the ch and the, the, the chin to almost touch the shoulder. I don't know why that is. Greg and I were talking about somebody else one day. You, you got home and said, what do you think about this guy? I said, I think this guy's being dishonest. And that was a, that was the cue that we talked about there for a second, Greg. Um, yeah. And just before she says, I know, I know that he's suing me. We see her mouth wide open with a chin jut. And that, that indicates she's trying to control what's coming, you know, control the situation or control herself. And it, it happened so, it was so odd, but it happened so naturally. I think her brain, when somebody verbally attacks her, that's her reaction is to just blow up. But I think she's controlling it. But I think her face automatically goes into that thing where her chin comes down and out and her mouth opens up wide. I think that's why we keep seeing that. All right, that's all I got. And he tells you, you will not see my eyes again, doesn't he? Uh, yes, he does in that recording. And he kept that promise, hasn't he? As far as I know, he cannot look at me. He won't look at you, right, Miss Heard? He can't. 
One of the first questions your counsel asked you on direct is, why are you here? Do you remember that? I do. Let's please play plaintiff's exhibit 357A, which is already in evidence, Your Honor. And for the record, it's 2122 through 2140. And see what the, see what the jury and judge thinks. Tell the world, Johnny. Tell them, Johnny Depp. I, Johnny Depp, man, I'm, I'm a victim too of domestic violence. And yes. I, you know, it's a fair fight. It's Steve, probably people believe, or side with you. That's your voice on that recording, right? Yes, it is. And you were speaking with Mr. Depp? Yes. And you said to Mr. Depp, quote, you can tell, you can please tell people that it was a fair fight and see what the jury and the judge think. Tell the world, Johnny. Tell them, Johnny Depp, I, Johnny Depp, a man, a victim too of domestic violence, end quote. That's what you said, right? I was saying it to the man who beat me up, yes. I thought it was preposterous. And the man you beat up numerous times. <laughs> right, Ms. Hurd? I could never hurt Johnny. You're here in this courtroom because Mr. Depp finally told the world that he's a victim of domestic violence. I know that he is suing me um, and has sued other people or corporations that have said that as well. You didn't think he would tell the world he was a victim of domestic violence, did you? I found it hard to believe that he could or that he would do that considering the relationship he and I had. I, I thought it would be crazy for him to do so, knowing what I know we lived through. Or, as you said to him in that recording, who was going to believe that Johnny Depp, a man, is a victim of domestic violence, right? With all due respect, I wasn't saying it because he's a man. I was saying it because he's a man who beat me up for five years. Mr. Depp is your victim, isn't he? <sighs> no, ma'am. You said he hit you and he wear, he, he was wearing rings, right, Ms. Hurd? So he hit you with rings on every finger? I don't know if I've ever known Johnny to not wear rings. Yeah. <clears throat> Ms. Hurd, you testified to an incident in March of 2013 where Mr. Depp hit you in the face multiple times. Do you recall that? That's correct. And you testified, quote, you don't know how many times he hit you in the face. That's correct. So Mr. Depp hit you in the face multiple times while he was wearing rings on this occasion, correct? Which occasion in March are you referencing? You weren't The specific. testimony that you gave on day 15 of this trial, March of 2013. You weren't specific as to the day. There were several incidents. The one where he hit you several times in the face. Uh, there were, there were, so, I'm sorry, just so I understand better, there were several incidents in March. Which one are you asking me about? The time that he hit you several times in the face wearing rings. Well, he pretty in much March always... March of 2013. Right. What are you asking me? I'm sorry. He was wearing rings on that occasion? I pretty much always knew him to wear rings. Okay. Let's please pull up Defendant's Exhibit 170A, which is already in evidence, Your Honor. You testified that this is a picture you took after that incident, right, Ms. Hurd? Yes, that was one where he grabbed me. And hit you in the face so many times that you don't remember. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And there's no injuries to your face in this picture, are there? Not that this picture shows. And there's no medical records reflecting that you sought treatment after this alleged incident either. I did not seek medical treatment at this time. So there's no medical records reflecting any injuries to your face after he, he hit you several times. I did not need to go to the doctor at the time. Despite hitting you several times that so you lost count with rings on, your on his fingers. That's correct. I did not seek medical attention other than my therapist. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so vocal clicks, which are the things that go like this before somebody 
talks. And we're going to hear a lot of those from Amber Heard, and we hear a lot during this. Now, what does that mean? In my view, when I hear those, I'm always looking out that there may be some stress around what's about to come. Does it mean somebody's being deceptive? No, not at all. But with other clusters of information that we're going to get, it starts to become a larger probability. And that's what we're dealing with here, is the probability that somebody is being de- de- uh, deceptive, not the actual fact that it's that it's happening. Uh, another one that I would put in that cluster, she does not state that he hit her with rings on. That's never stated. What she says is, I've almost never known him not to wear rings. Well, look, I'm not saying she hasn't been hit, and I'm not saying she has been hit. But if you had been hit, my probability would be on saying, he hit me with rings on. That's where my mind would go. That's where I'd expect other people's minds to go. Now, we all know, with violence going on, all kinds of things can happen in somebody's psychology. But all of that said, we've got um, almost never and a double negative. There's nothing wrong with a double negative, but there's easier ways to say yes than not no, okay? And, and, And if somebody's taking the difficult way around to something, that suggests to me they're making a journey that they don't really need to make. And why are they making that journey? Why are they having to circumnavigate such an easy route to a to a yes to that? So alarm bells go off for me on that one. Scott, what do you think? Uh, I think this is a situation where the witness prep uh, got a little bit out of hand. I think she went too far into it, and she's trying to be to do exactly what they said. She's repeating the answer, so it sounds odd. She's it, the whole thing just sounds weird. And nobody said, "Hey, listen, man, you need to dial it down a notch," from when they from when they took a break or something, because that's just too much. I mean, she it just her answers sound odd as she's going through that. She still answers all the questions. They're still short, tight, to the point. And I think she's beginning to realize her her snarkiness isn't working on this attorney, and that's starting to bug her a little bit. Um, and she's not sure how to go forward since it's not working, um, so she can guard her ego properly, or the way it should be guarded, so she doesn't end up freaking out and blowing up on her. So that's what I got. Uh, Chase, what do you got? So with this witness prep, I, Scott, I think the reason that so much coaching is involved in this is because there's one thing they can't tell her. Just tell the truth, mm-hmm. which is what a lawyer should be telling their client. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but let, let's uh, let's break this one down in reverse Quentin Tarantino order, which means in regular order. She smiles corrects the expression to artificial sadness, then looks at the jury to display it to them. Then she looks back at the counsel with a cold, emotionless face. This is in like two seconds, this rapid shift of emotion. And right at this moment, Mr. Depp hits you in the face multiple times. This look to the jury here is horrifying to me, personally horrifying watching it this morning. It was before the sun came up. It was dark in my office. I was a little scared. There's a weird, awkward smile while putting her head down. Then she looks back at counsel, at the counsel with no emotion, then back to the jury with a sad face. In my opinion, body language and behavior profiling is a lot like meteorology. It's based in science and gives you likelihood where we deal in terms of likelihood. But this is a rare occasion where I'm going to say there's a 99 and maybe a 100% chance of precipitation here, which I mean deception. There's no emotion, no willingness to insert details on top of her answers, which is her baseline. And the jury, I think, are all unconsciously processing this nonverbal behavior. So in reality, there in the courtroom, the jury is processing her behavior through this mammalian part of our brain. We've been communicating nonverbally for a million years. And they see these little rapid shifts in emotion, and it sends a signal, which gives us what we call a gut feeling. Since that part of the brain doesn't speak English, we're like, something is off. But it's likely nobody can really put their finger on it because that the mammalian part of our brain doesn't really speak English. 
So when we see something off, we get that gut feeling. So part two of histrionic personality disorder, this obviously has nothing to do with this case, and I'm not diagnosing anybody. I'm just randomly inserting this in here. Diagnosis criteria two displays rapidly shifting and shallow expressions of emotions. Criteria two. And that's all I got. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I'll add on top of your clusters as I go through this, but I got a handful of things to talk about. Number one, there's that swivel switch, turns her head or brow rises every time she looks at, at the jury. If you don't think she's working the jury, then pay attention to the fact she looks at the jury when she's asking a clarifying question. That would not happen if she was not working the jury. Now, is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. And she's probably been, probably been prepped by her counsel that she needs to make a contact with that jury. I'll also tell you, I think, Mark, you hit a couple of things dead on right there with these vocal tics and the lip compression come out around an emotional issue. I think she's containing, and I think what we're seeing here is well prepared to prevent her from doing what she did on the stand in 2016 or on the deposition in 2016, where she was snarky and talking down and aggressive. You don't want that coming out here. So if I'm, if I'm the person who's prepping her, I'd say that's correct is a fine answer. Don't be snarky. That's correct. That's incorrect. You can see that she has absolute, there are a handful of things that we know that we can read. She has contempt, and this is not her usual drawn back left side of her mouth, is full bore contempt when she looks at that attorney. She does a light sway. We're talking about clusters now, so we start to see things. She does a light sway as they're asking her questions about punching. Mark, again, you had it dead on. She avoided anything about did he hit you with rings on? Well, he had rings on. Okay. She also used a provocative statement, a provocative statement saying there were many or several incidents. And a provocative statement is a way to get your part of the story out by having the person ask you the next question. John Nolan, confidential. He's a master. He was my, my instructor to teach me all of that. So you look at those pieces, you start to say, okay, we've got clusters here now. She's avoiding a question. She says, that's correct. We see she's locked down. She does that provocative statement, trying to give you more information, trying to take you off path. She does some discomfort in her movement, meaning it's rigid, it isn't fluid. We associate that with fight or flight. So all that together, now we start to say, can we tell she's lying? No, but we would certainly want to go after her and this attorney wants to go after her. That's it. You said he hit you and he, wear, he, he was wearing rings, right, Ms. Heard? So he hit you with rings on every finger i don't know if i've ever known johnny to not wear rings yeah. <clears throat> mr you testified to an incident in march of 2013 where mr depp hit you in the face multiple times do you recall that that's correct and you testified quote you don't know how many times he hit you in the face that's correct so Mr. Depp hit you in the face multiple times while he was wearing rings on this occasion, correct? Which occasion in March are you referencing? You weren't The specific. testimony that you gave on day 15 of this trial, March of 2013, you weren't specific as to the day. There were several incidents. The one where he hit you several times in the face. Uh, there were, there were so, I'm sorry, just so I understand better. There were several incidents in March. Which one are you asking me about? The time that he hit you several times in the face wearing rings. Well, he pretty in much March always- March of 2013. Right. What are you asking me? I'm sorry. He was wearing rings on that occasion? I pretty much always knew him to wear rings. Okay, let's please pull up Defendant's Exhibit 170A, which is already in evidence, Your Honor. You testified that this is a picture you took after that incident, right, Ms. Hurd? Yes, that was one where he grabbed me. And hit you in the face so many times that you don't remember. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And there's no injuries to your face in this picture, are there? Not that this picture shows. And there's no medical records reflecting that you sought treatment after this alleged incident either. I did not seek medical treatment at this time. So there's no medical records reflecting any injuries to your face after he, he hit you several times. I did not need to go to the doctor at the time. Despite hitting you several times that so you lost count with rings on, your on his fingers. That's correct. I did not seek medical attention other than my therapist. 
Ms. Hurd, you testified that in January of 2015, there was an incident in Tokyo before uh, Mr. Depp's Mordecai, the film Mordecai's premiere. Is that correct? That's correct. And you told this jury that on this occasion, Mr. Depp was kneeling on your back. That's correct, in the closet. And you also told this jury that you wore a backless dress to the Mordecai premiere that very same night. I did. And you testified that you were checking for bruises in the car on the way back, on the way to the event to make sure that there, there were, quote, no visible marks, right? I was checking on my phone um, after the event to see, to make sure that nothing, that you couldn't see anything. Your testimony was that you were checking in the car on the way to the event to make sure that there were no marks on your back. Uh, Perhaps I misspoke or I misunderstood. It was on the way back from it was after I was concerned. After, you know, concerned that there would be marks in any photographs since we were being photographed at Johnny's press event. And you didn't show this jury a picture of you in that backless dress, though, did you? Um, I don't know what you mean. I'm sorry. You didn't show this jury a picture of you at the Mordecai premiere wearing a backless dress, did you? I haven't had the opportunity to. Okay. I assume you have it. I do. Um, let's please pull up plaintiff's exhibit one, two, five, six. <coughs> this is a picture of you and Mr. Depp, or the back of you, at the Mordecai premiere in Tokyo, correct, Ms. Hurd? That is correct. Your Honor, I move to admit and publish this picture. All right, one, two, five, six in evidence. This is you in the backless dress at the Mordecai premiere in Tokyo, right? That is correct. You would agree that there are no bruises or visible marks on your back in this picture? No, not that I could see. All right, I'll go first on this one. All right, but this is one of the largest micro expressions of anger I've ever seen. And when she says the word after, her entire face shows anger. You can slow it down, take a look at it. It's huge, and you saw it. You may not realize it, but you did see it. And it shows, she shows her lower teeth, that chin juts outward, and her brows furrow. Everything, she squints, everything shows anger on that. It's very brief, really, really brief. It's a micro expression. And it actually happens twice, right there when she says after, and then right there, right after it. And then on the word concern, we're seeing anger as well. And all the harm, hallmarks of anger in that spot. Uh, I think this is a fantastic study of full on full facial micro expressions because these are every now and then you'll see them like in the in the uh oj simpson case what's that, that little fella's name that had the long hair that that uh kato yeah yeah kato kalen uh we saw him him uh with some anger as well in there a couple of times i remember um i think it was ekman that put a couple of things out or maybe it was joe put a couple uh, joe navarro put a couple of things out uh, pictures where it just captures it, that anger face. But I remember that like it was yesterday. But that's what this reminds me of. And I'm going to pull those actually and use them for training. They're so good. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah. So if you think this is a good one, wait till next video. In the next video, there is one of the most profound anger faces I've seen in forever. And it's to your point, Chase, it is rapid. It moves so quickly if you're not paying attention or if you don't stop the video, you'll miss it. But in this one, here we are with a swivel switch again. Turn her head, brow goes up. Turn her head, brow goes up. She says that's correct and qualifies in the closet. Well, I don't know why in the closet matters, but that's to her baseline because she gives us more information when something is actually going on. She said, I did, and that's in baseline. She does that kind of scrunched face. That eyelid flutter that starts is recognition that she's about to have to answer a question about wearing a backless dress after she had been beaten up. So I think she knows that, she sees it. And then when she tries to get away from the question, she narrows her eyes and does a feigned misunderstanding so she can say, I don't know what you mean. She purses her lips, makes eye contact with the jury and then goes back to the attorney with I've not had the opportunity. And she raises her shoulders in helplessness. That's all congruent messaging. So we think, well, that's at least looks truthful. A lot of this other stuff doesn't. But then we see another uncertainty as her brow knits, and she says, I assume you have the photo. Well, yeah, that's not what you want to see, but of course she does. And then that's it for this one. There's, there's so much going on in this story. 
But she is working the jury the way she's been told. She's doing correct. I did very short answers to prevent doing the wrong thing. And Mark, I think this goes back to your cognitive control thing about doodling or doing something else. If you can remember, I always say curl your toes in your shoes, the mere fact that you're remembering what you've been told brings your thinking brain back online and keeps you from switching over into limbic thought. Chase, what do you got? If these uh, <clears throat> sketches ever appear on eBay, I'm probably going to just splurge and, and get one. But again, here we're seeing this weird face making for the jury display. And I do think, in my opinion, and this is all my opinion, is a display. There's when this picture comes out of the screen of this backless dressed, this uh, ability that you're witnessing here is either the only human on earth who can go through several emotions in mere seconds or the most talented emotional manipulator that you might ever see. It's my opinion. It's jury, sad victim, attorney, cold calculating. Jury, smile, back to the attorney, cold. Just during that one piece. And that's all I'm going to focus on is this rapid shift of emotion. And what we're seeing here is not really testimony. We're seeing a performance that's directed at an audience at very specific times, looking at them, scanning the jury, which you can see in this video. See if you can spot it. There's a moment there where the jury is being scanned during a question to see how they're responding to that question by Ms. Heard. And let me give you a number three, diagnostic criteria three for histrionic personality disorder. This is shows self-dramatization theatrically and exaggerated expression of emotion. Number three, verbatim. Was I the last one? Nope. Oh, sorry, Mark, go ahead. Lovely, thank you. So uh, let me tie a few of those things together because we've talked a lot about the anger, the contempt, the disgust that we're seeing popping up, but we have to recognize that that's part of her baseline. In the first, one of the first videos we did of Amber Heard, we saw that popping up when she wasn't under stress. And so you might think, well, great, that's probably a good thing for her that it's part of her baseline and we might be able to discount some of those elements a little bit. Well, unfortunately, probably not, because there's a study out of Switzerland. It's just one study, so uh, you can count it or discount it. But it found a massive correlation between the, the, um, the emotions shown in the face of anger, contempt and disgust, and something called borderline personality disorder. Now, borderline is different for different people, uh, and so you, know, you won't see this in everybody, but in this particular, this particular paper, they saw a good correlation. Now, I'm not conflating uh, borderline with histrionic. They're two different things, but you can have both of them at the same time as well. And so all of this is pointing towards potentially quite a difficult person to be around. Not impossible, but difficult to be around. And so I think we should keep that in mind that there may well be. The thing is with, with emotions popping up in people's faces. When they pop up now and again, most emotions don't last really much more than I would say 10 minutes because it's quite hard work for the body to deal with, okay? When they pop up for longer than 10 minutes, we tend to call that a mood. Somebody's got into a bit of a mood. It won't be high intensity, but it lasts a long time. And moods can last for hours or parts of of days. But usually when somebody wakes up the next morning, that's why it's sometimes good to sleep on it. When somebody wakes up the next morning, a whole bunch of calcium has moved to another side of a neuron and, and things are kind of forgotten about. And you can't kind of be like, well, what was that problem that I had yesterday? You can't quite remember it. Now, if the mood goes on for a long, 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 long time, days and maybe weeks and even months, we tend to say that that might be an affective disorder and we'll start to see the same behaviors in people day after day after day. And then we might start to move it towards, well, maybe it's a personality disorder. So I just wanted to bring that up. You will see all of these things in her baseline, but that might point towards an affective disorder or a personality disorder in my Little opinion there. Where, where are you, Mark? 
Where are you? I am in Banff. I am in Banff in Canada, in Calgary. If you could see out the windows there, you would see magnificent mountains, snow-capped with incredible trees. But what you're seeing here is basically any Fairmont hotel that you've ever been in in your life. You'll recognize these lamps from any Fairmont that you've ever been in. Almost home. Almost like home. my hotel a few weeks ago. Ms. Heard, you testified that in January of 2015, there was an incident in Tokyo before uh, Mr. Depp's Mordecai, the film Mordecai's premiere. Is that correct? That's correct. And you told this jury that on this occasion, Mr. Depp was kneeling on your back. That's correct, in the closet. And you also told this jury that you wore a backless dress to the Mordecai premiere that very same night. I did. And you testified that you were checking for bruises in the car on the way back, on the way to the event to make sure that there, there were, quote, no visible marks, right? I was checking on my phone um, after the event to see, to make sure that nothing, that you couldn't see anything. Your testimony was that you were checking in the car on the way to the event to make sure that there were no marks on your back. Perhaps I misspoke or I misunderstood. It was on the way back from it was after I was concerned. After, you know, concerned that there would be marks in any photographs since we were being photographed at Johnny's press event. And you didn't show this jury a picture of you in that backless dress though, did you? Um, I don't know what you mean, I'm sorry. You didn't show this jury a picture of you at the Mordecai premiere wearing a backless dress, did you? I haven't had the opportunity to. Okay. I assume you have it. I do. Um, let's please pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 1256. <laughs> this is a picture of you and Mr. Depp, or the back of you, at the Mordecai premiere in Tokyo, correct, Ms. Hurd? That is correct. Your Honor, I move to admit and publish this picture. All right, 1256 in evidence. This is you in the backless dress at the Mordecai premiere in Tokyo, right? That is correct. You would agree that there are no bruises or visible marks on your back in this picture? No, not that I could see. You testify that after this alleged incident, you had cuts on your forearms, right? Yes, that's true. And you testified that you had cuts on the bottoms of your feet as well? Yes, that's true. And you testified that you had a bruise across your jaw from when Mr. Depp, quote, clocked you in the face, end quote. That's true. You didn't take any pictures of these injuries while you were in Australia, did you? I don't think, no, I don't think I took any pictures. You just took two pictures of Mr. Depp's writing on a mirror. Isn't that right? I believe so, yes. So you had your phone on you, right? At some point I did have my phone. And your iPad? I had my iPad, I believe. You testified that you were also in Australia, right, Ms. Heard? Yes. You testified you bled from your... Yes. There aren't any medical records reflecting that you sought medical treatment for any of these injuries, are there? I did not seek uh, medical treatment after Australia, no. Not for... No, I did not want to tell anyone. Not for the cuts? No. Not for the injuries to your face? I didn't need to. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, we see this uh, thing happening with the liquor bottle there right at the beginning. There's emotional accessing and there's hesitancy there, which is a little unusual. Not a giant mountain of behavioral clusters. And then there's this discussion of bleeding. And this is a different yes than any of the others. It's shortened with other, some more emotional uh, accessing there. And the cross is talking about medical treatment, the, uh, the attorney. And Heard scans and calculates the emotional reactions of the jury to the information that's presenting itself during this question about medical treatment, which I find very, very strange behavior. 
So the third mention of this R word thing, there's a backwards head retreat. And I think the questions could have been a little bit better here. Something like, can you explain why you didn't need any medical attention? So more open-ended to get, we're helping the jury to see the personality of the person that we're talking to. I'm going to leave some of the other nonverbals alone here. I'll give you a histrionic personality disorder point number four here completely randomly uh, uncomfortable in situations where he or she is not the center of attention may do something very dramatic, such as make up stories or create a scene where they aren't the center of people's focus. And that's all I got. Scott, what do you think? I think I almost spilt this water. Um, okay, each time she says that's true, we see contempt. And there's a little muscle right here called the buccinator muscle. And that's what pulls that part of her mouth back. And on the third time when she says that's true, both sides are pulled back. Now, some people are going to think they're seeing uh, Duper's Delight. It looks a little bit like it, but it's not. But if you're slowing it down and going frame by frame and all that, you'll see what looks like that. It's not. I promise you it's not what it is. Because what's happening is when we see her emotions, they're, they're flipping from one to the other like a card. Bang, bang, bang. Just pull them out really quickly. We're not seeing that morphing from one to the other. Usually when you go, or not usually, every time you see a true emotion, you'll see the emotion and you'll see it blend with the next emotion as it changes into that emotion. We saw this in the, in the, on the last, uh, in part three, where it was just boom, boom, boom. She was just clicking through these emotions like flipping through cards and they would just change automatically and she's changing them. She has a, a face she's showing the attorney and she has a face she's showing the jury. And you can watch that thing change when she's looking that way. Bang, it changes as she gets where Greg's talking about halfway through. Those eyebrows go up and she looks over that way. It, it's it's fascinating how she's she's trying to pull that off, but she doesn't know not to. She, if she watches this, she will. But so when the attorney says, you didn't take any pictures of those injuries when you're in uh, Australia, did you? Again, we see mac micro expressions of anger, two of them. And at the same time, or with her mouth open really, really wide as she breathes out or she breathes in at that point, and that chin comes down and we see, see some teeth there. Time's really, really fast, but you'll see it if you pay attention. And what, again, I'm going to say what I think her brain is doing is reacting the way it normally would when she's being attacked by somebody verbally. When, be it a boyfriend, be it a husband, be it a friend, whatever. When somebody attacks her, she automatically just snaps into that, that um, reply of, of an attack and i think that's that's just a like a flinch for her at this point we'll see that in this volatile type of personality and but she's controlling it but that's what those when you see her mouth wide open like that and those teeth come out and that chin come forward that's what we're taking a look at or that's what we're seeing at that point um i'll stop there greg what do you got yeah so that rate one of the best anger micro expressions, full blown expressions I've yeah. seen in a long time is at 25 seconds. When she says, I don't think there's real anger there. Let's talk about what anger looks like. Her brows are drawn together and down her lower teeth are exposed and her eyes are narrow. So she's focusing on you. She, there's anger there when she's responding to that question. Then she does something really interesting. Chase, to your point about all this emotional change, she does confusion in the brow, then back to anger, and then back to confusion. There's three times like that. It's rapid. And I say all that movement in her face, I think, is real based on what she's feeling. Scott, I think you're dead on. She would usually be very aggressive, I think, and she's been coached to contain all that. And when all that happens, it's got to go somewhere. Well, hopefully you do it in your hands or your feet or somewhere else. But in her case, I don't think she's – this will piss her off, I'm sure. I don't think she's sophisticated enough for that. I think that emotion is coming to the surface and it's going where it goes. When she answers, when she says – starts off by saying, yes, that's true to the question you testified that. She does a vocal tick or vocal click to your point mark in this one, which is an odd place, the only one. And then after she answers the question, she does smug face, that little thing where she is looking down her nose at the woman. Then she goes back to contempt. Well, after the confusion and the brow change, she does the head wobble. That's a, not a yes and not a no. That's a head wobble. She doesn't know how to respond, and she's moving her head around. That means something in some cultures, but it doesn't in ours, so it has no assigned meaning. It's her confusion. Then she directs contempt again at that questioner and some anger as her chin's up. Yet yeah, chin jut, you pointed out, Scott, and the narrow mouth. You can't miss that. And she finally answers after being saying, yes, that's true. She went from yes, that's true in the last yes to just yes. 
So something is going on. Do I know that she's telling the truth or lying? No, but what I do see is a pattern. There's a vocal tick, there's anger, there's telegraphing of her emotions, stuff travels through her face rapidly, and then she shows anger and she closes it out with a shorter answer. All those are indicators. What do they mean? Not sure. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, we'll see that head uh, wobble, the yes and the no together in a video coming up at another important point, I think, Greg. Uh, yeah, we get that vocal click. Yes, that's true. Yes, that's true on the second one. Now, no vocal click before that's true, but a big chin raise there. So with everything that everybody else has put into that, I'm really not sure that anything there is particularly true. Now, when we get on to did you seek medical attention? And, you know, we all understand that there are all kinds of reasons why somebody who may have been through a real trauma will not seek medical attention. OK, we get that completely. She says, and it's very rational for this situation, I didn't want to tell anyone. OK, I think that's that's a very fair thing to say. But she says later on, I didn't need to. So I didn't want to tell anyone. That's why I don't seek medical attention. And then later on, I didn't need to. Well, this seems a deviation from the first story. And I'm, I'm not saying you can't have both at the same time, but I'm saying it's a little bit overly complex. And we know these situations can be complex. But personally, I want to go, well, which one? Which of the ones was it? Was it I didn't want to tell anyone or I didn't need to? Because both of them at the same time feels a little overly complex to me. Now, I know you'll be able to think of all kinds of reasons why that complexity could happen. But it's fitting into a pattern for me of complexity where it doesn't really need to be. And so I worry that if there's complexity where it doesn't need to be in other places, that here's a place where complexity doesn't need to be as well. And here might be a place where there's deceit or a story or it's not quite accurate. So looks not good to me. I don't quite buy it. That's what I've got on that one. Well, we're going into this next one really quick. And people can take just a second while we're doing this to hit that subscribe button. What do you guys think of this one video, one to a hundred? What do you think the likelihood of deception is? Just this one clip that we just looked at. Yeah, put it in the notes. Yeah, you're talking to you. Talking, yeah, yeah, I'm talking to you guys. Oh, us. Oh, 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 I think eighty-eight. I'm going with eighty-eight. Yeah, I, I don't know. If, on a one to a hundred, two thirds, two thirds away there. There's just so much shit in her face normally that yeah. some of this is part of her baseline. All that negativity in her face, to Mark's point, makes it difficult to say when she's doing contempt for her. And I think it's normal for a person to have contempt for the attorney who's questioning them. I just don't think she's sophisticated enough to block it and to hide it. So I would yeah. go two thirds of the way there. I wouldn't go yeah. as high as 88, in my opinion. I'm going to go, but I'm, uh, that's a tough one, man. I'm, I think I'm going to go a little high, man. I think I'm going to go, I'm 75%. I think, I think she's, you know. Too much going on there. And I, I agree with you, Greg. Those She's getting ready. She wants to attack so bad she can't hardly stand it. And that's driving her nuts, man. But I'm going to go with 75. Okay, so I'm going to hedge. I'm going to hedge down from 75, somewhere in between Greg and Scott there, just because I can probably fit <laughs> in there. There's nowhere left for me now. Um, here's what I think. I'm not going to say deceit, but there's a struggle going on. It feels too much okay. of a struggle going on. And that's what I don't like. Do I know it's deceit? Mm. Do I think there's a right, struggle? To tell. Yeah. Struggle. And that struggle could be her overriding her desire to say, uh, I think start so, doing yeah. that. Yeah. Like we saw in the other. So this is where body language alone is so paralyzed compared to controlling the conversation, asking the next question, yeah. using an elicitation technique or interrogation ploy to psychologically prod them. You, you, we have no control over that part. So yeah, yeah. I think it's a good yeah. question, Chase. Yeah, would you, would yeah. you say, Chase, what would you put that in? I just wanted to know what y'all Oh, hell no, we're gonna put it in. I think it it's a good thing you, to put in, yeah. Yeah, what was your percentage, Chase? What was it? 88. Okay, okay, well, I'm up there close to you. You're a little bit higher than me. Well, I like you more than everybody else now, automatically. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. We'll leave that in, too. <laughs> the last, the last you ever see of me.
You testify that after this alleged incident, you had cuts on your forearms, right? Yes, that's true. And you testified that you had cuts on the bottoms of your feet as well. Yes, that's true. And you testified that you had a bruise across your jaw from when Mr. Depp, quote, clocked you in the face, end quote. That's true. You didn't take any pictures of these injuries while you were in Australia, did you? I don't think, no, I don't think I took any pictures. You just took two pictures of Mr. Depp's writing on a mirror. Isn't that right? I believe so, yes. So you had your phone on you, right? At some point I did have my phone. And your iPad? I had my iPad, I believe. And you testified that you were also with a liquor bottle in Australia, right, Ms. Heard? Yes. You testified you bled from your as a result of that assault. Yes. There aren't any medical records reflecting that you sought medical treatment for any of these injuries, are there? I did not seek uh, medical treatment after Australia, no. Not for No, I did not want to tell anyone. Not for the cuts? No. Not for the injuries to your face? I didn't need to. This is your medical record for December 17th, 2015, isn't it, Ms. Heard? That's correct. And this record doesn't document any physical injuries on you, does it? I, I, I don't think so, no. I, I don't think I spoke to Kipper. I didn't speak to Kipper um, that day. And but you went I didn't to tell. Dr. Kipper's office and were seen, correct? I went to Dr. Kipper went to Dr. Kipper's office for a concussion check. Right. Okay. And this medical record is from that visit, correct? Partially, yes. Scroll down, please, if we could. The signature Kipper down below. This is the entirety of the medical record, right, Ms. Heard? Yes, what I meant by partial is I didn't talk about what happened to me. I didn't get into my injuries. I didn't get into what happened or um, ask for anything other than should I get some sort of scan done. Right, but this record doesn't document any physical injuries on you, does it? Uh, I'd have to read it in full, but I, I don't know. Well, let's do that. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, what comes up for me is is Greg in my head on this one. Uh, when I've heard you in in various interviews with subjects and, uh, and and interrogations, going here we go, negotiating, negotiating, and and this is what's happening here for me is there's negotiation of the parameters. Okay, I think I don't think so. No, I don't think I spoke to Dr. Kipper. I didn't speak to Dr. Kipper. The idea of partially in there. I mean, there's lots more in there. It's just full of negotiation. Now, does this mean deceit? I think in some cases it does. Certainly there's a struggle going on, but maybe in a court, we should expect some of this negotiation and semantic, where well, we get a lot of semantic negotiation come on later on. We should expect some of this negotiation. However, I want you to look over the whole of these um, these videos and think, does she negotiate some of the parameters when she doesn't really need to? I think in some of these cases she does, and in some she doesn't. I think I've got a case further on where I think it's very fair that she negotiates uh, the parameter. Um, but by the way, and I just want to call out, I'm sure as we all do, I think it's Camilla Valjez, who's, uh, who's the... Um, Questioner, who's the examiner? Oh man, uh, here. she's awesome. I mean, if if anybody comes out of this, uh, you know, star. never a star and never wanting for it, like like that's a lawyer who will always be on demand. Yeah, I man. think always going to be on demand. What a, what an incredible lawyer! What a brilliant example of calm, assertive. A little bit snarky when she needs to, just to kind of yeah. twist the twist the, the screwdriver a little bit, but just just incredible. Um, yeah. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree with you. She's negotiating a question at every turn. She does a single shoulder, and I'm going to hit just very few. If you're always going to say that is correct, that is incorrect, that is true, that is not true, you suddenly don't start stammering around things where you need to negotiate. That tells me what's going on inside your little head. And that's why source leads, when you're talking to a person in the interrogation room, and they always give me short one-word answers, and they suddenly give me a long answer, guess what? There's the bear trap. 
And that's what she steps into here. And she thinks that she's going to dance around it a little bit. And this attorney does a great job of locking her down. So she starts with, that's correct. She does a single shoulder rise at one time out of baseline when she doesn't, when she says, I didn't talk about my injuries. Well, why would be my question? Why? And the, she gives just rambling information to try to cover that why so that she doesn't have to answer anything. A little bit of chaff there, a little bit of spitting out information so that you'll let her move on. She edits as she speaks when she says, I don't think I didn't. I'd stop right there and say, which is it? You don't think or you didn't? Which is it? Which is it? Which is it? And you lock her down. Of course, she's got an attorney who will stop that from happening. One other thing, if you're her and you're drinking a glass of water, this is free advice to you. If you're on the stand and you're drinking water and somebody asks you a hard question, don't gar gargle the water and damn near choke to try to help them out by answering their question. Take your time, finish your water, set your bottle down and answer the question. Give yourself time to think. Interesting she didn't do that. She tries to avoid the question by saying, I would need to read in full. She does kind of what I would call a prim face, like a little school marm face and she goes well okay then and you see the uh-oh occur in amber's face it's a beautiful moment scott what do you got right i think we're seeing all the cues of someone thinking while they're trying to appear at ease and i think it's because she's in cognitive overload she realizes when this when when the attorney brings up this uh the, the health document there's going to be trouble there it's going to be against her so she's what she's doing she's running these trying to think and run these scenarios of what she's going to answer by what she thinks the question is going to be Mark's Hotel room, may I help you? Room service. <laughs> so she's running these scenarios uh, of what the of what the, how the answer might end up and what her answers are going to be uh, before it even finishes. That's what's putting her in cognitive overload. That's why she starts stuttering. And when she says she went to the doctor for a concussion check, she shows a stress mouth or disappearing lips or lip compressions. Some people call it. I call it stress mouth uh, because that's what you see, for example, in congressional hearings when someone, especially when they're their uh, integrity is questioned. You'll see those lips disappear. They, they, they'll compress them and they'll completely disappear. And that's what we're seeing in this case. But that's I call it stress mouth because they're under a lot of stress at this point. Also, her eyes are wider than they've been up this point uh, in this series, series of videos we've been watching. And that's because she's keeping her eye on the attacker. Also, watch how many times she doesn't look at the jury during this. Look at check that out, and that gets worse as we go along. When she's again, when she nails her with something, um, but I think she's she's she, when she goes to the doctor and she's supposed to have been being beaten, she doesn't show me the inj inj injuries. I understand that, like Mark was saying earlier about not talking about that. That makes sense. Uh, some people don't want to talk about that, but I think we're seeing her in panic mode, and she's trying not to derail herself as she gives these answers and trying not to give anything away. But I think she's in cognitive overload, and it's just like I get when I get on here and I get to talking too fast and words start running into each other. That's what's happened to her. She's trying to think about what she's going to say next. Chase, what do you got? I agree with the guys. I've been crossing stuff off of my list here nonstop. Oh, and that's sorry, one of the man. things like if you don't know this, we don't review this before together. We don't compare notes. We don't do any of that stuff. So when you see a lot of us kind of looking down and doing that kind of stuff, we're crossing off what somebody else is covering. But right at this moment where there's the words concussion check, right at that moment, the lips tighten around the teeth. They start stiffening while still leaving the lips parted. And I was struggling with this this morning, going through these videos, and I had to call in the big guns. So I spent 20 minutes on the phone with Joe Navarro this morning, sent him this clip, had him analyze it, go to this exact thing, because I needed some, some feedback uh, from, from the godfather here. So this is from Joe Navarro here. Communicating severity is what this means. It's hard to fake. And it typically indicates negative emotions that a person is going through or thinking about negative emotions. And I told Joe I would say this just to basically brag that I had his number. Joe's response was, uh, the biggest brag you can do on YouTube is, to, is that I picked up the phone. <laughs> but that's from Joe, not from me. But let's quickly talk about what I mean with this small movement of the muscles on the face. When somebody wants to fake something, it's going to be big it's not often going to be small because they want it to be seen by other people especially if the jury's 30 feet away and right at this moment when 
we're hearing, I didn't talk about what happened. She literally told the doctor that she bumped her head while standing up. You know how I know that? Because it's written on the medical paper right there on the screen. Very strange behavior here. So let's let's move into uh, histrionic personality uh, segment number five or quality number five. Considers relationships to be more intimate than they actually are. Direct quote from the DSM will refer to physicians early on in care by their first names. Interesting that we saw that here and it's literally written inside the DSM. So that's all I got. This is your medical record for December 17th, 2015, isn't it, Ms. Heard? That's correct. And this record doesn't document any physical injuries on you, does it? I, I don't think so, no. I, I don't think I spoke to Kipper. I didn't speak to Kipper um, that day. And but you went to Dr. Kipper's office and were seen, correct? I went to Dr. Kipper went to Dr. Kipper's office for a concussion check. Right. Okay. And this medical record is from that visit, correct? Partially, yes. Scroll down, please, if we could. The signature Kipper down below. This is the entirety of the medical record, right, Ms. Heard? Yes, what I meant by partial is I didn't talk about what happened to me. I didn't get into my injuries. I didn't get into what happened or um, ask for anything other than should I get some sort of scan done. Right, but this record doesn't document any physical injuries on you, does it? Uh, I'd have to read it in full, but I, I don't know. Well, let's do that. Directing your attention, Ms. Heard, to a photograph. This is a photograph you took in March of 2013, right? That is correct. And this was taken at your apartment in Orange? Yes. And this is your breakfast table? That is correct. And it's your testimony that Mr. Depp left this breakfast table just the way you took it? That is correct. So this is what the table looked like after Mr. Depp had been doing cocaine? Uh, well, clearly he has yet to snort these lines. There are four lines of cocaine on this table, right, Ms. Heard? In this picture, I see four lines. There isn't any cocaine residue around those lines, right? Uh, I, not that I can tell, no. Doesn't really look like anyone's been doing cocaine off that table, does it? With all due respect, I'm not sure you know how that works. I'm asking if you do. You've testified you've done cocaine. I have. Doesn't really look like Mr. Depp or anyone was doing cocaine off that table, does it? Uh, I beg to differ with you on that. When you snort cocaine, typically it goes into your nose. And there's Doesn't stay residue. on the table. There's residue from that cocaine when your lips and nose touch the table, right? Will the tampon applicator next to um, the credit, I mean, um, driver's license that you see is a device that uh, I believe my sister had taught him to use in order to put the cocaine uh, in your nose. Mr. Depp is a pretty heavy smoker, right? He is. And, and that's a cigarette in the ashtray in the back there? Um, back right? Yes, it looks like one of his hand rolls. There's no other cigarettes in that ashtray, are there? I see one cigarette. The one that's not smoked? That's correct. There's no ash in that ashtray either, is there? Uh, not that I can tell in this picture. It's pretty clean. In this picture, it looks like it, yes. It's a pretty neat table. Wouldn't you agree? Um, depends on what you would call neat, I suppose. And you sent this picture to your friend, Rocky Pennington, as well, didn't you? I sure did. And when you sent it, you said, quote, look at my morning, or something like that. Is that right? Yay for mornings. So you have a habit of sending stage photographs to your friend, Rocky, don't you? I had a habit of communicating with my best friend about what was going on in my life. You don't have any pictures of Mr. Deb actually consuming cocaine, do you? 
I don't think I have a picture of him mid snort. No. You don't even have any pictures of Mr. Depp with cocaine. What do you mean by that? Holding cocaine, standing next to cocaine. Um. Sitting next to cocaine. I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, you haven't shown any of those pictures like that to the jury, have you? I don't know. I No, I haven't. And you were never able to catch Mr. Depp with cocaine on film either, were you? I never tried. But you were able to catch him sleeping, right? Uh, I have seen him pass out in all sorts of places, yes. Chase, what do you got? These are some rapid and quick answers. And then we're seeing after these in the beginning here, we see some backpedaling, some not answering questions at all. So one thing I will continuously tell since you're subscribing as we speak, you're going to hear this quite often. What's being concealed in the story? Is there emotion? Is there detail? Is there sensory detail? What's being concealed or removed from a person's story? So instead of just lo looking at the verbal stuff, the nonverbal stuff, what's being hidden in the story? Right when she says, not that I can tell, no, this is the most uh, strongest indicator of anger that's not the anger facial expression that I could possibly see. And this is a dominant shoulder retreat. The dominant shoulder starts moving away from the person that's asking questions. Because I think as this next question is loading, she knows where it's going. And there's a lot of lower teeth exposure here. And right when she's saying, I have a habit of communicating to my best friend, there's some closed eye talking going on there, which typically indicates in some people pretentious feelings of or self pride. And you haven't shown any pictures to that jury. We hear that elicitation statement in there again, uh, John Nolan. It, this is another bizarre expression, uh, kind of flash to the jury. You can watch it right on her face. You can see it. The video is going to come up as soon as we're done. It flashes to the jury. And I want to talk really quickly about true and false facial expressions. True facial expressions will fade off of the screen or fade off of a person's face over time. A false facial expression is more likely to drop or fall off the face quickly. But throughout this whole thing, she's failing to answer questions. A lot of these questions are kind of like designed to sound snarky on purpose. I'm not sure. I think they could have been worded a little bit better, but I think she's doing a great job either way. Staging photos question is like, I think a way it could have been asked is like, is your testimony here today? that you didn't adjust a single aspect or detail of a single object on this table before taking this photograph. And that might elicit a, a different response. So let's get to histrionic behavior profile indicator or diagnostic criteria. Number six, this person is suggestible, easily influenced by other people or circumstances. And keep in mind, there's eight of these. You only need to have five to have a diagnosis by a licensed uh, psychologist, which is not me. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I think there's some great examples of elicitation here. And uh, I think the, the examiner here is doing a, a tremendous job of playing Herd here. Herd comes in with a bit of a snarky comment, which is basically around, you, you wouldn't know how to snort coke at all. You're so prim and proper. You know, you lawyers don't do any of that stuff. And so what happens is, is the lawyer plays into that. And so I think the lawyer well knows the residue that's being talked about here, which is the residue that happens once the line is gone, there will be something left there. But she plays into the idea of she doesn't know what's going on here and goes, no, 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 it's like when, because your nose gets really close, which then elicit that innocence, that naivety, which is a great elicitation technique, then elicits from her a whole diatribe about, no, my sister came round and, you know, facilitated Johnny, take, enabled him taking drugs. Like the whole family are involved in Johnny taking drugs. And you notice that this may sound like she's going off on a tangent, but the examiner is letting her run with this. The examiner has got exactly what the examiner wanted from her by playing the innocent here. I think that's really quite interesting. Uh, I saw that uh, that that 
uh, eye block of superiority there, Chase, and, and thought of you. I think it's a great, great example. Here's what I'm most interested on this. Uh, no pictures of Johnny with cocaine, but pictures of Johnny passed out, or as he calls it, napping. Now, we've already heard from Amber this idea of uh, cocaine is is taking cocaine is pretty cool because she sends pictures to her friend going yay it's the morning this is me on my morning okay this is a cool morning to to be had um but she doesn't take pictures of johnny doing cool stuff like that she takes pictures of johnny passed out or asleep i believe because that's embarrassing and not cool when you get to a certain age and you can't handle your drugs like you used to be able to do as a young rock and roller, gets a bit embarrassing. And so these are, I think, opportunities for Amber to get evidence of the old man, of uh, the, the disheveled, past it rock and roller, which will obviously raise her status as his goes down. And think about a personality that might like to raise their own status. And if they can't have their status high, well, they just need to lower other people's and have evidence of that to bring theirs up. Interesting stuff. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, one thing that you'll notice in this case that is missing, she has been very engaging with the jury up to now. And you'll notice she starts off engaging the jury with that switch. She looks over, her brow rises again. And then she forgets that as she starts to get in a bind. She shows some absolute contempt and some disgust as she engages the, the attorney after she first looks over to these guys and goes, well, clearly you don't understand or whatever her words were there. And she's trying to bring the jury along with her, but suddenly she steps into that trap. And I think, Mark, you're dead on. The attorney uses naivete, which means I'm feigning not to understand a complex thing, so you explain it to me. It, it preys on our natural instinct to teach. So what you're doing is that she then starts to spill information and she has a rational response for why there is no no residue left and that kind of thing. And then as she's moving through that, you can't miss that she forgets to engage the jury for a long period of time in there. That means she's fallen into this and her brain is working on whatever the problem is. And I think she starts to realize then that she's fallen into this. You watch her stretch her neck in some awkward kind of craned around, let me see, as she's trying to answer, that's correct. She moves her neck around to say, let me see, and her whole body moves in an awkward fashion and she's stiff. It means her brain is starting to register there's a threat. You see her shrink, she does a shrinking target, what you guys have always called turtling, I just call shrinking target. And she actually asks a question that I think she's asking for real clarification when she says, what do you mean by that? Because I think she's doing a little bit of squirrel in the road. I think her brain is going, oh, 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 what do I do now? When she's asked, do you have pictures of Johnny? She does, it looks like she's looking at the jury, but she isn't. What she does is she first goes to her visual accessing side and starts looking for, hey, do I remember pictures? Are there possibly pictures? Uh, and you can see that's when she's scrambling in the road and then she purses her lips in disapproval. This is a place where it looks like to me, she's fallen into it and she's kind of in a bind and it's maybe the first place we're seeing her actually starting to come to realize that this woman is actually a threat. The rest of it, I think she's been pretty prim, pretty you know direct with her and kind of short and snarky. And I think here she fell for something she shouldn't have. I agree with you, Mark. Scott, what do you got? You guys got almost everything, so it's about to be fairly quick. So we're seeing, I'll just say we're seeing all the classics of facial expressions here. Everything from happiness, sadness, fear, worry, anger, contempt, disgust. We've seen the chin, chin jets and plenty of micro expressions. And um, I think she's so focused on on the attacker at, at this point, which I think she's seen the, the attorney as. She's, she at this point, she's not even after that first section she doesn't even look at the jury she's just answering right to the attorney so she's seeing her as the attacker so that's at that point i think that's what what we're seeing there now i think what's happened is this is almost turned turned into a ping pong game i'm trying to see who's the most who's the most snarky and smartest as they go through this so i and i think amber's in the corner she's got her head down she's swinging as hard as she can and it's not helping her at all and she's still trying to control that anger since we're talking about micro expressions, there's this uh, a woman named uh, Melinda Ozell, 
and I found her on LinkedIn. She does these great, and I know, I know we're all friends with her, I think, on, on LinkedIn, has these wonderful uh, little videos, short videos, uh, that tells you exactly what these little muscles are around your face, the obicularis oculi. She, she goes through everything, really short. Some of them are under a minute, and explains what all these little micro expressions are. That's her specialty. So if you get a chance, check her out. Uh, Melinda Ozell, as a Googler, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. All right, we good? Yeah. All right. Directing your attention, Ms. Heard, to a photograph. This is a photograph you took in March of 2013, right? That is correct. And this was taken at your apartment in Orange? Yes. And this is your breakfast table? That is correct. And it's your testimony that Mr. Depp left this breakfast table just the way you took it? That is correct. So this is what the table looked like after Mr. Depp had been doing cocaine? Uh, well, clearly he has yet to snort these lines. There are four lines of cocaine on this table, right, Ms. Hurd? In this picture, I see four lines. There isn't any cocaine residue around those lines, right? Uh, I, not that I can tell, no. Doesn't really look like anyone's been doing cocaine off that table, does it? With all due respect, I'm not sure you know how that works. I'm asking if you do. You've testified you've done cocaine. I have. Doesn't really look like Mr. Depp or anyone was doing cocaine off that table, does it? Uh, I beg to differ with you on that. When you snort cocaine, typically it goes into your nose. And then it doesn't stay residue. on the table. There's residue from that cocaine when your lips and nose touch the table, right? Well, the tampon applicator next to um, the credit card, I mean, um, driver's license that you see is a device that uh, I believe my sister had taught him to use in order to put the cocaine uh, in your nose. Mr. Depp is a pretty heavy smoker, right? He is. And, and that's a cigarette in the ashtray in the back there? Um, back right? Yes, it looks like one of his hand rolls. There's no other cigarettes in that ashtray, are there? I see one cigarette. The one that's not smoked? That's correct. There's no ash in that ashtray either, is there? Uh, not that I can tell in this picture. It's pretty clean. In this picture, it looks like it, yes. It's a pretty neat table. Wouldn't you agree? Um. Depends on what you would call neat, I suppose. And you sent this picture to your friend, Rocky Pennington, as well, didn't you? I sure did. And when you sent it, you said, quote, look at my morning, or something like that. Is that right? Yay for mornings. So you have a habit of sending stage photographs to your friend, Rocky, don't you? I had a habit of communicating with my best friend about what was going on in my life. You don't have any pictures of Mr. Depp actually consuming cocaine, do you? I don't think I have a picture of him mid-snort. No. You don't even have any pictures of Mr. Depp with cocaine. What do you mean by that? Holding cocaine, standing next to cocaine? Um... Sitting next to cocaine? I don't know. I don't know. Well, you haven't shown any of those pictures like that to the jury, have you? I don't know. I No, I haven't. And you were never able to catch Mr. Depp with cocaine on film either, were you? I never tried. But you were able to catch him sleeping, right? Uh, I have seen him pass out in all sorts of places, yes. You testified under oath that, quote, the entirety of your divorce settlement was donated to charity, end quote, didn't you? That's correct. I pledged the entirety. No. Ms. Heard, my questions. Your counsel will have time to redirect you after. You testified under oath, quote, the entirety of your divorce settlement was donated to charity, end quote. That is correct. I pledged the entirety. I'm going to move to strike everything after yes. Uh, all right. There's nothing to strike here. No. No. 
Ms. Hurt, this is it, really yeah. inappropriate. I, I'll sustain the objection and we'll just move forward. Thank Let's you. Let's move forward. Next Thank question. You. Under oath, that statement wasn't true, was it, Ms. Hurd? I'm sorry, I don't follow your question. Sorry. You testified under oath, quote, the entirety of my divorce settlement was donated to charity, end quote. That statement wasn't true. It is true. I pledged the entirety to charity. The statement. When you say you buy a house, you don't pay Ms. for the Heard, entire house Heard, at one time. You pay it I'm over not asking. time. Ms. Heard. All right. Next question, please. Thank you. That statement isn't true today, as you sit here today, is it? It is true. I pledged the entirety. But to you didn't charity. donate it. Unfortunately. You didn't donate it. It's a yes or no. I haven't been able to obligate, I mean, to fulfill those So that's a no, right, Ms. Heard? I, am, I made the pledge. I want to be very clear. I pledged the entirety. I haven't been able to fulfill those pledges because I've been sued. You had all of the $7 million for 13 months before Mr. Depp sued you, and you chose not to pay it to the charities you pledged it to. Is that I, correct, Mr. I disagree with your characterization of that. All right, Greg, what do you got? I'll try to keep this one as tight as I can. She starts off with a real hard contempt face looking at the attorney. She conditions the question. Here we go again. Instead of saying she donated, she said, I pledge. Then she she goes to eye blocking. The attorney puts her on notice and starts to illustrate and tell her exactly what to do. And then I, one of my favorite parts of anything we've seen is she gets to this emotional head tilt where his heads, eyes are down to the right. Lips are drawn and her eyes are narrow. That's pre-conflict body language all day. If you can't recognize that, you're probably going to get in an argument with someone today. Then she conditions the question again with I pledged. Then she goes to hard eye contact, with low blink rate because she realizes this is a threat. And then this is her saying what she thinks she's going to be able to get away with and she doesn't. She goes to full on rejection. A Morris, uh, uh, Desmond Morris tongue jut for rejection, her chin out in defiance. She changes her cadence, and then she's full of contempt and sarcasm as she's working her way through. Her blink rate increases, and then the final blow is she conditions a question, softens the question, and distances the question with, I disagree with your characterization of that. Now, What's happening here is all that stuff that these attorneys have caused her to put in place to cover up 2016 Amber has slipped. And we're starting to see 2016 Amber slide out of here. Chase, what do you got? Yeah. One thing you'll notice is she's using the same tactics around avoiding truth around donation as she is around all the instances of violence. And right when the judge says, let's move forward right here, I want you to watch this. I think her thinks that her games are working and wrongly assumes that the sustained objection means that her attorney won. I do think that that's exactly what we're seeing. She sits upright. There's condescension on the face. The chin goes up. This is a challenge behavior. She's showing genuine joy in the game that's going on right now with this word salad testimony. And we can upgrade this maybe to Mark's favorite word. It might be a word lasagna. <laughs> But under oath, that statement wasn't true, was it misheard? So we hear that from the opposing counsel. And I want you to watch the eye flutter. This is strange because it really stands out here. And this helps her to delay the process and continue the game of deception that I believe she is genuinely enjoying, in my opinion. And when she says, I disagree with your characterization of that, there's a dismissive head tilt. She feels, I think, entitled and almost proud to have learned these new methods of linguistic manipulation. And those words are from her attorneys. I would, I would bet on it, at least $4. <laughs> on a side note, this stone cold attorney uh, sitting next to Depp is finally showing some emotion. This is the first time we're seeing him do anything. I think the entire courtroom is in disbelief right here at how someone could weave such a deep rooted web so openly and, and blatantly. And it might help us to ask ourselves the question, what kind of person would be comfortable doing all of this? So finally, histrionic number seven or eight here, uh, personality disorder indicator, uncomfortable in situations where she is not or he, the center of attention, does things dramatic like creating stories or a scene to make themselves more of people's focus. 
And one more is using themselves or their body to gain attention from other people. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think she knows she's busted. And that's where her nose goes up and that chin goes out and she looks down her nose at the attorney. And almost every blink, like you were talking about, Chase, every blink is a double blink. It's really, really odd. It's really, really odd because she does the eyelash flutter, the eye blink flutter and all that uh, earlier on. But this time, every one of them is a, is a double. So I think that's, that's something to point out there that just lets us know her stress is just jacked really hard. And at the same time, when she looks back and forth from the jury, we see that head when she turns, her head does a thing where it goes back and forth like this. And it's just a sort of wavering thing back and forth. I think that's an adapter. Any repetitive behavior, we see that as an adapter, a way to get rid of that built up stress or tension. And she's really tense and really stressed right here. And I think that's what's happening. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so negotiating the criteria here, it's argumentative and it is um, semantic. It's a semantic uh, word, lasagna, I, th I think there. But I actually think that's what she's doing is has some reasonable nature to it at a semantic level. And she is accurate that in large gift giving, you don't give it all at once. Just in the same way, however, that Anna Sorokin was accurate when she said rich people borrow money. That's true as well, okay? But really what's happening here is, is the trying to get out of that timeline of you didn't give all the money immediately. Well, I pledged it, yeah, but you didn't give it. So there's a semantic argument going on here. Um, Johnny Depp's uh, kind of sidekick there, who, who's, a, who's an interesting little character, doesn't seem to do very much apart from this moment where he suddenly realizes he has a piece of information about the timeline line and he's just desperate to give it and so when he gives it across and he hears uh, the um, the questioner the examiner read out uh, what he's put forward he's there nodding his head and when it doesn't beat her because she is going to argue this one to the very very last because that's the kind of person she is and and it's to her benefit to keep on arguing this one when he, he it doesn't go his way he simply can't believe it he's like he's a shock with the rest of the court like i can't believe this is going on but i think there is something quite reasonable in some ways about what's going on here in a court but you wouldn't want this kind of arguing day to day outside of a court because that could get really taxing on a day-to-day -day basis and it may be that this particular personality might do this kind of argument on a daily basis which could be quite taxing yeah that's all i got on this one all right you testified under oath that quote the entirety of your divorce settlement was donated to charity end quote didn't you that's correct i pledged the entirety no. Ms. Heard, my questions. Your counsel will have time to redirect you after. You testified under oath, quote, the entirety of your divorce settlement was donated to charity, end quote. That is correct. I pledged the entirety. I'm going to move to strike everything after yes. Uh, all right. There's nothing to strike here. No. Ms. Hurt, this is really inappropriate. I, I'll sustain the objection and we'll just move forward. Thank you. Let's move forward. Next Thank question. You. Under oath, that statement wasn't true, was it, Ms. Hurd? I'm sorry, I don't follow your question. Sorry. You testified under oath, quote, the entirety of my divorce settlement was donated to charity, end quote. That statement wasn't true. It is true. I pledged the entirety to charity. The statement. When you say you buy a house, you don't pay Ms. for the Heard, entire house Ms. Heard, at one time. You pay it I'm over not asking, time. Ms. Heard. All right. Next question, please. Thank you. That statement isn't true today, as you sit here today, is it? It is true. I pledged the entirety. But you didn't charity. donate it. Unfortunately. You didn't donate it. It's a yes or no. I haven't been able to obligate, I mean, to fulfill those So that's a no, right, Ms. Heard? I, am, I made the pledge. I want to be very clear. I pledged the entirety. I haven't been able to fulfill those pledges because I've been sued. You had all of the $7 million for 13 months before Mr. Depp sued you and you chose not to pay it to the charities you pledged it to. Is that I, correct? Ms. I Hart? disagree with your characterization of that. 
All right, let's give a quick little wrap up and throw around the room and, and we'll uh, wrap up what we think is going on here and our thoughts on it. Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, I would just say this. There is huge struggles going on for Amber Heard during this storytelling. I'm not going to talk about it in terms of what's the truth and what's deceit. I mean, personally, I think it probably moves towards deception quite a lot of the time. But I can say for sure there's a struggle going on when really there shouldn't be a struggle going on. If it were a true story, it should be super easy to get across even if there's stress and pressure and angst and all kinds of horrors that have really happened, it still should have a certain ease to it that it doesn't have. Chase. I think most of what we're seeing here is just like that game called Two Truths and a Lie. I think there's a lot of weaving going on here. And I think there's a truth and lies that are mixed together in a way that every lie has three pieces of evidence that kind of almost sort of support it a little bit, maybe. And that's what we're seeing. There's a lot of stuff going on that's truthful, and there's a lot of lies underneath. Greg? Yeah, we'll never know exactly what happened. We know there's some kind of chaos going on in this relationship. The mere fact they were married for like 13 months or something, this thing was a mess. We don't know whether he hit her or she hit him. All we can do is tell you that that's not her job. Her job is to convince the jury. And if she's believable, likable, looks innocent, and delivers the right details to win over the jury, she'll win $100 million because she countersued him for 50, I think is what they said. At the end of the day, we'll not know any of that. What we'll do is tell you that we see discomfort, that she came in there very prepared to cover up something that would make the jury not like her, and we see some of that slipping. My grandma taught me when I was a kid that poor ain't trash and cash can't fix it. I'll leave it at that. Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah, I agree with all you guys. It sounds good. And I think I think to me what we're seeing is a great example of someone who is uh, went into something thinking they could everything they said would be taken for a fact. And it just isn't. And she's fighting for her life in here, fight for one hundred million dollars or fifty million dollars, whatever it is. So I, I think that's what we're seeing. She's back in the corner. She's coming out swinging all at the same try, time trying to show that she's not angry and trying not to be angry. That's the fascinating part of it, is watching this personality type try to stay in control as somebody attacks the uh, the ego here. So that's what I got. All right, fellas, I think this was another good one, and I'll see you next time. Have fun. See you. Trying to just scrabble to pull some semblance together Chase, of... Get the screen up, Chase. We've we got four nine 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 here. Yeah, sorry, right, I'm getting busted, but we yeah, said no, we go for it. So what's yeah. happening here is we're about to hit 500,000 subscribers, half a million subscribers. And we talked earlier and said, as soon as it goes over, when it starts to happen, let's stop whatever we're doing and go in and wait on it. I can but, see the next hey. mean comment. These guys are so self-absorbed, all they do is sit and look at their numbers. <laughs> <laughs> there, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody heard us. Oh, that man. That was fun. <laughs> Holy smokes, that was close. Yeah, I agree. There's, there's a lot of, there can be a lot of detachment from uh, uh, reality. And, uh, but I, I think. There it is. Hey, there, you go. there it is. There you go. All Congrats, right. boys. Excellent. Thanks. Excellent. There it is. Mineral bottle mineral. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? Oh. Yeah. Who are they? All right, so this is our nine five hundred thousandth subscriber, and she's well like, done. "I don't even like that stuff. I just clicked on it because my mom called and said <laughs> to click on it." Yeah. <laughs> Chris Cuomo is back in the news again. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, this is an interview with Dan Abrams, and he will cover things such as what part he played in his brother's downfall and how he tried to protect him, why he actually left CNN. And he's about to have a new podcast coming out in October, so he'll be everywhere. Let's talk about some of the specifics here. Um, it started, really, the controversy started mm -hmm. with regard to your brother when you started interviewing him during COVID. Right. Um, do you regret that? No. Um, but I think it's more fair to say, subject to your own counter, um, that the media was pretty quiet when Andrew was first coming on the show. Uh, why? because people, it resonated with people in a way that nothing, I've won almost every award that 
the TV journalism business has to offer, mostly because I've worked with the best teams uh, that TV journalism has to offer. I've never had people thank me for what they saw as the help that they got during my reporting when I was sick with COVID, about uh, the people around us who were in charge of COVID, and the interviews with my brother, which my everything I know about this situation tells me that, of course, there's a conflict of interest. But people got that, Dan. Nobody thought I was interviewing my brother the way I interview other people. That wasn't the point of purpose of those things. And I even said at the time, and people were like, you don't need to say that. The time will come when he can't come on this show anymore. There will be a time for accountability. There always is in crisis. And I can't cover him about that. People got that. The media should have gotten it. They should have seen it for what it was. And I believe that there was a purity test that was applied to that that wasn't really fair given the context and circumstances as people understood them. That said, you are correct. That was something that was gonna come back to haunt me. It was just a question of when. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm trying to reproduce the way that he holds his hands because it's, I've never seen anything like this before. And I was trying to work out what's it about. Is he trying to suppress some of his uh, illustrators in some way? Could could be that. He could be trying to suppress his dominant hand here, which fists up, which is interesting. But what I like about this gesture is that it leaves his hand already very high to come in and moderate and take control. And he really does take control of this interview and starts basically interviewing himself. Well, why does he do that? Well, oh, how does he do that? He does rhetorical questions, just like I'm doing right now, and then answers them. Um, look, eyebrow raises on people, best, thank me, help COVID, interview with my brother. People, best teams, thank me, COVID, and the interviews with my brother. So he's really laying down this narr narrative of people and I'm the best and they thank me and we're helping COVID and, and then conflating that, mashing that together with interviews with my brother. They This, this public service is not the self-service that the public or the courts or whoever has a problem with this, uh, um, you know, that they, they think it is. So he's trying to make both things a public service. Him talking about COVID and interviewing his his brother. I don't think the public see it that way. I don't think the courts see it that way. They don't see it as a conflated issue. He's trying to do that. I think he fancies himself at it because he does a little shimmy at the end as well. When he's finished, there's this little shimmy move that says, hey, I think I did a good job there. Uh, Greg, what do you think of this one? I don't know about you, but I was riveted during the COVID. That's all I watched was Chris Cuomo. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, come on. Everybody's going to have who they like on TV and that kind of thing, and he's going to play to his audience. I, I say he's the Lucille Ball of news, because if you're old enough to remember Lucille Ball with all the faces and stuff she would do, he's got more faces than I can make. And, you know, Scott grabs mine occasionally, but this guy's got a lot of faces and he's using them all. That forehead constantly. Mark, I love that you're pointing out every time he uses it as an illustrator to drive his point. And you can see all those wrinkles, all those residuals because he does use it that way. There's a lip compression when he says, when Andrew first started coming on the show. We always associate that lip compression with either withholding emotion or some information. My guess is emotion in this case. He's pretty good at containing emotion. And does that surprise anybody considering that rigid lockdown of control that he starts off with? What's interesting is we didn't see that when he was on CNN because he has his hands and he controls the frame. But it tells you there's something going on in him about control, whatever it is. He illustrates to the back of his hand when he's talking normally. And much like his brother, I think his brother's pattern may be reversed. But you always talk about hemispheric tendencies, Chase. He illustrates negative things with his right hand. I think his brother illustrates negative things with his left hand. One or the other. It's been a while if we go back and look at them. But he is an emphatic speaker with his hands. Those pointed down fingers, he's driving that. That's good because it clearly sends a message and it's very much a New York thing. But it's also negative. It's also a double-edged sword. If you stop doing that, then we go, hmm, why didn't you do that here? Must indicate that you don't have the same passion about it. We do see fight or flight in him. 
I think it's irritation, and you can get fight or flight from irritation as well as from fear or trying to get away. See, his forehead goes smooth. In him, that's fight or flight. Shaking his head no, and he's doing a halting out breath. His blink rate increases, and then he navigates the language as he's trying to get to the end of this. Um, that upright eye movement he's doing here, I don't think it has anything to do with you know him accessing information. I think he's trying to figure out how do I characterize this in a way that's least damaging. He's, he's going to lawyer his way through this entire interview, but I agree with you, Mark. He's interviewing himself. Scott, what do you got? All right. Uh, you're right, Mark. He begins with, with his hands crossed in that weird-looking way, and they turn into a fist halfway through. The bottom one, anyway, turns into a fist. So you're right. I've never seen that before either, but it is really interesting the way he uses that to his advantage. So let's keep an eye on that and see what he does with it. When he says no, he 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 does his head forward like it's a yes, but and that's not a confirmation nod. Confirmation nods happen when you say, no, I didn't do that. But he says no, and then his head comes down. Happens really quickly, but take a look at that. Um, and that's what happens with illustrators. Again, they should land right on, on time. If it was a confirmation nod, it would have hit right on the money there, there, but it didn't. For me, most of the action happens here at the top and the rest is just filler and has really didn't have much to do with the, uh, the question itself. When he starts talking about COVID, didn't he get in trouble, you guys, for, uh, biking? He was like running around on his bike or something when he was supposed to be in the house with COVID and he got busted something. outside. And, yeah. And some was guy was hollering awesome. at him. Somebody was hollering at him. Yep. Yeah, so I just don't have any, I can't get into it. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I keep just lining out stuff I have in my notes here that you guys are just covering like crazy. I even was really proud of myself for coming up with the line interviewing himself. So thanks a lot, Mark. This is the most self-aggrandizing clip I think I have ever analyzed for the panel. Uh, it's awful. His hands are relaxed at the beginning, and then when the camera goes back to him, you'll see that fist there. And when he says the media was quiet, then he just asks himself a question, and then he answers that question for himself, to himself. And then there's contempt on his face right when he mentions how he's won every award. But yeah, the man. contempt is towards the other interviewer, in my opinion, and we're going to see some more of that behavior a little bit later. And this eyebrow behavior is a continuous need for reassurance and approval. And this is sales behavior, selling. Thankfully, the body language here is so transparent that I think anyone would see the pitch. And I, I would hope uh, that anyone could see the pitch. That's all I got. That's, that's all I got left anyway. <laughs> right. Let's talk about some of the specifics here. Um, it started really the controversy started mm -hmm. with regard to your brother when you started interviewing him during COVID. Right. Um, do you regret that? No. Um, but I think it's more fair to say, subject to your own counter, um, that the media was pretty quiet when Andrew was first coming on the show. Uh, why? Because people, it resonated with people in a way that nothing, I've won almost every award that the TV journalism business has to offer, mostly because I've worked with the best teams uh, that TV journalism has to offer. I've never had people thank me for what they saw as the help that they got during my reporting when I was sick with COVID, about uh, the people around us who were in charge of COVID and the interviews with my brother which my, everything I know about this situation tells me that, of course, there's a conflict of interest. But people got that, Dan. Nobody thought I was interviewing my brother the way I interview other people. That wasn't the point of purpose of those things. And I even said at the time, and people were like, you don't need to say that. The time will come when he can't come on this show anymore. There will be a time for accountability. There always is in crisis. And I can't cover him about that. People got that. The media should have gotten it. They should have seen it for what it was. And I believe that there was a purity test that was applied to that that wasn't really fair given the context and circumstances as people understood them. That said, you are correct. That was something that was gonna come back to haunt me. It was just a question of when. You said also I never attacked or encouraged anyone to attack any women who came forward, which is um, probably the biggest issue, I think, to a lot of people, was the sense that you were doing 
helping doing research, for example, on whether there was any information about any of these women uh, out there. Uh, for example, you know, you said at one point, I have a lead on wedding girl um, is something that had been uh, had been talked about. Um, and did you do any research, help try and find information about some of the women making accusations against your brother? Never. And the text that you're talking about or whatever the communication is, yeah. um, is demonstrably not about that. This was a situation where there were so many accusers coming out that were a surprise, unaware, unknown. That's what the team was saying to me. I got a call from a friend who knew this woman and said, hey, I know who that is, said something about how he knew them. At the time, no one knew who she was. That's what that communication and context was about. Not me digging into trying to find something. I've got a lead something. on her? I mean, a lead, what does that mean? It means that, that you don't know who she is. I think I know who she is. And therefore what? Then, therefore, when I then contacted, uh, I think, Melissa, but again, this will all come out. Um, she said, no, we know who that is. You're late on it. I said, oh, okay. Because I was contacted about it. I never made a phone call about it. I would never make a phone call about any of them, and I never did. And there will never be any proof of otherwise, because it never happened. Yeah, great save. <laughs> great. He, he hits it in the back of the net at the end. <laughs> oh, man. man. Oh. That's too bad. <laughs> all right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I, I think to your point, Greg, uh, lots of exaggerated expressions really starting here now. Smiles, concern. So he's really kind of mugging it, gurning it for the British out there, pulling big faces to just, you know, clearly demonstrate to us the emotions and the feelings that we should be having around all of this. Not me digging, he says. And there's a, a succession of alternating shoulder raises, which is weird. It's like he can't shake this question off him. I'm not quite sure what that's about. hope somebody else has got some ideas around that one. I don't see that often. Um, then the story gets complicated, overly complicated. I frankly get lost. I don't know what he's talking about during this. I don't know where he's going, but he does knock it in the back of the net at the end with never happened. And you think, great, goal, he got it. But then he looks away. He looks away, he looks down and away. He shades his eyes and it's like, oh, no, penalty, penalty. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? I totally agree. This, in my opinion... Uh, this story is all fake. The denial is rapid. It moves immediately into a sales pitch. The behavior is fake. The eye accessing is actually artificial. And if you watch this again, you'll see artificial eye accessing. He's got the answer ready, but he pauses to go, uh, and it's a fake pause. He's got everything ready to go. Uh, the eyebrow flashes are an attempt to appear innocent because this is the opposite of anger. I Anger pulls your eyebrows down and together. This big eyebrow flash is an innocent uh, attempt. The facial expressions are over-exaggerated. They're false. Mark, you talked about that. I think this is uh, extremely unusual that the denial at the end here is very specifically about the phone call only. Only a phone call, not an email, not a text. The, it's a very specific denial about the phone call not taking place. This is what a... Real denial looks like in the beginning uh, or, or a real denial looks like at the end here about the phone call for his baseline. But keep in mind, the denials probably I would think is absolutely true, but it's only about the phone call, not an email, not a personal chat, not a conversation, not about a Zoom call, but just a phone call. But I think that's true. The phone call probably didn't happen. Greg? Yeah, so we disagree about one thing. You think he's using his face intentionally, and I think it's like a roach when the lights come on. He uses it so instinctively that it's just happening. I don't think, I think it's like their little leg scurrying. He, he's not doing it thinking I'm doing this. He just so instinctively does it. And again, the right. organism does what made the organism successful. That's what he is. It's interesting. He's, he's got those hands gripped tight and now stacked. I think he's barriering in some way there, in addition to being in control. In the beginning, when he starts to call him out, when Dan starts to call him out, his mouth narrows, and all that data intake face where he's doing that goes away. He goes smooth in the face. When he calls him out on an accusation, he does a very quick nod, 
very short nod of acceptance. Not necessarily a good, you know, I believe I'm going to accept it this way, but it's admission that something's actually happening. His breathing rate increases, and you can tell because his coat opens and closes. You can see his breathing rate increasing. He goes never, and then he starts back into that quick, quick, how do I respond to this? Chase, you're right. He goes down left. He's looking in internal voice. Which words am I going to use for this? Then he does something that's very New York, that kind of weird smile that's like, mm, not so much. That's very New York. People do that to each other all the time. Yeah, no. And just move on to the next thing. Then when he talks about he contacted Melissa, look at the contempt, the outright contempt. One of the best contempts we see ever in a video is there for that. I don't know who she is, but then he wa he just waves her away. Forget about it, you know, that kind of thing. And then he goes on this conversation and he says, I called and did it, did it. They already knew, so okay, okay. He does a fading fact, to your point, okay. Scott, where it just drops off. Well, even though I found it and was calling, they already knew, so no big deal. I didn't do anything wrong is what that sounds like. It is a way of dismissing any participation, whether you did anything wrong or not, a way of dismissing any. My favorite part of the entire thing is when he says, therefore, and he says, therefore, um, chickens and cats and dogs, and you could it, insert any word there because he's rambling to try to figure out how does he recover from that one. And he almost does it, but at the end, he says, there's never going to be any proof of that. He doesn't say, then he says it didn't happen. Usually you say didn't happen, didn't happen. Never going to be any proof of that. He is very legalistic language coming from a lawyer. How do I feel about him after this? Probably not so good. Scott, what do you got? Man, you got almost everything I was, talk I was going to talk about. All right. Well, we see his hands are still fists when he comes to the beginning of that. Should be, I guess. He's, and he's very still because he's a pro. That's what he does for a living. His cadence speeds up. So things are changing just a little bit at this point. And during the question, we see these two blinks. One of them really, really takes a while to get open. I'm not so sure if it's it's all eye blocking or all, but it, it, it looks pretty odd. But I can tell, or you can tell as well, that the heat's been turned up on a little bit and it's starting, he's starting to feel it. So that's what, that's probably what that's about. When he's asked, um, and like Greg was saying, when he's asked who he's checking into and that, and that uh, woman, Melissa, he said, I think Melissa, when he says, I think, that's when you need to look for that uh, contempt or disdain because, man, it's a good one. It's perfect. You're right, Greg. It's just like, mm, that's going to be, a, that's a great example of that. Um, at the end, of course, when he says there'll never be any proof otherwise because it never happened, that's when, again, you hear that the fading facts on that. We hear fading facts when someone's being deceptive quite often, not every time, because you're, they're trying to distance themselves. As a, that's what we call it when they're trying to. They, their brain goes, dude, you shouldn't be lying like this. And so they start getting quieter as they go along as it comes to the end. Um, all right. Is that everybody? Yeah. Yep. All right. You said also I never attacked or encouraged anyone to attack any women who came forward, which is um, probably the biggest issue, I think, to a lot of people, was the sense that you were doing, helping doing research, for example, on whether there was any information about any of these women uh, out there. Uh, for example, you know, you said at one point, I have a lead on wedding girl, um, is something that had been, uh, had been talked about. Um, and did you do any research help try and find information about some of the women making accusations against your brother never and the text that you're talking about or whatever the communication is yeah. um is demonstrably not about that this was a situation where there were so many accusers coming out that were a surprise unaware unknown that's what the team was saying to me i got a call from a friend who knew this woman and said, hey, I know who that is, said something about how he knew them. At the time, no one knew who she was. That's what that communication and context was about. Not me digging into trying I've to find something. I got a lead something. on her? I mean, a lead, what does that mean? It means that, that you don't know who she is. I think I know who she is. And therefore what? Then, therefore, when I then contacted, uh, I think, Melissa, but again, this will all come out. Um, she said, no, we know who that is. You're late on it. I said, oh, okay. Because I was contacted about it. I never made a phone call about it. I would never make a phone call about any of them, and I never did. And there will never be any proof of otherwise, because it never happened. When your brother gets in trouble, mm -hmm. you start advising him, talking to him, being involved with the meetings, etc. What did you tell 
CNN about your involvement in those conversations? Did you say to them right at the outset, hey, guys, I just want you to know I'm going to be talking to my brother a lot through this process? It was known. Now, as you said, there's litigation. I want to respect it. But the reason I'm shy on this subject is not just pro forma because there's litigation. I really believe that I have to focus on things that I think are helpful to people. And I learned something during this period. I have been obsessed with what happened, when, what was known, and there are a lot of facts that I believe are gonna come out. I've also learned that they are largely only important to me, Dan, <laughs> in terms of what I want people to think and how I want people to feel and how I want them to see me. That's about me. I don't think that it's helpful to a lot of other people. So yes, there's litigation going on, but I'm telling you, I never lied and there were no secrets. Well, look. All right, Chase, what do you got? Right at this point where he says, did you essentially tell CNN? And he says, it was known. Well, by who? Of course it was known to some people, especially you. This is a fabulous example I'll be using in my training courses from now on, this one clip. Uh, it's it's kind of like the question, what did you do after work? And somebody says, well, I usually go straight home. It's vague, it's ambiguous, and it's very deceptive. Uh, it doesn't 100% indicate deception. It indicates that this is a giant red flag that the interviewer or one of us would definitely jump on. There are a lot of facts I believe are going to come out. He has this. That's a meaningless, what a profound statement. There's a lot of facts I believe are going to come out. There's, it's a court trial. Of course, there's going to be facts coming out. It's ridiculous. But look at the distance between his fingers now. Uh, this is also a sales pitch where it's more exaggerative. His fingers are really distance apart. This is not in his baseline at all. And when he says what I want people to think and feel, he says that's about him. I want you to go back and he says what he wants people to think and feel about him is about him only. And he says he never lied, but he just finished rewriting every question the interviewer asked. Then he rewrote his answers in the color of his intent and not his words. That's called a lie. And it's funny that the test in politicians and people like this that are on TV a lot, it, to me, is that the degree to which they pretend to be perfect is often the degree to which they are being deceptive. And I think we're seeing a lot of being perfect going on here. Scott, what do you got? All right. When he says, I really believe, I believe, he shudders. Check that out. It's the weirdest. I've never seen this before. He says, I believe, and he does this little weird little shudder thing. It's really, really odd. I've never seen that in someone who didn't have a neurological situation uh, running in tandem uh, with their interview or whatever. It just seemed really, really, really odd to me. His illustrators are almost on the money, almost there, just clipping him just a little bit, man. So that that's a little iffy for me at that point. For his, the, I think he's trying to be sincere about it, but I'm not sure he's being um, <laughs> truthful about the whole thing. It seems a little deceptive to me. Uh, when he says, I never lied and there were no secrets, he counts them on his fingers. I never lied and there were no secrets. You know who else did that all the time? Lance Armstrong. That was one of his big ones on most everything he lied about. He'd start counting things off almost every time he counts stuff off all that I've seen every time he did. He wasn't being uh, honest about it. And we see in a little while, we see, in, I think we're going to see in a little while, um, another instance where he looks like somebody else who's a famous liar as well. Um, all right. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so he says, reason I'm shy on this subject, not just pro forma for litigation, and he brings himself up to his full height in his chair. So he either likes this idea that he's put forward of, look, I can't really talk about this because you don't if there's litigation going on. He either likes that or you know, he likes the fact that he's got that in and he's now taken control again of why he's not going to properly speak around this. And he says, focus on things that are helpful to people. And we see this weird shoulder thing again. Again, I don't, I don't know what that's about, but it's odd. And I would want to check in 
to that because it, it's not stable. It's certainly not stable. There's something going on which has no stability to it. So I question that he is focused on uh, things that people, uh, the things that are helpful to people. Um, then in his in his talk there, there's what I would call a lot of nested loops, which is when things just go round and round and round and start a new story, start a new subject, start a new subject. I'm pretty smart. I've been awarded by in many ways for my smartness and I work with very smart uh, people and I did not understand what he was talking about. So if I don't understand it, it's got to a level which is not not too rational anymore, I would imagine. Or maybe I'm just stupid. I don't know. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Am I, am I smart or am I stupid or is he talking nonsense? <laughs> Well, we'll withhold judgment until the end to figure that one out. But, <laughs> but I'm going to do this. This is such a good one. I'm going to do it in charades. One word. <laughs> that entire thing. Now, if you're, if you're not a regular viewer, you won't know what that means. Chaff and redirect to me is when an aircraft is flying along and a missile comes out and it dumps tons of garbage behind it, flares, all kinds of things. So those missiles will go after it. And so chaff and redirect is when I dump a lot of garbage out and you pick up on one of those and I don't have to answer the question. I challenge you, I challenge you to listen to his answer without listening to the question and try to figure out what the hell he was asked. Zero answer. Zero. I'll leave it at that. When your brother gets in trouble, mm -hmm. you start advising him, talking to him, being involved with the meetings, etc. What did you tell CNN about your involvement in those conversations? Did you say to them right at the outset, hey guys, I just want you to know I'm going to be talking to my brother a lot through this process? It was known. Now, as you said, there's litigation. I want to respect it. But the reason I'm shy on this subject is not just pro forma because there's litigation. I really believe that I have to focus on things that I think are helpful to people. And I learned something during this period. I have been obsessed with what happened, when, what was known. And there are a lot of facts that I believe are going to come out. I've also learned that they are largely only important to me, Dan, <laughs> in terms of what I want people to think and how I want people to feel and how I want them to see me. That's about me. I don't think that it's helpful to a lot of other people. So yes, there's litigation going on, but I'm telling you, I never lied and there were no secrets. I get there. Chris, I wanna talk a little bit more about what led to your being fired from CNN. Now, the official reason was always about Andrew Cuomo. It's about what you were doing, advising him behind the scenes and favoritism, et cetera. But there was reporting from the New York Times and the New York Post that the, the final issue was a claim of sexual assault against you. Um, the New York Times says, quote, from a letter that they got, it relayed a story that had begun in 2011 when the woman, who was referred to as Jane Doe, was a young temporary ABC employee hoping for a full-time job. One day after Mr. Cuomo, an anchor, had offered her career advice, he invited her to lunch in his office, according to the letter from her lawyer, interviews with the woman, and emails between her and Mr. Cuomo. When she arrived, there was no food. Instead, Mr. Cuomo badgered her for sex, and after she declined, he assaulted her. She said she ran out of the room. Your response to that? Denied it at the time as soon as I heard about the allegation. Do you and, know who this woman is? Uh, I, I think I do. And none of this happened? None of this happened. Did you know her? Did she come to your office? Is Look, this will be part of the litigation in terms of things coming out. And I denied it. I am concerned about giving attention to stories uh, I am concerned about distracting uh, from what's supposed to matter to people. And look, I'm happy to answer the questions. Yeah, uh, but, but because this is an important one because this. Well, look, is because all I can do is deny the allegation. Right. We all know what happens here. Is the reason I didn't come out more forcefully early on is because everybody who gives you any advice about it says all you'll do is feed it. All you'll do is feed it. And you know what? They're right, because that's how our business works. 
The reason that we want people who are involved, especially if they're a bold-faced name, is that it gives you another day on the piece. It's not because you've advanced the story. It's because, well, now there's a reason for people to want to consume it. I don't want to play that game any more than absolutely necessary. I denied the allegation at the time. Nothing has changed. And you have um, no understanding of why she would feel this way or make this claim? That is not for me to know. All right, I'm, I, I figured out who this guy, the interviewer, looks like. What's this guy's, the interviewer's name? Dan Abrams. You know who he looks like? Nosferatu's grandson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, man, put some fangs on this cat. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, if you watch him in the beginning, again, the jacket, you can see respiration increase when he's asking the question because that jacket opens and closes. Uncharacteristic so far for Chris Cuomo is chin down. We usually associate chin down with shame or, or grief or th something associated. He also does a, a, a distaste when he's asking the question and his blink rate is up. So all of that means is there's some stress starting to show in him. This is clearly a question he has to be answering headlong and one he probably has not been asked much in the media because he is tightly tied to the media. But in, in there, he says, I denied it at the time and kind of threw that away. His messaging, here's the interesting piece. If you're looking for a reason that he's lying, I don't see a lot. I don't see a lot in his body language that says he's lying. What I do see is congruent messaging with, I think I know, which scares me even more because it means when he says, I think I know, in the next video, he's going to tell us about talking to her. Well, if you think you know, that, again, is getting back to this is instinct for this guy, that he can do something that casual and do all the right stuff makes me really concerned. My opinion, all this is our opinions, but he goes to a helplessness and a slower response we typically associate with that. And then the most honest looking body language of the entire thing is he shows distaste at the reason I didn't come out more forcefully early on is, and you see regret in his face as he walks through this. I think he really probably does regret not coming out early and saying, nope, nothing happened and not being more, more um, forceful about it. And that shows in his body language. But the thing that's interesting to me is how he can go, I think I do. And then in the next video, talk about this woman with definite language. That makes me question how practiced he can be at delivering the messages correctly. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, interesting. So we see that uh, adapter as he goes to his ear. I think he's got an earpiece he in does. there, which he'd yeah, be he which he'd be used to. Okay, so it's it's not necessarily that he's you know it's an adapter that he's pulling on his ear, and everybody goes, "Oh yeah, so you so you're lying there." Now, what could be interesting here is that it's not in the ear that it's usually in for him. He may well usually sit where the interviewer would be, mm -hmm. and now he's being interviewed, and you're always going to have that earpiece away from the camera, so it, it can't be seen in there. You, usually, not always but usually. But I, having watched this whole interview through, he tends to go for that earpiece when he's talking about being in the business. It's his signal for going, you know what, I, I, I work in the media, by the way, I work in the media. So, he, so he's more overtly, I think, pointing it out to us, as well as it may be being it being him being unused to it being there, and it's maybe therefore feeling a bit loose. But he does go, that's how the business works. So he's going to tell us, look, what business, what this industry does is to take stories and prolong them when it's not really in the public interest. And he doesn't want to, as he says, play that media game now. He doesn't want to play it now. Now he's on the wrong side of it. That's a bit arch, isn't it? I mean, either, you know, either you, you play it from both sides or you shouldn't have done it in the first place. So I, I'm not a very fond uh, of that. Um, uh, now, none of this happened, says the interviewer, as a question, and he says none of this happened. He just repeats the question back with a downward intonation. Um, so the response there, for me, isn't a great denial, because I would prefer to hear just a no rather than a Seinfeld repeat or a kind of a reverse Chris Voss questioning technique when you say the thing back to the person but with an upward inflection uh, at the end of it. So, you know, odd there that there's no, there is a denial, but it's just a repeat of what somebody asked with a downward intonation. 
Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? I agree with you. And at the and when he does repeat that, it's fading facts. It gets quieter, quieter as it goes. It doesn't doesn't do what it should do at that point. And then when he says, "Look, this will be part of the litigation in terms of coming out." After look, that's a mistimed illustrator. Look, this will be part of the litigation in terms of things coming out. So at this point, it's getting get a little bit iffy for me. When he says, uh, "And I denied it," he, he should have said, "And I still deny it." He said, "I denied it." He's, and should have added, I, I still deny it, but didn't do that. Then he says, I'm concerned about giving attention to stories, and I'm concerned about distracting from what's supposed to matter to people. You know who that sounds like? Anybody? Anthony Weiner, all day long. That's all he did was say stuff like that. Every time the question would come up, he'd say, I'm, hey, I'm happy to answer the question, but he wouldn't answer the questions at that point. And I think that's what's going on here. Then he knows, goes right into another Weiner classic when he says, I'm happy to answer the questions. That right there is where I lit him up because at that point, he's not answering anything. He's not doing what he says. He's standing there saying, I'm doing this while he's not doing that. Boy, that's just such an open shot that it, that guy could have got in there and just gone right in on him. Um, and I think at this point, I think it's, I feel, in my opinion, safe to say, and it's just my opinion, that this guy's line is fake tan off. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, definitely some deception going on right here. Mm. He shifts to internal dialogue here a lot during these questions because he's rehearsing the answer. I mean, uh, uh, my dog would be able to see some of the deception in here. And when this allegation is read and the, the interviewer says, what's your response to that? The response to that, uh, I denied it at the time. That's super weird and he knows how to speak which means this is calculated deception and there's distancing there's lack of pronouns there's a lack of denial there's a vanishing perpetrator if there's a lie going on you call the person a liar and that doesn't happen that's the vanishing perpetrator it's present here throughout the video and he uses denied it again with no denial and there's a fake facial expression for effect right when he says, uh, I'm concerned. You can see this expression on his face. And he's uh, I'm concerned about giving attention to the stories, stuff that matters, and what's supposed to matter to people. He doesn't say what matters to people. He says what's supposed to matter to people, because this isn't supposed to matter to people. And I think that was a little slip up. And there's some really slippery answers that are offering nothing of substance, almost 99% of this entire video, the whole interview is zero substance. It's just hollow platitude blather. And this forcefully, uh, he's so forceful about having uh, denied this at that time. And right at the end, that's not for me to know, that's the best. There's more smoke and uh, non-answer statement. I get there. Chris, I want to talk a little bit more about what led to your being fired from CNN. Now, the official reason was always about Andrew Cuomo. It's about what you were doing, advising him behind the scenes and favoritism, etc. But there was reporting from the New York Times and the New York Post that the, the final issue was a claim of sexual assault against you. Um, the New York Times says, quote, from a letter that they got, it relate a story that had begun in 2011 when the woman who was referred to as Jane Doe was a young temporary ABC employee hoping for a full-time job. One day after Mr. Cuomo, an anchor, had offered her career advice, he invited her to lunch in his office, according to the letter from her lawyer, interviews with the woman and emails between her and Mr. Cuomo. When she arrived, there was no food. Instead, Mr. Cuomo badgered her for sex, and after she declined, he assaulted her. She said she ran out of the room. Your response to that? Denied it at the time, as soon as I heard about the allegation. Do you and, know who this woman is? Uh, I, I think I do. And none of this happened? None of this happened. Did you know her? Did she come to your office? Is Look, this will be part of the litigation in terms of things coming out. And I denied it. I am concerned about giving attention to stories. Uh, I am concerned about distracting uh, from what's supposed to matter to people. And look, I'm happy to answer the questions. Yeah. 
Uh, but because, I think this is an important one because this. Look, because all I can do is deny the allegation. Right. We all know what happens here is the reason I didn't come out more forcefully early on is because everybody who gives you any advice about it says all you'll do is feed it. All you'll do is feed it. And you know what? They're right because that's how our business works. The reason that we want people who are involved, especially if they're a bold-faced name, is that it gives you another day on the piece. It's not because you've advanced the story. It's because, well, now there's a reason for people to want to consume it. I don't want to play that game any more than absolutely necessary. I denied the allegation at the time. Nothing has changed. And you have um, no understanding of why she would feel this way or make this claim? That is not for me to know. Furthermore, they said that years later, and I'm going to continue reading from the New York Times, after years without any substantive communication from Mr. Cuomo whatsoever, Ms. Doe suspected he was concerned about her coming forward publicly with her allegations and wanted to use a proposed segment as an opportunity to test the waters and discourage her from going on the record about his sexual misconduct. And then they say that you did a specific segment on TV for the company she was working at to benefit her as a way to keep her quiet. Okay. Not true? It's for her to explain. It's absolutely not true, but did, did it's for her to explain. But you did reach out to her and... Yes, but actually I didn't, but the show did. And it was a no-brainer segment. Again, um, these are things for someone else to explain, not me. Someone else meaning? If you're going to make the allegation, then it's about how you feel and what you think. And my feeling is it's in the past. Uh, I'm never going to be able to convince people one way or another. I feed the story by commenting on it. I denied it. And you try to move on. A big aspect of our business is we'll say it's accountability, we'll say it's responsibility, but I don't know that that's always true. I'm not indicting you asking me the questions. Yeah. I'm saying that I think that a focus of coverage very often is about extending and prolonging drama, not about uh, finding the truth. And that matters to me more now than before all of this. I mean, even in a way, if I almost feel like apologizing to your audience, you're doing your job. Don't get me wrong. But I don't want them to feel that I'm going to talk about me and not about them and that this really matters and this should matter to you. I know it doesn't matter to other people the way it does to me. I get it. I get it. But, you know, this is this is kind of the state of play. All right, Greg, what do you got? I'm going to be short on this. And what? <laughs> what? Just what? I mean, the only thing I'm going to focus on is there's body language where he says that matters to me more now. And he is emphatic with his eyes and his forehead. I think he's probably telling the truth right here. That matters to more to him now because he's on the griddle. He's on the other side of this thing. And he doesn't want to be dragged out. He doesn't want us giving our opinions of what he's doing. He doesn't want other people giving opinions of what he's doing. And that's the most truthful thing I've seen and the most honest thing I've seen out of it. Other than that, I have no idea what he's talking about. It's just long, lots of words. It's like he's a lawyer and he's being paid by the word. Don't know. Maybe that's it. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, this is maybe not one of the worst liars, but definitely one of the most insincere uh, human beings that we've ever done on the entire show. Two years of doing this. He won't answer anything. I mean, anything, any question that he was asked, he didn't really answer it. He renegotiates every detail. It's kind of like interviewing a teenager. And when he's saying he reached out to her only just one video ago, he said he thinks just kind of thinks he knows who she is. Like Greg mentioned this and the allegation is already made and, and explained. And he's saying, my feeling is this is in the past. This is in the so things that occur in the past should no longer be relevant today. That's that's what's going on. We're seeing that strategy come out. Then he asks himself a question again, and he answers it again. And he's saying finding the truth matters so much more. Greg, you covered that just because it's about him. And he say you're doing your job. Don't get me wrong to the other guy. I don't. Uh, I don't want them to feel that I'm going to talk about me. That is astonishing. 
And that's literally all you talk about. That's the entire clip is him talking about himself. Everything is about him. The entire thing, how awarded he is, how perfect he is. And this is, I dare say, uh, a bit disgusting to watch. It's another example of someone pretending really, really hard to be perfect, which in itself is a gigantic red flag. And the facial expressions here are full of eyebrow flashes, false smiles, and almost smugness toward Dan Abrams to regain some kind of hierarchical superiority, or maybe one might say status over the interviewer there. Mark, what do you think? Said it well. Said it well. Um, what I just got one question. Why has he suddenly become a media vigilante? Suddenly he's there like going, look. You know, we cannot prolong stories like this. I almost want to apologize to your audience that the media does this thing. He was an absolute part of it. He was a, a, a massive cog in that in that machine. And now he's raging against the machine. What's the motivation for that other than you you might be about to get minced in that machine and you want to stop that machine. Well, he's, he's unlikely uh, to manage to do that. Uh, he might be able to do it with his own podcast and, and, and run his own stories about himself in that. Maybe that's what his idea is. But you've got to understand now this story is not is nothing to do with his integrity. He's managed to spin it to the integrity of the media. It's no longer Let's question you, Chris Cuomo. He's like, no, let's not question me. Let's question the media on the whole and stop this ridiculous jamboree that happens on stories like this. I, I, I'm a little disgusted by it as well, I have to say. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. This is where everything changes. Everything's gone on at a pretty good pace at this point. This is where everything slows down. His voice gets a little bit lighter. It gets quieter. His tone changes. His attitude, the tone in his attitude changes as well. He gets quiet about 5 dB quieter than he was earlier. Everything's being softened at this point. This isn't the baseline we've seen at this point at all. And I think, Greg, if you had him in the box and he started this, I think it's so bad you'd start giggling. And you'd have to say, I'll be back in about five minutes. That's how bad I think it is at this point. His answers, the words he's using to set up his answers, those change as well. They get really small, really small. If it seems like I'm talking where everybody watching this, there are always comments that go, oh, something's doing this, or Scott's hair, this, or I'm supposed to get a root canal. My mouth is swollen up over here, so I can't talk normal. So that's what it is. Anyway, back to what I'm talking about. Um, his words get, get smaller. The structure of his sentences get tinier. Everything starts getting compressed almost, but very light on there. Um I know before I said that the other one I think was the most insincere. I think this is the most insincere, and he's just full of it. I, I couldn't figure out what where he was going with this. I don't know what I don't know what was going on half the time in this. It was just amazing. That was really, really amazing to see him. The balls it took to go ahead and, and lean into that like that. Wow, unbelievable. So well, you know, you're, and when you're famous, you're you know you have to. <laughs> So yeah. what it sounded like to me is just rambling yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Furthermore, they said that years later, and I'm going to continue reading from the New York Times, after years without any substantive communication from Mr. Cuomo whatsoever, Ms. Doe suspected he was concerned about her coming forward publicly with her allegations and wanted to use a proposed segment as an opportunity to test the waters and discourage her from going on the record about his sexual misconduct. And then they say that you did a specific segment on TV for the company she was working at to benefit her as a way to keep her quiet. Okay. Not true? It's for her to explain. It's absolutely not true, but did, it's did for her to explain. But you did reach out to her and... Yes, but actually I didn't, but the show did. And it was a no-brainer segment. Again, um, these are things for someone else to explain, not me. Someone else being... If you're going to make the allegation, then it's about how you feel and what you think. And my feeling is, it's in the past. Uh, I'm never going to be able to convince people one way or another. I feed the story by commenting on it. I denied it. And you try to move on. A big aspect of our business is we'll say it's accountability. We'll say it's responsibility. But I don't know that that's always true. I'm not indicting you asking me the questions. Yeah. 
I'm saying that I think that a focus of coverage very often is about extending and prolonging drama, not about uh, finding the truth. And that matters to me more now than before all of this. I mean, even in a way, if I almost feel like apologizing to your audience, you're doing your job. Don't get me wrong. But I don't want them to feel that I'm going to talk about me and not about them and that this really matters and this should matter to you. I know it doesn't matter to other people the way it does to me. I get it. I get it. But, you know, this is this is kind of the state of play. Uh, let's go around the room one time in 30 seconds or less. Let's talk about what we think we've seen. Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, no, I'm just going to say at least watching this, we got a bit of a first for me, which was this gesture here. I haven't seen that before. I can see how useful it is to be able to launch up into some gestures and take control of things and suppress yourself at the same time. Uh, really interesting to see. Not a character that I like particularly. Good spin doctor, though. Super spin doctor. Uh, Chase, what do you think? I think this is the first step in the Gangnam Style yes. dance. <laughs> yeah, that's, you're right. That might be what we're seeing. You're right. But it's like everything is fake. Every word is fake. The Everything is fabricated, fake, and hollow. The words don't really mean anything. You've heard it from four behavior experts. And I think I'll go deep on little psychology here. I think there's a struggle with an identity that he built that conflicts with another that is, is being very well hidden or trying to be very well hidden. And I believe, my opinion, he suffers with some self-control issues and possibly some rage and has an ego that hides under this veneer. And I'm sure you all can see some of this, but there are a few people who I bet can't even see any of that and thought this was a great interview. Greg? Yeah, first of all, Mark, I've had many interviewers who stack their hands like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I don't think he's cable tied, yeah. is he? <laughs> no, he's not. But yeah, <laughs> mine usually were cable tied or restrained some capacity. And so they would hold their hands like this all the time when they were talking to me. <laughs> so yeah, not the first time I've seen it. However, yeah, this for me, I watched this thing on the surface and on the surface level, if you just pay attention and listen to the things, it sounds like he's trying to come out and say, hey, I made mistakes and, 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 and I should have been more considerate until you start paying attention to the fact all he's doing is redirecting the question. He's not answering any complex parts and we'll even give you reasons because of lawsuits and, and, and. My opinion, this is hard to trust, hard to believe. And then that last two videos, when he says, I think I know, and he looks honest and then says... Uh Oh, yeah, that happened and knows exactly who we're talking about. That kind of just throws the whole toy box upside down. So do I trust him? No. Do I think most people would trust him based on how quickly he answers the questions? Maybe. So it's really hard for us to separate those things. Scott, what do you got? All right. I agree with you. All of you guys, this is just it's all just fluff, man. There's nothing really there. When you ask him a question, Chase, you broke it down perfectly. He just doesn't say anything. There's really nothing happening there. He just Girts around everything, just wiggles around every every time there's a, a question. But but this guy's coming on pretty strong with him, which is which was really it was almost shocking to see that because I think they're friends. I think they know each other, and this guy was really trying to get in there and and and, and give him you know all he's got on that. So I was, that was kind of impressive, I thought. But there were still some times where he could have dug in there and really just let him have it, real you know in a way that he didn't do it. All right, fellas, I think this was a good one, and uh, we'll see you next time. See you. Today we're going to talk about uh, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. This is part five. Greg, wants to tell us about the videos you're going to watch. Yeah, this is the remainder of the video. This is direct and cross and redirect in the defense side for Heard and for Depp, and there's a lot in here, and we'll talk about how they're trying to impact the jury and how they're prepared. Amber, other than the threats that you've described, what other threats have you endured since the Deb Waldman statements were made? I receive hundreds of death threats regularly, if not daily. Thousands since this trial has started people mocking, mocking my testimony about being assaulted. Making fun of my objection relevance, non responsive. What's the damages? You can continue. 
has been agonizing. Agonizing, painful, and the most humiliating thing I've ever had to go through. I hope no one ever has to go through something like this. Oh. I just want Johnny to leave me alone. I just want him to leave me alone. I've said that for years now, and I thought he would after 2020. Fashion non-responsive. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so we will use occasionally on this show a lot of jargon. So we're going to be careful not to use a lot of jargon to unpack some of the dense concepts that we talk about. But in this one, we don't need a lot of jargon. I'm going to tell you that she, her head is like it's on a switch. And she's got a little limit switch right here. And when she looks at the jury, her face changes from what it is when she's looking at the attorney. So we'll call that a swivel switch, just my own made up word. If she does that, she's changed her face. That's okay, except remember, people who are in the jury are human beings. And those people in the jury may come from a different culture where too much eye contact is bad. They may come from a culture where too much eye contact means something. They may also have trigger points that when you look at them with an angry face, it makes them feel something. If I were coaching her, I would say, hey, that's a little bit over the top right there. When you look over there and you start making all those mean faces, what if that person over there has had an experience that you're triggering? And I'll give you, before we end this, one of my favorite ever stories I've heard about body language from an attorney when they learned that I was doing this. So she needs to be more cautious with that hard eye contact. Now, you guys remember there used to be a, like a litter, a cat litter commercial on TV for, a, I think it was Tidy Cats called Stank Face. You remember that? When the people would walk in the room and their face would go, well, she's doing some of that, which is a little bit over the top. And it would be funny if it were not for the fact that that happens when her feelings are hurt more than when it's about her being threatened. Her words trail. She kind of runs way back. She'll number hundreds regularly, if not daily, hundreds with no emotion. But when she starts talking about mocking is when she gets that little stank face thing going on and her whole emotional demeanor changes. She rubs her legs and there's too much emotion in the wrong places for me. Chase, what do you got? Yep, I agree with you. And right at that question, what threats have you endured? The attorney asks her this question, then it's business-like, emotional. There's this large inhale, turns to the jury, and instantaneously starts with this face wrenching again, like you talked about, stank face, uh, to get into an emotional state. And this rapid shifting of facial expressions is not truthful. If this is peer reviewed, this is well reviewed in, in multiple studies. And it's, it's very strange. We don't see this very often. <clears throat> but she says mocking three times. And my testimony about being uh, assaulted and not mocking her abuse, not mocking her suffering, not mocking her life, but they're mocking the testimony not the fact that she was abused, they're, they're mocking the testimony, which is an interesting point to make here. Not, I'm not saying there's some deception here, but that's a definite huge red flag. There's a disgust facial expression uh, in her trial baseline in general. She makes this kind of disgust uh, facial expression. And if you imagine smelling, sticking your nose into a rotten gallon of milk and sticking your nose down there, it makes everything in your face kind of go towards the middle. And that's what we're we're seeing here. But throughout this whole thing, she's selling and not telling. She's checking the responsiveness of the jurors, one, two, three, just kind of scanning around uh, the jury pool, what to be a deeply internal experience of discussing her suffering. She, she's checking to make sure that she's touching base with each person when she should be emotional. And emotions don't happen when she's processing the questions. They happen when she's looking at the jury. This is a big deal. And when she says, I want Johnny to leave me alone, this was the entire case against her, is him trying to get her to do the exact same thing. So it's strange. But I want you to watch one point during this that's really special to me. When Camille, which is uh, Depp's attorney, objects, the facial expression to the jury disappears and she's back to holding it off just to look at Camille just to look at that one person who's objecting. So the instant, all of the suffering just vanishes and she gets cold and calculating just to look back at Camille. Pretty strange. Scott, what do you think? All right. Can I have one okay. thing first? 
Guys, this is our opinion, and we want you to remember that as you go through this video. All of it. Yep. Oh, yeah. And remember, we know people go through stuff much worse than this. We understand that. We, we, we really get it. We know people go through some horrendous things that we'll never hear about and that you'll never hear about. So we, we've taken that into consideration. We're talking about this one person and our opinions, and that's all it is, of this one person's behavior that we're seeing. All right. And Johnny Depp, I guess two different people. So, um, all right. So after uh, Camille says the, the the threats that you you describe, her eyes are wide. They're wide open, and the only blinking we see is when we see that that eye flutter, that eyelash fl or eyelid flutter, um, right after that. And there's another pause where her eyes are locked in on her, and then she just keeps looking at her. And after that, the lawyer says non responsive. We see 18 expressions of contempt, disgust, anger, scorn, sadness. All these and a lot and. Altogether, there are 26, but 18 of those are micro expressions, which which go on from micro expression to a big uh, expression. Again, like Chase was saying, these things don't morph from one to the other. They just click like she's clicking a dial to show these different expressions. That's not real. That's not right. That's acting. I'll say it, it's not acting very well. How does that sound? So then at the same time, we're not seeing any tears. All this time, she's supposed to be so upset and all this stuff is happening and her voice doesn't crack. When you're that upset, when you're talking about things like that and you're upset, your your vocal cords, your your larynx will start or the muscles around it will start contracting. There's none of that. Her voice is almost smooth as she's going through this. It doesn't crack, it's clean, it's clear, you can hear everything. That's just really unusual for situations like this. Then when she says, uh, uh, you can continue, it's again odd placements of these expressions. They'll start before she before they're supposed to, and the, the She'll, as she's talking, they'll just fly in there and fly out, and they're odd. They're not timed correctly. That's that's an odd way to say that, but that's the only way I know how to know how to put it. But watch for those twenty six different expressions in there. How they click from one to the other. Just one, two, three, four, five, and you can count them as you go through. You might see the micro expressions if you look really tight, but um, you'll definitely see the bigger expressions that they morph and they don't morph into, but they click into. And then before she says, "I just want Johnny to leave me alone," she goes, "Oh." Oh, like this. And the reason it looks so weird and it gives you such an irky feeling is because she can't pull off those emotions she's supposed to have that she's trying to sell. She's trying to work herself up and fire herself up to go into this deep emotion thing when she says, I just wanted to leave Johnny to leave me alone. It just it doesn't work because it's so fake. And it look, that's why you get that feeling. And everybody watching this play, went, oh, that's horrible because it's fake and she can't get up enough emotion to, to pull that off. So I'll, I'll leave it there because I know Mark's got a whole bunch of stuff. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I agree. Quick successions of disgust, disdain, distaste uh, in the mouth there. I think you're right, Scott. Some of it is absolutely to do with her trying to kind of raffle through emotions, not being able to pick the right one, clearly doing that for the jury. I think some of it is is there's some good literature out there that says we will get an abundance of those uh, those emotions around certain personality disorders. And so there's there's a good chance that there's a baseline there of of this um, disgust and distaste and disdain, which is around a personality disorder. But you know, regardless of all of that, is it having an effect on the jury? Wh which way are they going to go? Because you know, she's she probably quite right to try and have an effect on the jury because they're the ones that are going to make the decision. Well, we're not there; we can't see the effect on them. But we can experience some of the effect that it's having on the judge. Or certainly I was having a conversation with an old friend of mine who happens to be a judge, happens to be a magistrate in the UK system. However, she is a magistrate that deals with a great deal of domestic violence cases. And in this conversation, and very trusted person, in this conversation, she said, well, if the judge believed these emotions, if the judge believed that Amber Heard is experiencing some very difficult emotions at this time, the judge has a duty of care. And the judge would probably, possibly, maybe say something like, Miss Heard, do you need a moment? Or let's take a break for a moment. If she believed what was going on here. I suspect, I don't think, I've not seen that the judge at any point during Heard's most emotional displays has ever done that. I'm going to take from that 
that the judge doesn't buy this. Well, it doesn't really matter because the judge isn't making a decision, okay? The judge is just running the court and going, I will decide if somebody needs time because the judge, it's the, the idea is, is the judge will get, will help the, the victim get out the straight facts uh, unencumbered in many cases by the emotion because it maybe doesn't help. Often it doesn't help get the story across correctly. In this case, the judge seems to be letting her run with this. Well, I think that's interesting. I think that's interesting because if that's the case, the judge doesn't buy it. If the judge doesn't buy it, why would the jury buy it? So it's maybe not having the effect that she'd like it to have. Uh, now, having said that, U.S. system could be de very different from my friend's U.K. system. I don't, I don't know. Amber, other than the threats that you've described, what other threats have you endured since the Debt Waldman statements were made? I receive hundreds of death threats regularly, if not daily. Thousands since this trial has started people mocking mocking my testimony about being assaulted making fun of my objection relevance non-responsive you can continue it's been agonizing agonizing painful and most humiliating Thing I've ever had to go through. I hope no one ever has to go through something like this. I just want Johnny to leave me alone. I just want him to leave me alone. I've said that for years now, and I thought he would after 2000. Non responsive. What do you hope to reclaim after this is over? Protecting the secret that I did for as long as I did has taken enough of my voice. Johnny, Johnny has taken enough of my voice. I have the right to tell my story. I have the right to say what happened to me. I have the right to my voice and my name. He took it long enough. I have a right as an American to talk about what happened to me, to own my story and my truth. I have that right. I hope to get my voice back. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Right at this whole secret thing. We're talking about this secret. There's distancing because there's no mention of anything there there's no abuse there's no getting beat there's no mention of anything it's all encapsulated in this one word secret where we see an eye flutter and we see facial avoidance right at that exact moment when she's talking about this secret what she's saying there's a right to tell my story to say what happened my voice there's a huge sad expression as she's scanning the jury her face goes way down you can see it here almost forced one might say and when she's saying I have a right to talk about what happened to me and own my story and, and truth, she's still checking the jury one at a time uh, for signals that she's being effective, I think. And the only time truth is mentioned here is when it's her truth, not the truth, her truth. And I think there's a difference between those two. And this missing voice routine kind of sounds like it's from a movie not sure which one maybe you know if you do let me know in the comments i'll just search for the word movie and uh see if you get it that's all i got mark what do you got yeah lovely um so let's look at again the context of this and and the images and maybe the linguistics that are going on as some of you might know i've spent quite a bit of time as what back in the uk we call a spin doctor somebody who takes a story and politically makes it into something else here's there's some great spin going on here i mean all credit to anybody who's trying to get their way on something they're trying to convince not only a jury you know 
uh, 10, 12, whatever it is, people. I think eight go in at the end or maybe six. Can't quite remember. But a, a mass of people, but also a public out there. The question that's put is about reclaiming. Well, that's really interesting because it says that you had something in the first place and it was taken away. So the reclaim, the taking back of what was yours, and it then redirects to human rights. Well, that is always a great thing to put down because because it's very difficult for people to go, well, no, I mean, you shouldn't have any human rights. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's very good for those to be taken away from you. So the moment you go to human rights, then you're now on a super moral high ground on that. So she's, she spun it to her human rights have been taken away. That's a tough one. I mean, you can say, well, no, I don't think that's the case because you were able to talk um, and nobody stopped you talking. They just sued you around it. I mean, just look, you can say whatever you like yeah, in, in America, for sure. Say whatever the hell you like, uh, just about anywhere. I think there's only, you know, you can't shout fire in a theater probably like you can't in the, in the UK. But apart from that, you can say whatever you like, but there are consequences. If you say stuff, somebody will sue you um, or, or some other consequences. You know, some in some cases you can say stuff and you will go to jail. You're not allowed. I mean, you can say it, but you're not protected but in, in what you say. Um, you're protected to say it. You're not protected after the fact. So she deflects to redirects to the to, to the human rights. And then she deflects to an even higher power, probably, which is an American. And that for me is great spin because we would say all the time, look, let's just get out there, stick the flag up the flagpole, you know, and just let's attach our message to the flag because it's so hard for somebody to take that message down unless you're, they're your enemy and then, you know, they'll burn the flag. But if, if it's your group, they will not attack that. So what I love about that piece of spin there is she went for the two, she spun it to the two of the, of the highest. She didn't quite hit God there. Uh, that would be the, the next place to go. Not going for that one. Um, maybe because of her, her audience in, in, in general, who she's trying to align with there. But give her a Jew. Good spin. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Where you going? Yeah, Mark, I'm almost going to mirror exactly what you said. I mean, I call it the duty, her duty on her country speech. I mean, mm -hmm. she's wrapping herself in the flag. She's talking about human rights. She's doing all of that. And, and I just said, boy, this one ain't choreographed, is it? It's, I'm an American. I need my voice, my truth, modern words, really strong modern words. Um, I, I said she should have thrown in some other rights while she's swinging for the fence. What the hell? You know, just go for it. But there she was. This is the audition of her lifetime, guys. This whole trial, if she has been successful to now, this is her last audition. If she fails this and she comes out as a monster who's saying he's a monster and she's wrong, you think she's going to work again? Do you think people are going to line up to see the movie? This could be a big deal for her. So in my opinion, she has to deliver on whatever she's trying to here. Do I think she does? No. She does start with some good sorrow. Her brow tips are pointing up. And you can see it. She, but then she starts to kind of go down that well toward anger. Let me tell you one thing. People who are angry show it like that. They don't ramp slowly up to it and stumble over it. It comes up very quickly. I'll, I'll, based on my, it's been many years since I studied all the impact of, of adrenaline on the system. But if I, my memory serves me correctly, in about 45 microseconds, you start to show thumbs rotate in. Your rib, your rib cage gets rigid. Lots of things start to happen. It doesn't slowly build up as your words get stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's what we're seeing here. That's acting. That's going down the well. That's trying to build up enough emotion to feel it. And then the last one is, Chase, you've said it over and over and over. Only children have that flush of emotions run across their face like this. Little bitty children may have it. I've seen little bitty children when they're confused and they're trying to control an emotion because they know it's going to go badly for them. And you'll see them, it break through and go back, break through and go back. But it's not many emotions. It's one and a control, one and a control, one and a control. That's not what I see here. On his part, if you watch Jep, or Depp, I see him milling his jaw and doing everything possible to avoid eye contact with her. When she looks down, he looks away, all of those kinds of things. So this is her last audition, in my opinion. That's what I think we're seeing. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, that's pretty good. 
So you guys have covered pretty much everything. But after the question, when she's first asked the question, a lot of people are going to say, oh, I see a single shoulder shrug. She's actually down here rubbing her hands doing that. So after the question, you'll see that come up. You may think that you may not have seen that or, or might be thinking about it. that's that's what I um, saw in that part. And she's using that her hands as an adapter because it's getting pretty stressful for her at this point. She knows that question is coming and she's obviously she's prepped for it. So she's ready for it. And it's pretty much like you guys were saying, the same stuff we saw earlier. She's, you know, delivering a prepared answer and the emotions are, are fake and she's just trying to be dramatic. What do you hope to reclaim after this is over? Protecting the secret that I did for as long as I did has taken enough of my voice. Johnny, Johnny has taken enough of my voice. I have the right to tell my story. I have the right to say what happened to me. I have the right to my voice and my name. He took it long enough. I have a right as an American to talk about what happened to me, to own my story and my truth. I have that right. I hope to get my voice back. Ms. Hurd, you just testified that this case has been very hard for you. So let's talk about that and why. All right. Your lies have been exposed to the world multiple times, right? I haven't lied about anything I've been here to say. You sat here and told this jury that the events in Hicksville started with Mr. Depp getting really upset about a woman leaning on you. Is that correct? Yes, that's effectively what happened, yeah. You testify that he actually grabbed that woman's wrist and twisted it, right? And told her that he could effectively break her wrist by saying he knew how many pounds of pressure, asking her how many pounds of pressure it took to break a human wrist. But your own witness, your former best friend, Rocky Pennington, she didn't corroborate that, did she? Uh, I'm not quite sure what part of that night she saw. There were a lot of people there. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, just one little thing here, body language right wise that I really like. Uh, micro expressions of disgust and disdain around former best friend Rocky Pennington. Now, is that uh, disgust and disdain because it's a former best friend who didn't uh, tell a story that uh, Heard would have liked to have her to have told? I don't know. Is it disgust and disdain for the 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 question? being asked or discussed and disdain for something else around that. And by the way, as I've said before, there is just this baseline of disgust and disdain with with Heard. But in this particular case, it is framed by nothing else happening in the face. And they're, they're pretty good micro expressions that are happening there. So I'm going to say it's a real feeling not acted of disgust and disdain around that issue there. Um, I don't know whether it's about the question or whether it's about a former best friend, but might be worth you just going back, taking a look in there, you know, going frame by frame and taking a look yourself and seeing what that looks like. Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. We see eyelid flutter when she says uh, your your lies have been exposed to the world multiple times. That sort of sort of hits her wrong at that point because she knows this is important. And her voice, her voice tone is much lower here. Her her the volume of her voice is lower. Her cadence is a lot slower. She's just, just delivering this ding, ding, just one, two, three, like that. Her posture is bent forward a little bit. And all these cues are letting us know that she's a little bit, she's unsure about answering this and that's going to come out right. She's not really, maybe she didn't rehearse it enough or wasn't ready for it, but that's what it looks like to me anyway. And then she does an eye roll when she's, when she's asking her about how many pounds of pressure, when she says, when she asks her the question, she says, he's talking about how many pounds of pressure on the thing. We see an eye roll in there. That's a cue of disrespect. And see, so you could say it's boredom. That's a lot of times you'll see that uh, when so with someone who's bored. But in this case, I think it's 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 disrespect and you know the credit trying to make his credibility look low. But I think he says stuff like that all the time. You know that's why she would do the eye roll. I actually think that was real because maybe he sits around trying to say cool stuff. He says some pretty cool stuff. So maybe he's saying cool stuff all the time, and she's just sort of over it. You know. Amber and I do that when I tell the same joke over and over and with a different group of people. She's so over all my jokes. So, it, you know, I'm sure I get a lot of eye rolls in there from her. 
that's the feel I can feel it coming off her. But um, and when she said, I think he said, uh, uh, no, nah, I'll skip past that because Mark covered that. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. At this point, I think I, I thought she really didn't like him at all at this point. I thought she she doesn't like him, doesn't, not in love with her. Anything. Now I think she hates his guts, especially after seeing the eye roll like that. I think she's so over this guy, she can't stand it, which she should be at this point, I guess. Chase, what do you got? I agree. <clears throat> Right at this point where she's saying, I haven't lied about anything I've come here to say. There's qualifying. There's no mention of truth whatsoever. There's a lack of a confident denial. And there's immediate mouth closure after her statement, which are all indicators of deception. And we treat if we're treating uh, body language and behavior profiling like meteorology, we're looking at science-based stuff, collecting a bunch, and then providing a likelihood of deception to you, just like precipitation. That was a high degree of a uh, high percentage of preci- precipitation. It's <laughs> a nice shot, man. Good <laughs> brain. And it just said snow. Would have been easier. <laughs> He's Canadian, of course. It's snow. <laughs> brain. So uh, once she's saying there's a lot of people there, she shifts back. I want you to watch her face closely. She shifts back to her trial protection face when she was sitting with her attorney, watching Depp take the stand. This this very protected face that she's adopted. And I'm surprised I haven't, I'm not an attorney, maybe an attorney. If you are an attorney, let us know why, but I haven't heard maybe once. I don't know. I don't think I've heard it. An objection for assuming facts, not in evidence, which is I've heard here many times, as far as I know, Greg, have you, any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, the only thing I have noticed, Chase, before I get into my part, the um, the only thing I have noticed is they will introduce into evidence things that were not there already, because we'll see that late in this series of videos. And it may just be that they're doing it and we clip the video in a place where there's something that, that they had introduced and it was brand new. The good thing is when you introduce something Oof. brand new, we get to see stress. That's great. <laughs> That's Look great. at me. Look at me. <laughs> you oh, my God. <laughs> what the? <laughs> Oh my God! It's Rouse, not like the good camera either. Always happy to be on the behavior panel. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, fellas. Um, I'm never going to hear the end of this. <laughs> never. So this is about as friendly as her face gets. Mark, I agree with you. She has all this negative emotion, all this disdain, and all that just wrapped up in there. And this is actually pretty calm for <laughs> her. But it's how she keeps her face set. She says, all right, and you can hear her being kind of placating and talking to the front of her mouth. That's a good indicator that, all right. Then you hear. If you pay attention to her, you'll see that two faces. When she's talking to her attorney, she's got a much calmer face than she does here. And that shows you all that disdain and everything else is in there. A couple of things that are interesting for me that they should have chased is when she says, I haven't lied about anything I have been here to say. Hmm. Question number two. Well, what about the things we forced you to answer would have been my question. I would have crawled her. We're going to see more of that. She's conditioning the question, and she has a long, drawn-out pause to answer the question as she's talking about the woman leaning. She does that little bobblehead thing, and while that may be part of many cultures, it's not in ours. So something's going on in her head there. And I'll, I'll leave a couple of last ones. i got a bunch here. But you'll watch her as she's trying to answer the question, rifle up left, rifle up right, as she's trying to figure out how to respond to is that he was leaning, she was leaning on you and he got angry. And she said, you could effectively say that. And Chase, when she does that quick mouth close, she does a lip retraction at the same time. There's no emotion whatsoever when she's talking about him threatening this person. The only thing we see is she sways when she disqualifies her friend Rocky, in addition to Mark, all that disdain that comes up. So I think there's something here. There's something that we would dig into. One question that she avoided that they let her get away with. That's it. And now we'll go and try to find Scott. Yeah, John. Can you guys still hear me? Ms. Hurd, you just testified that this case has been very hard for you. So let's talk about that and why. All right. Your lies have been exposed to the world multiple times, right? I haven't lied about anything I've been here to say. You sat here and told this jury that the events in Hicksville started with Mr. Depp getting really upset about a woman leaning on you. Is that correct? Yes, that's effectively what happened, yeah. You testify that he actually grabbed that woman's wrist and twisted it, right? 
and told her that he could effectively break her wrist by saying he knew how many pounds of pressure, or asking her how many pounds of pressure it took to break a human wrist. But your own witness, your former best friend, Rocky Pennington, she didn't corroborate that, did she? Uh, I'm not quite sure what part of that night she saw. There were a lot of people there. She but you testified that you had absolutely nothing to do with the video's release, right? Absolutely not. And you testified that you learned about it when you landed after flying into LA. Do you remember that testimony? Upon touchdown is when I was alerted to the video's you existence You heard Mr. Online. Tremaine testify that this about this video as well yesterday, didn't you? Yes, I did. And you heard Mr. Tremaine testify that TMZ received the cabinet video the same day you landed at LAX, yes? I don't know if that I, I don't know if that's what his testimony was. I'm sorry. You heard Mr. Tremaine testify that the cabinet video was posted 15 minutes after TMZ received it. Yes. That's what I heard him say. And that this could only have been possible if the video was received directly from the source. Yes. I heard him say that. I don't know if that's true or if that's possible because it didn't come from me. I was Mr. flying. Tremaine. So testify. Th th I know that's incorrect. Is what I mean to say. All right, Chase, what do you got? So right at the absolutely not point, there's an immediate mouth closure there. I was I was alerted to the video's existence online. And Camille's question was about learning about it being posted. And if someone else leaked the video for her, these are the words that you might expect to hear in a scenario like that. And when she's saying it came directly from the source, I'm just going to touch on a couple things here. Uh, she's saying, I don't know if that's uh, true or if that's possible. It's She's talking about her own phone. And let's talk about qualifiers really quick. If I ask uh, Greg, uh, did you do drugs last night? And Greg's answer is, well, not to the best of my knowledge. That's potentially deceptive. But I, if I ask Greg, did a guy who lives four doors down from you do drugs last night? And you say, well, not to the best of my knowledge. It's the same answer, but whether or not it's deceptive or potentially deceptive is based on what question was being asked. And this question is very specifically about her phone, which makes a huge difference. So it depends on the situation being asked about. But in this situation, yes, there is a high, a very high likelihood of deception where she said, I don't know how that could happen or if that's possible. It was her own phone. So she's not making a denial about something she very well should be if she was being truthful. And when she's saying it, it didn't come from me, I was flying. As an interrogator, here is where you dig. She asked somebody to send it. I, I would be willing to say as an interrogator in that moment, I'm, I, my only thought would be I need to find out who sent it because it wasn't her. It was probably somebody that was asked to send the video. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, thanks for picking me next, because I'm going to fall right in where you dropped off. The interior of me would be crawling all over her at the moment. Let's just do a couple of things. Number one, I'm going to cover two pieces of body language. That's it. The rest, we're going to unpack her deception or her potential deception. Number one, she started off by saying absolutely not and did a lip compression, minor but a lip compression. If you pay really close attention, she's either holding back emotion or information or something. I always call, you know, real hard grip. Usually there's emotion, but it's always some kind of information. The other thing she does is she whips her head around. Having that little tail hanging there, you notice her head whipping around. And anybody who has ever had any involvement with, I, I won't say all women do it, but every woman I've ever met, when you anger them, their heads move differently than they do when they're talking like, happily so that's a bad indicator that she's starting to get aggressive back now let's interrogate what she said she said she conditioned the question and she negotiated the answer by saying upon touchdown was when i was alerted of the video's existence online there's a hell of a lot of distancing conditioning qualifying everything you can think of in there so i'm just going to run down a list of things i might ask her which video i want to make sure i lock her down to which video we're both talking about and my next question would be were you surprised because that's a real potential for her to lie and guys when we talk about indicators of deception we're talking about a social contract that humans have with each other that we feel guilt remorse or discomfort with breaking. So every time you give a person, when you're questioning them, the opportunity to break that contract, the interrogator gets to go, well, there's a deviation in word, in deed, in breathe, breathing rate, in physical things, in body language, all of that. 
So then I would say, is it the first time that you learned about this video? Guess what? That's a leading question. And by interrogator speak, that means it only has a yes or no answer. And that is usually considered a bad question. But I would be doing it to corral her so that when she says it's from her phone, she can't say it's the first time she'd learned about the video. So I've now redirected the conversation to, into my wheelhouse. Then I would say, where did this video originate? How did it give me your phone to the distributor? Whoever distributed it, don't care. What was the agreement with the distributor? All those are building pressure and we get the chance to see things. Were you surprised by its appearance? Were you surprised by the video's appearance online? Now let me reframe the question, Ms. Heard. How did a video from your phone appear on the internet without your knowledge? And that changes the equation from what she just answered. Now she's got to lie seven times to get to that final lie and it's building up on her. Now, when she locks her down about this TMX testimony, her use of language starts to fade. And we know that fight or flight turns off the thinking brain and turns on the cat or responsive brain. And when that happens, then she starts to go humana, 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 words that make no sense. She didn't come with it as a prepared answer. And I would ask her the last question, how did that get from your possession to there? How did it get there? That's my one question. It, by letting her get away with this, she's come with one sentence she has to stumble through and prepare, and you didn't take it apart, you didn't unpack it. We all know that that's part of being an attorney and part of being in front of people, but that's the power of questions. That's interrogator brain. Scott, what do you got? All right, two things for me. I'll, I'll keep mine fairly short. There's that word, absolutely. Not that it means that somebody's, every time you hear it, somebody's being deceptive, but boy, you sure hear it a lot when somebody's being deceptive. I mean, we hear it all the time. Absolutely not. You know, that's, I don't know, every time I hear that. Another thing that makes me pay attention when, was when people start talking weird. You know, she says, uh, upon touchdown. Who talks like that? Uh, astronauts, maybe. It'd be like me saying to Greg. Tussle. Uh, yeah, yeah, a tussle. Upon touchdown, I shall meet you in the uh, what Sky Lounge at the Delta, and we'll have those little uh, chicken sandwich croissants like we love so much, and we shall drink the sparkly fizzy water like as doth the rich man. And we, nobody talks that way. So every time I hear something like that, I go, every, there's just everything in me goes, wait a minute, hang on, man. Say that again. Talk again. So I make him talk about it again, or I would make them talk about it again. That, so that just bugs me. That just sends off every red flag. And I agree with you, Greg. I'd climb right up there and, and just tear that whole story apart at that point. Mark, what do you got? That, that's how I talk all the time when I'm inviting people to the lounge, <laughs> by the way. Just just drink the fizzy water as doth the rich man. That's, a, that's, no, that's just normal English, by the way, just so everybody knows. Um, so... Uh, look, she's decided to wear her hair today or have it managed for her in a less puritanical way. So it's it's falling in tresses. And just as Greg, you were saying, it means we can really pick up the movement. And some of the movement, like you say, is just it's just exaggerating some of the normal head moves and some of the movement is exaggerating some of the more extreme head moves. And there are some times, I think, where we really see a clear flick of that hair. Now that I would say is, is, a, is a faint move, not a faint as in like I'm fainting, but a distraction move and, and a kind of a showing off move. She's got good hair, that's expensive hair that she's got there. And one of the things that males and females, but probably culturally across the planet, more predominantly females will use their hair as a display of status. I thought you'd like that one, Chase, a display of status, and then flick that hair, move that hair around. So as many people as possible can see that the, the wealth that went into that hair. Yeah, Greg, nothing I can do for you, mate. <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing I can do for you. You're an outlier at a whole different, a whole different level. Um, so I would say she is uh, where we see those head, those hair flicks. She is very aggressive against the question. She thinks she is bigger, higher status, or she wants to show higher status against the question. Now, I think there's a slip up here. I could be wrong. I often get these kind of things wrong, but I think there's a slip up here. It did not come from me. I was lying, she said. Well, hang on. Did she just admit she was lying? Did not come from me. I was lying. What do you think, Greg? You say, I think she said flying. I think it's just the way. Oh, it's I was so. flying. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what, what she said. That's yeah. why you have. Yeah. See, I don't speak American, only English. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's scrub that. 
completely then. Did not come from me. Uh, I was flying. That's incorrect, is what I meant to say. So she does still correct herself on that. That did not come from me. I was flying. Mm, could have still come from her. And then she corrects that to, I was incorrect, is what I meant. It was incorrect, is what I meant to say. All right, that's all I got on that one. But you testified that you had absolutely nothing to do with the video's release, right? Absolutely not. And you testified that you learned about it when you landed after flying into LA. Do you remember that testimony? Upon touchdown is when I was alerted to the video's you existence You heard online. Mr. Tremaine testify that this about this video as well yesterday, didn't you? Yes, I did. And you heard Mr. Tremaine testify that TMZ received the cabinet video the same day you landed at LAX. Yes? I don't know if that I, I don't know if that's what his testimony was. I'm sorry. You heard Mr. Tremaine testify that the cabinet video was posted 15 minutes after TMZ received it. Yes? That's what I heard him say. And that this could only have been possible if the video was received directly from the source. Yes? I heard him say that. I don't know if that's true or if that's possible. Because it didn't come from me. I Mr. was flying. Tremaine so testified. Th th I know that's incorrect is what I mean to say. This is you at the courthouse on May 27th, 2016, when you got your domestic violence restraining order against Mr. Depp, right? It is. And next, and next to you is a woman is named Jody Gottlieb, Gottlieb, right? Right. Yes. Yes. Jody Gottlieb is your publicist and dear friend. Yeah. Now I'd like to show you what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 1316. This is a picture of you and your friend Rocky Pennington, right? That is correct. Your Honor, I'd like to move to admit this photograph. Any objection to 1316? No, Your Honor. All right, 1316 in evidence. You can publish the jury. This is a, picture, is a picture of of you on May 28th, 2016, right, Ms. Hurd? I don't know when this was taken. This is the day after you obtained the domestic violence restraining order against Mr. Depp, right? I have no idea when this um, image was taken. I did not take it. There's no bruise on your face in this picture, is there? Again, I don't know when this was taken. And also, I'm outside. I was obviously wearing makeup. I have no idea when this was taken, so I have no idea if I can Let's speak to what recollection. you can Let's see Let's refresh your recollection about when this picture was taken. Um, can we please pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 1315, just for the witness? This is an article dated May 30th, 2016, right, Ms. Hurd? That's what it says, yes. And this article contains the same photograph of you and Ms. Pennington we were just looking at, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, I see that. And the article is entitled, Amber Heard Smiles as She Puts Arm Around Friend One Day After Getting Restraining Order Against Johnny Depp. Is that, is that what the title says? I know that's what the title says, yes. Your Honor, I'm going to move to admit and publish the article with everything but the headline and date and the photo redacted. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm short on this one. When we first started the show, you guys remember when we were trying to say, what do we like best about body language? Like, 150 episodes ago. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Mine remember was that. amusement. And amusement has always been, for me, a beautiful thing to watch because people's cheeks will rise, but they'll contain their smile and their eyes will still engage the smile and you can't miss it. And you're starting to see some of that with her here. She's prepared for this question. She looks at the jury with a smug face. And so she's just ready for it. You see her neck stiffen and tighten just a little bit. And she goes, I did not take the picture. That's she sets up straight. It's just all rigid. She's prepared. It's just conflict for her. Now, Depp, if you watch him, here's a really good example of what we always talk about. When somebody recognizes something, their brow rises, his attorney leans over and says something to him and his brow goes, Choop. interesting. So something he recognizes something or he's recognizing the idea and it taking it in. And then there's also that odd nervous smile that's part of his persona as he, and watch him tapping and and drilling his fingers. That tells you when he's on the stand, he's contained and under control later. Um, Scott, what do you got? All right, well, in the first half, she's calm, and her body language is pretty much the same as it's been from what we've seen before. And then when she the sees the picture of, her, of she and her friend, she kind of, it, it's almost like hits her a little bit. So that's, uh, that shows she's interested in it, but she knows it's coming at that point. She's acting like, ah, oh, it's kind of like a little surprise, and she smiles a little bit. Um, and when she says, I have no idea, 
uh, when that picture was taken, I did not take it. She didn't contract. You would say, normally you would say, I don't know when that picture was taken. I, you know, I didn't take it. But she doesn't. So we, that, that's a cue. Most likely this was, you know, something they rehearsed and were ready for and, and playing for. So, but, but when they don't contract, that's when, that's another one of those things when somebody starts talking that makes me perk up and start paying attention like a big red flag. Um, all right. So I got Chase. What do you got? Yeah, I just want to know who brings a publicist to the court for photo. Oh, wait, she's a dear friend that that makes it well. Sorry, I forgot about that. Uh, right when Camille's saying there's no bruise on your face, is there these? I think uh, the is there stuff and didn't you and aren't you could have been rephrased to be a little softer uh, to help that that legal team, because the legal team and whether or not the jury likes the legal team, sadly, is just about as important as whether or not they like the defendant and the plaintiff. But she denies knowing the date of the photo. About and the questions about a bruise, she denies the date. And a truthful witness would, in in my opinion, be more okay with talking about wanting to cover up the bruise, the desire to cover it up, and recalling the date after having spent weeks reviewing all of her evidence. I think a truthful person would have experienced some shame about the bruise, especially if it's a if it's what a witness is referring to as the huge secret that would openly discuss the desire to conceal the bruise instead of publicize them. I don't know when this was taken, so I can't say whether or not you can see a bruise in this photo or not. So we see this just like legal language here. But, whoa, this took me for a ride this morning. How bizarre and out of character from what we've all likely seen in truthful recollection of witnesses when she says, I don't know when this was taken, so I can't say whether you see a bruise. I don't know when it was taken, so I don't know whether there's a bruise in front of my face looking at this photo right in front of me. Super strange. And continuing to, to argue about these like uh, dates and stuff, instead of saying yes, she's trying to be a lawyer, which is a bad idea, especially on the last day when the jury is going to deliberate. And she's saying that's what it says. Yes, I see that. I know that's what the title says. Yes. You just agree. Be more agreeable because the jury needs to like you. And I'll go off on a short rant here. It'll be about 40 seconds if you guys will allow it. I know it's uh, easy to see people on YouTube and think they're just some random dudes. All of us have well over, I think, probably 100,000 hours of interview and analysis experience. So when we see the comments like, well, did you think maybe she didn't have sleep or maybe they're stressed out? I think those are cute and helpful. I know you're trying to contribute. But here's one thing I want you to leave with you here. And the hardest thing to measure in academic studies is also the easiest for academic people to ignore, and that is skill. If somebody studies the science of athletics for their entire life, it will never make them an athlete. And somebody studies psychology for decades in college, it doesn't give them charisma or even social skills, even good people skills. And what studying academic sides of things does is increase knowledge. It doesn't necessarily increase skill. The real skills come when knowledge and skill are kind of paired together. And there's a huge, tremendous difference between an information expert and a skill expert with experience. And I'll leave you with one question here. As you hear all this stuff about body language on the internet, would you rather ride on the back of a motorcycle with somebody who's studied the physics of motorcycles for 20 years or somebody who's been riding them for 20 years? And that's all I have on that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, lovely. So, you know, often as well, it's where you place that skill and that knowledge and in places where maybe other people would never think to place it. I want you to have a look at one of those pictures, not the picture with her and her dear friend, the publicist, but the picture of her with her former friend, uh, Rocky Pennington, uh, former best friend, uh, Rocky Pennington. And, um, okay, so what I want you to look at 
by the way, listen, whenever you look at a still image, as we're always asked to look at this still image, look at this still image, we have to understand we're looking at a frame in time, okay? So we don't know what's happening before and we don't know what's happening after, but there are some questions and ideas that may be helpful that come from where we are right now. I want you to go and look at how Amber Heard is holding the arm of Rocky Pennington. Rocky has a drink in her hand. I think it's this arm here. It's in really close. And Amber has her joint there. Okay. Now, just try and do this with a, with a best friend or former best friend. As they're walking along with a coffee, just tuck your arm around them and just grab their elbow joint and, and see what happens. See, see if they don't go, what the heck, what's, what's going on? See if they don't just shift a little bit to go, what are you, why are you controlling my arm and my... So look, here's the question that comes to mind, and I don't know the answer to this, but it's the kind of question that somebody skilled might think about, which is, is that hold from somebody who's caring, or is it from somebody who is being controlling? Are they comforting? and caring or are they controlling is that hold from somebody who's being friendly or are they being forceful now again i don't know the answer to that but i know where my bias is swinging right now based on what i'm seeing and that i don't see that hold very much now of course you'll be able to come up with reasons and i can come up with reasons as well and we'll all be able to come up with reasons why that might happen in a moment after something or before something else but it is interesting that it's there. And if you missed that at all, what was happening there, well, that's what skill does for you, is to look in places that other people don't look. This is you at the courthouse on May 27th, 2016, when you got your domestic violence restraining order against Mr. Depp, right? It is. And next, and next to you is a woman named, named Jody Gottlieb, Gottlieb, right? Right. Yes, yes. Jody Gottlieb is your publicist? And dear friend. Now I'd like to show you what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 1316. This is a picture of you and your friend Rocky Pennington, right? That is correct. Your Honor, I'd like to move to admit this photograph. Any objection to 1316? No, Your Honor. All right, 1316 in evidence. You can publish to the jury. This is a picture, is a picture of, of you on May 28th, 2016, right, Ms. Heard? I don't know when this was taken. This is the day after you obtained the domestic violence restraining order against Mr. Depp, right? I have no idea when this um, image was taken. I did not take it. There's no bruise on your face in this picture, is there? Again, I don't know when this was taken. And also, I'm outside. I was obviously wearing makeup. I have no idea when this was taken, so I have no idea if I can Let's speak to what recollections you can Let's see. Let's refresh your recollection about when this picture was taken. Um, can we please pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 1315 just for the witness? This is an article dated May 30th, 2016, right, Ms. Heard? That's what it says, yes. And this article contains the same photograph of you and Ms. Pennington we were just looking at, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, I see that. And the article is entitled, Amber Heard Smiles as She Puts Arm Around Friend One Day After Getting Restraining Order Against Johnny Depp. Is that, is that what the title says? I know that's what the title says, yes. Your Honor, I'm going to move to admit and publish the article with everything but the headline and date and the photo redacted. Ms. Vasquez has suggested that you faked bruises on your face. Is that true? Absolutely not. I didn't need to. Did you ever fake an injury caused by Mr. Depp? No. Is any of the evidence of your injuries that has been put to the jury in this trial fake? No, absolutely not. And to the extent that there may be some confusion over when a picture of spilled wine was taken, why might that be? Objection, there's so lack of foundation. Overruled. Because there's so many incidents of violence. There are so, there's so many pictures. There's so much evidence. Most people don't have this kind of evidence for years, five years. And when I was saying that to Johnny on the phone in that recording, I was saying for years, this has been going on. And I have pictures, we have texts, we have everything. Normally you don't get this amount of evidence. That's what I was pointing out to Johnny. It would be crazy to try to challenge this in this way. 
it's crazy. It's easy to, to not know the context of a, a picture of spilled wine because there are so many more important details, pictures, and also so much I didn't photograph, so much I didn't have the presence of Objection, non-responsive. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm, I'll be short on this one. Look, when they ask her, she, did you ever fake an injury? She does a wonderful thing, and that is she shows exasperation. She holds her mouth open, and she goes, but it's 12 seconds after she delivers the answer. This is a bad kung fu movie. This is something wrong here in the way she's delivering this. All that animation, all that messaging that she's doing is just not timely. So something's up. Then when she, they say something about photo evidence, that one shoulder rises and she's got that swivel switch going in when she looks at the jury she's making hard eye contact and making lots of faces she's got to be careful again depends on who's in the jury and which culture they may be from remember virginia is a real mix of cultures especially Greg, tell, us, tell us what that shoulder rise means really quick yeah thanks thanks for bringing that up yeah so uncertainty with what you're talking about or with what's being discussed when you do that single shoulder rise so we wonder okay why is this an issue for her for me, the biggest tell in this entire thing, when you want to talk about tells, though, is to have all of your messaging right and then suddenly deliver it like, you know, I really feel bad for you. I know you've been going through a lot, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> That's about what that looked like to me. It's that delayed or even more. It's seconds, if not many seconds later. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so here's the way I'm putting it, Greg, is there is a lot of emotional dressing around the whole piece. It's like a, yeah, I mean, it's like a costume of emotion being worn. And I really pick it up in the breathing. There's breathing that's happening around stuff that doesn't make any sense for the through line of what she's trying to achieve. It doesn't make any sense for the emotion that I think she's wanting to be having, or even any emotions that, that I know of. She's not breathing in a way that, that denotes any strong, clear emotion for me, which suggests it's dressing. And then the real nail on this one for me is, has any of the evidence of injury uh, been, been fake or words to that effect? There is a massively contrasting different tone to that answer. I mean, go back, look at it again and see what happens in pitch, in breathing, in that emotional breathing, dressing around it, and Scott, to your point earlier with that word, absolutely. And again, let's just say it again. It doesn't mean anything, but we hear it a lot. And we hear it a lot from people who've turned out to not be not telling us the truth. Okay. It's not necessary. It's, 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 you know, it's absolutely not necessary to add that. Absolutely. Let's just say that. Anyway. I'll leave it, I'll leave it at, at, at that, and I'm sure everybody else is just going to compound on top of this. But let's see. Scott, what, what do you think? All right. I think this, uh, this answer was completely prepped because she's ready for it. And it's, it, she knows it's an important answer. That's an important question. So I think that's why they're ready for it. And when the other attorney breaks into it to object, she has to start all over again. She's Man, she's like reared back cocked and ready to go but as soon as she goes hey Vic, and then she breaks in and goes okay and they make and starts at the very same spot again so I, I think this is rehearsed and it's just and it's just it's, it sounds so pitiful to go it's just lame but you know what are you gonna say at this point we're seeing pretty much the same stuff over and over and over but it's just she's just uh, she's not acting she's not delivering this as she should it doesn't look the, the way it should that's all i know what to say about it um chase what do you got yeah, I think uh, she believes this. I'm going to go out on a limb. But I think she believes this to an extent. And I think, this is my opinion, here is exactly how Amber believes her own story. So there are small pieces of events that she recalls that were truthful. Then she edits details and each one enough to just to increase the severity of a few things, according to her. And she's rehearsed the stories in her mind a lot, uh, many, many times. And I think also the final factor here is that she believes that she's doing something good for herself, but more importantly, that she is doing something good for humanity. And even if some of the details are changed, 
Johnny's still a bad person, so I can edit a few of these details and it's okay because he's still bad and evil. So changing a few things doesn't change who he is in her mind. It helps the world understand how bad he is and it helps her to become an icon who can help women. So the imagined uh, morality here justifies the blending of fact and fiction. And I think that's what's really going on deep down. Uh, juries are only processing data during pauses. So I'll say this for every attorney and every person who's ever going to be deposed. Juries are only going to start processing the data once you stop talking, like you just did now. So the attorney just barrels through these questions and doesn't even look at her for her responses here. It's her own attorney not even looking at her for her emotional responses. Bad idea. When they're talking about the fake bruises on your face, nods yes before the answer. So it's mismatched and it deviates from ba her baseline behavior. And uh, did you ever fake an injury? She says no and then shakes her head. There's a spilled glass of wine photo discussion. Watch this clip a few times and rewind it. She starts answering with disgust facial expression on her face. And when the objection happens, right when the objection happens, this emotion on the face vanishes in less than a second while she coldly looks back over to Camille. And when it's overruled, instantly the, um, the sad emotions back on her face and she's looking back at the jury again. What well, she's saying, there's so much evidence. I think this points to my opinion that she's viewing this mountain of evidence for Johnny being unusual, strange, mean, callous, leaving her, that she's able to emotionally justify the other actions or the other claims to assist her case. That's all she's doing is just assist as a small assistance in her mind. And I think, in my opinion, she views this evidence as being a mountain of abuse because she equates the two. I think that she equates the abandonment to abuse. So this mountain of evidence is real, 100% real in her mind. That's why she's talking openly and honestly about no one has this much evidence. No one ever has ever collected this much evidence in a case. So whether that's this is a thorough, deliberate falsification or a desire to be the center of attention, or she honestly just believes the story, which I doubt, we may never know. It's true, okay, Chase. Well, nothing is ever you. nothing is ever nothing is ever better than histrionic <clears throat> persons. Scott, what do you got? Okay, I here's your thing. When you get into it, man, you squish all up and do this number. You get this going. That's you know when you imitate me before we get started. That's that's the one I'm going to get on you. That's fine. You always go. You squish down and get that yeah. hand going like that. Yeah. Okay, I got you. Keep going in and out of focus. Yeah, because you're, right? you're moving your hands in front of the camera. You That's how I turn the auto focus off. Mike, this camera's horrible. I bought it from Eric like a year and a half ago as my backup. Yeah. Bought a camera from Eric. <laughs> yeah. Is he a camera salesman now. My what? Eric Hunley, is camera salesman. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> cameras by Eric Hunley. Like, yeah, Scott. Uh, do you want? Ms. Vasquez has suggested that you faked bruises on your face. Is that true? Absolutely not. I didn't need to. Did you ever fake an injury caused by Mr. Depp? No. Is any of the evidence of your injuries that has been put to the jury in this trial fake? No, absolutely not. And to the extent that there may be some confusion over when a picture of spilled wine was taken, why might that be? Because there's so lack of many. foundation. Yeah, overruled. Because there's so many incidents of violence. There are so there's so many pictures. There's so much evidence. Most people don't have this kind of evidence for years, five years. And when I was saying that to Johnny on the phone in that recording, I was saying for years this has been going on. And I have pictures. We have texts. We have everything. Normally, you don't get this amount of evidence. That's what I was pointing out to Johnny. It would be crazy to try to challenge this in this way it's crazy it's easy to to not know the context of a, a picture of spilled wine because there are so many more important details pictures and also so much i didn't photograph so much i didn't have the presence objection non-responsive how many times have you done mdma in your life mr depp uh, actually not many not that many 
times I would say in my lifetime, maybe in my lifetime, MDMA, six, seven, maybe. And how much MDMA have you done on those occasions? Uh, not enough to, um, not enough to uh, properly, well, not, not, not enough to properly, properly experience the, what the um, chemicals are supposed to do to you. Have you ever consumed eight to 10 MDMA pills at once? No, ma'am. No, I have not. And why is that? Um, because I'd be dead. I'm pretty sure I'd be dead. Um. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, okay, look, he does go around the houses a little bit to get to some answers here. And, <coughs> excuse me, under normal circumstances, if somebody were taking that amount of time and going around the houses on this one, I might be a little bit worried. But given his baseline, this is fairly usual for him. And here's the important thing. He lands eventually on a very clear answer, like six or seven, and didn't have the effect it, it should, and I'd be dead. So yeah, I think, uh, you know, you could look at this and go, is he being deceitful here? Why is he taking such a journey? Why is he taking so long around this? That's normal for him. Lands on strong answers. I don't have a great deal of problem with his performance here. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Yeah, I usually would agree with you, Mark. In this case, I'm not certain. Here's why. He conditions the hell out of the question. Yes, he's a he's a search for change in the floor as he speaks kind of guy. He doesn't do all that in here. When they ask him the question, he conditions a question. Actually, I would say not that many times. Then he negotiates even further by saying, in my lifetime, finally to an answer of six or seven, maybe. He could have said four. He could have gone, uh, you know, uh, 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 but his baseline is exactly what you say, hunting for the answer, make hard eye contact, shake his head, or, or shake his head. His timing is not the same. Go back and watch the very first video we did. When he makes a point, he'll go, Mark, it was, uh, it was six, six or seven times. That's not here. Something's missing here. So I, I doubt it's six or seven times. My opinion is I would dig in a little harder, not that it matters for this case. All that they're trying to do is prove that he has used drugs, and then they're going to try to tie this into some other part. I, you know, I, I would bet you could find six or seven times that people have seen him use some drug. That, just my opinion. But so pay attention to that. Then he moves some to some distaste with his mouth that we didn't see earlier in these. And he, when they ask him about the eight to ten pills, he does something trademark for him, and that's that disarming smile he has. Hey, I'm Johnny Depp. <laughs> You know, self-deprecating, but a smile. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I tend to agree a little bit here. And uh, one, the first thing here is you're going to see, we talk about this contempt facial expression. What the hell does it look like? We talk about this a lot. Textbook, beautiful chef's kiss example, right on Amber Heard's face during the beginning of this. And you'll see the corner of the mouth go up. It's kind of a one-sided smile. This is a beautiful example on what it's supposed to look like, the textbook example of feeling contempt for another human being. But when he's saying and not enough to experience, you know, the, what the chemicals intend or something like that, the answers are looking a little more coached than normal. He's having trouble with the descriptive language. Uh, there's three postural retreats here just during this answer, three postural retreats where we lean away, there's facial touching, which is also in his baseline. So I ignore anything that's in baseline. But it sounds coached. It sounds a little rehearsed. It's likely not entirely truthful. I think the 8 or 10 thing is probably truthful. I looked it up. It's pretty bad. You'd probably be in the ICU uh, with that. But 8 to 10 MDMA at once. He, there's repetition of answer, which is more suggestive of honesty. And I think he's probably done enough to get the results in the past, uh, uh, despite what he claims here. That's all I got. Scott? All right. Uh, I think he's breaking eye contact to thank you. I'm just going to have to get rid of all the stuff you guys have already talked about. That's pretty normal. His cadence, is, it's a little bit wacky, but that's goes with a persona he's chosen to, to show people the star. He's a star, baby. He's a star. So that's that's normal for that, 
that kind of thing. Um, he has no problem really talking about that he's done drugs. Everybody knows he's done drugs. We knew that before he went in doing this. Look who he was hanging out with. So, we, and the movies he's done. Yeah, man, he's done drugs and we know it. So I don't think he has a problem talking about it. But I think the, the amount of times he's done MMDA, I think that might be a, a I might, that might be a problem the number of times. I think she knows it's a lot more than he's going to say. That's why we see that contempt on her face. And I think this is a great example um, and something to save uh, and think about for what's coming up as the, I think the last video there, I go out of focus again. How many times have you done MDMA in your life, Mr. Depp? Uh, actually, not many, not that many times I would say in my lifetime, maybe in my lifetime, MDMA, six, seven, maybe. And how much MDMA have you done on those occasions? Uh, not enough to, um, not enough to uh, properly, well, not, not, not enough to properly, properly experience the, what the um, chemicals are supposed to do to you. Have you ever consumed eight to 10 MDMA pills at once? No, ma'am. No, I have not. And why is that? Um, because I'd be dead. I'm pretty sure I'd be dead. Um. Mr. Depp, when Dr. Kipper was treating your finger, what did you tell him about how your finger became injured? Um, I told him, I told him that there was obviously, I mean, when you saw the damage in the house and everything, the blood everywhere, I mean, obviously there was serious damage done. Um, I, there would be no point in lying to the man. He'd been through it with me and, and, uh, Miss Herb before I told him that she had, uh, thrown a bottle of, bottle of vodka and smashed my hair, smashed and cut my finger, uh, off. The tip of my finger, just the, but a good chunk. I miss it. <laughs> Chase, what do you got? I'm hoping you call somebody else because I was chewing on an ice cube. <laughs> oh, I can. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Uh, so, listen, I think there's, again, some behaviors there that I would put within his baseline that I think, you know, other. if you didn't know that, you'd come into it and go, why is he taking so long? Why this? Why that? Here's what I do see him doing, which is smashed my... Uh, smashed and cut my finger. So he's being very certain to maximize the, the injury there and not minimize it because we've had before in the case, um, testimony that says it was just, his finger was just smashed. He definitely wants people to know it was cut. Um, you know, even when I say it, smashed as opposed to cut. Cut is a much better word. It's a much more forceful word. You probably see a much better injury if I say cut finger rather than smashed finger, maybe. And I think that's what he's trying to go, trying to do. The smash alone just minimize it. He needs the cut. And then he says tip, the tip. And, and then he realized he's minimized that. So he has to go a considerable amount. So he doesn't want you to think that just the tip was smashed. He wants you to, to know that a considerable amount of the tip was cut. And again, once I tell you that story, much better, much better story. And then quite nicely, he finishes this piece of what I would say is spin. He's really trying to tell a good story about the injury there, which, which could, could be true, could be, could be false. I'll let everybody else weigh in as to how true or false that might be. But he, he finishes off with quite a good kind of Python-esque Jack Sparrow, I miss it at the end. Lovely little button at the end, I miss it. Uh, a bit of pathos there, which is part of his skill. He does often manage to button stories with a really nice, you know, pathetic line at the end. Quite skillful. Uh, Chase, what do you think? So in this video here, <clears throat> there's a shift to internal dialogue. And this happens when our eyes move down and to our left. And 
This is when we're talking to ourselves or rehearsing something that we've been reading or hearing uh, over and over again. And what he's saying, he'd been through it with me and misheard before. There's a shift to internal dialogue again. There's facial touching in his baseline, though. And there's hesitancy where he's pausing a little bit, a small amount more than usual. But this, I don't think the stress here is around the story, but his retelling of the story to the doc specifically. Not that the story was inaccurate, but I think his stress is around the fact that whether or not he told the doctor the story. It looks like he's uncomfortable only during the recall of the relaying of the story to the doctor. And during the bottle story of his testimony, when he's talking about the bottle like whizzing past his head. We've all seen that, uh, that dramatic illustration. There was no indicators of deception. So now I'm only wondering if the doc was accurately informed or if he actually told the doc at all. Greg? Yeah, I'm on the same page. What's interesting here is when he is passionately talking about something and then here. We know that his baseline is to look down into his left as he thinks about the answer he's going to use, move his eyes over to the right as he searches for impact, then move around in his head. We know that when people's eyes move, it means something. Now, it, there's no absolutes. You have to go and dig for what it means. In his case, it's part of his baseline to go away left, away right, do that searching for change move that I was talking about, and then make eye contact and nod or shake his head. When he's emphatic, he does a very good job of that. When he's not emphatic, he does a poor job of the hard eye contact and shaking or nodding. What he does here is a poor job, which you might immediately say, well, he's talking about his finger being severed, but he isn't. This is not the emphatic. This is not the bottle wisdom by my head. This is not that. This is credibility of what I told the doctor. Well, the doctor is going to say whatever it is. So I don't feel, like, Mark, to your point, a lot of this is in baseline. He touches his face. So what? Maybe his nose itches just is who he is. His, there are a couple of things that he does that are odd. He grabs the mic stand and moves it around. And I think, Chase, to your point, is because he feels uncomfortable with how to answer this. Don't know. I can't read his mind. I can only tell you that that's unusual for a guy who lives in front of a microphone. He stammers and his head shakes and he does what he usually would do, just not as hard to eye contact. That's the, the biggest deviation I see. There's a narrowing of his mouth and his blink rate is up as he's looking for things. But it looks like he's relaying some information with some trepidation about what exactly to say and how to say it. Mark, I think if... He, in fact, realizes he's minimizing. That would be enough reason to cause him not to feel emphatic and to realize that he just stepped on his own feet and does something. We'll get a chance to see what he looks like when he's under stress. But that's it for this one. Scott, what do you got? All right. Again, he's acting like a star, which is what you expect from somebody like this. You want to see him do that. You want to see him be that way or you expect him to be that way. I'm not seeing any deception cues here. Not not much at all as it goes through here but i do so see somebody being really really careful of what they're saying as we all would be so he's got to be very careful as he goes along here making sure he, he doesn't say anything out of line uh, of what he's rehearsed uh, or what he's been told to talk about i think that that little uh thing on his nose that's a, when he's scratching his nose that's just an adapter and he keeps his arms really close to his body and this helps him to look a little weaker like he's not a big he-man or very strong or anything he keeps him really really tight and really 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 close and i think that helps him uh, get maybe a little pity from the from the jury it may help it may it may not i don't know and he's not pandering to the jury like she was he's answering the questions to the attorney he's not looking at the jury when when the attorney asks him the questions he doesn't flip around look at the jury and answer and then come back to the to the attorney so you guys cover most everything here and that's all i got mr depp when dr kipper was treating your finger what did you tell him about how your finger became injured Um, I told him, I told him that there was obviously, I mean, when you saw the damage in the house and everything, the blood everywhere, I mean, obviously there was serious damage done. Um, I, there would be no point in lying to the man. He'd been through it with me and, and, uh, Miss Earl before I told him that she had, uh, thrown a bottle, bottle of vodka and smashed my hair, smashed and cut my finger uh, off. The tip of my finger, just the, but a good chunk. I miss it. <laughs> Could you 
repeat that? And you've also said that with Could you respect, repeat that, please? Yeah, that, that if you want to be with a woman, that she is rightfully yours. That's ludicrous. You've also said that with respect to women that you want to be with, you've remarked, I need, I want, I take, haven't you? Equally as ludicrous, no. Can you pull up DX883, please? You can pull what you like. I've never said those words. Okay. There's not enough hubris in me to say eight, anything eight, like eight, that. 883? 883, Your Honor. It's not, DX, is it evident? It is not admitted yet. Okay, 883. Mr. Depp, these are text messages from you to Stephen Duders on February 22nd, 2017, correct? Um, this, no, this looks nothing like me. You might have mistaken. Uh... Mr. Depp, we can show the full unredacted. You've looked at a number of text messages in this case. And the words him as the identifier, that's you, correct? In every text message we've seen in this case. Yeah, uh, yeah sure. It yeah. still doesn't mean it hasn't been screwed with. That's not anything that I've ever said or written. You want to see the whole, the whole thing unredacted? We can look at that, too. No, it's because good. you could have typed it up last night. No. Yeah. I can assure you I didn't type it up last night, Mr. Depp. Your Honor, I move for the admission of Exhibit 883. All right. Any objection? Uh, objection on relevance grounds, Your Honor. All right, do you want to approach for a moment? Yes. Let's take a look. I haven't, I haven't done one first, so I'll go first on this one. Uh, this is where it all changes. So his voice tone goes a little bit higher, his cadence speeds up, his eye contact with the, with the attorney is almost fixed, and his voice is a little bit louder. And these are all indications, again, that he's on alert, that he's paying close attention to what he's saying, what he's doing. His lips are pursed, and that, that indicates disagreement or something he's, he's not into, something he doesn't like, or hearing something he doesn't like. Um, and, to, and, and usually you look at that and say, oh, when you see uh, pursed lips, there's an issue there. That's what you want to think when you see something like that. Uh, as he explains, there's not enough hubris in him to say that, that, um, that that's him in the text or that he wrote those texts. We see a lot of lip person at that point. The definition of hubris is excessive pride or self-confidence and arrogance, which is he's coming across with a lot of that. But I think it's I don't. I don't think it's working against him. I think he's he's pulling it off in a lot of parts at that point. But since he's like that, and I think all of his everybody would assume he's like that, he's got to kind of own that a little bit. And I think he does. So he's he because he's aware he, that he comes off as prideful and arrogant, and that's why he smiles a lot. Try to tamp that down. I think. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I, <coughs> excuse me. I think this is the most on the ropes that we've probably seen him throughout the whole trial so that might tell us something about about his character first of all but also you know how much evidence he thinks is stacked against him and what the type of evidence he feel he gets most stressed out by yeah we see these bites at the side of the mouth we see lip pursing so this is more stress than we normally see from him um, still, the use of the poetic words like you use there, Scott, hubris, instead of using confidence or pride, he still has. He's not so stressed out that he still can't grab a, grab a word like, like hubris. Um, so that's the poet there. You know, it's interesting, right at the start, could you repeat that? Could you repeat that, please? That is the most I've heard him sound like John Lennon. And then he went on, I think the next night or the night after to play in Sheffield with Jeff Beck and sing Isolation, which is a John Lennon uh, song. Not particularly well, actually, in my opinion. But then he was up against Jeff Beck, who's a genius on the guitar, and Johnny Depp is not a genius on the guitar uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But nonetheless, uh, interesting to hear that John Lennon uh, clearly coming through there, from my opinion. I think he's genuinely has some confusion about the 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 evidence at some point. It, it may well be confusion around that, that it's just confusing for him. He has never seen anything like this before, or he's genuinely confused by being surprised by it. I'm not quite sure which one. Anyway, all I'd say at the end of this is, I don't think the lawyer there does the best job of really, uh, you know, nailing this down because he said, I assure you, I did not type it up last night. Well, that just doesn't discount then that he didn't type it up on some other night or somebody else didn't type it up 
last night or on another night. I think if I were the lawyer, I'd have tidied that one up to say it's it's real evidence. It's the real thing. That's your, you know, that's your text message. I wouldn't have tried to qualify it in that way. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, this is one where he is indeed on the ropes. And I think what's happening here is if you think about this as a chess match, if he admits that he sent some drug fueled or drunken text that said this, how does that make him look? Now that lets them set up the next the next pawn in the chess match. So I think that starts, he realizes that now something's going to be used against him. He's going to have a hell of a time backing out of because his text came from his phone. Here we are back to a video coming off somebody else's phone. And he, not unlike, not unlike Amber, is also in the audition for his career. If the world finds out or thinks and he walks away from here and they believe he's this monster she's made him out to be, he's done. He's done. We see what happened to him in the past. So he has to be very cautious as well. His blink rate is through the roof. We don't see that usually in him. He's very stoic in blink rate. He also, his target is shrinking. His body is shrinking. He's turtling. He's getting smaller. Scott, you hit it dead on. His, his eye contact is sustained throughout the whole thing. Hard eye contact. He goes to internal voice, but he doesn't search for change over on the right before he answers. And then he says a new word, ludicrous, ludicrous. Now, maybe he said it during other times, but we didn't hear it. He uses it twice here equally ludicrous and he is emphatic when he does that and he telegraphs with his cadence by saying equally ludicrous purses his lips in disapproval that pushing forward and then he is talking with that downward tone from the back of his throat then he does a disclaimer likely for the good of the jury to say there's no way i would do anything like that i don't have the hubris but then when they show him the actual text watch his face everybody out here all of you can recognize the shock we all know what shock is because Darwin, all those years ago, figured out it was a universal emotion that we can all read. Once he does that, you see an O, then he narrows his mouth and his body language gets a little more rigid. You can hear him breathe. His breathe, breathing rate increases, you can hear him breathe. And then you see that grief muscle come up and he starts to navigate the answer. No, these aren't, he says, this looks, looks nothing like me. Well, if I'm interrogator, I'm saying, well, hold on, I didn't ask you if it looks like you. I'm asking, did you write this? You see the mouth grooming you mentioned, Mark, because he's feeling the stress. And he, this is starting to build up on him. And interrogator should jump on him and go after him and say, is it possible you don't remember? You just said you didn't remember something five minutes ago. And that would be my approach. He's on the ropes here. And this is a place where he actually could look very, very, very bad because he's saying something that they can make him into a different person. I think he's feeling the stress. Chase, what do you got? You guys got most everything, and I agree. Uh, but one thing we do see in here that we rarely see, especially in the courtroom, is a retreat of the dominant shoulder. And we see this as the subject gets brought up. If you try to get yourself, if you're just listening to this while you're shopping cucumbers in your kitchen or whatever, just pull your pull your, that dominant shoulder back. And that's how we get into a uh, like a fighting position. So that's one of the pre-violence indicators if we're on the street as a cop, but it's an anger indicator or disagreement indicator, especially in situations like this. And I think the level of confidence that we see, I think he initially doubts that he said these things. I do believe that he doubts that he said it. He likely sent these texts, but now he's going to go, has to go into this defensive mode. You see his blink rate spikes and, and drops Exactly. You can watch in this video go up and down, up and down, exactly how we describe it with stress and focus. You can watch it in this one clip. And this is what to look for, not, not to say someone is lying, but to identify the special context where more questions are needed. And in the overall sense of things, if you just think about the in trial in its entirety, if this is the one thing that got him on the ropes... It should tell you a whole lot about who he is and what all we're dealing with between him and his ex-wife. That's all I got. Could you repeat that? And you've also said that with Could respect, you repeat that, please? Yeah, that, that if you want to be with a woman, that she is rightfully yours. That's ludicrous. You've also said that with respect to women that you want to be with, you've remarked, I need, I want, I take, haven't you? Equally as ludicrous, no. Can you pull up DX883, please? 
You can pull it what you like. I've never said those words. There's not enough hubris in me to say eight, anything. Eight like eight that. three. Eight eight three, Your Honor. It's not. Ex- is it evident? It is not admitted yet. Okay. Eight eight three. Mr. Depp, these are text messages from you to Stephen Duders on February 22nd, 2017, correct? Um, this, no, this looks nothing like me. You might have mistaken. Uh... Mr. Depp, we can show the full unredacted. You've looked at a number of text messages in this case. And the words him as the identifier, that's you, correct? In every text message we've seen in this case. Yeah, uh, yeah sure. It yeah. still doesn't mean it hasn't been screwed with. That's not anything that I've ever said or written. You want to see the whole the whole thing unredacted? We can look at that, too. No, that's because great. you could have typed it up last night. No. Yeah. I can assure you I didn't type it up last night, Mr. Depp. Your Honor, I move for the admission of Exhibit 883. All right. Any objection? Uh, objection on relevance grounds, Your Honor. All right. Do you want to approach for a moment? Yes. Let's take a look. All right. Well, let's throw down the room in 30 seconds or less. Let's kind of wrap it up and talk about what we think we've seen here. Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, I guess thinking about all of that, I just kind of think who's having to work harder here? Who's having to work harder? Who's putting in more effort here visibly i'm not saying somebody couldn't be paddling hard underneath and it not really showing but who's really showing that they're putting in more effort here to the jury uh emotionally um and and do we think that's going to have the impact that they desire well we're going to find out uh pretty soon i guess chase what are your thoughts from an academics perspective, if just looking at this stuff from academics is you're going to see something that I call a laboratory blind spot. We can't isolate everything inside of a lab. And you're definitely going to see that here. But on, on the overall, where is the abuse? Shame, being ashamed of something, turns the volume down on false accusations. And pain turns the volume up for truthful accusations in my opinion. I think we're seeing an actress and not a storyteller. People who write really good fiction know one thing very well. The main character needs a deep character flaw to make them likable. Nobody enjoys a perfect character. Look at every superhero movie, every Disney movie, there's flaws in every main character. And this was a case of a flawless, innocent, perfect human who's never made a mistake versus the most vile villain that ever existed. It's just bad storytelling. That's all I got. Greg? Yeah, I would start this off by saying my wrap of this, the entire series, is this is a train wreck and a trash dump. This is a horrible, horrible story, no matter how we look at it. And it looks like the story of a brawler, in my opinion, the brawler and an insecure, druggy kind of guy, a guy who uses substance to for whatever reason, whether it's recreation or whatever, those two people might not match very well together. And I'm not sure which side is honest. I will say this, that she is hard to believe and she's hard to like when you're looking at her and the way she approaches things. Her emotions, her most ramped up emotions, to your point, Chase, about anger, are around when she's disrespected, when I would think I would be really angry about the violation of person, of self, all the physical violence. It just doesn't show the same. He likely also has moments where he doesn't remember things because if he's drinking that much or doing that much, we can't tell. But if any of what she said is true or half of what he said is true, maybe he does send these texts and those kind of things. Almost all he said, she said stories are going to be one side or the other, you know, a little bit in the middle. It's not going to be, none of it's going to be true. It's going to be half truths. But she swung for the fences on this story. He's either an all out monster. I mean, the stuff she's accusing him of is not kind of he's a jerk. He's an all out monster if she's right, or she's a liar because she swung for the fence. They both have shown signs of deception. His has mostly been around stupid things like saying stupid stuff. He's shown some certain there, something he's written or he said. That leads me to believe. She's the one that's not believable. And if she swung that hard for the fence, we'll wait and see what the jury says. That's my opinion. Scott, what do you got? I think this is a great example of seeing, uh, like Chase was saying, seeing a story go along. The more 
th that you watch of this trial, <clears throat> the more you see the separation of she's really different than this guy. She, you know, she's really telling one story. He's really telling another story, as you would expect in this situation. But it sure looks like she's I'm getting a lot more deceptive cues from her than I did from him. So when it comes to believing, if I had to put my money on it, I don't think it'd be uh, tough to, to say who showed the most uh, cues of deception in those two. So I think it's a great example of seeing people that we all the time we're all the time talking about uh, trial and court and those types of things. I think it's a great example of just being able to sit there and watch these things we always talk about happen right in front of you. So, all right, fellas, I think this was a good one, and I'll see you next time. Deal. With behavior panel. <laughs> Objection. Objection. I knew her. <clears throat> she was my friend. All right. She was my friend. She was you my know friend. The one objection that I never heard during this trial that I, I hear during every single trial. It's, yeah, that's uh, it. What the f man? I'm not going to say it in the video, but it's objection call, calls for facts, not in evidence. Yeah, yeah. There's a there, there is one, her. and there's one that they actually do that has facts not in evidence, and they part of it, Chase, I think, is because See, they're we're saying, missing out on this. Yeah, well, let's let's say it. Let's bring it up. We'll talk about it. Let's yeah. at the end of our of our talk here. Let's bring that up and make it part of the closing. Yeah, Chase, just throw it in, just like yeah, we were doing. Go. Save so, this. Oh, this wait, is yeah. the good let's stuff. That's right, great. All right. Then we're going to talk about Daniel Holtzclaw. Greg, why don't you tell us about him? Yeah, Daniel Holtzclaw was an Oklahoma City police officer who abused his badge who sexually assaulted, was, was charged with 36 sexual assault charges, convicted of 18, got 263 years in prison. The Innocence Project has since said that's probably not true and they're trying to get him out, but his appeal has been denied. Do you remember her name? It was on the I description. Don't, I okay. don't. Okay. Um, do you make traffic stops normally after work? I don't, but in that case, I saw her swerve and whatnot, so I... I mean, me, I don't. Felt. I, <laughs> I know. I mean, people I know, I can't say that is have a, you know, one nine <laughs> right. to have the vision, whatever. But I felt like I needed to make that traffic stop. Okay. How was she? Was she respectful? Was she She not? felt like was she, she was nervous and whatnot. And I'm like, why are you nervous? And she was even crying. I'm like, why are you crying? Why are you nervous? What not? And she's just like, I don't know. I'm just nervous because you're a cop and I got pulled over. Like nothing you had to be nervous about. And I told her, I'm like, I don't really want to take you to jail for no SDL or anything. I just got off work. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. So, with my officer, um, courtesy or whatnot, I said I'd go get that taken care of tomorrow. And, they're on their way. and you don't have to, fix, I'm not going to sit here and go, why didn't you right. take her to die? Well, that's, that's the reason why. No, I don't care. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'll keep this really quick. Um, he has a strong denial of her name as he turns his head and draws the left side of his mouth. Now, whether he knew her name or not doesn't really matter. That's one place he can go. What he has is some rehearsed information he's going to release here. And we see him using illustrators, but we're, we also quickly see him going into this braced position where his feet are locked. I want you to pay attention to his feet and how they look. Pointed in, pointed out, slammed together. He's bracing his body. And when you brace your body, your body doesn't like that. And he's a big muscular guy. So when he's standing there and that he sits in a place for a long time, that muscle starts to feel that. And when she gives him the out, and she's a good investigator, she gives him an out by giving him a break and saying something that lets him feel free. His leg pushes forward and he starts to try to relax that. He adapts on his legs. He almost does the whole batter on, on deck thing with his legs. And that's one of the first adapters you learn. It's a way to release nervous energy. He starts also to run down this mantra, swerve, didn't feel. And he does a nervous laugh when she asks him, do you typically pull over people when you're off duty? We're going to see a pattern here. This is the beginning of it. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you. And he's locked down and he's wearing body armor. If you've never worn body armor before, it stuff's heavy. And it's hard to breathe, and he's still maintaining that lockdown. We see pacifying here, some genital protection, which we do when we're scared. It's covering this genital area, which is also covering the femoral artery. So our, our body automatically starts protecting arteries when we're scared. And we don't really have a good baseline for this person. So my analysis here, I speak for myself, will be mostly rooted in two things, which is one, 
the presence and the timing of stress behaviors that are well known to occur. And number two, the experience in the interviews and research I've independently conducted for 22 years. So a lot of this will be my opinion and some of it will be peer reviewed, uh, so to speak. In this clip, the interrogator is more nervous, I think, than the suspect. And this is something that we rarely see. There's some strong confirmation glance while they're trying to overtly relate to the officer about the pain uh, in the rear of having to do a DUI or having to process a DUI, do the paperwork, get the person in prison. That was a big, let's let's connect and, and see how we both understand this thing together. And it was, there was a confirmation glance after that, which it was probably a little cringy uh, in that environment. That's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So as many of you are often note about me, it would seem that I've been living in a cave for the last few decades and I know nothing about this case at all. In fact, the first I heard of it was uh, what what Greg just told me uh, about, about it there. So uh, so um, I've gone into this completely clean. Let's see if I'm any good or not. Let's see if he's any good or not. Uh, so what have I got? Uh, symmetrical gestures. That's always nice to see. But the illustrators, uh, they're not very buoyant. They keep collapsing down. Uh, Chase, to your point, that could be about this body armor bringing him down. Let's see. Let's see how that goes. So there's something depressed about it. Uh, palms will often come in as the gestures come down. So it's quite protective. And I agree, Chase, it often comes into a fig leaf. Quite protective there. Uh, here's the most important thing for me about this one. Do you remember her name? In that case, I saw her swerving one night. So she asks, do you remember her name? He says, in that case, I saw her, sw oh, he says, he says, no, he didn't know her name. In that case, I saw her swerving one night. Hang on a moment. So he's seen her on other nights then, which instantly causes me to go, have you been stalking her? How come one night you see her swerving? You've seen her on other nights as well. Sounds to me like it could be, a stalking case. No, I have no idea how this turns out, apart from what Greg just said there. But uh, but sounds to me like we've got somebody stalking. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right, we're going to hear a lot of, of jargon. That's like police jargon. I'm not a cop, never been one, but I'm familiar with what some of that jargon is. And SDL is the suspended driver's license. So that's they talk about, about that a lot. That's one of the reasons he, he, he or one of the things he brings up about pulling her over. Now let's pay attention to how close he's sitting to the wall right now, because when we get toward the end, he gets closer and closer and closer, almost like he's being sucked into that corner in the wall right there. We're seeing a liar on guard at this point. So the illustrators he's showing us, I agree with you guys about the, the body armor and 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 the, the guarding of the groin and that stuff. But when you have that stuff on, if you'll notice a lot of cops, what they'll do is they'll they'll that they take so they take these weird postures when they when they've got that stuff on because it hurts up under here and it's tough up under here. So I see them hanging on like this, and and they'll put their hands up here to get them. Yeah, you'll see their hands up here to get the in the front of their of their belt and their and their thumbs pushed in because it takes that that uncomfortable stuff out from under your arms when you do that kind of thing. So I think in this case, what we're seeing. We're not seeing a whole lot of adapters here. I'm with you, Greg. We're not seeing a whole lot of them. But what we are seeing as adapters, that's when those hands go slap into the lap. I think that's what happens because when you slap your lap, you can feel those muscles contract just a little bit. And I think that's all he's got room for at that point. So he's he can do that and it looks fine to them. It looks normal because they they're they were he's talking to cops. So they understand the whole the whole body armor thing. Um for the most part, his illustrators are small. You're right, Mark. They're very small, they're very tight. And as we know from Alder Bray, what he would, he found in his studies were if someone's not being honest, if they're being deceptive, in other words, uh, their illustrators tend to be smaller or not as big. We do see some large illustrators, but those things go up like this. And so a lot of that is hand slapped down to his lap. Uh, and a lot, like Greg was saying, a lot of the, the hand rubbing on his legs, those kind of things. And that's, that's very, um, that's indicative of being deceptive. You see that all the time in that. I'm not the only one who thinks that. There's a lot of other studies that, that show that as well. You can't count on that as, as an adapter. That's the point I'm getting to on this. You can't count on because somebody rubs their leg that, that they're being deceptive, but boy, it sure shows up a whole lot. Um, we're hearing some fading facts in there as he talks. It gets quieter toward the end of what he's talking about. But 
to wrap all this up, we're seeing a liar on alert at this point. Do you remember her name? It was on the description. I don't. Okay. Um, do you make traffic stops normally after work? I don't, but in that case, I saw her swerve and whatnot, so I... I mean, me, I don't... Felt. I, get off work. <laughs> I know, I mean, people I cop say that is have a, you know, whatnot <laughs> right. to have the vision, whatever, but I felt like I needed to make that traffic stop. Okay. How was she? Was she respectful? Was she She not? felt like was she, she was nervous and whatnot, and I'm like, why are you nervous? And she was even crying. I'm like, why are you crying? Why are you nervous? What not? And she's just like, I don't know. I'm just nervous because you're a cop and I got pulled over. I'm like nothing you had to be nervous about. And I told her, I'm like, I don't really want to take you to jail for no SDL or anything. I just got off work. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. So with my officer, um, courtesy or whatnot, I said I'd go get that taken care of tomorrow. Way. And you don't have to. Exp I'm not going to sit here and go. Why didn't you right. take her to the doctor? No, I don't care. What about pants? Nothing in her pants, as far as I'm concerned. She was wearing tight jeans. So she said she pulled them down. I didn't see it. You didn't see her pulling down. I didn't see her pulling down pants. Could she have done it when you were up searching the car? She could have. I didn't Did have she her, have them on? I didn't have her handcuffed or anything. When you came back to the car and got her out, were her pants fastened? Were they? Yeah, everything. They was were still, up, and everything was still intact. So you never saw her pull her pants down. No, I didn't. Why do you think she's making this up? I don't know. Did you write her a ticket? I didn't. I let her go, and I said, "I said I want to arrest you for your no STL." Trying to figure out why she'd say that. I mean, I could see her saying it if you wrote her a ticket because she's pissed off. Right. Now, make it quite clear, if you saw her boobs, I don't care if she's flashing you. I did not see you her You did not breasts. see her boobies? No, I did not see her breasts. Is she saying you shined your light on her? I did not see her breasts. Where do you keep your flashlight? The left side right here, right behind my radio. Did you have your flashlight out on the traffic stop? I did. When she was going like this, did you have your I flashlight on her? like that. But I, as I'm out on the radio like this, I have it right or position over us, but I didn't. Right, but did you have it on her when you're talking to her so you can see her? Just I mean, was it her. on her when she goes like this? Maybe she could have right. construed to see, it. to see her inside the vehicle. Was the dome light on? The dome light was not on. It doesn't come on? I don't know how. Does that come on when you open your back door? Mm. It's been too long since I've been in a scout car. I can't recall, to be honest with you. <laughs> I don't, th I don't think the on? back, I don't think it does. This was the dome okay. light. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I love the interviewer's uh, gesture there, you know, as she kind of rattles her fingers there going, hmm, I can't really work out why this is happening. I think that's a signal to him. That's a signal to, to him of, of frustration. You know, we got to get this moving. You know, I, I got, we got to make sense of this. What's interesting from the angle that we have we can then see how she self-soothes after that. I think already she's feeling this isn't going as well as she would hope. This isn't quite as rapid as, as we would hope. Because this is like, let's move this along kind of gesture. And I'm quite active and enjoying this. And I'm enjoying the Inquisition. This for me says... I'm worried about this at the same time. So that's interesting. I also see when she looks away, he rubs his leg at the same time. Now I think that indicates that he's noticed she's not watching him at that point and it's a chance for him to self-soothe. So I'm concerned about his self-soothing as, uh, as she looks away. I'm also concerned about, just as you were saying, Chase, that she's looking not so confident ab about this. And that concerns me. But, but Chase, what, what do you think about it? I was laughing because I was doing those hand things under the table as you were discussing them. And I'm like, yeah, that is, that's what that feels like. <laughs> uh, there's one critical point here. There's a bunch of stuff here in the beginning, but right at this point where he's saying, I never saw her pull her pants down. He's slurring and softening speech at the same time when he's saying, no, I didn't. He didn't finish the word didn't at all. And guilty suspects are far more likely to do things 
like soften the severity of the words that we're using to describe a crime, they're also more likely to have vocal changes present uh, where three things typically happen. And number one is the fading volume. Or if you're uh, uh, in the bodylanguagetactics.com, you'll learn about fading facts a whole lot. And this, this is a critical thing you'll see a lot. Number two is words are less cohesive. And number three is more word usage. Instead of just no, they'll use more words. No, I didn't. No, I did not. And there's a, a doctor who wrote a book about this. I highly recommend. I get no kickback from this. His name is Dr. James Pennebaker. And this book is called The Secret Life of Pronouns. Fabulous book. I highly recommend it. Uh, but finally here, she asked, do you have your flashlight out on the traffic stop? He says, I did. And right there, there's no hesitation. There's a single head nod. He maintains eye contact. And he has some discomfort using words to describe shining the flashlight down her shirt. If you watch it again, when he's doing this shining motion with his hand, he's narrating with his hand, shining it down her shirt or miming that, there's some discomfort there. And I think you'll be able to see it. Doc, what do you think? Um, okay. I, th I think... When she says, uh, did, did she pull her pants down? He answers way too fast. He said, well, I didn't see it. Uh, and that, that, that's just for what he's been doing up so doing so far for the baseline. We've got him so far. That's way too fast. And, he's, and then she asked the interviewer asked, uh, did you write her a ticket again? Way too fast. I'm not seeing this thing where she's afraid of uh, to talk to the guy or nervous at all. And keep in mind, there's a guy sitting right across from him when he's when he's rubbing his hand on his leg. So I don't think he's sneaking a hand rub in there because that one guy is, is sitting right in front of him is like I'm facing you right now. So I, I think it's just nervousness. And that's the way he's adapting. I agree with you, Mark. That's the way he's adapting right there. But I, I'm not seeing the nervousness with her. You guys are seeing I'm seeing her step into this. Um, the way she should this looks the way it should to me i could i could it all looks it, it looks the way it should greg what do you think well guys if you go watch this whole video i i think what you're catching is she's projecting and that's what i think you're seeing mark because she's talented if you go watch this whole video she starts off building rapport and yeah. she's like potty mouth bad to try to get him to talk and it just i, I cut most of that out so i think what you're seeing is she transitions to make him feel a little more comfortable. And what is beautiful about this is he does a couple of dumb things. Number one, he's locked down. If you don't believe he's locked down, watch those feet bracing him back in the corner. A good interrogation room could fix this. If you got into where he had to move around and he was not wedged in there like you know a little fat potato stuck in the corner, then he would be in a better place. But she does a couple of really cool things. He does a nervous laugh and does some throwaway words when he says he didn't see her. There are two things that are incompatible in his denials. He says, no, I didn't see her take her pants down. And then he says in his voice to your point, Chase, and to your point, Mark, his voice drops. He does some kind of a fry and he says, I did not see her breast. Hmm, hold on. Which one of those things is true? Are they both true? Does he switch patterns casually that way? Most of us don't. So I would be hanging on there for a second. She's pretty damn good at picking up on source leads in later videos. So I wonder if she picked up on that. I don't know. Uh, but when you see him there, he's got his forehead up and lilting at the end as he says, no, I didn't write her a ticket. I think that's his normal communication style. If you'll pay really close attention to him, I think what you're going to find here is when he's prepared something, he uses his hands, he illustrates. When he runs out of data, you hit it dead on mark. Those hands drop and then he starts to adapt. If you want to know whether he's braced in the corner or not, really easy. Watch him. The minute she gives him that freedom to say, does the dome light come on? That's non-pertinent. In interrogator speak, that's non-pertinent questions. When she does that, he relaxes and takes that foot out of the brace position, moves out, adapts because his leg is feeling that pressure and the stress. But I'll go back to something else you covered, Scott, early. His head is tilted further in the corner now. So we're seeing him braced and pushing away. And I think we could be seeing a combination of a ploy by an interrogator that looks like X or Y. That's what I got. What about pants? Nothing in her pants as far as I'm concerned. She was wearing tight jeans. So she said she pulled them down. I didn't see it. You didn't see her pull them down? I didn't see her pulling down pants. Could she have done it when you were up searching the car? 
She could have. I didn't Did have she her, have them on? I didn't have her handcuffed or anything. When you came back to the car and got her out, were her pants fastened? Were they? Yeah, everything. They was were still, up and everything was still intact. So you never saw her pull her pants down? No, I didn't. Why do you think she's making this up? I don't know. Did you write her a ticket? I didn't. I let her go, and I said, "I said I won't even arrest you for your no STL." trying to figure out why she'd say that. I mean, I could see her saying it if you wrote her a ticket because she's pissed off. Right. Now, make it quite clear, if you saw her boobs, I don't care if she's flashing you. I did not see you her You did not breasts. see her boobies? No, I did not see her breasts. So she's saying you shined your light on her? I did not see her breasts. Where do you keep your flashlight? The left side right here, right down my radio. Did you have your flashlight out on the traffic stop? I did. When she was going like this, did you have your flashlight I didn't, I didn't on her? Like that, but I, as I'm out of the red, like this, I have it like uh, positioned over us. But I didn't. Right, but did you have it on her when you're talking to her so you can see her? Just I mean, was it on her when she goes like this? Maybe she could have right, construed to see, it to see her inside the vehicle. Was the dome light on? The dome light was not on. It doesn't come on. I don't know. Well, does that come on when you open your back door? Mm been too long since I've been in a scout car. I can't recall to be honest with you. <laughs> I don't, th I don't think the back, on? I don't think it does. That's what the dome okay. line. Little officers do too, so. Well, Daniel, this is, this is kind of one of the things that uh, we kind of bring in here to right. see how truthful you are. Right. Now you need to kind of, kind of think of a few different things here. Okay. Okay. We pulled up a lot of video around that area okay. after these allegations. Okay. Okay, she also have a SANE exam, which you know what that consists of. Right. There's a reason why we wanted your buckles. Okay. Okay. Now, I mean, we can go through a couple different things mm -hmm. of why we've got you in here, but you sure there's nothing you wanna? Nothing. So if we go off the video and watch that. Right. You're still gonna stick with your story. Yes, sir. If we go off DNA? DNA as well. Should we show you the video? If yes. You, you do want to see it? Do yes. So there's nothing that... You everything that I recall of that night is what I what was I asked and everything. That's what happened. If I, have I maybe not asked enough questions? I think everything covered as far as that. Chase, what do you got? This is a classic bait question, and it's done well. It's done well. We were collecting lots of data, and is there any reason we would see X is kind of the basic formula for that. But during the video question, you guys might disagree with me, but it's pretty good. He's pretty good in response to the video question. And if and guilty people, we're more likely to uh, see people to ask about the video like what video is it? Where is it from? And negotiate about what they should say, ask for a lawyer, probe the interrogator for more information. And his head nod and answer had no hesitation or breaks in eye contact, which I would have expected to see. And when they're uh, talking about a sane uh, exam. exam, this is a sexual assault nurse examiner. And if you've been sexually assaulted, I will give you a couple of tips here. This might save your life and might put somebody in jail if this ever happens to you. But number one, don't take a bath or a shower. Try not to use the toilet. Don't change your clothes. Don't comb your hair. Don't clean up the area where you're assaulted. And that will help this investigation. That will help to catch this bad guy. The interrogator's level of nervousness around bringing up these questions is kind of obvious here. There's some, we see pacifying, we see artery protection. I'll let you be the judge where the artery is. We protect arteries when we're scared. And we're also gonna see fidgeting, which is just expending or burning off some excess energy. I've got a bunch here, but uh, won't, uh, won't bore you too much. Greg, go ahead. Yeah, this is one of those great examples of a source lead. Remember, I always talk about when you're talking to somebody, they tell you what you should ask them when you're interrogating someone, and he does a great job of it. He goes to everything that I recall that night that was asked is what was asked, and she goes, hold on, did he just say, I've told you everything you asked me? And she goes right after him, and that's a beautiful thing when she does that because if you watch him, he's got his hands together. Now he's in what I call his stress fort. He's back in the wall. 
His feet are blocked. His feet are together. They're together. They're like in the position of attention, pointing toward that the guy who's asking a question. And he goes to some softening and respect when he says, sir, I'm not sure that may be a senior guy that is somebody in the department, maybe the reason. But you see his feet locked tight. You see his hands braced. You see him flex those thumbs when, when he gets cornered. And it is he's starting to lose language is a reason he can't finish a sentence to say, I, what I recall is uh, everything that was asked. And he's doing a little bit of that front of the mouth talking as he's being respectful. He's not asking questions back. He's only responding to what he's gotten and he's licking his lips. There's stress. If he were not in that little wedged in fort that he's got, we'd see a whole lot more movement. And if we had him sitting on a table or something where his feet were hanging, I bet you we would start to see his feet pointing toward the door. But watch his feet from here on out. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. I don't, I don't think they should have asked the question. When he answers the question about the, the cameras and stuff, I, I think he I think he he knows there are no questions there. I think she made or I think they made a mistake during that because you don't go in and, and do it like that. The good, um, in my opinion, the good bait question is, would there be any reason that you would be we would have any footage of you on camera they come on saying that we've got camera footage and we're go they may have it but i don't think they do and i think he knows they don't and that's why he looks so confident with that answer that that really that really but they're really good so they maybe they do have it and i'm missing it because they're they're great uh interviewers but i don't know that that that's the only thing that rubbed me wrong on this now when he says everything i recall happened by using the word recall he doesn't say no, he should be outraged at this point. He should say, no, you got camera footage. Let's get that in here, man, and be loud about it. Uh, he, he wouldn't be saying, well, sure, I'd like to see it. You don't, you know, if you ask if they want to, would you like to see that? Yeah, sure. I'll take a look at it. No, you say, yeah, you get that in here right now, man. Let's go over it. I want to show you that's not what happened at all. If you have camera footage, this is over, man. Let's take a look at it. That doesn't happen. That really... So he's not acting the way he should in this. He's confident because he know he's probably sure there's no video. But if he, but at the same time, he should have said, "Yeah, man, let's get a look at. It. I want to see what's going on." Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I believe the male interviewer here knows that bait question didn't get the effect that he was hoping to get because he 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 launches that bait question, doesn't get the gets the response, okay, and then the interviewer tuts afterwards there's a there's a vocal click afterwards he's upset that he didn't quite get the result the female there I, i'm with you chase it's interesting there's she's self-soothing right in here uh, for a long long time at the same time her foot is going 10 to the dozen there so there's a massive difference between what her feet are showing and what her thumb is doing on her wrist there as well I'm going to suggest that good as, as these two are, they have somebody in the room here who is not responding as in the way that others that have been in that room will tend to respond. Okay. I have a feeling that this is not going for them as deftly or, or fast, or it's not, it's they're not seeing the kind of responses they would like to see on any one day where you go, let's go in there, let's get this done, you know, and things would move along quite swiftly. It's not, I think, a normal day for them because we're seeing responses, we're seeing conflict in the female there, and we got that tut afterwards that it didn't hit just as they'd like it to hit. There, that's what I got on that one. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> what are you saying? What are you All saying? I'm saying is this guy's locked down pretty damn good. I mean, his body language compared to a lot of senior guys. I don't think he's been a cop at five years, but you know, he's learned a lot of stuff in five years. I, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a, I don't, he's, a, he's a player. I'm not seeing this. I I think what we're seeing with her is excitement. I think it's what we're Could saying. Be. I think she's trying to contain yeah. excitement. I don't think she's nervous. I don't think the other guys Could are nervous be. either. Same I same think, chemical. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I don't yeah. All I'm saying is there's conflict. There's conflict between what her foot is doing 
and the self-soothing here, which could be to calm down excitement, or it could be, I don't know what, I'm not a mind reader, but, yeah. but, uh, but I know there's conflict going on. Well, there. then the other thing, Mark, is I, I will tell you that being an interrogator and being in the room and trying to get somebody, you're animated as all hell yeah. mentally when you're doing it. You're like, you know, so some people bleed, others don't. And if she doesn't think he's, he's reading her, I guess she wouldn't care. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, officers did too, so. Well, Daniel, this is, this is kind of one of the things that, uh, we kind of bring in here to right. see how truthful you are. Right. Now you need to kind of, kind of think of a few different things here. Okay. Okay. We pulled up a lot of video around that area okay. after these allegations. Okay. Okay. She also have a SANE exam, which you know what that consists of. Right. There's a reason why we wanted your buckles. Okay. Okay. Now, I mean, we can go through a couple different things mm -hmm. of why we've got you in here, but you sure there's nothing you want to? Nothing. So if we go off the video and watch that, right. you're still going to stick with your story. Yes, sir. If we go off DNA? DNA as well. Should we show you the video? If yes. You, you do want to see it? Do yes. So there's nothing that you... Everything that I recall of that night is what I what was I asked and everything. That's what happened. If I, have I maybe not asked enough questions? I think everything covered as far as that. Well, I think you really, in all honesty, you need to really double think about this. I mean, I, I gotta be honest with you, it doesn't look really good. Okay. okay. I mean, in what you originally thought, detectives just don't roll up in there for no reason. Right. Okay. And we just didn't pick you out. out. Okay. Right. I mean, there's a whole line up there. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there's definitely enough here to bring you in here to start questioning you. Right. Okay. We knew you were on that stop. Right. We knew you were there. Mm -hmm. And we can watch a whole lot of actions being performed while you were there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's why she was trying to give you every out on the whole booby thing. Right. Okay. Now, is there any reason, any reason at all, even from whatever angle, because, you know, it takes a little bit to clear up those videos. Right. But any reason why your penis would be out? No. Nothing? Nothing. Okay. All right, I'll go first on this one. I think this is a classic bait question. This is the bait question. Is there any reason that da 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 And I think at this point, I don't know, maybe they do have it. It doesn't feel like they do. It doesn't feel like they do, but she's so excited she can hardly stand it. She's rubbing on her head and everything else. I really do think that's what we're seeing is the excitement there because they know they've got this guy because they've got a lot more information than they've let him know so far about what's happened before he got there, with with which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. But I think she's excited. I think the other guy, and he is the detective we can't see or the guy we can't see, he's doing such a good job. He's going right down the line of how you uh, to approach these questions and everything. It, it's almost like, uh, well, I think he's doing a really great job on that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So um, I think the issue for the uh, subject here is is the exam. Because on the exam, we get the elbow popping out. I can't remember what you call that, Chase, but I think you have a a, a, a name uh, for that one. If it's coming to mind, pop it in now. What's what's your name for that? It's a pugilistic or joust gesture. I love it. I love it. Joust gesture. Yeah, so lovely. So he jousts on the exam. That would suggest to me there's a there's a problem in that for him. He, you know, so that's interesting. He's anti the exam. Same time, he's resisting quite well. I, I get what everybody's saying about he's moving towards the, the the wall and he's and and we could say, look, he's locked himself down. It's very hard. It's clearly a lockdown because it's very hard to stay in that position for a long, long time. It's not a very natural position at all to steeple with your thumbs for that amount of time. So he's clearly locking it down, but he's getting quite a good result, I think. Um, Here's my problem with the idea that they have camera evidence. These videos are not helping. Well, what videos and how are they not helping? We're going to do the comparing and all that. What are you talking about? Compare what to what and what's all that? You know, why? why? 
Well, what's that about? But it's not looking good so far. It's not looking good. You, you're doing antithesis there. It's, it's uh, you know, if I were listening to that, I'd be thinking, you don't have anything, do you? You just don't have anything. And my worry would be on the exam. And I think that's why what he, what's happening here. His worry is on the exam and, and they're leaking for me too much that they don't have anything there. I don't think they'd be using that language if they had anything solid. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Yeah, if I were in a situation like this and given the opportunity to milk as much information out of the investigator as I could, I would do exactly what he's doing. I would lock down, I would brace. I probably wouldn't do it physically because I'm looking for body language tells. But this investigator is bleeding information in the beginning. I agree with you, Scott, his question is good, but he has filler words in the beginning. And he says, in all honesty, double think this. That's mm -hmm. time for him to think. If I'm sitting across from him, I know that he's trying to think. And he's doing, remember I say, good interrogator looks like a swan, but their feet are paddling like hell under the water. His feet are paddling like hell to do this. Then she's smart. Here's where I do think she's talented. She leans into him and gives him a break, the good cop, bad cop thing. And you see a little bit of a break in that lockdown. But his blink rate goes up a little. I can see a little bit of it there. And then he, this guy drops to a grunt to answer every question. It's barely a syllable. And then the one thing that I noticed that is interesting for me is there's disheartened response and sound that barely comes out of his mouth when he's saying no and nothing. It sounds a lot, Scott, like when you and I were talking to, no, when I hear that, that makes me want to dig in. But he's doing a great job of forcing them to give information and he's giving none. That's powerful. Chase, what do you got? This is a great example of him doing something that the this is the read technique is what we're seeing. We're, we're, and I think direct quote from the read training is building anxiety associated with deception. And what they're doing here is called data stacking. This is I'm stacking known data with suspected or assumed data together so that it has more credibility. And then there's the bait question, which is great. And if you ever hear these words yourself, stop talking and get a lawyer. <laughs> There's not much behavior to show here. Uh, there's a lot. And Scott, I agree with you about the excitement there. Uh, when I'm saying nervous, I, I refer to the exact same chemical. Okay. I refer to uh, adrenaline. Uh, and an Olympic athlete where it's excitement or an um, amateur where it's like I'm worried. Uh, yeah. So I think yeah, absolutely there's excitement there that she's thinking that there's something around the corner, that there's going to be yeah. some confession or something. I think there's a, actually a, a kind of a confident denial going off of his limited baseline that we have so far, that we've seen so far. And this is my opinion as I watched it this morning. And so far, it looks like a confident denial. But we're going to show you, I think, in the next few videos why it's not. Well, I think you really, in all honesty, you need to really double think about this i mean I, I gotta be honest with you it doesn't look really good okay. okay i mean and what you originally thought detectives just don't roll up in there for no reason bro okay and we just didn't pick you out out okay bro i mean there's a whole lineup there mm -hmm. okay but there's definitely enough here to bring you in here to start questioning you bro. okay we knew you were on that stop bro. We knew you were there. Mm -hmm. And we can watch a whole lot of actions being performed while you were there. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that's why she was trying to give you every out on the whole booby thing. Right. Okay? Now, is there any reason, any reason at all, even from whatever angle, because, you know, it takes a little bit to clear up those videos. Right. But any reason why your penis would be out? No. Nothing? Nothing. Okay. Now, in doing this, you know how saying exams work, and I ain't got to explain about DNA or anything like that. Right. Now, I didn't say you had sex with her. Right. Okay. But getting Okay. That is a different story. Right. Okay. You see my concern here. I'm just listening to you, sir. I know. That's my but I'd rather listen to you and you start talking. That's all I have, sir. 
Do, yeah. Are we are we gonna get something from the same exam? Go with the same exam. Do, and do you understand that you don't have to full blown to get something out of the same exam? Right. We can get skin cells. We can get pre. And do all that and still get DNA. Right. And or did your penis? No, it did not. Okay. Because DNA will clear it up. And here's the deal, too. I. It. We can fall on the sword. Okay. And say I screwed up or something. But if we say we didn't do it, we didn't do it, we didn't do it, and then the DNA comes back and says he did it then we have a huge problem. Right. We're here to give you the chance to fall on the sword so we don't we don't want a huge problem. We don't want a huge problem for you. Right. It's this is time. It's time. If you're if it touched her mouth, if it touched the inside of her mouth for one second, two seconds, three seconds, you gotta tell us now. Look, right. there's there's a huge difference. There's a huge difference in between being forced mm -hmm. and some and old girl who wants it right. okay we've had plenty of that we, we, we get that we know that okay but there is there is there is a big difference okay right but i'm just saying you know these videos ain't helping and um, we're going to do the comparing and all that okay okay but uh, it's not looking good so far okay okay and i don't want to see anybody go down for something that right. there was no force. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, he starts off, this investigator is painting a picture. Chase, you're dead on. He's stacking everything against him. He's trying to talk him down into this position where he's got nowhere to go. And he does a good job of talking to him that way. And if you want to know how I know that, it's because he's internalizing. Look at me, he's having an internal conversation with himself as his eyes drop down to his left while the guy's talking. Now, he is either tr thinking, how do I counter this? Or he's internalizing it and turning it into something useful for the investigator. It doesn't matter either way. He's impacting this guy. The guy's not just rigid sitting there. I think he does a great job of being father-like. There's probably something associated with him being senior in the, in the department, the reason he keeps referring to him as sir. But he projects and actually shows you what he's thinking when he does a nervous laugh and he says, I'm just listening to you, sir. He's telling him exactly what he's thinking. But that nervous laugh comes up again. We've heard this about three times and it's always around things that it shouldn't be. And then that's all I have, sir. And he does a quick head nod like, okay, that's it. When they ask you, what are we going to find when we use the sane? No is the answer, not go with the sane. No, you're not gonna find anything about me. There's nervous laughter again. Then he tucks his head and he leans back into the corner. We also see a little bit of jaw working. Mammals do that when we're thinking. It's just part of what we do. And you can see when pressure's rising, that happens. But he takes a deep breath. He backs into the corner. And then that officer tries to release it a little bit. This is just showing you that he's got a posture established of bracing himself and holding himself in that corner. I would love to see what happens when you pull him out of that corner because they've given him an out here. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so again, the female interrogator here is always full of some kind of conflict for me. I don't know why. Uh, if she were in some kind of professional conversation with me, I'd call it out and I'd go, hey, here's what I'm seeing about you. And, you know, what's going on for you right now? We get splayed hand on the table and the other hand protects the, protects the wrist joint and holds it down. That for me is a conflict going on. Just, and we'll see other conflicts going on the way. Again, I'm not a mind reader. I don't know why she's always in conflict and what the conflict is. But if it were a professional conversation between the two, she's in some kind of session with me or interview with me, that is something that I would go on and go, so I'm really curious, what's going on for you right, right now? Um, now, for him, I think as a generalization, the subject here, the denials are pretty good and strong. They, and I'm sure people will pick them apart and, and absolutely, but as a generalization, seem pretty strong and he's continuing with this steepling here as well. Now, again, what I've said before is that's hard to do. That's, you've got to make that your job. So now I start to go, clearly now this is your job 
to to nail this one down, button it down, and to come across with as strong a denials as you possibly can. And my guess is you probably have an idea of what those should sound like. So now it feels to me like he's definitely in this performance of resistance tactics. And as a generalization, his tactics are not bad. I mean, he's doing relatively well in this situation. Uh, Chase, what are your thoughts? We see a lot more read methods here uh, in play. And some of the ones we're seeing here are minimizing the situation, projecting the blame onto someone else, socializing it to where people understand, emphasizing the truth. So those are some of the key elements of, of read. And Daniel seems confident in his answers and seems confident about DNA a little bit as he was about the made up video. So he knew he probably knows the video thing is is made up. And as a quick note, if you're seeing closed off behavior here, you're probably also seeing uh, how most police are going to interact with internal affairs personnel, even when they're not under some kind of investigation. But they're comparing things, a oral thing versus actual intercourse. They're comparing uh, something willing versus something that's not willing. And this is an interrogation technique called the alternative question or alternative phrasing, where I'm saying, are, are you either uh, this guy who's done this 60,000 times or did you just make one little mistake? And that's what we're seeing right there. And we're still lacking uh, firmly stated denials, and we're also lacking emotions. The biggest emotion that we're really lacking here is anger. Innocent people get angry. Guilty people get angry. Innocent people stay angry. Guilty people's angry goes away relatively quickly. So I, the only critique I have of the interrogator here is falling on the sword is not a very good metaphor or choice of, choice of words to pick for him. Uh, him doing the right thing is dying on some sword. And in the end here, Scott, you said it before we we went live here. Uh, this is the point where the, the nodding started right at this point. And I'd love for you to talk about that. All right. Uh, his conf is, is not, is, 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 a, is not a confirmation nod. Uh, there, they'll, I think there'll be an argument about whether it is or not, but usually the confirmation nod, you say, I didn't do it. And they'll be doing like that. His isn't going with the words. His is, his, is, his is just up and down, up and down. There's no, uh, it's not in sync like an illustrator would be as you, as you speak. That kind of thing. So, yeah, I don't think that's happening when it comes to, to the hands on the desk, Mark. I think if her if her fingers hadn't been splayed out, I would say, yeah, there might be a problem there. But the, the more space you have between your fingers as you speak with someone, as you know, then the, the more confident they are with what they're talking about. Even though she's slapping there on the table, I got the feeling when I was watching that she was trying to creep up slowly to him so she could put her hand on him. I just knew that she was going to reach out and say, man, you know, you got to talk. You got to tell us what happened. But she didn't do it. She was she was right there. And the, when we were in here watching this, we, we talked about that a second. She was so close to doing that. And when he, when Hoskall says, that's all I have, sir, he would have a whole lot more to say, like Chase was saying, than that. He just wouldn't say, that's all I've got to say, sir. No, you're going to be mad. When you go into something like that and you tell somebody that you know something is, is one of the things you look for when you say, hey, when you sit down and say, we, they know you did this. There's no question about you doing it. I'm sure you're trying to find out what happened. Why did you do this? If you start off with why did you do this and that person gets mad, it's easy to look mad. Like you're saying, Chase, it's so simple. But the person who didn't do it, they're going to stay mad because they're, they're, they'll know they're there because somebody put them there. Somebody from their group of people said, no, that's the guy that did it or the girl, that, the woman that did it. And so they're going to be mad at that person too. And their anger is going to stay there throughout that. And they're going to keep going back to that. None of that here, nothing whatsoever in this thing. And again, they bring up the same exam. Now, keep in mind that that's the same thing as a rape kit. When you hear people say, oh, they use a rape kit, that's what they're talking about. Because it's, an, it's an, uh, a nurse who is specialized, has extra training to go along and do this as well, to, to get in there and be able to grab that evidence and collect it the right way to help put that person in prison uh, at the end. I'm getting all worked up here. I shouldn't be as worked up as I am. I'm going to try to calm down a little bit. Anyway, so that's what I'll 
I'll end there then before I get. So Scott, that chairs. might be the conflict that I'm talking about because because that's, that's right. what I said is that is that yep. she's confident they're splayed, yep. and she's got her other hand over the wrist holding that hand back. Ah, there Maybe you go. she does, which is the conflict that I'm talking about. Maybe she does want to go out and touch, but oh. there's conflict as to is this the right time to do it? Is this the best time? to do it and what I don't get is that is that conflict between the yeah. two you know okay I see what you're saying I got yeah. you I got you yeah that makes total I think you nailed it that makes total sense there yeah man now in doing this you know how saying exams work and I ain't got to explain about DNA or anything like that right now I didn't say you had sex with her right okay but getting okay that is a different story right okay you see my concern here. I'm just listening to you, sir. I, I know, I'm, but I'd rather listen to you and you start talking. That's all I have, sir. Do, um, are we are we going to get something from the SANE exam? Go with the SANE exam. Do, and do you understand that you don't have to full-blown to get something out of the same exam. Right. We can get skin cells, we can get pre and do all that and still get DNA. Right. And or did your penis No, it did not. Okay. Because DNA will clear it up and here's the deal too. I it we can fall on the sword. Okay and say I screwed up or something. But if we say, we didn't do it, we didn't do it, we didn't do it, and then the DNA comes back and says, he did it, then we have a huge problem. Right. We're here to give you the chance to fall on the sword so we don't, we don't want a huge problem. We don't want a huge problem for you. Right. It's, this is time. It's time. If you're, if it touched her mouth, if it touched the inside of her mouth for one second, two seconds, three seconds, you got to tell us now. Look, there's there's a huge difference. There's a huge difference in between uh, being forced mm -hmm. and some and, old girl who yeah. wants it. Right. Okay. We've had plenty of that. We, right. we, we get that. Right. We know that. Okay. But there is, there is, there is a big difference. Okay. Right. But I'm just saying, you know, these videos ain't helping and... I mean, we're gonna do the comparing and all that. Okay. Okay. But uh, it's not looking good so far. Okay. Okay. And I don't want to see anybody go down for something that right. there was no force. Enough of them. Okay. Cases that it didn't happen. The problem is is where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's why we wanted to hear your version of the story. Right. Whether we just go off of what we see and. And I mean, whatever this tests out as, right. okay. But, sir, so I'm I'm sticking with my story. I'm, I'm okay, <laughs> okay. On the video, are we gonna see her boobies? You shouldn't see her boobs. I didn't see her boobs. Okay. Are we gonna see her pull her pants down? I didn't see her pull her pants down. Okay. Are we gonna see your out? No. Nope. Are we gonna see your go in her mouth? No. Are we going to get any DNA to that? No. Let's switch up for a second. You had another girl, okay? Mm -hmm. You probably don't, not necessarily going to remember the name, but her name is Terry Morris, okay? Black female. Um, supposedly you promised her a ride to the city rescue mission. Did this ring a bell? No. You did a, a traffic stop with her. Uh, she thought you ran for warrants, was it clicking, you drove her around. Mm -hmm. no. name doesn't, I don't recall a name like that. Okay. She's claiming the same thing, the exact same thing. And here again, for whatever reason, the things are pointing at you again. Right. Now this was before even this incident this morning. All right, Chase, what do you got? The denials are semi-confident here. Only slightly worried denials showing stress is when she asks if they're going to find DNA. There's a little swallow muscle movement here. But the denial that he makes 
is only about her name. The denial is only about her name, which is a little suspicious. And this locked down behavior isn't suspicious on its own. So remember, a lot of what we're looking for are clusters of behavior, which indicate likelihood of deception. So the lack of denial here for the second woman is more telling of guilt. And him being truthful at certain moments does not equate to him being innocent. So let's get that completely out of the way. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, let's talk a little bit about this lockdown. <clears throat> I firmly agree with you that lockdown alone means nothing. However, when he's talking about something he's prepared, he's not locked down. His hands are moving. It's when he's in a bind that he has his hands and all that locked down. I'll, I'll give you a couple of things to look for here. If you've ever been in a situation where you just have been lambasted, beaten to hell up verbally, and you're in a situation where you can't do anything about it, you lock down. It's what humans do. We lock down and we sit there. I, I have, when I was in the old guard in Arlington Cemetery, I got my chewed by a sergeant major for 45 minutes one time. You know how I stood with my hands behind my back, listening and going, yes, sergeant major, no sergeant major. That's what you do, what you can't do anything else. He's talking to IA, he has no choice. If you're a rage filled person, you're also smart enough to know you don't let the monster out. You don't let the trigger hit you because when it does, you're gonna do something and you're really gonna look guilty then. So that containment may be, he may be a hothead, not saying he is, can't tell, but that lockdown gives a, a person who's hotheaded the ability to sit dead still rather than letting that trigger happen. We all know when the amygdala hits, what comes after that. So if you pay attention to him, he's nodding along with this guy, and then his face kind of recognizes what's going on. He's calling out someone else. The guy says, she said, she said exactly the same thing you did on this first one. Remember, the organism does what makes the organism successful. If this guy was doing sexual assaults and had a method of operation to do it, people are ritualistic around food, sex, and sleep. It's just the way our brains are wired. If you pay attention to this, you'll start to see he makes two really interesting fumbles here. He says, I'm sticking to my story. That's an odd choice of words to say, I'm not guilty. He also says, you shouldn't see that. And then when she says, are we going to see your, the weakest response possible comes out. It's another, no, it's a disappearing, or as you would say, Scott, fading facts. He breaks eye contact when she's asking him specifically about his, his body parts, her mouth, and DNA. And then he goes back to the mail. He, his blink rate increases. He takes that bone that was thrown and says, I don't remember her name. That's it. He doesn't go, I didn't know her, never met her. So we got a problem here. Scott, what do you got? What did you do to get yelled at for 45 minutes? Let's have that. <laughs> well, it's kind of a dumb thing. This guy was a hot head. Everybody knew he was hot headed. And I was helping somebody out. Another Sergeant Major whose daughter needed an ID card. I was trying to handle it. And I turned around and said to this Sergeant Major, I was on the phone and said, hey, Sergeant Major, you got to do it yourself. This Sergeant Major happens to walk in the room and hear me tell the Sergeant Major he has to do something for himself. And he just melts down. Uh -huh. And the other Sergeant Major standing there going, hey, uh, JD, um, um, trying to calm him down. No good. And he screamed at me for, no kidding, 45 minutes. I was a record for a while. Jeez. All right. Were you dating when the girl you're in the old guard, you don't, you don't talk back. You stand. Oh. Uh. It's got right. uh, Jay Leno did call. He said he wants his outfit back. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, this is a mistake. <laughs> I can't get this thing to work. <laughs> oh, Lord. That's funny. Okay, here's what I'm saying. His answers are very, uh, he's sitting really still. His answers are short. One word answers, one, two, or just tick, tick, these little, little pops of answers. And then again, you're right, Greg, where he says, I'm sticking to my story. That's weird. But he does that hand slap thing again as, as he's adapting. He doesn't get on the boobs question. And then uh, with any of these questions that, that you would get, anyone would get, you'd be animated at this point. You'd be all fired up. You'd be angry. You'd be outraged and nothing. Now, when they bring up Terry Morris, this is when he knows for sure he's had it, man. This is when he gets real still at that point. He's almost like freeze framed there. If you go back and look at him, just really he, he knows it's up at that point. The odds of somebody of, of you being in trouble for something and them talking to you about it and then having saying as well, and you know, it's a fact because you did it, them saying, hey, guess what else? Somebody else said the exact same thing that this girl said or this woman said. So what do you think about that? The odds of that happening are astronomically low. 
of two different people who don't know each other outside of that that happening to him so he's on the again the liar on guard this guy is in big trouble and he knows it mark what do you got yeah so i agree he's locked down and he's locked down hard at the moment i'm just super interested in the drama between him and the female uh interrogator here because i think her questions at the start aid his locking down i think she knows she's got some good strong kind of hints and questions going on there and then it hands over to the male and i think she starts to lock down at that point could be all for, for all kinds of reasons i don't know whether it's about she's super excited and she wants another go at him she thinks she's onto something or she's holding herself back because she wants to move away from the script that they have or certainly the process that they have i think there's all kinds of reasons but very interesting how um how there's some some slight mirroring between the two and it could be that it could be her going okay so he's he's being still and locking down i'll do that as well i'll join him on that i don't know what it's about but it's interesting for me enough of them okay cases that it didn't happen the problem is is where we're at right now mm -hmm. okay and that's why we wanted to hear your version of the story right. whether we just go off of what we see and and i mean whatever this tests out as right okay but so I'm, I'm sticking with my story I'm, I'm okay okay <laughs> on the video are we gonna see her boobies shouldn't see her boobs i didn't see her boobs okay are we gonna see her pull her pants down i didn't see her pull her pants down okay. are we gonna see your out no nope. are we gonna see your go in her mouth no are we gonna get any dna to that no Let's switch up for a second. You had another girl, okay? Mm -hmm. You probably don't, not necessarily gonna remember the name, but her name is Terry Morris, okay? Black female. Um, supposedly you promised her a ride to the city rescue mission. This ring a bell? No. You did a, a traffic stop with her. Uh, she thought you ran for warrants. You were clicking. You drove her around. Mm -hmm. no. Name doesn't. I don't recall a name like that. Okay. She's claiming the same thing, the exact same thing. And here again, for whatever reason, the things are pointing at you again. Right. Now this was before even this incident this morning. She didn't offer that. Mm -hmm. She was nervous. Like I said, she cried earlier. Did what she cry know? as soon as you? stopped her or after she was in your car when did she start crying i think in the car yeah what made you let her go number one to be you? to be honest okay. i want to get home then I why'd wanted... you pull her over it, <laughs> like i said earlier i just cop swerve dui and well, if i had if i had, if I, had if I know if i had to do it i would have done it but i didn't think that she was past the legal limit That's just, I mean, I just would avoid that if I, did you at any time, you said you picked her up around 50th and Lincoln. I mean, when you just, saw her swerve, right. did you at any time, were you always behind her or did you pull up beside her to maybe see who was in the car and then no, pull back she, behind her? She was at 50th and Lincoln, swerved and I was behind her. So I felt behind her. And then wait you, till were you ever away. beside her? No. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I think we see a big tongue jut from him right at the start of this. I think there's some attrition happening. I think there's some breaking happening there. And I think the female interviewer knows that at this point. I'm gonna, I reckon the conflicts that we see in her, because we see them again, we see the, the, the hand being comforted uh, between the legs. We see her go and touch her ankle as well. And I think we see that when she thinks she's onto something, when she's getting excited, when she thinks it's actually moving in the right direction, she starts to suppress, restrain herself, soothe herself, to calm it down because I think she might be like a dog in the trap. And once the rabbit is running, like 
the dog's out and she's she's going to be after it and she's going to get it. And I think it might be her way of just keeping herself calm and locked down so she, she doesn't make a potential mistake of going too fast, too far, and, and plays it by, um, I think, I guess, the methodology and the rhythms that are proven to work time after time after time. Though when the dog sees the rabbit, you want to you wanna go for it. But lovely to, to, to see that elements of self-soothing there and adaption there. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Yeah, so this is him with what he's prepared to talk about. And this is later in the interview from the first part. When he gets back to something he's prepared to talk about, he strings phrases together. He's no longer doing these single single syllable utterances. He even appears to have a little bit of a smirk. His hands and body are out of that fortress mode, and now he's just guarded. His hands are still up here. Uh, but his head and neck are moving, and he's paying attention to the person he's talking to. He goes with his brow up, and he says, to be honest. Well, to be honest... People will say that means you're lying. To me, it means that you are in a push-pull word. What does that mean? I want to ask and negotiate why you use that word, and I want to dig in. Well, what do you mean, to be honest? I thought that's what we were doing, and I'll go at you that way because now I get to create some stress in you as I'm talking to you. Then when he says, I didn't want to ride her, and, 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 and she asks a simple logic question that causes him to have nervous laughter. This is where I would dig in. He stammers. He does a nervous laugh. And then he goes to the Roundsburg mantra, you know, we're back to phone, dash, floorboard, whatever it is. He's using words. He's saying cop, swerve, chickens, whatever, because his brain is now losing the ability to use language. Anytime he feels like he's credible and he has a prepared story, he's illustrating, he's making eye contact, and he's out of that grunt and block. Grunt and block is his style when he thinks he's in a bind. So I think we're seeing something that will matter. Scott, what do you got? All right. Uh, shoot, he went over a lot of stuff I was going to do. But let's talk about his, about his illustrators. They're not in sync. And they're just, they're really odd at this point. When he said, uh, um, to be honest, he's still doing the leg slapping. We're still seeing all that stuff going on. He's still using his adapters that way. And then he's, as he's speaking, as he's not speaking, he's using the, his illustrators to, in place of the words. It's just really, it just looks weird. Man, at this point, that's somebody whose head is on fire in there. They can't. Uh, I, I think he, he. I think he knows it's up at this point. Okay, who's got a haircut like Kim Jong Un? Okay, that'd be Chase. Go ahead. What do you got? <laughs> so, uh, this reminds me of uh, eating kimchi. <laughs> while testing nuclear weapons <laughs> trying to think of somehow to tie that in I couldn't <laughs> if this if he's truthful that means this woman made up the statement completely falsified the statement to the police if she falsified a statement to the police she has committed a crime if she has committed a crime she is a perpetrator and guess what has vanished in every moment of this entire interview, there is no perpetrator. The vanishing perpetrator strikes again. One cool thing, you guys covered a whole lot. Uh, right at the beginning, there's two adjustments of the thumbs, right when he locks back down again. And this is preparation to get them in the right place so that his body is locked in position. And you'll see this much more than you could possibly think. You'll see it if you're watching somebody pitch you on an idea. And Scott is uh, excellent at, at doing that kind of stuff. But right here, where he's just reciting these words, that is untruthful because he has not done this before. Some people just speak in these little nouns or these just like nouns and verbs. But he does not. He never has. Throughout, and this is a long interview. He never does that. So this is a huge, massive uh, red flag here. And right there, when, when they're talking about besides her, it looks honest, probably due to the reasonable expectation. Uh, like, did you come up beside her in the vehicle? He's, he looks honest here, probably because he knows there's no street cameras in that area where he was initially flipping his lights on and, and doing the stop. She didn't offer that. Mm -hmm. She was nervous. Like I said, she cried earlier. Did she cry as soon as you, stopped her or after she was in your car when did she start crying the thing in the car yeah what made you let her go 
Never wanted to be. To be honest, yeah. I want to get home. Then why'd you pull her over? It, <laughs> like I said earlier, I just cop swerve DUI. And if I, had, if I had, if I had, if I had, I know if I had to do it, I would have done it. But I didn't think that she was past the legal limit. That's just I mean, I just would avoid that. If I did you at any time, you said you picked her up around 50th and Lincoln. I mean, when you it's saw just, her swerve, right. did you at any time, were you always behind her or did you pull up beside her to maybe see who was in the car and then no, pull back she, behind her? She was at 50th and Lincoln, swerve, and I was behind her, so I felt behind her. And then wait you, till were you ever away. beside her? No. Did your pants come unzipped, unbuttoned, anything while you were standing right there? No. CSI is processing your car right now. Right. And when we stepped out, they found some pubic hairs right in here. Could they be yours? No, that's not. I didn't pull my out and didn't do anything right there. Did she? No. But she do you think they could be? No, it's not. No. Nothing of mine. Your pubes couldn't be no. right there? No. Has your ever been out Do by I'm your car? While I'm working? No. Not working? No. Have you ever had sex in the back seat of your car? I have not. Because, I mean, some people do. You know, no. I mean, I'm not saying forced sex, consensual sex. Right. So your ass has never been in your back seat? Mm -hmm. Is not it possible any of this DNA shares? No. It's not. That's, I would like to go, go at it. Not my DNA. Are those pubes going to be yours? No. No. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I think she makes a mistake and she realizes she makes a mistake here because she gets married to a concept and follows it too far. She asked him about hair from a specific part of his body and whether or not that could be in the car. And she just goes at it and at it and at it and at it. And he may not have hair on that part of his body. And I think he is strong and confident in his denial and laughs about it, not in a nervous laugh, in an outright laugh. So. He didn't direct answer some of these things. He goes back to that fortress. He's in that single syllable until she brings this up, and then he's comfortable. He says, she asked him, did you pull your body part out? And he says, I didn't pull it out. And she picks up that source lead. Well, maybe he didn't, maybe somebody else did. So he, she brings that up and he goes, eh, well, uh, no. And then he tucks his chin in, inhales, and goes to a throw it. No, again, something's up there. He locks down tight. She missed that question about maybe he doesn't have hair. And then she goes another source lead where he says, working, no. She gets it and she goes after him. He goes back into that lockdown and there's nervous laughter. But you can see that he feels like he had a win right here. I think she makes a mistake. Scott or Chase, what do you got? During this uh, pants question, the chin goes down a little more than normal. And this is a protective behavior. And when they're talking about the hair, the denial, listen closely when you go back. The denial about the hair is about location, about where all this took place. The denial is it didn't happen there. It didn't happen she right that there. Too. Yep. And in truthful people, it's more common. They encourage the testing and the analysis of evidence instead of just making a little denial. And are we going to cover 11? I hope so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll get to it. That's all I got. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Uh, so what interests me and is becoming kind of apparent from hearing what you're saying, because again, I'm fresh into this. I don't know the outcome of any of this. And I heard from Chase in between videos that this guy does some kind of bodybuilding. He's a, you know, he's a big, big lad there. So that might suggest why he's calling them on the DNA from hair because there may not be hair in a certain place. Also, it speaks, now I understand he's a bodybuilder, he may well be taking testosterone, which will also mean that he's going to see the world as not so threatening, less risk in the world, which might be why he's managing to keep 
relatively, from what we might expect somebody to do in this situation, relatively calm and collected and knuckled down because he may not be seeing the threats that you and I would be feeling and experiencing in this situation. That's what testosterone, one of the things that testosterone does, it makes the world look way, way less risky to you. And that's why I think, so we get this pen click from her at the end, which would normally, it's an adapter and it's a pacifier because we hear it again and again and again. We might ascribe to uh, some kind of stress, pressure, anxiety, Based on what you've said there, Greg, maybe there's a feeling from her that she missed something there, that she's played it just that little bit wrong. We get the anxiety there. She turns to her partner in that sense of, I think you need to take over or you take this one or where are we going to take this? Because it didn't quite hit how we'd like it to hit. I think he's calling out the DNA there and going, I don't think you got anything on that one. Uh, Scott. Anything more to add on that one? Yeah, just a little bit. I agree with you. I think she's, she's, but it's like a, a car that's trying to get over a hill or something or get over the bump and it can't quite do it, but it keeps backing up. Yeah, that's what I think that, that pin thing is about. I think she's all worked up at that point. I think she, she, I feel the same way you guys do about it. Did your pants come unzipped, unbuttoned anything while you were standing right there? No. CSI is processing your car right now. Right. And when we stepped out, they found some pubic hairs right in here. <laughs> Could they be yours? No, that's not, I didn't pull my out and didn't do anything right there. Did she? No. Do so you think they could be? No, it's not, no. Nothing of mine. Your pubes couldn't be no. right there? No. Ever been out by while your I'm, car? While I'm working? No. Not working? No. Have you ever had sex in the backseat of your car? I have not. Because, I mean, some people do. You know, I mean, I'm not saying forced sex, consensual sex. Right. So your ass has never been in your backseat? Mm -hmm. Is it possible any of this DNA shares? No. It's not. That's, I would like to go, go at it. Not my DNA. Are those pubes going to be yours? No, no. We've had so many people sat in that same chair right. that tell us all day long, I didn't do this, I didn't do this. They promise on their baby, on their mama. Right. They promise to God. And then they come right back. We get back these tests and you can't get out of it. You right. know, I mean, once you kind of get basically kind of locked into something there there's no talking about it right and that's why we would try to give a person every opportunity right because if the tests come back you ain't coming back in here because we're here we have a woman that says about you know basically being right okay and right. we're calling it by force and all that big difference between that and a hookup right and to come back if if there's something there and you say no and she said it was that you know, you see where we're going. Right, with this. I do. And that's why we always try to give every angle. Right. We wasn't there. Right. So we just got to go off of everything that we see and, and have. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you understand? No hookup. No hookup. Not even a little hookup. No, not a little hookup. No booby. No booby. I saw no breasts. Did she see your? No. I'm just trying to think of anything that she could have misconstrued or why. Why did she go to all this trouble? I don't know. Did you do anything that pissed her off? And that's what I'm saying. I don't think I did anything when I was talking to her. I don't know, wasn't rude. She was cooperative. I wasn't at a point where I'd be like, okay, you're going to jail or something or whatnot. I don't think I made any like threats to make, you know, to get in the car, like I said, or anything like that. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so I, I like the way she goes on this, which is to lighten the mood there. You know, quite an animated voice there, almost a cartoon character, a very young cartoon character. N you know, uh, not even a little hookup 
she says, trying to lighten the mood. She's using childish words now or colloquial words for, you know, parts of the body, the secondary female characteristics and uh, softening that. But it's interesting. He's going for anatomical words, more adult words around that. So he's not going to join her on this particular you know, route that she kind of quite like him to take to soften this idea. More anatomical, more adult there. Uh, you know, I love what she's doing with her, thing, her fingers there. She's she's super excited. And I don't know whether she's trying to indicate that to him, like we're running out of ideas and trying to get him to fill stuff, or this is truly her. She gets excited and she has to calm herself down. But what most... Um, jumps out for me is I wasn't rude. I don't think I made any threats. Well, if you're very definite about that, you weren't rude, but you're uncertain. I don't think that I made any threats. I mean, I think you would, you would know if you know, you're not rude, you know, you didn't make any threats. So, so there's a strong possibility for me that some threats were made there. Scott, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I agree with you on that part. Again, he's not reacting or responding the way he should for this kind of thing. At some at some parts, he's laughing, and his brain just must be on fire, man, because he knows he's against the wall at this point. But he's still doing that, like Greg talks about that nervous laugh. Good lord, I mean, it's just so. That's got to be so tough on his, on 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 what's going on on him and his brain in there. Uh, and there's that wall again. You know, he's getting closer and closer, backed in that corner. Now, physics tells us if he gets any closer to that crack, to that corner, he's going to be able to see into the future at this point. So I don't think he can get any closer than that without saying, okay, it's over. And his answers are really quiet. They're not forceful, not even a little bit. I, I think he knows. I think he knows it's up. He's still, I don't know. I, I just think there's, there's, there's not much left here for him to to defend and I think he knows that's why it's getting so weak I think at this point Chase what do you got I think at this point this is where the bait question should really be hammered in this mm -hmm. is the spot this is the location for the bait question and the, the perfect one especially in many of these cases that are just like this is is there any possible way that this person could accurately or even remotely describe your genitals or pubic area in any way. And if they can describe it, the person's going to have to wonder, like they've gotten some kind of testimony. What has this person said? How, what have they gotten from this other person? But the technique she's using here is called narrative scarcity. And this is your last chance with us here. Once we walk out of the room, we can't help you. And this is it. We want to make sure that your story's right. We want to help you get this, get ahead of the problem, all this kind of stuff. And this is the last chance. But he actually says the words, I don't think I made any threats. How could any human being who, especially a law enforcement officer, be uncertain about whether or not there was some threat to get a person into the back seat and take off their pants? It's surprising uh, to me that they didn't just jump into this with like a 12 gauge. Anyway, uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, guys, I, I had my threat comment here. You guys have covered that in great detail. So I'm going to jump to something else. Every interrogator on earth knows to use threat and rescue. Good cop, bad cop, Mutt and Jeff. There's names for it everywhere. And if you don't believe that, the people who came back from Vietnam from the Noi Hilton called it threat and rescue. They could identify the ploy that was being used by the North Vietnamese interrogators. So it's common and it works and here's why it works watch what happened here he's locked down he sees the threat as the the male investigator clearly because he's in fortress again and he's being helpful and grunting little short syllable answers and then she jumps in there mark with your funny joking and she becomes the good cop that gets him to start talking again and when he starts to talk he starts to bleed information he does that nervous laugh he's in fact amused look at his face he's falling for the fact she's just like using childlike words if you don't think it's working here's the best one to show you he starts to illustrate again and his feet turn and face her they point toward her something is going on in his head and that's how we always know a, a lot of times i'll often say I'm always the threat, so somebody else can be the rescue. The guy who is raising a lot of noise and putting pressure on somebody is a prop. 
the interrogator is the person who's being friendly. And you just need to know that. Watch what happens. We've had so many people sat in that same chair right. that tell us all day long, I didn't do this, I didn't do this. They promise on their baby, on their mama. Right. They promise to God. And then they come right back. We get back these tests and you can't get out of it. You right. know, I mean, once you kind of get basically kind of locked into something, there, there's no talking about it. Right. And that's why we would try to give a person every opportunity. Right. Because if you know, the tests come back, you ain't coming back in here. Because we're here we have a woman that says about, you know, basically being. Right. Okay. And right. we're calling it by force and all that. Big difference between that and a hookup. Right. And to come back, if, if there's something there and you say no, and she said it was that, you know, you, you see where we're going. Right, I do. And that's why we always try to give every angle. Right. We wasn't there. Right. So we just got to go off of everything that we see and, and have. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you understand? No hookup? No hookup. Not even a little hookup? No, no, not a little hookup. No booby. No booby. I saw no breasts. Did she see your... No. I'm just trying to think of anything that she could have misconstrued or why. Why did she go to all this trouble? I don't know. Did you do anything that pissed her off? That's what I'm saying. I don't think I did anything when I was talking to her. I don't know, was it rude? She was cooperative. I wasn't at a point where I'd be like, okay, you're going to jail or something or whatnot. I don't think I made any like threats to make, you know, to get in the car, like I said, or anything like that. I didn't hear a lot of drunk questions, you know, like uh, how much have you been drinking? Mm -hmm. um, mainly it's just have you been drinking, trying to get her confessed, see anything inside that juice? No. Um, why are you driving so late at two o'clock? I don't know where are you going. Going to Arbor uh, on the west side. Where are you? Who are you gonna see? Just trying to just talk to her. But, okay, uh, right there. Those questions maybe took forty seconds. Fifteen minutes. And you said five at the car. So then we got ten of a lot of questions. Right. Okay. I mean, you tell me I wasn't there. I mean, obviously, and, uh, I don't have any audio. And, uh, and, uh, and that's what I'm saying. Roughly on a traffic stop, take about 20 minutes. It was the quickest traffic stop, about 15 minutes. That's your quickest traffic stop? No. Okay, you're a slowpoke. I'm not. I don't, I don't really get 1090 at all or anything like that, but I I take but, my time sometimes. But you didn't write her tickets. Didn't write her ticket. You didn't write her. Didn't write her. You didn't even put yourself out. Didn't put myself How out. How could you take 15 minutes on that? Just talking. I must have been talking. So that's it. I don't. I can't see her wanting to talk if she's crying and asking if you're going to shoot her and all this. I don't see her being real forthcoming with conversation. Whether my questions or whatnot, that's it. I'm Chase, what do you got? So I've got one sentence here. Uh, to describe the whole scenario that we just saw in this clip. The woman has details for those 15 minutes. He does not for those 15 minutes. That's all you need. And this is textbook concealment decision. It's, it's, it's deception. We're think, we got to think in terms when you watch any of these videos in the future, what's being hidden, what's missing. And this is exactly what I call a detail valley that any time there's tons of tons of details and then it goes into a valley where there's no detail whatsoever and it's skipped over and then it goes right back out. So when you hit a detail valley, there's a ton of stuff missing. There's something being concealed. That's all I got. Scott? I think this is the worst for him so far. And he's talking about pulling over another person, not running them and not giving them a ticket and not putting himself out when they, when they, Talk about running them. That means they're they're uh, seeing who they are. They're um, call it. They are seeing. Are they a criminal? Or do they have a background that's not good? That kind of thing. And when you say uh, putting yourself out, you didn't put yourself out. He's when you pull someone over. Like I said, I'm not a cop. Never been one. But I know this is 
what they do is they when you, you call it putting yourself out or, or I'm out at. So you tell the dispatcher where you are. So if anything happens, I know where to send people. So anything comes up. Nowadays, you can see where they are on a big map. But that's what that's what they're talking about there. If this guy is doing that, if he pulls up somebody, pulls them over and doesn't even say, hey, I'm pulling somebody over, something's up. And it's not the first time he's done it. So I think this is the worst for him so far. Greg, what do you got? Let's make it this very simple. Most lies are going to fall into four categories, all lies, omission, commission, embellishment, or transference. Now, lies of omission, I'm going to tell you the whole story except for the bad parts. That's exactly what he's doing. He's hiding time. Well, the reason they're asking him about time is they know procedure. They probably wrote it. They're senior officers. So what they're doing is they're saying, you should have done these things. Why didn't you do that? And why did it take so long for you to do the things that you did do? So if you walk through the whole process, you get him starting off. He's editing as he speaks. He says Arbor, not Ann Arbor. He earlier said Ann Arbor. He is now saying Arbor. He does a, high, a hard eye contact with her when she calls him out and said that should have been 40 seconds. Hard eye contact. He recognizes the threat and his face kind of looks fallen. If you notice, his lower face goes flat. He's gone from brace now to putting his hands in front of his groin and his body slumps. That's pre-confession. That's getting to pre-confession when you get there. He pushes his feet together and forward, and then he goes back to this whole thing of bracing. And she brilliantly comes back to that good cop release. And she gets him comfortable enough when she starts joking around with him about being a slowpoke that he actually adapts, moves around, and then does the batter on box, rubs his thighs. That's powerful. That means she just realized she's got to play the good cop. He, he, when he says talk, he must have been talking. She turns it around on him, goes at him again really hard and says, why would she talk to you? See his mouth, his forehead and his head shake and the rise of his hands. I can't explain it. She knows he can't. She's got him on the ropes. Mark, what do you get? Yeah, totally agree. That lightning of the situation with the slow poke, which seems like a bit of a joke, but it's kind of a neg move, draws him in. He emits the laughter. You get that self-soothing with the hands on the legs there, and he's now moved into her. Um, my, uh, my, th that whatnot, go back and replay whatnot. If it was, if whatnot wasn't important, you just get whatnot. Okay, what we get is what not. There's about three or four movements in the knot. That means that there's something unsubstantial in that. There's something hidden in it somewhere. Like what is what is ten minutes of what not? It's like go go back and, and listen to it. It's an extraordinary piece of music that goes on there. Uh, so beautiful move there and elicits from him not only self-soothing but a cadence in one word that is totally out of his baseline go back listen to it let's see some samples on the internet of that you know let's get dead mouse doing a full a full extended 45 version dance mix of that one it's gonna be amazing okay <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear a lot of drunk questions, you know, like uh, how much have you been drinking? Mm -hmm. oh, mainly it's just how have you been drinking, trying to get your fist, see anything inside that juice? No. Um, why are you driving so late at two o'clock? I don't know, where are you going? Going to Arbor uh, on the west side. Where are you, who are you gonna see? Just trying to just talk to her. But, okay, uh, right there, those questions maybe took 40 seconds. 15 minutes? And you said five at the car. So then we got 10 of a lot of questions. Right. Okay. I mean, you tell me it wasn't there. I mean, well, obviously, I don't have any audio. And, I'm, 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 and that's what I'm saying. Roughly on a traffic stop, take about 20 minutes. It was the quickest traffic stop, about 15 minutes. That's your quickest traffic stop? No. Okay, I'm, you're a slow poke. I'm not, I don't, I don't really get 1090 at all or anything like that, but I, I but, take my time sometimes. But you didn't write her tickets. Didn't write her ticket. You didn't write her. Didn't write her. You didn't even put yourself out. Didn't put myself How out. How could you take 15 minutes on that? Just talking. I must have been talking. So. That's it. 
I don't. I can't see her wanting to talk if she's crying and asking if you're going to shoot her and all this. I don't see her being real forthcoming with conversation. Whether my questions or whatnot, that's it. Uh, well, let's throw it around the room and uh, see what we get. Let's wrap it up in 30 seconds or less and say what we think about what we see. Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, I didn't know where this one was going to go at the, at the start. I mean, it, it starts it starts quite lightly, and I'm not sure, sure exactly how well uh, these interviewers are going, and the subject there is really locked down, but it doesn't take many moves to elicit what we get in that last video. And as Greg was saying, he's he's on the ropes and he's on his way out, and um, I, I think he's he's inside and he's doing time, as he as he very well should be. Chase. I'll just do it one sentence here. The problem with locking down is that it either shuts off or screws up the behaviors that should be there with a truthful person. It shuts them down, screws them up. Greg? Yeah, you can hide a lot of things, but you can't hide everything. And when you choose to make a way of behavior work for you, and it's that lockdown, the Hulk, I'm going to grunt and I'm going to sit there and embrace myself. Anytime that changes, it's a deviation in baseline, and that's what we all love. Scott, what do you got? I think this is a great example of two interrogators working well together. I think they've, they've probably done this for a long time, and I think they did an excellent job, actually. And uh, watching this guy, he doesn't change a whole lot. A lot of people are going to think this is, may think this is fairly boring because he's not doing a lot. But as, as you've seen from us talking about him, there's a whole lot going on there. So I think that's it's a good lesson, I think, to see or to, to understand that just because there's not a lot going on that you can see once you become observant and know how to observe these things, this is what we're trying to teach you. Then you see all these these little things are such a big deal. So that's what I got. All right, fellas, I think this was a good one and uh, we'll see you next time. See you. Mr. Holsclaw, this jury finds you guilty of the various uh, counts. You will be remanded to the custody of the Oklahoma County Sheriff for formal sentencing set January 21st, 2016 at 10 o'clock a.m. The behavior panel. Mark the other oh, direction. There you no, go. the other out. direction. Behind oh, where you go. That, that way. Yeah. You know. Me too. You're good, Chase, right where you are. What are we are. supposed to be doing? Just this? Yeah, I'm going to go like this. I'm going to go. Right. Like that. So, so up at this corner, like we want yes. the top corner of our box. Yeah. Right. Okay. Me and Greg want the bottom corner of ours. Yeah. So yeah, you look good. So come closer. It's a little bit closer, uh, Chase. A little bit closer, Greg. And we just want faces. Not I can't hands. get any closer than that. Yeah, just go. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You ready? So, yeah, but Greg, you look down in the corner. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Okay, ready? Here we go. Yeah. Hey, help. Hey, help. We've heard cases come to a verdict, come to an end, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Greg, why don't you tell us about the video we're going to watch? Yeah, we're going to watch a couple of minutes of this video from the verdict. We're not going to watch the entire 42 questions being read. It's more of the same. We'll cover what we see here and tie that back to the entire case. Is this the verdict of the jury? Yes. All right. Is it unanimous? Yes. Thank you, sir. Do you find that Mr. Depp has proven all the elements of defamation? Answer, yes. Has Mr. Depp proven by a greater weight of the evidence that question, the statement was made or published by Ms. Hurd? Answer, yes. The sta question, the statement was about Mr. Depp. Answer, yes. Question, the statement was false. Answer, yes. Question, the statement has a defamatory implication about Mr. Depp. Answer, yes. Question, the, de the defamatory implication was designed and intended 
by Ms. Hurd? Answer, yes. Do you find that Mr. Depp has proven by clear and convincing evidence that Ms. Hurd acted with actual malice? Answer, yes. Do you find that Mr. Depp has proven by clear and convincing evidence that Ms. Hurd acted with actual malice? Answer, yes. As against Amber Heard, we the jury award compensatory damages in the amount of $10 million. As against Amber Heard, we the jury award punitive damages in the amount of $5 million. Do you find that Ms. Heard has proven all the elements of defamation? Answer, no. Do you find that Ms. Heard has proven all the elements of defamation? Answer, yes. Do you find that Ms. Heard has proven all the elements of defamation? Answer, no. As against John C. Depp II, we, the jury, award compensatory damages in the amount of $2 million. As against John C. Depp II, we, the jury, award punitive damages in the amount of $0. Members of the jury, if this is your verdict, please answer yes. If this is not your verdict, please answer no. Juror number six. Yes. Juror number 10. Yes. Juror number 15. Yes. Juror number 16. Yes. Juror, juror number 22. Yes. Juror number 27. Yes. Juror number 29. Yes. All right, I do find that the jury's verdict is unanimous. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, the first thing we're going to hear from everyone is these are actors. Yes, they are actors, but they still have the same biological systems you do, fight, flight, I'll, I'll abbreviate it as fight or flight, impacts them the same way it does. When we watch her here, we're going to see some of that happening. You see her blink rate increase. You see her cast her eyes down and to the right as she is drawing an emotion. What's interesting for me here is I also, if you watch that little necklace, you'll see some breathing happening. And it's a little erratic, like she's emotional. This emotion is believable, unlike what she's done for the past two weeks on the stand. This is more, I've watched more of her than I ever want to remember and more of Johnny Depp than I ever want to remember. And I like him. So what I see here is her Throughout this trial, her choices of diction, what she says, pitch, tone, and cadence were not believable. Her social response, how she dealt with the attorneys, was difficult. And she showed two faces, one to the attorney and one to the jury, as she mugged for or cheesed for the jury. Um, we also saw some outright avoidance and resistance to the question that brings up the interrogator in me and made me wanted to crawl all over her. And in these places, I saw her more emotional about disrespect Go watch the videos. I, I saw more disrespect emotion than injury emotion, which made it hard for me to believe. And she swung for the fence when she talked about the things he had done to her. That makes it hard to really believe her. And then when he was deceptive, his deception was mostly around things he had said or things he had written. That ties back to the disrespect thing. So when all things are said and equal and you're looking at a he said, she said story and somebody swung for the fence, it's a little tough when she's not believable. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, at the beginning, when they start reading the uh, the verdict, uh, reading the, the damages and stuff, we see her eyes shift back and forth really quickly. She's, I think, getting a grip on what's happening. I'm not sure what's in front of her. I don't, I don't know if there's a sheet of paper, if there's something she's reading or what. But briefly, you can see her eyes go back and forth. Her breathing rate, like you were seeing, Greg, saying, Greg, it does go. It, it, it's kind of odd. At some some points, it speeds up. Some points, it slows down. And I, I agree that that might show some true emotion because the hammer is falling on her right now. And that's going to be an emotional event for you if you're in a, in a mess like this. The, the expression she has is pretty blank. A lot of people say, oh, it's a stoic expression, which I agree it is. At the same time, it's just, it's, it's almost, uh, I think she's, I don't know who she's playing to at that point, but she just looks really, really, really sad as she should. Um, her head goes down just for a second and then it comes back up. I think when she realizes she doesn't want to look like she's been defeated. And uh, when she gets a grip on that. And then uh, at the very end, her mouth pulls back almost into a grimace, these little parts back here. And I figured it would be when, when they read the part about um, how she gets nothing from him, how, you know, the, the, she gets com uh, the compensatory, what is it? What is it? Compensatory? How do you say that correctly? Damages, whatever it is. Yeah. 
is zero. Then you see her, her lips go back almost in a grimace, but I was expecting more of a lip purse there. Uh, when, when they said, I said, oh, we're gonna see a lip purse, but we didn't, which, which would signal or indicate that she doesn't agree with what's happening or doesn't like it. But the grimace is, is, this is just as much at that point. And her blink rate when the, um, at the end of these things, they start reading the money part of it, quite often she'll do a double blink. Not a whole lot of blinking going on, and her rate is, is fairly steady throughout, and there's, there's a space in between. She'll do a quick flutter, and then she'll do a one blink. There's a space, and a quick flutter and one blink. It's, it's a little bit odd, but then again, that's an odd situation to be in, so I'm sure she's feeling a little bit, um, little, little bit out of place at that point. Chase, what do you got? So, let's, uh, Greg, you brought up that, that necklace kind of moving. There's two places we can really breathe from. If you're watching this, you can try it out right now. We can breathe from our chest up here where you can see the chest rise and fall, or you can breathe through your abdomen, which I'm doing right now, and you can't really see that. So when we're more relaxed, we're more likely to breathe into our abdomens. And you see that throughout this trial, she's been using her abdomen to breathe, and you can see it. Finally, the stress is high enough to where she's doing chest breathing. You can see the breathing rate go up, and you see the location go upwards as well. So it's going from abdomen to chest. Another thing I think was interesting here, <clears throat> right when the jury's coming back into the courtroom, she adjusts her posture and and starts adjusting her hair because she knows this is a either a, the jury's going to need to look at me differently even though the verdict is done but i think there's a camera moment like this is the big moment that's going to be all over fox and cnn and all that stuff so that was priority one and when we see this eye flutter you'll see a couple of blinks there that's kind of what the brain does when we have a lot of stuff opening up worth so all of a bunch of apps are opening at once so she's probably opening what are the consequences of this how is this going to work what is this going to make me look like what are the news repercussions of this maybe i can get a book deal out of this all this like consequential stuff that she's thinking and this is the brain trying to shut down those apps that are running in the background they're competing for that person's attention or or their time and one other one there is we don't see the emotion of a victim who has been victimized a second time in the courtroom. We see shame. We see a person who's kind of lamented and reserved into taking their licks, so to speak, as we might say in the South, but we're not seeing, I'm not seeing if this was an innocent person who was forced into this and then lost a trial against this person, I, I would expect to see very, very different emotions. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so we don't uh, consult with each other beforehand, and it's interesting that we've all got the same ideas. So I'm gonna be very reiterative of what everybody's said. Just like you said, they're chase preening beforehand. So there's a sense of needing to look right as this comes in, but I don't think she knows at this point which way it's going to go for her. I don't think it's a surprise for any of us here. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting that the Victorian actresses during melodrama would wear a necklace of some sort, often with a jewel, so the light would catch it and the audience could watch the breathing unconsciously and join in with that and experience these big emotions of melodrama. So it's great that she has that necklace because we can read her breathing almost exactly. So just like a melodramatic audience, breathe along with her and see what you get. At the start, I get a sense of excitement, okay? Which which is to be accept, expected. The breathing is, as you say, Chase, high in the chest. Okay, there's gonna be some adrenaline there, I would say, and there's a sense of excitement. First, um, first call comes in of a yes, and I think there's a breathing shift. It shifts up, it starts going faster. Next verdict, verdict comes in, and there's a second shift. It goes even further than that. And in my view, if it shifted again and she went faster, she would be close to hyperventilation at that point. But why don't you test it out? Just see what it's like to breathe along with that. What happens to how stable you feel and think, well, if it shifted another gear, how stable would I be? So as verdicts come in after that, I think we see this in that the breathing doesn't go up, but we start to see these little palpitations in the breathing. I reckon that's panic 
try it along to her. She's starting to move towards this panicked breathing because my guess is, is she's doing the calculations in her mind of now how much is this going, uh, going to cost. And I think we also see these erratic, um, flutter movements in the in the eyes and that head fall because at some point she is getting closer to that kind of give up collapse situation but she pulls herself together on that and fronts it up uh yeah so uh high emotions during this panic and the brain just trying to work out how she's going to deal with this that's what i've got on that one back to you scott i've got a quick one for greg yeah, Greg, uh, if you don't know this, Greg spent a long time teaching resistance to interrogation and all kinds of cool spy kind of stuff. But what did you make of the attorney vigorously writing down notes as if they're never going to get a copy of this? Like just like, oh, I need to I need to just continue writing. What do you think that was? Well, I'm not sure she's writing what is being said. I think she may be writing something for Amber. Don't worry. Who knows what she's writing? But if you notice, Amber's eyes dart over from her right to her left at least once. I think that's what it is. The other thing to remember is if she's feeling like, uh oh, now I'm in a bind. Mark, you talk about it all the time. Engage your brain, engage your brain, engage your brain. Doodle, doodle, doodle. The same thing we saw Johnny Depp doing. So I think it could be either or. Yeah, great, great catch. By the way, uh, among those things, I think, Mark, that's brilliant with the breathing piece. And it, it, Chase, there was something you mentioned. Just going to let's just leave it at that. Just keep moving instead of dragging it out. Why not? Let's have it. What do you well, get? There was something he mentioned. There was something he mentioned up front that I was thinking was brilliant that you caught. Oh, the the closing apps. I, let me cover that. That where you talk about closing apps, that is the brain's natural response to. Uh oh, I need to look out for whatever the real threat is. And I think it's beautiful to to call that out. That you're shutting down all these other things so that your eyes can focus on the thing. I'd love to see her pupils. They're probably going. Mm. So we've got five videos on this very subject on what we're talking about. And we go through the trial and you can see what happens and what we're talking about step by step with Johnny's body language and with Amber's body language. And you can compare to what we're saying to, to what the uh, turnout was in the verdict. But at the same time, it would be a good education on how to look at things as you go through situations like that, through um, um, trials, through uh, things at work, through arguments. And you can see what's happening with that. So anybody want to add anything else? Yeah, I did one thing. I did one thing for somebody who was in court. They were really nervous. I had a sheet of paper in front of them, very similar to this situation here. And they were really nervous about what's going on. And on the sheet of paper, I just had a couple of words on there. It said, being comfortable will not put you in danger. Because that's what our brains default to. That's why our body gets ready to fight. And that's why our adrenaline pumps up. Just kind of helping to remind yourself that if you're, ever feeling any kind of stress like this, just push, pushing your body into a comfortable position is not going to make you uh, in more danger. But where our brains are programmed to think that way to keep us safe, doesn't work as well in the modern world. Yeah. All right. Well, go check out our other videos and uh, see what you think about that and see if you can learn a little something about what we've seen so far. All right. I think this is good, fellas, and we'll see you next time. Deal. Cheers. Today we're going to talk about a guy named Anthony Tott. I believe that's how you say his name. And he's done some pretty bad stuff. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, and if I mispronounce his name and call him Toad, just expect it. I will at some point. But this video is him on the stand testifying. The first one we're going to see is him under direct and then under cross. What we did not choose to do is the police interrogation and confession of this guy. He's changed stories three times. So we know he's a liar. We just don't know when he's lying until we watch this video and we'll show you what we see. The story is his wife, his 13-year-old, his 11-year-old, and his 4-year-old daughter were all murdered. And he was charged with their murders and sentenced to life in prison without parole and murdered his dog and was suffocated his dog and was given an extra year in addition to his life sentence for that. So he's a convicted murderer, whether you want to believe what he says here or not, it's another story, and stayed in the house with all his family's dead bodies piled up in the master bedroom for several weeks after the murders. What was the occurrence that made that day memorable? I came home and my kids were dead. It was the most horrible day of my life. And what I mean more horrible is my wife 
died in front of me also. Had there been a, a blueberry pie that was cooked in the house? According to what she told me. Objection hearsay. And it, hold on just a sec, Mr. Tote. Response. Describe what you know or saw and not what you heard from another person if you can. Thank you, sir. When I came home that morning, I knew my family the night before was having dessert, and I declined it because you saw my health. I was jogging and losing weight. I came home that morning, and there was a melted purple, looked like a pudding pie. I, I can't really tell you exactly what it was. She told me what it was later, but it was in a graham cracker crust, and the the kitchen, it was my job to clean the kitchen. But when I came home, that purple, bluish, grapeish, melted pie, I guess you want to say, in a pie dish was sitting there on the counter with some residue on the kids, um, at the kids' places on their, on their plates. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about emotions, because that's what hits me about this first one. Clearly, uh, right at the start of this piece, he's looking to inform his his audience, my guess is a jury to one side of him, or oh, there's some emotions are going on. And, you know, you be the judge of whether you think they're uh, real or false or, or whatever. But let me tell you a little bit about emotions. For the whole of kind of Western history, the element of water has been associated with emotions and the, and the humours, the, uh, the things that create our mind back in medieval days. These four humours were liquids and they would kind of wash around in you. And so you get this general idea from the start of psychology, early psychology, that emotions kind of flow and they collide and they mix with each other. Well, here's what happens in this situation. You get this kind of fluid at the start, but then it turns to ice really quickly. Look how it quickly becomes a very, very solid state. And that's why I believe if you look at this and you go, there's something kind of up with this. It's not just the collision of ideas at the start or, the, or that it doesn't quite flow as you'd quite like. It's that it suddenly stops around second 50. Around second 50, it goes to ice. And so it's no surprise that often for people who we feel are emotionless or hollow or even we might call them psychopathic or, or sociopathic, we'll often use the metaphor of ice for them because it's that state of water not being fluid anymore and being set and locked and it can't collide. There, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree with you and I must point out exactly where the change occurs. This is a really interesting one because before he starts to talk, before he's asked the question, he engages a grief muscle, which makes me think, show, 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 show and tell. And he ambers, I'll just use that as a verb. He turns to the audience or to the jury and boom, full blown everything he's got there. But it's not real. It's not believable. It does look like remorse. There's sorrow in his brows. His chin is up. His chin boss is involved. He's trying to contain his emotion with his lips. That all looks real. There's a lot of reasons to have remorse. Killing your family might be a reason to have remorse, not that your family died, but that grief muscle showing up before he even asked the question is an interesting one. It makes me think, okay, here I'm prepared and I'm ready to go. And when he starts talking about, I came home and my children were dead, there's no anger. Look, my wife is there, my children are dead. What sane person walks in the door, your wife's there, your children are dead, she tells you kill them, and there's no anger. There's all this other emotion, but there's no anger. That's odd and misplaced. I'll give him the benefit of a doubt. Go further into this before we figure it out. Um, but I've watched all these videos and I have an opinion. You'll find out later. But this stuff changes so quickly. He has rapid grief muscle there and then it just disappears when he says, at my wife died also. And he gets a little tear, but he's, I, he's doing something I call milking your eyes, squeezing the hell out of his eyes. So you get a little bit of fluid to come out of your eyes. And he tongue juts at according to what she told me. Now, go watch his interrogation if you have the stomach for it, it's horrible. 
you'll learn that this was Benadryl baked into a pie, some kind of a frozen treat for the kids, so they could do something to the kids more easily. He knew what it was. His eyes drop down to his left as he navigates the message. That doesn't always mean he's lying, but in this case it does, and all that emotion just disappears from his face. When the rescuer asks the question, he goes into internal voice and says, thank you, sir, as if he's talking to a guy about ice cream. And then he goes to high ground. I was jogging because I was losing weight. And then he goes back to a normal baseline with no emotion. That's a lot going on and a lot of fading. Mark, to your point, we call it freezing. It just disappeared. This is the most emotional thing that most people would ever go through in their lives. And for him, just gone like that. Chase, what do you got? Totally agree with you. Uh, throughout this whole thing, there's no emotional accessing. And that's when someone moves their eyes down and to their right, to their right. So if you're sitting in a Tesla and you look at that big screen, that's emotional accessing there. <laughs> Would be for me. There's an <laughs> eye flutter as as well there. And that it's typically a response to some kind of mental stress or, or what we call cognitive load. They're processing uh, data. Uh, grief could be from regret, not the recall. So we're seeing a little bit of grief there. And let me just make a quick distinction. When we're talking about shame, shame is an external emotion that we show publicly. Guilt is an internal feeling that we feel inside. So shame is external, guilt is internal. There's no mention of anybody's name here. And this is a big deal that we see commonly in guilty people. Again, there's a vishing perpetrator. Kids were dead. Not my wife had killed them. My kids were dead. I came home and my kids were dead. That's a big deal. That's vanishing perpetrator. And when he says blueberry pie, he gets to talk about blueberry crap, whatever he's talking about. There's instant excitement. There's micro eye widening. You can see his eyes get bigger. There's an instant drop of sadness on the face. All that sadness, he's like, oh, this is the time where I get to talk about the pie. And I counted, he spent 970% more time talking about the details of this blueberry pie than the deaths of his wife and children. That's a big deal. And uh, seven and a half uh, milligrams per kilogram is an overdose limit of Benadryl. I weigh 75 uh, kilograms, give or take. So that would be, give or take, 750 or something like that. But listen again. You'll hear a lot of detail, but the detail added is made to inject ambiguity. So anytime you hear a spike of detail and it's not about the relevant event and the details actually add ambiguity to the story, that should be the most massive red flag of all. Scott? All right. I, I, all you guys are spot on. I, we're seeing a, an attempt at sadness. This isn't sadness because when she asks him the question, just like Amber heard, he looks over at the, the jury and he starts delivering. We're not, other than that little watery thing, Greg, you're going to call it a tear. <laughs> I'm not going to give him that. There's no redness in the sclera. There's no residual redness anywhere on him. The, 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 we see the glabella contracting and that grief muscle is not even a real grief muscle. It's just he's trying his best and he tries to keep that engaged because we see it keep disappearing. And then it comes back down because when that's happening, you can't help it. This part goes down like it comes inward and upward and this part comes down. And that's what makes that upside down horseshoe looking thing. And you wouldn't say I came home and my kids were dead. You wouldn't say I came home. You'd said, I found my kids dead. And she asked him, what happened that day? I found my kids dead. He would have said, I found my whole family dead or my family. But he zeroes in on the kids first. I just thought that was odd. On the, the question about the blueberry pie, Greg, you're spot on with that. Two seconds after he gets into that, all that sadness is gone. That's It's just, boom, it's gone. Nothing, nothing. No residual anything in that emotion anywhere. And then... Um, Everything he talks about, he has this, these extremely detailed memories, like you were talking about, Chase, about the pie and the this and the door. As we go through these, listen to all the details this guy throws out about everything. But when you start act, talking about what actually happened, watch how far away he gets from that. But everything is this really odd detail, and that's because he's thought his story out. He's had a lot of time to sit in there while he's thinking, how am I going to, I already told him I did, how am I going to switch this around and make it look like, that I didn't do it. How am I going to get out of this? And he's thought and thought, and he's walked his way through that. Okay, here's what I'm going to say then. And that's why he comes up with all, it has to stop him and say, you want the whole story, which you're going to see in a few minutes. 
It's just, it's, it's ridiculous. It, we're, we're, he's, he's trying so hard to look like one thing, but he's actually something else. So that's why he's in defense mode. It sounds like if these were swords when they were talking, it would just sound like a fencing tournament in there. Because every time the, the attorney asks something, he jets, he just squirts back really quickly with a, with a quick, short, tight answer. What was the occurrence that made that day memorable? I came home and my kids were dead. It was the most horrible day of my life. And what I mean more horrible is my wife died in front of me also. Had there been a, a blueberry pie that was cooked in the house? According to what she told me. Objection here, sir. And a, hold on just a sec, Mr. Toe. Response. Describe what you know or saw and not what you heard from another person if you can. Thank you, sir. When I came home that morning, I knew my family the night before was having dessert, and I declined it because you saw my health. I was jogging and losing weight. I came home that morning, and there was a melted purple, looked like a pudding pie. I, I can't really tell you exactly what it was. She told me what it was later, but it was in a graham cracker crust, and the the kitchen, it was my job to clean the kitchen. But when I came home, that purple, bluish, grapeish, melted pie, I guess you want to say, in a pie dish was sitting there on the counter with some residue on the kids, um, at the kids' places on their, on their plates. You get back. And now it's daylight. The sun is up, yes. And which door of the house you go into? Back door. So you go in the back door, and what do you do? Go to pee. Okay. After I walk through the kitchen and saw the remnants of everything. Okay. So you see everything still on the table. You walk. You pass the bathroom to go upstairs, right? No, I went to the bathroom downstairs. Okay. I thought earlier you testified that you went upstairs to After go to the I bathroom. went to the bathroom. What I testified was I went to the bathroom, then went upstairs to meet my wife. Okay. So at what point did she come to the top of the stairs then? When I came out of the bathroom downstairs, she must have heard motion. She was at the top of the stairs. Okay. So um, were the doors to the library open or closed? Don't know. Didn't see them. Is the library not close to the stairs? The library is past the stairs, that's correct. But when you have to pee, you have to pee. Well, you're standing at the bottom of the stairs looking up at Megan at the stairs. You can't see the doors to the library? Ma'am, can you see that gentleman back there? Mike, you don't ask me questions, I ask you questions. Can you see the door to the library when you're standing at the stairs looking up at Megan? No. Okay. And... You're engaging with Megan, and what is Megan's demeanor? Not what she says, what is she doing, and how is she appear to you? She's standing at the top of the stairs. She has tears in her eyes and said, you're alive. Okay, and what is she wearing? She's wearing my gray HydroWorks shirt, which is something she usually slept in, and she's wearing some kind of pants of some sort. She had clothes on. And did she have any injuries at that point? Ma'am, I, she was standing there. She was fine. I don't know. I hugged her, kissed her, told her, I'm sorry I'm late. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to be long on this one, I warn you, because this is a good example of smartassery meets bad questioning. And she does a poor job of questioning here. I'm going to point out the mechanics of questioning where she fails, because she's effectively showing him Edgarly storytale. He came in with a plan. You can see it clearly. He doesn't access anything. 
He's telling you what he remembers. It's rote memory. He's just rolling it off. Watch the lack of eye contact with the jury now. He's on with her. He knows she's a threat. He's not trying to convince. He's locked on the threat. He's doing what Scott and I call in, in the True Crime Workshop, the romance story. I mean, eyes locked, all constant attention, very little blink rate. He starts that iterative storytelling. And he does lip compressions at almost every step. Now, when we mean iterative storytelling, I'm going to give you a little piece of information to get my next piece out so that I get out what I want you to hear. And when we say lip compression, often that's withheld information or emotion. He goes through that and he starts to bite the inside of his mouth. That's an adapter. It's a way to, way to release nervous energy because he can see what's coming. She allows him to deny and that could be part about the door being closed or the door being near the, um, the bathroom. That could be an elicitation technique. You can feign ignorance and say, isn't the door near this? And let that edge you. That's what it is. Bad questioning. It's a bad style. When he's living, his blood rate is yesterday. It's zero. There's none. His pursed lips indicate he's got some apprehension and he's hanging on to her words and ready for retort. He's just waiting. Here's where she really makes a mess of the questions. And if you're listening, I'll send you a class for free because these are horrible questions. A leading question. When you ask, was this, was the door here? Okay, that's a leading question. Yes or no is all they can answer. Compound, was it open or closed? That means you're asking a question they can say yes or no to, and it should be that way. Negative, was the library not close to the stairs? All of that creates confusion and allows this guy room to do a lot of BS. And if you ask the questions more concisely without giving him that wiggle room, you get information. So all that ambiguity allows him to get away with some things and all those lip compressions and that he starts to feel like kind of he's got the upper hand. You see him moving his body around. He's feeling a little stress. The other one that there's a source lead and a source lead is when somebody says something you should follow up on and jump on it immediately. She misses is his wife said, you are alive. Hmm. Why would she be asking you that would be one of the things he's not accessing. And he has concern in his brow as he replies for the only, only time. And he does do, I'll bring it up, Chase, because I got it in my notes. He's got one single shoulder hopping all over the place. I know that's a lot usually, but this is a mess. And he's getting away with some iterative storytelling. We'll see that come apart later. Scott, what do you got? All right. He first, when he answers questions, then he backtracks and starts adding all these qualifiers to it. to make Because he's forgotten to say that, he hasn't practiced this story out loud. He's always practicing in his head when he's in his cell. So as he tells the story, he, he says the whatever the part is they ask, gives him the answer, and he goes back and starts adding things to it. You're right, his, his adapter is that lip grip and that mouth movement, that chewing on his mouth and all that. When she asks him about the library, and this is going going. Everything we teach in, about deception, we're seeing in this. Everything from stress mouth to uh, quick little shoulder shrugs to adapters. This is this is great because everything we talk about, you're going to see it here. Yeah, but it's so blatant, it's it's hard to even take seriously that it almost looks like it's been set up because there are so many of them. His cadence is is moving right along at a fairly good clip. His um, his eye contact is hard. You know, he's trying to, to 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 make sure he's got all the information, so he has his has see how it fits within his story, so he can deliver that really well. And at the very end, we see what I call mercy hands. It's when that hand goes up, and it's like, oh, please have mercy on me. Please believe what I'm saying. You can't see it hardly, but when you see that, that's what I call. It's not like this when somebody's doing this. It's that complete that, and those palms come up, and they push their hands out like that. That's what I refer to as mercy hands. All right, uh, Chase, what do you got? Yep. I agree with you guys. I saw a lot of the same stuff. I'll uh, just go through the things that y'all didn't cover yet. Uh, this, I just want you to look at this choppy, quick vocal shift here when he's addressing the opposing counsel. Uh, his attorney might not be the best in the world at preparation. Uh, there should have been a, like the attorney says, okay, this guy freaks out easily. I'm going to set up a hand signal. If I reach my arm up and I start scratching my head to get your attention, you need to calm down and then you need to stay calm. There's a chin boss movement uh, at this question. And question to you, is this shame or guilt a response to seeing the remnants of everything or a response to the guilt of either uh, maybe lying about it? And I think this is almost just embarrassing to watch for me. His chest is heaving, uh, fighter flies kicking in. Of course, 
And when she's saying it's the library not close to the stairs, uses maybe a 10-ish o'clock accessing. So his eyes are moving to our 10 o'clock as we're we're looking at his face. Uh, so I, of course, he knows where this is. He's processing the data. So I, as an interrogator, you as a panelist, will be knowing like that's truthful information. I'm going to file this away in my brain that that 10 o'clock movement is very important to, for when I'm about to ask other questions here in the next few minutes. And they're going to be important. Uh, like he goes like, see that man over there. He's like challenging her. She does nothing about it. Uh, his chin kind of goes up in this little defiance, like, like an 11 year old. And I think it's really great that when she does actually kind of smack down a little bit, like you don't ask me questions. There's a postural retreat. There's an eyebrow flash for innocence there and a dominant shoulder retreat of some kind of concealed anger. Uh, so a lot of people, we have types of people in the world. Some people practice self-control. This guy's lived his whole life practicing self-restraint and you can see it. So he has no control. He has to use like an emergency break for everything because he, these everything in his life gets out of hand. My best psychology professor I ever had in my life said, you're only ever going to see two types of patients, those who need loosening and those who need tightening. This guy needs a little loosening. And happiness brings you loosen, loosening, not pleasure. And there is a difference. Uh, there's a whole lot else to have here. Um, the final thing, I'll skip over everything else. When she's asking, was she injured? Was there any injuries? What a moron. And this is my opinion. I'll just say that right now. You'll be able to dissect one this one easily. I think uh, my dog could dissect this. It's uh, we're seeing a child trapped inside of it, what should be a man's body. That's all I got. Uh, okay. So let's tap into this idea of emotions a little bit and work out which emotions might be real in him, which are not potentially. Well, actually, it's more going to be which ones are true for him. So remember, the premise is, is that emotions are like water because they flow and they merge and they're either like water. Water is either very, very direct yeah, or totally indirect. It either goes where you think it's going to go or goes where you didn't think it was going to go, but goes there directly. Or it kind of just meanders around and you go, where the hell's that water going? How did it get from there to there? Well, what I want you to notice at the start is that his gestures are very indirect at the start. A lot of breaks in the line of energy there as he kind of points within what I'd call first circle, you know, close into his body. But then as he says, hey, see that, that gentleman over there, suddenly becomes very, very direct. Well, I'd suggest because because he's transitioning now to anger. Now, as we got that, that look out, the juice and the through line of energy, that's very, very real, okay? He really wants to take control of that moment and goes very, very direct. So from indirect, again, very true, that he doesn't quite know where he is at the moment and he's trying to find his stability and then very, very direct to take control. She says, I ask the questions. And just as uh, Chase was saying there, we then get some very indirect movement. We get the head wobble, he moves to the side and loud is a whole different type of water. Look, nothing made up there. All of that, very, very true in terms of his own emotional state. He's telling all kinds of other stories, but the emotional state he's in there of anger, trying to take control, uh, then realizing he does have control and he's going to have to sit back and, and, and go with the flow of what's going on. Again, very, very true. You get back, and now it's daylight. The sun is up, yes. And which door of the house you go into? Back door. So you go in the back door, and what do you do? Go to pee. Okay. After I walk through the kitchen and saw the remnants of everything. Okay. So you see everything still on the table. You walk. You pass the bathroom to go upstairs, right? No, I went to the bathroom downstairs. Okay. I thought earlier you testified that you went upstairs to After go to the I bathroom. went to the bathroom. What I testified was I went to the bathroom, then went upstairs to meet my wife. Okay. So at what point did she come to the top of the stairs then? When I came out of the bathroom downstairs, she must have heard motion. She was at the top of the stairs. Okay. So, 
Were the doors to the library open or closed? Don't know. Didn't see them. Is the library not close to the stairs? The library is past the stairs, that's correct. But when you have to pee, you have to pee. Well, you're standing at the bottom of the stairs looking up at Megan at the stairs. You can't see the doors to the library? Ma'am, can you see that gentleman back there? Mike, you don't ask me questions, I ask you questions. Can you see the door to the library when you're standing at the stairs looking up at Megan? No. Okay. And you're engaging with Megan, and what is Megan's demeanor? Not what she says, what is she doing, and how is she appear to you? She's standing at the top of the stairs. She has tears in her eyes and said, you're alive. Okay. And what is she wearing? She's wearing my gray HydroWorks shirt, which is something she usually slept in. And she's wearing some kind of pants of some sort. She had clothes on. And did she have any injuries at that point? Ma'am, I, she was standing there. She was fine. I don't know. I hugged her, kissed her, told her, I'm sorry I'm late. And is Alec and Tyler's door open? That I don't recall, ma'am. I'm sorry. Why did you go to Zoe's room? Because she said she, she said the kids were dead. And Zoe was my little angel. That's the first one I went to. So when you get into Zoe's room, what do you see? There's a pillow on her head. There's a hand. And there's covers on top of her. She's laying on her mattress on the floor. Look, the mattress is on the floor. She's laying on her mattress. What do you do? I went over to her. I uncovered her, her mouth, uh, uncovered her face with a pillow. She had told me that she had stabbed the kids. So of course I looked for blood, I looked for anything, I looked for any sign of life. It was nothing. I turned back to her and I said, I thought you stabbed her. She says, I thought I did, I didn't know. It bounced off of her. Okay. So after you discover Zoe, what do you do? I went to the bathroom and picked up a washcloth. Her mouth was open, her eyes were open. She looked uncomfortable. It's my normal demeanor to help put my kids in rest. Don't ask me why I did it. I was trying to close her eyes. Okay, so where's Megan when you're doing Somewhere this? behind me. She was following me, talking to me. At one point she was standing in the doorway, talking to me from the doorway to me, because I was asking her, I, thought, I said, I thought you stabbed the kids. Okay, so did you, you said you had charged your phone the night before. Did you have your phone? I said I plugged it in and attempted to charge. Little did I know that the charger was not a direct charger. It had to have the engine on. The, the battery never charged. And I also found out that phone wasn't an active phone. That was an act. That was a phone that we used for things. So no, it was not charged, and it was not a technical phone. Okay. Did were there other phones in the house? There were other possessions of phones in the house, but Megan hid them and would not tell me where she hid them. So it's your testimony that you could not have called anybody. That's correct. I didn't have a phone. And it's all right, Chase. What do you got? All right, here we are. Remember. When I asked you to pay attention to that 10 o'clock eye movement to recall the details of the house, well, right here, we see something very different. What we see is 2 o'clock. So not only are we in a different position, we're in a different hemisphere. A different part of the brain is being accessed here, which is a gigantic red flag, like a Texas-sized red flag. What happened to the emotions about the incident? We're not seeing those and we're also seeing something very unusual here. We're seeing a person who's uncomfortable getting angry. And when you see this, if the person's actually angry and you don't see their actual response to anger, but you see self-restraint and you see other little behaviors that are childlike, which is exactly what we're seeing here. If you ever meet somebody like this, you're either facing somebody with low self-control or somebody who's going to push you in front of a bus uh, to save themselves because they doubt themselves that much. And people with a high self-worth and high self-control are able to exhibit being angry without any risk of violence. 
And that's the difference there. He's clinically going through this description of finding her like a like a surgeon would describe this to one of his colleagues about cutting open somebody's heart. And this is horrifying. And he's not even feeling anything. And then there's dissociative language when he's talking about his own children. A hand. He uses the word a hand was there and never uses their names. There's a pillow on her head. There's a hand. And there's covers on top of her. She's laying on her mattress on the floor. The mattress is on the floor. She's laying on her mattress. And you already know this is complete and total BS, but we're here to point out why your brain sees that so clearly. So he's checking the child to see if she's alive. And his only confusion here is about not seeing stab wounds. It was nothing. I turned back to her. I said, I thought you stabbed her. That's it. No emotion, nothing else. Just, hey, I thought you stabbed him. That is the craziest thing I've ever heard. And using a washcloth to close her eyes. I think this is actually truthful in some regard. I think this was a time where he actually just covered their faces. And a lot of times when murderers are uh, really close to victims, the shame of seeing their face and especially their eyes, because eyelids don't close like they do in movies. Uh, this is usually gonna drive murderers to cover up faces. I've been on a lot of deployments and I have gotten desensitized to some seriously horrific stuff. Kids in cases like this are not something you can get used to. And this is a horrific case, but this guy is almost so stupid, it's hilarious. So there's at least that that we can enjoy uh, while we're here. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so he wants you to believe that what he's saying has some emotion to it and is true. But how can we tell whether it's true or false? True or false? True or false? Well, is he acting like water at the moment? Is there some flow to it? Is it, is it, um, is it indirect in its flow or is it very direct in its flow? Or is he more like ice? Well, you're probably going to say he's more like ice. But you might go, well, he's quite direct, you know, but he's never fully getting there. I want you to notice how all the sentences break up. I went over to her. I uncovered her, her mouth, uh, uncovered her face with a pillow. She had told me that she had stabbed the kids. So though he does get to the end, it shifts along like a block of ice, it doesn't go directly and it doesn't flow. So look, I want you to think about it in this way. Is it legato, if that word means anything to you, which kind of means kind of Italian for kind of musical term for flowing, or is it staccato, which is another Italian musical term for being kind of jagged? Here's what we know about poker, by the way. By the way, don't go and play poker unless you really understand mathematics and probability. Number one thing, you've got to understand mathematics and probability. Above and beyond Beyond that, if you're looking for the tells of people, there is one tell that has been proven to show that somebody is confident or unconfident about the hand that they may have in their hand. And that is, do they push in their chips? Do they push in their bet staccato or legato? Does it flow in like water or does it kind of jutter? In. So you've got to look really carefully, but there are some really good, some really good scientific papers that suggest that is the thing, the best thing. There are lots of things you can look out for, but that's going to be your best bet above and beyond understanding math and probability. So is he staccato or is he legato? Because if he's staccato, we would probably suggest he's not telling the truth and he's not confident about this. And that's why you get sentences that don't quite follow through to the end. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so Chase, I'm with you. He does a variation from his last eye accessing. He's still in the visual area of the brain, but either last time he was lying or this time he's lying. We can't really tell absolutely 100% because we don't know what's going on in the house. However, when he says, is the door opening? It looks like an actual eye access for memory. And then he disclaims. And then he says, by saying, I don't recall, ma'am. He's overly polite. Is Alec and Tyler's door open? That I don't recall, ma'am. I'm sorry. 
that cluster of behaviors makes us think this is the lie side. The other side is actually retrieving information. So when you start to distance yourself, we, this is a great example of looking for clusters. We can't tell for sure, but what we know is he's gone to two different places in his head for the same kind of information. So good call. Why did you go to Zoe's room? Cadence shifts immediately. She said she dad, 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 and just goes off and slows down. He eye blocks, he blows out air, and he swivels. Now, eye blocking and blowing out air could be exasperation, could be a very bad feeling, something that could be real feelings. But when we see that, we also then expect clusters of good behavior, some arching of that grief muscle in the forehead, <clears throat> some concern in the brow, some drawing of the sides of the mouth. None of that's there. It just looks like clinical, like he's, I have a note here. It's like he tells you he's driving a 2011 Traverse. That's with a cut in the right front seat. That's what it oh. looks like. Oh yeah, my Traverse. I don't have any belief in him at all. We had a baseline for what was really emotional earlier. Either that was real or this is real. Which is it? Come on. You're really not very smart to do this. I think the guy is smart. He's a physical therapist. He had to go through school. He had to go through a whole lot of memorization. And he's doing that here. I think he's smart. He just is making some stupid moves. He thinks he's smarter than the whole system. It doesn't matter that she's not getting information because he comes across as a jerk. And remember, the jury gets to vote, and that's one of the things you have to be careful for. He also does some turtling, and he's got the best example of turtling I've ever seen because he's heavy, and his neck kind of shrinks down in his body. And then this this thick neck, you can watch his pulse in the thick neck. It's, it's comical almost, so watching and paying attention to it. Then he stumbles over those words about comfort, and you can clearly see that those are not comforting words. He gives a great baseline for BS because we can't miss it. And then he does lip withdrawal and I didn't have a phone. He has this thing all prepared like he thinks he knows where he's going and nothing works. And then he starts to stammer and the phone falls apart. If you really want to find it, go watch his interrogation. You'll hear where he's making up all this stuff. That's it. That's what I got. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Again, he's just running down the, down the path and just and just giving his rehearsed answers. Mark, what you're talking about about water and ice, I call that loping. The difference in that when you're just you talk and you just kind of lope along through the field on a horse and everything's fine, and it just flows right out. And when it doesn't, that's when you say something's not right here. And you usually hear those those are examples of someone who is is just re repeating a story they've said inside and not outside or out to the world that they haven't told to anybody. When he, and you're right, Greg, or who was it that said there was no emotion when he described his little, little angel? Nothing. Nothing there at all. If that was his little angel, we would go back to seeing those same expressions we saw earlier with, with his eyebrows, where his, his glabella at least pulled together. He would have thought, oh, I'm supposed to be sad here. I can try to look sad. We don't see anything in that part. His vocal tone is, is strong. His cadence is a bit fast. But he sounds like... During this, he's discussing plans on, on landscaping the yard. Sounds like he's talking to the yard guy. Here's what we're going to do. I want to try to do this. And we'll try. And then he tries to think what, and then goes on. Just, it's out of hand here. There's no loping going on whatsoever. Now, if he's thinking, if, if he's come to, to the revelation that his children are dead, and he's assuming that his wife did it, what do you think he's going to do? He's not going to stay. There's, he, he, there's no... He doesn't talk about feeling threatened or in danger or if, if, or if she hadn't told him. You see two dead kids in there, you're like, oh, my Lord, you know, what's going to happen? Am I in danger? That would be your first thought. You wouldn't be standing around looking, doing stuff. You'd be you'd have your back to wherever that had happened and wait for something else to come at you at that point. And then when he says uh, after he didn't find the phone, he, he, he uh, was hollering out the window to see if anybody was there to help. He should have said, I was hollering at the, my neighbor, and he might have even said their name for help, you know, but he didn't say that. It's just, it's just odd. This whole thing is just turning odd. That's what a normal person would do if you, once you have this horrifying revelation that your wife had murdered everyone but you, you know, going back to the part where he should be afraid for himself, but he never even says that because it doesn't enter into his brain because, or his mind because he, he was never afraid of being killed since he was the one doing the killing. And is Alec and Tyler's door open? That I don't recall, ma'am. I'm sorry. Why did you go to Zoe's room? Because she says she... She says she...
said the kids were dead. And Zoe was my little angel. That's the first one I went to. So when you get into Zoe's room, what do you see? There's a pillow on her head. There's a hand. And there's covers on top of her. She's laying on her mattress on the floor. The mattress is on the floor. She's laying on her mattress. What do you do? I went over to her. I uncovered her, her mouth, uh, uncovered her face with a pillow. She had told me that she had stabbed the kids. So of course I looked for blood. I looked for anything. Looked for any sign of life. There was nothing. I turned back to her and I said, I thought you stabbed her. She says, I thought I did, I didn't know. It bounced off of her. Okay. So after you discover Zoe, what do you do? I went to the bathroom and picked up a washcloth. Her mouth was open, her eyes were open. She looked uncomfortable. It's my normal demeanor to help put my kids in rest. Don't ask me why I did it. I was trying to close her eyes. Okay, so where's Megan when you're doing Somewhere this? behind me. She was following me, talking to me. At one point she was standing in the doorway, talking to me from the doorway to me because I was asking her, I, thought, I said, I thought you stabbed the kids. Okay, so did you, you said you had charged your phone the night before. Did you have your phone? I said I plugged it in and attempted to charge. Little did I know that the charger was not a direct charger. It had to have the engine on. The, the battery never charged. And I also found out that phone wasn't an active phone. That was an active, that was a phone that we used for things. So no, it was not charged and it was not a technical phone. Okay. Did, were there other phones in the house? There were other possessions of phones in the house, but Megan hid them and would not tell me where she hid them. So it's your testimony that you could not have called anybody. That's correct. I didn't have a phone. And it's... And what'd you find in Tyler's room? In or, Alec's room? In Alec and Tyler's room. Yeah. Alec was on his back, pillow over his head, covers over him, and there was blood. How much blood? Enough that I noticed. I can't really tell you because I pulled back the, the blankets. The shirt had some blood on it, and there was blood on the abdomen. Was there blood on the blankets? And they didn't inspect it. My goal was to see if they were alive, and my goal was to see what the hell happened. Okay. My language. So after you see Alec, do you go downstairs to Tyler? No, I actually do the same thing with the washcloth. His eyes were open and his mouth was gently slack, looked uncomfortable. Normal father thing is to relax their head and relax, and I was just providing them comfort. Okay. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to be really short on this one. So. I'm gonna, now let's bring in a whole new piece of literature from history, Dante's Inferno. This guy deserves a ninth plane of hell if he killed his kids this way, because that's what where betrayal belongs, and that's the ultimate in betrayal if you kill your children. Um, he has all the emotion of that whole routine of describing a car again. No engagement in the jury. I don't understand why he went earlier, and now he's not going to. He does lip compression at what the hell happened. Well, he knows what the hell happened. It's clear to us. And then he says a normal father does a relaxing the head thing. And there's cadence shift in there that's awkward, nothing natural about it. And then he starts to mill his jaw as he's talking. This, look, this guy came in here to iteratively storytell, and she's enabled that to now. We'll see this is going to fall apart here in a little bit. But right now, she's playing his game, he's playing her game, whatever you want. And he's got a lot of speech patterns that allow him to do this clipped, quick, pieces and get back to the next piece. He's setting up the next sentence every time he says something. Mark, what do you have? Yeah, so I just want to point out that there's a transition for him into now justifying his behavior. Before, he's been going, well, he actually said, don't ask me why. Don't ask me why. I, I think it was around the the, uh, the towels on the head, the flannels on the head. I think it was around that. Don't ask me why. So he's basically saying, don't ask me to justify this because he probably felt a little more confident 
around that time. I think the pressure is building up for him. He's feeling less confident. And so he talks about the normal father thing. So he tries to socialize this into a normality so that, again, we won't dig into the story because, you know, this is what every normal father uh, would do. I don't think that's true at all, that every normal father would would do that. Um, but just notice there that we can tell, I think, the pressure is coming on him because of this transition to now feeling like he has to justify. Scott, what do you got on this one? I think a normal father would be angry. I think he'd open up with anger. That's, I mean, that's his, his intro would be anger for a normal father. Seeing the child is, looks uncomfortable, what he should be worried about is if that woman's going to stab him to death in a minute. That's what he should be focused on. But uh, but like I said before, he's not. Then he talks about there being blood on the abdomen. That's not the abdomen. That's your child's stomach. You're going there and seeing your child dead and you're talking about it like you're, that's, he's not even giving the same respect you would give the frog in high school when you dissected the frog. He's not even talking about, about it like that. It's just, it's just it's, there's nothing there emotionally. He's not, he's, he doesn't, there's no empathy. There's no sympathy. There's no anger. There's nothing there. He's not even trying to fake any of it. No residual grief from any of that. If you're looking at your kid's stomach and, and your child is dead and you're seeing blood and you talk more about the situation of blood, you said there was blood. Really? Where, where, you know, you would say it's everywhere. Anytime you see a child's blood, it's too much blood. No matter how much it is, it's way too much. It doesn't even, doesn't say anything like that. Nothing. Nothing. So a normal father would not act this way and react this way at all. Not at all. Not even a little bit. Okay. We good? Yeah. Chase. Can I go? Chase, sorry. We're bad. Yeah, oh, sorry, man. <laughs> got, too up. Got, got up into it too much. Go on. Oh, man. So, uh, you know, the first time I held a human brain, I was in college. And before anything happened, there was a person on the table and they told us her name and while we were holding this thing we're we're feel we're feeling the like the cerebellum area which is kind of like fish gills but we say this is her brain this is her temporal lobe not the temporal lobe we're saying her this is a person i didn't know i didn't have a, a personal relationship with and I'm still connected and I'm still using that language. And this person isn't doing it with their kids. It's a huge deal. And Greg, I think to your point about him not looking at the jury, I'll just say there's two things that can make your brain focus on something, whether you like it or not, something that's valuable and something that's threatening. That's it. I think in the beginning when his attorney was doing the questioning, the jury was a valuable thing. And threats are always more powerful than value for when it comes to competing for our focus. And then, then the prosecutor came in and the value kind of took over. But I do think he's genuinely recalling all of this. Except that he's genuinely recalling bullet points that he made about all of this. So the recall is genuine, but the recall is not of the event. The recall is of a story. There's way more dissociative language. Like Scott, you said the abdomen. If you hear this ever in your life when somebody's talking about their family or their kids, this should be the biggest red flag you have ever seen in your entire life. It, and it means you need to be really ready or really careful before you form a relationship with someone that does this. And the washcloth provided the kid comfort. He did use the washcloth. I think he's legitimizing this behavior when he's saying the normal father thing, this is a very cheap, like nine-year-old level attempt to convince the jury that this is what fathers do. He used the washcloth to cover the faces for guilt. And what'd you find in Tyler's room? In or Alec's room? In Alec and Tyler's room. Yeah, Alec was on his back, pillow over his head, covers over him, and there was blood. How much blood? Enough that I noticed, I can't really tell you because I pulled back the, the blankets, the shirt had some blood on it, and there was blood on the abdomen. Was there blood on the blankets? Didn't, didn't inspect it. My goal was to see if they were alive, and my goal was to see what the hell happened. Okay. My language. So after you see Alec, do you go downstairs to Tyler? No, I actually do the same thing with the washcloth. His eyes were open, and his mouth was gently slack, 
looked uncomfortable. Normal father thing is to relax their head and relax, and I was just providing them comfort. Okay. Um, you can see that view from the bathroom. Can, is Megan within your view? No, she's standing by her end table. When I left her, she's standing by the end table on her side of the bed. Okay. And how long are you in the bathroom? Don't know. A few minutes. What happens when you come out of the bathroom? As I'm walking out of the bathroom, I hear a sound that is similar to a balloon. You know, like you rub a balloon, like a... Mm -hmm. At which point, I poke my head out you know, as we're coming out, and I see her laying on her back, stabbing herself. Okay. Where at? Is she in the bed? Is she She's on the laying floor? on her back, on her side of the bed, with her head on the pillow, laying on her back, on top of sheets, with a knife in her abdomen. What color was the knife? The knife was the only knife that was there. It was a green buck knife that I bought for the kids as a Christmas present as part of their fishing lures. Okay, so she has a green knife. That's correct. Um, is she right-handed or left-handed? Green-handled knife. Green-handled knife. Is she right-handed or left-handed? She's right-handed. And which hand was on the knife? Both hands were on the knife. Both hands were on the knife. Yes. And you said that the knife was in her abdomen. Yes. When you came out of the bathroom? Yes. What did you do? Um, I stood there in shock. And I said, what the hell are you doing? And at that point, she says, I'm doing what I did to the boys. I'm trying to get my inferior vena cava. I'm sorry. She said, I'm doing what I did to the boys. I'm trying to get my inferior vena cava. Did you go for help? I went over to my wife and pleaded for her to tell me where the phones were. She asked me not to leave her. She did not leave the boys. So my question is, did you go for help? Yes or no? The answer is no. All right, well, I'll go first on this one. When he talks about coming out of the bathroom, he says, as we were coming out of the bathroom. He's the only guy there. So that makes me wonder what the hell's going on up on up in his head. What's this guy thinking about? Is he, th is he thinking... I don't believe he's got multiple personalities or anything like that. But what's he thinking? Why is he saying as we came out of the bathroom? It's really, really odd. That should, and the attorney should have caught that and said, what are you talking about? But at the, on the other hand, if she had caught it, what is she going to say? He said, oh, I'm sorry, I just meant me. Then you can't dig into psychology from that point. Um, but from that point of view, it's just kind of odd looking. We see him adapting by swaying back and forth from that chair. And his details are just finely tuned. He's got it all down, the green knife and corrects her on that. All those things are real stickler for these really these details that you don't need. Nobody needs to know any of that stuff. They're too intricate for real for real storytelling. That's what inhibits the uh, the loping. That's why we're not really hearing much of that. Um, when it, when it, the, the details are so intricate, for example, I thought this was a good one. When a director directs a movie and you, and you have an actor and there's a situation and the actor says, well, I've got to go over to so-and-so's house or go over there, to, you know, miles away, I'll drive. The director doesn't have them show them saying goodbye, walking out the door, open the door, shutting the door behind them, walking out to the car, opening the car door, getting in, starting the car, putting on their seatbelt, adjusting the, and then driving off and then showing up, getting out of that whole scene. They just show them showing up over there or they show them leaving in the car or driving up and that's it. That's it. These details mean nothing in the story. And it's just, and that's the, these are, every time he gives one, it says flag, 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 because it's so odd and so out of, out of character for a real story, you know? Um, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. This is a fantastic study for the beginner who's just getting into body language and trying to study deception, what to look for. That's all we're really seeing here are just cues of deception, pretty much. I mean, there's, we're going to see him going to fight or flight here in a while, but this is, this is just great for you to, to look at and study. A lot, of, a lot going on here. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so this is going to start a two-part story. Okay, Scott, come in. I see Scott there with a knife, stabbing himself and cutting his <laughs> inferior vena cava. Yeah. And I go, hey, Scott, where's your phone? Does anybody yeah. believe that? Does anybody believe that's what's happening? Does anyone really believe that a guy's going to walk up and the way he's going to try to stop his wife from slicing a major artery is to talk to her about her phone? That's not how life works. Aside from the fact she has a knife in her hand, he walks in, she's got it in her gut, just working around cutting an artery. Okay, 
We believe that for a minute. He's calm, but this is three years later. He's told this story, and he's doing that romance here. I'm not kidding you. Like, he's got his eyes locked because he's trying to see what she believes and what she doesn't. And that smart assery thing he does with little short clips to his questions and answers just keeps coming up. I don't know. I don't recall. This is the only place when he's talking about where were you and was the door open, that stuff, that his signaling is actually congruent because it's non-pertinent and he doesn't care whether she knows something or not. He edits and adjusts and he says she is standing, but that's very much a New England, Northeastern kind of thing. I had a good friend who would say, I'm working in the city for 35 years. So that's just a speech pattern thing. You don't read too much into that. There is some disgust when he talks about hearing something that sounded like a balloon. Makes me think that's probably what it sounded like when he did something. And that went through his head because you see his nose wrinkle in disgust. And his face, Chase, as you always say, moved to the center. Really good way to put it. He goes into a lot of detail about the sheets and where she was lying and all that. That must have some pertinence in the way he's going to explain away blood patterns or something. Don't know. But then he gets meticulous with that green handle knife and you see him go back and attack that he should stay this way through the rest of the story and we're going to see that fall apart because we always say the pattern that you use should be the pattern you use for the rest of the time and i'll just i'll, I'll hop over that last one and then say this is just an iterative story and where's that emotion he was displaying for the jury when he's talking about his wife disemboweling herself in front of him this is just broken and you can't miss all of that when he says when he answers no watches lips and his chin withdraw. The, this guy's not believable. Scott, you're right. Everything that we teach, the most simple things are here, but they're in grand scale because he thinks he's outthought them. And every person, when they get on the stand, every person when they face an interrogator has their story made up. This guy's put a lot of time into it. He's had three years. And he's having to recant something he said before. Chase, what do you got? Yeah. The one thing he's got in common with Amber Heard, he thinks he's got them fooled. And that's, he has confidence and stress at the same time, which makes these uh, behaviors more exaggerated. But there's more details here about trivial BS than any of the deaths of the kids or discovering uh, that they were dead in the first place. In very, very rare cases throughout my entire career, I will say something is definitively deceptive. This is one of them. If you hear a story where minute, stupid details are just vividly injected and then the critical moments are just carelessly walked through, like someone reading a clothing uh, laundry label. That's deception. That is deception. You don't need many clusters. But here's the clusters we're seeing. We're seeing a detail spike, or let's call it a detail mountain. We're seeing a detail mountain with irrelevant BS, and we're seeing a detail valley when it comes to critical. Then we see another detail mountain when it comes to irrelevant BS. That's deception. And notice there's no emotion, no crying, no screaming, no care, no worry, no love, no anger, no sound that he's describing, no feeling. He's a physical therapist. His wife is a school teacher. Inferior vena cava is not something that she would say, in my opinion, I don't think. And I love how she's just stabbing herself and casually saying this and just very medically and clinically describing the exact name of the vein as she's stabbing herself in the stomach. It's just a casual conversation between medically educated people that the jury probably wouldn't understand. And I think that's exactly what's going on in his head. The jury's not going to get this. This is a really highly educated word. It's going to make the jury automatically believe me. I think that's what he's thinking. That's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so let's look at some nonverbals that are going around those spikes of, of detail, because I agree with you on that. We get the first um, first time we've seen a moderator or regulator gesture out of him like this, which is a stop, a halt and suppress. So he comes in at a kind of a 45 degree angle, uh, green handled knife. So he wants, he wants the whole of this situation to just halt for a moment while he gives this piece of detail. We can't quite work out why this might be so important. Maybe it is pertinent to evidence, maybe not, I don't know. I think he just, it's a moment for him to go, I'll control this for a moment. Because he's got a lot of control, and my guess is his control is has some relative importance to him, especially as you've been saying, Chase, the suppression of something. So we get that nice, it's not fully suppressive, 
Yeah, but it halts the proceedings and just pats down on that idea of the green handled knife. Then we get a beautiful example of the aloof eye block, which is when, uh, and, and Chase brought this to our attention many times ago around, what was it, the, the, the neighbor who's just got a solar panel yeah. on there. On well, that's good for the environment, you know. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, so that I'm going to call the aloof eye block. It says, what it says is, I'm so much more bigger and important and more intelligent than you that I can't even look at you. I can't even look at you and you maybe shouldn't even be able to see me. And so, because I'm, you know, high on the pedestal and therefore, because I can't close your eyes, I'll close my own. So it feels like you can't see me and I can't, and I wouldn't ever deign to look at you. And we get that on the idea of when the stenographer, I think, says, can you repeat that? And he repeats inferior vena cava as if to say, come on, you idiot. Everybody knows the inferior vena cava. Everybody knows that. And that beautiful aloof eye block. Great example of that. Again, controlling the situation. Great moment where he He's controlling some of the elements, the instruments of the court, probably feeling pretty good for him. Um, you can see that view from the bathroom. Can, is Megan within your view? No, she's standing by her end table. When I left her, she's standing by the end table on her side of the bed. Okay. And how long are you in the bathroom? Don't know. A few minutes. What happens when you come out of the bathroom? As I'm walking out of the bathroom, I hear a sound that is similar to a balloon. You know, like you rub a balloon, like a... Mm -hmm. At which point, I poke my head out you know, as we're coming out, and I see her laying on her back, stabbing herself. Okay. Where at? Is she in the bed? Is she She's on the laying floor? on her back, on her side of the bed, with her head on the pillow, laying on her back, on top of sheets, with the knife in her abdomen. What color was the knife? The knife was the only knife that was there. It was a green buck knife that I bought for the kids as a Christmas present as part of their fishing wars. Okay, so she has a green knife. That's correct. Um, is she right-handed or left-handed? Green-handled knife. Green-handled knife. Is she right-handed or left-handed? She's right-handed. And which hand was on the knife? Both hands were on the knife. Both hands were on the knife. Yes. And you said that the knife was in her abdomen. Yes. When you came out of the bathroom? What did you do? Um, I stood there in shock. And I said, what the hell are you doing? And at that point, she says, I'm doing what I did to the boys. I'm trying to get my inferior vena cava. I'm sorry. She said, I'm doing what I did to the boys. I'm trying to get my inferior vena cava. Did you go for help? I went over to my wife and pleaded for her to tell me where the phones were. She asked me not to leave her. She did not leave the boys. So my question is, did you go for help, yes or no? The answer is no. After Megan dies, how long, what do you do? What do you do? Well, we skipped over quite a bit there. I don't know if you want to go through everything or not. What did you do after Megan died? What did I do? I yelled out the window to see if anybody was around to help. There was some weird sound coming from her mouth. I thought she was breathing. I started CPR after I wiped her mouth off with that gray pillow. Okay, so you, she, she stabs herself once or twice? Like I said before, she stabbed herself a cumulative times of twice. Okay, and these are right after each other? That is no. Okay, so what happens? She stabbed herself the first time. I sat there pleading with her to allow me to find the phones, to allow me to leave her to go get help. My loyalty is to my wife. She did not want to be alone. I thought if I stood there, she would said she was going through the inferior vena cava. I have medical experience to know that one of those major arteries will bleed out quickly. In the area of the house, we liked the house rental because there was no one around. Neighbors weren't there. Most of the neighbors around us were snowbirds. If I left her, I thought she was gonna die. I thought in my decision making, the best chance was for her to tell me where the phones were. At one point, I 
hate to say I annoyed her. I was trying to convince her, trying to talk into her language, saying, obviously, the universe doesn't want you to go. She says, I want to be with my kids. I need to be with my kids. So I leave. Objection, non responsive. What do you do? All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I think he's uncomfortable here with the idea of Megan dies. It's it's too hard. He's been softening this idea. And so um, he shifts to the other side of his chair. Great transition there over to the other side of the chair. Now, I think he then tries again to control the situation. He's got now a chop gesture down what I call the wheel plane coming down his center line with this chop. Very controlling. Uh, with You skipped over quite a bit. So again, tries to control the narrative, control the, the calendar, the timeline that's going on. Fails at that completely and then has to buy time with what did I do? So I think we're constantly seeing this person trying to control with their body, failing, then control with 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 trying to control the interview or the questioning and fail, really on his back foot here. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so I, I fully agree. And right when he says, I don't know if you want me to go through everything or not, there's a chin thrust, which is we do as a challenge. As primates, we present arteries to other primates to say i'm not i'm not threatened or scared by you and he's basically saying you know what i've got all these details memorized you want to test me on that that's exactly what's happening here i think there's question repetition when he says what did i do he's repeating the question exactly and this guy is medically educated and this is not a behavior thing so i'm deviating a little bit from my baseline this guy's medically educated and he should know what that weird sound is coming from her mouth. This is called agonal respirations, and it does not come from the brain. It's the spinal cord trying to keep the body alive. And when he says, I thought she was breathing, I started CPR. If you think someone's breathing and then start CPR, you're an idiot. The details yeah. are about forensics defense and not the story at all. Every single detail that's given here is about defending a forensic finding. So he says, I have medical experience to know a major artery will bleed out quickly. That's hilarious. Uh, this, I mean, a, a person trained by the American Red Cross has more medical experience than this. But he's saying no one was around. He's saying no one was around our entire property. In the area of the house. We liked the house rental because there was no one around. Neighbors weren't there. Most of the neighbors around us were snowbirds. Is that why you yelled out the window for help? What did I do? I yelled out the window to see if anybody was around to help. I'm curious about that. And I love how he's having this weighted, deep, carefully thought out discussion, very calm, calculated discussion about life in general with his wife, Megan is her name, while she has a knife buried in her gut. And it seems like, you know, it's not a big deal. It's got a knife in here. We can have a casual conversation. I'm just, I've never said this on the behavior panel before. This is the biggest douchebag I've ever seen. And I am, I applaud the composure of the prosecuting attorney here. Greg, what do you, what do you got? Well, the level of arrogance that this guy comes up with through this entire thing, but I'll point out the body language of arrogance as we get closer to the end of this. I have written right on my notes, this is a skit. This is a skit. Who talks to somebody? Uh, uh, Megan, how's it feel while you're in there digging around? Did you get the right artery? Is about what this sounds like. I mean, yeah. Okay. Number one, he, he stops her and says, hold on, let me tell my story in effect. Would you want to hear what happened in between? That tells you this is incremental storytelling. He's setting it up so he has a way to get exactly what he wants out. My quick, quick question is, number one, why did you wipe her mouth? But number two, why with a pillow? I think something is up with that pillow that would break his story apart. And so he's trying to say, I wiped her mouth with the pillow. Mm -hmm. That's an added detail that we don't need. And she misses asking that question. That's a lead. Then he does something that we always say is a great indicator. Scott said it earlier. This is lying 101. Like I said before. Like I said before, she stabbed herself a cumulative times of twice. Redirect. Back to something I said before. Then he says, in a detailed cumulative of two. This is all her stuff. No, she stabbed herself twice, and I was panicked, and I tried to do this. But instead, what does he do? 
He says, well, I was talking to her. I was afraid she would die if I left. Well, she's certainly going to die if you don't leave. This whole logic thing from a medical point of view, from a guy who knows, but he's a, he's a physical therapist. Guarantee he knows where arteries and that are under the skin, under the muscle. He knows where muscles are put together. This guy has probably has to have a doctorate to practice in today's world. So this guy knows more than he's letting on. And then just why, this, the basic question, why didn't you stop her from stabbing herself? The basic question, instead of running for help, why didn't you stop her from, okay, she's already stabbed once and she's still looking for an artery. Stop. Go over there, take the knife out of her hand. This reminds me of being in the Army. Navy probably does it too. The first thing you do is you go, Annie, Annie, are you all right? Help. They have a little anatomical Annie dummy that you check for pulse, you check for breathing before you start, and Chase, you hit it dead on. I'm giving somebody CPR who's breathing. I'm not yelling for help. I might stick my head out. This is all messed up. Then when he gets to this point where he says, in my decision making, he gets that swivel rate thing going that we always Full talk swivel. about. Yep, full Doesn't swivel. Fall. He's getting away from it. <laughs> Any, I, I just have to think, how does anybody else, does anybody else wonder what kind of conversation you have with a person who's got a knife in their gut, stabbing around? I, you're clearly stronger than she is. She's lying on the floor. You could take the knife from her. There's real arrogance at the objection. When the guy says objection, his attorney, chin thrust, throat is open. That's defiance. We all say that to you all the time. Looks down his nose. And there's slight amusement as the corner of his mouth rise. This guy, yeah, he thinks he's brilliant. If he only knew how, what we see, he might have a different opinion. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. And at the top of that, he tries to, once again to take control of the conversation. He's got more of his story that he didn't get to tell that he needs to add in there so it lines up with exactly what happened. Because if you listen to what he says, you can go straight from when he first gets there all the way up to where she's stabbing herself. And everything fits right in from what he's looking at. You can go through and look at all those things as you went. So he didn't get to say those parts. So that's why he's adding that stuff in. And when he says, I looked out the window to see if anybody could help. Like, again, I said this earlier, he would have hollered. He just, if that was going to happen, he wouldn't have done that anyway. He would have run out of the house because he would be, he would, number one, he wouldn't be there because he'd be afraid she's going to kill him. Number two, if she's laying there trying to stab herself, trying to Harry Carry herself or Harry Carry, have you say it correctly? That's, that hurts, man. That hurts. When I'm running through the house to, to catch the dog, you know, catch Chatty or something, I hit my knee, everything shuts down, man, right then. <laughs> it's done. We're, we're done until I get finished going like, uh, like on Family Guy. I'm done, man. So if somebody's trying to stab themselves, and another, another thing that when you see a, a, a suicide, uh, somebody's committed suicide, and, and the person with them says they tried to stab me, you know, before they killed them themselves, well, then what's happened is that person who has supposedly been, almost been stabbed has been has killed that person. This is the road they go down because they'll have these little things where they try to to stab Hesitation. themselves, and try to cut Hesitation. themselves. Yeah, and these little mark out where you, you got to try it again and keep going because it hurts. And nobody's going to have any kind of conversation. The only word that that woman would be saying is. Ah! That's all you would hear, and the neighbors would have heard it too, no matter how far away they were, because that hurts when you do that. So, gosh, I'm getting all worked up in this. Anyway, he should be all worn out talking about that as well, and where he is in the situation in, in this uh, on the stand. Not only and the and the attorney, she's really not good at, at at asking questions. She's really not good at getting there and getting the information she needs out. I know we're coming off that Johnny Depp Amber Heard where we saw a pro that everybody fell in love with but this is this is not good she's not she sees all there's all, all like you're saying greg all these openings where you can climb in and go hang on a minute man what you just say what are you talking about why didn't she say so she's talking to you while she's stabbing herself is that what is that what and hear even, this? even if it's not productive or it's objected to the jury heard it you've jabbed it into the jury's mind exactly yeah, I mean, look Exactly. Any anybody sitting in any sane person there has to be. Are you really telling me you're having a conversation while somebody's slicing her abdominal aorta? Monty Python. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's Monty Python, man. Exactly yep. like that. So, all right, I'm done. You guys good? Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. All right. After Megan dies, how long? What do you do? What do you do? Well, we skipped over quite a bit there. I don't know if you want to go through everything or not. What did you do after Megan died? What did I do? 
I yelled out the window to see if anybody was around to help. There was some weird sound coming from her mouth. I thought she was breathing. I started CPR after I wiped her mouth off with that gray pillow. Okay, so you, she, she stabs herself once or twice. Like I said, before, she stabbed herself a cumulative times of twice. Okay. And these are right after each other? That is no. Okay, so what happens? She stabbed herself the first time. I sat there pleading with her to allow me to find the phones, to allow me to leave her to go get help. My loyalty is to my wife. She did not want to be alone. I thought if I stood there, she said she was going through the inferior via cava. I have medical experience to know that one of those major arteries will bleed out quickly. In the area of the house, we liked the house rental because there was no one around. Neighbors weren't there. Most of the neighbors around us were snowbirds. If I left her, I thought she was gonna die. I thought in my decision making, the best chance was for her to tell me where the phones were. At one point, I hate to say I annoyed her. I was trying to convince her, trying to talk into her language, saying obviously the universe doesn't want you to go. She says, I want to be with my kids. I need to be with my kids. So I leave. Objection, non responsive. What do you do? Did you go to Sarasota? No. There was no way I could drive to Sarasota. Did you leave your phone at a Starbucks in Sarasota? If I didn't go to Sarasota, I didn't leave my phone. So you're denying that you went to Starbucks in Sarasota? In Sarasota, that's correct. And you, you, so you never went to the beach in Sarasota? Nope. It was over two hours away. There was no way I could drive. And you did see the interview that was played yesterday, right? Correct. I did see the interview. And... You did speak with the detective more than one time, right? That's what they tell me. You're denying this knowledge? I am. I don't even remember talking to the interview that day. So, you don't remember talking to the detective on January 15th of 2020? Last thing I remember was falling down the stairs and saying, you hold on to somebody in custody, deputy. Next thing I knew, I woke up in jail and thought I was in purgatory with the red floor and the bright sky. Okay. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so in the beginning, when she starts questioning him, he's touching his face. Well, we assume that's an adapter, a way to comfort self. And so people release nervous energy. That's a way of, of, of comforting self. He swivels at the question of leaving his phone in Sarasota. And he has some, again, smart-ass remark. If I had never been in Sarasota, I couldn't have left my phone there. He's a, this is allowing the guy to condition the question. Because technically, if I'm in the outskirts of a town, if I'm in a non-branded Stop, let's say I'm in the, uh, in the Starbucks and it's in a suburb that is not called Sarasota. It's not Sarasota. And this is the kind of guy who would parse those facts. So in this case, he goes out and he says, exactly, I've never been to a, to a Starbucks in Sarasota. She should say, when was the last time you're in Starbucks, period, and then play from there. But she doesn't. She does a bad leading questions by saying, you didn't go to the Starbucks in Sarasota. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. Then he does this piercing stare with Romancer. We always say he does the Aaron Kathy blink rate. His eyes are cemented open. I don't know how he's holding them open that well. Look at his hands. He's a nail biter. So he's got nervous energy. You know, I always look for fingernails when people have chewed their yeah. nails away. It's an indicator that their nervous energy has to go somewhere. So you pay attention to that. She's feeding him with leading and poor questions and he's getting away with it. And his iterative storytelling is getting good because she is not good with questions. That will fall apart when she starts to lock him down with a transcript and ask, did you say this? Did you say that? Did you?" So it's gonna work for in the long term, but it isn't working well here. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right, so this so far this is the most uncomfortable we've seen him. And these are the biggest indicators that let us know he's uncomfortable. When um, when when he put, starts putting his hand on his face, that's one thing. He's adapting at that point. Then it becomes what's, what Joe Navarro refers to as facial denting. When he does that whole thing, when he starts 
pushing his face and everything starts smushing in. And you can feel that when it happens. I mean, go ahead and push on your face and get that feeling. You'll see what I'm talking about. Because when you let go, it kind of relaxes those muscles in there. But sometimes something's so intense, you need to be pushing because you're feeling that finger stretch or your finger stretch. You're feeling all those things. And not it just doesn't help take your mind off of it, but it kind of relaxes you as you're stretching muscles and pushing. And it gives you something, almost something to do to remove yourself from what's happening at that at that point. Um, so the deeper the dent, the more the more stress there is, especially in this case. And it gives answers, like you're saying, Greg, like he's solving a logic problem for a fourth grader. I didn't have a phone, so I couldn't say, no kidding. No, there's no need to do that. But I think what he's doing with these is he's buying time to think at this point. He makes sure he gets all of his details in, but he pushes back. But it doesn't take much time to get something going in there. So if you're trying to work something out really quickly, and with your story, make sure you're going forward. And I think he's doing that because he's looking for time to think, or trying to create time to think. We see that, like you're, like you're saying, he's got that little swing going back in his chair, going back and forth in his chair. He's locked down, and he's turtling. He's got all that going on. His eye, his, his blink rate isn't very much because he's locked on, making sure he doesn't miss anything. His brain goes, "We better watch, watch her, and find out what she's saying, and pay attention, so we don't miss something." At this point, he answers really quickly. These short, sharp, sharp shock uh, shots of answers, and um, he, he looks locked down. He really looks like locked, locked down. If this watching this, if this makes you feel weird. And because you think it sounds weird and you think it looks weird, it is weird. It is weird. This is this is this is totally out of character for for normal human behavior. That's why we're saying earlier, this is a great example of uh, for lessons to watch when someone's being deceptive. And remember, if it looks like a duck and it sounds like a duck, it probably killed its family. Mark, what do you got? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I agree with you. Not about the duck thing. I mean, it could, it might not be a duck. Who knows? <laughs> you know. Uh, but I certainly agree with you uh, on on that self stimulation piece where he's he's kind of pushing in hard enough that he he may be causing enough pain, you know, in order to control that. So, if the outside environment is painful to a human being, they'll often con- they they can control that by causing their own pain in some way. That, that that's probably happening at the moment but even if it's not that is a full face block that he's got now and i think sometimes you'll see him talk as well and you'll see the little finger just poke up in front of the lips as well to block those just slightly as well and that is such a difference from where we've seen him before okay so i think it's it's there's such a cluster there of he's in trouble right now just one other interesting kind of cultural thing I want to note there is he has a really good understanding, a fuller idea of the geography of 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 um, the mythology of death in Christianity. So the idea of purgatory and and Greg, you brought up the first the the third circle of hell as well. And and so so it's quite interesting. We've got somebody here who wants to mention that that finer point of the geography of the mythology in, in the Christian passing from life into an eternal life and that purgatory is a stop off. Most people don't really know that. Most people go, oh, you know, you die and you like, you go to heaven, don't you? No, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that happens in between, which, you know, is kind of interesting for me that he understands that detailed story. And my guess would be is that has something to do with why this has gone on. I mean, why else would he mention that kind of detail in this particular situation? Chase, what do you got on this one? I agree with you guys. And uh, y'all covered most of it. I've got one left. His failing memory uh, because of all this police trauma that he endured. So he if you don't know, he's claiming to have memory loss for all of this time period after, you know, the, the cops came and got him. All this family failing memory just disappears the moment that he's able to relay how someone else could have done it except for him. That's extremely convenient. Huge red flag. I think this is due to the fact that he fully confessed to committing all of these crimes. And the only pathway to getting his confession off the record was the classic three-part three part dance. The drugs in my system, memory loss, and I couldn't make legal or logical decisions for myself at that point in time. Did you go to Sarasota? No. 
There was no way I could drive to Sarasota. Did you leave your phone at a Starbucks in Sarasota? If I didn't go to Sarasota, I didn't leave my phone. So you're denying that you went to Starbucks in Sarasota? In Sarasota, that's correct. And you, you, so you never went to the beach in Sarasota? Nope. It was over two hours away. There was no way I could drive. And you did see the interview that was played yesterday, right? Correct. I did see the interview. And you did speak with the detective more than one time, right? That's what they tell me. You're denying this knowledge? I am. I don't even remember talking to the interview that day. So... You don't remember talking to the detective on January 15th of 2020? Last thing I remember was falling down the stairs and saying, you hold on to somebody in custody, deputy. Next thing I knew, I woke up in jail and I thought I was in purgatory with the red floor and the bright sky. Okay. And is it true that the multiple times that you spoke to detectives, that you told detectives that you went into Zoe's room you gathered the courage, and you rolled over on top of your daughter until she suffocated. Isn't you know, that what you told law enforcement? Is this a yes or no question? Or do you want a the yes answer? or no question. That is what the video, yes, shows you. And your testimony here today is that Megan did it. Megan killed Zoe. And you told the detectives multiple times that after Zoe... You went to Alec's room, and Alec is your oldest, was your oldest son, correct? That's correct. And Alec was 13 years old, and he was the strongest, right? That is incorrect, ma'am. Who is the strongest? Tyler is downstairs. Okay, so you go to Alec's room next because Alec's upstairs. That's correct. Right? And you told law enforcement on multiple occasions that you went into... Alex's room and you stabbed Alec and you suffocated Alec. Isn't that correct? That's partially correct. And isn't it true that you initially told law enforcement multiple times that Megan was in there during that killing? That's what the video showed, yes. And isn't it true that you also told law enforcement that Megan took part in the killing? That's what the video showed, that's correct. And that, in fact, Megan held Alec's legs down while you suffocated Alec. That's what the video showed. That's correct. And your testimony today is that that is not true. My testimony today is the fact that Megan killed her kids and killed herself. Okay. All right, I'll go first on this one. Uh, we see another huge adapter, and uh, that's where he's pushing his finger into his neck. Same kind of thing we saw last time, except it's getting worse. Because when you... There's a different feeling when you push in there than when you're pushing on your neck in there. You've got that little lymph node you're going by and pushing on, and you're stretching your finger. That's helping a lot, helping him a lot too. But pushing in there and staying, that's weird because you feel it up in your mouth at that point. He's almost looks like he's going up into his sinus area with it. But it's still, that's an adapter that helps him get rid of that built up stress or tension. So the stress is building. And this is sort of where the noose starts to tighten on him. And even though this is questioning, that the attorney's doing isn't really good. She's getting what she needs out of him or what she wants out of him. Um, the shoulder shrugs really aren't, I, I wouldn't count those as shoulder shrugs as far as deception goes. He just can't get comfortable. So that's why he feels really quick things. He's trying to move around. It's almost like a tick at that point. And he's trying to keep himself calm while this is happening. I think that's what that's about. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is actually one of my favorites because he feels he has upper hand in the beginning. You can see he's doing that kind of chin up and he's judgmental, but she's starting to make a mess of his iterative storytelling now because she's asking yes or no. And that yes or no has been effective for him to get some things out in the past, but now she's gonna shift to talking about the transcript. And when I'm making you stick to a transcript, now you're admitting to something or, or fighting it and saying, no, I didn't do it. That starts to make your story come apart. Now, whether that was her plan or not, no idea, but it starts to become effective. And if you don't believe that's true, Listen to when he says, is this a yes or no question? Is this a yes or no question? Or do you want the yes answer? Yes or no question. That is what the video, yes, shows you. That's what he's looking for is how do I get to deliver my story if you do that? And then he says, is it a question or do you want me to do this? That storytelling starts to come apart. She could shift gears right here and start to push on him, but she doesn't. I'm just I'm going to skip a couple of things. But every opportunity this guy gets to release info, he does. 
There's one interesting little fleeting piece of body language to go and watch very carefully. After he says that's correct about going to his son's room because it's upstairs, you see a really quick, you could call it a micro expression, fleeting terror go across his head right here. Something is up in his story that he needs to stay away from. And I don't know what it is. And I would have gone, hold on, hold, hold on. I would go and figure out what's going on there. Even though, even part of that's going to be partially correct, but he starts to mouth groom a little bit and do something a little odd. And we can't tell why, but we're seeing signs of fight or flight. My guess is it's to that fleeting terror that he had. And then she locks him down further in this transcript. And he says, my testimony today is the fact that, that's all filler. That's all, Megan killed her kids, her kids, and then herself. He eye blocks, he mouth grooms, and he swivels. That right there is plenty. Guys, if we haven't seen enough, that sentence, that distancing that much, that distancing from your kids, and that swiveling and showing fight or flight, somebody needs to be crawling all over this guy. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I think he's trying to cope here with the significant reversal of the story that's now that he's now gone for. Uh, I think he looks down in order to... He's thinking of self-soothing with some kind of bottle of water, I imagine, um, but, and which would make a great... I mean, it's a great thing to bring in as a block, great thing to do to protect yourself. For some reason, he decides not to. I don't know why he decides not to, but if I think he makes it, you know, maybe there's no bottle there, maybe it's got no water in it, and he goes, I'm going to look like an idiot because there's nothing to drink. Um, or maybe he just decides against it because maybe... Maybe he goes, no, I'll just look like I'm self-soothing. That won't look good. But then, because he can't use that, he has to readjust. And that's what I think the shoulder stuff is there. He's now got to do something to readjust to the fact that he's that he the story is going a different way now. He wanted to go for the water, but he's decided not to. And now he's got to do something in order to make it look like you should be doing that kind of thing. It's a complete mess for him right now, uh, as it should be. Chase, what do you got on this one? I think our first five episodes that we ever filmed, uh, I, have, I was drinking out of a cup and I realized it was empty and then I pretended to drink out of it because I wanted to commit. I, wanna, <laughs> yes. I, I don't quit. I, I commit to things. So what I think he was doing here is a a uh, medical technique for people who are suffering certain kinds of emergencies. You can rub up and down right here. It's called a carotid massage. That's the actual name of it. Go look it up. Really cool. But it's proven to lower blood pressure, calm people down. You can actually do that just by poking in here and kind of rubbing it around. I think that's what he's doing. He's a physical therapist. He's on the stand. He's freaking out. I think that he's defaulting to this technique. And I think he's doing out of all this crap that he's doing, he's doing this one thing, I think, on purpose. Because I think he feels more self-assured because there's this deniant, defiant, like this self-amused uh, behavior at his little defense strategy, which actually reminds me of Amber Heard. Uh, Amber Heard's not doubling down because it's true. She's doubling down because it's based on her belief in her ability and how unintelligent that person thinks the everyone else is. And I think this little worm uh, believes the same. And when he says Megan killed her kids, that's a big deal. Then we can call it a slip. You can call it a mistake if you want to. It's a big deal to probably all four of us. And then herself. And right when he says herself, I want you to watch his lower jaw. And we do this during concealed anger, especially if we're hiding anger. But I think this one is a concealed tongue jut. And I think he's just preventing himself from parting his lips. And I think that's what we're seeing here. It wasn't high def enough for me to see it. That's all I got for this one. And is it true that the multiple times that you spoke to detectives, that you told detectives that you went into Zoe's room, you gathered the courage, and you rolled over on top of your daughter until she suffocated. Is you know, that what you told law enforcement? Is this a yes or no question? Or do you want a the yes answer? or no question. That is what the video, yes, shows you. And your testimony here today is that Megan did it. Megan killed 
Zoe. And you told the detectives multiple times that after Zoe, you went to Alec's room. And Alec is your oldest, was your oldest son, correct? That's correct. And Alec was 13 years old and he was the strongest, right? That is incorrect, ma'am. Who is the strongest? Tyler is downstairs. Okay, so you go to Alec's room next because Alec's upstairs. That's correct. Right? And you told law enforcement on multiple occasions that you went into Alec's room and you stabbed Alec and you suffocated Alec. Isn't that correct? That's partially correct. And isn't it true that you initially told law enforcement multiple times that Megan was in there during that killing? That's what the video showed, yes. And isn't it true that you also told law enforcement that Megan took part in the killing? That's what the video showed, that's correct. And that in fact, Megan held Alex's legs down while you suffocated Alex. That's what the video showed, that's correct. And your testimony today is that that is not true. My testimony today is the fact that Megan killed her kids and killed herself. Okay. All right, well, let's throw it around the room and talk about what we think we saw during this in 30 seconds or less. Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, you know, look, obviously we've got a complete liar there. I think that's pretty obvious to people. But look back at some of the classics of body language. I especially like to see in that that halt and suppress gesture there. And it tells me something about his general demeanor, which I think, you know, we've been right all along. There is something about him suppressing what's going on, that, that emotion inside him. And, and, you know, chances are it's turned out very, very badly for his family, which is massively unfortunate. Chase, what do you think? I'll rewrap exactly as I did. I think this person is having a long standing issue with control versus being controlling, dominant versus domineering, self-control versus self-restraint. You can see it in the hand gesture Mark just talked about. I think that if the hand is like this, the further down the hand is, the more respect or reverence that person's showing. The further up it is, the less respect or reverence. Because you see somebody with social anxiety, their hand will just stretch out flat on the table while their hand's down there, while they're objecting to something. But again, he is the exact individual that cannot really fully comprehend the difference between experiencing pleasure and feeling happiness. He equates the two with the same, and you can tell that by the neighborhood that he moved into. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, if I were picking a video to show you some rudimentary body language and deception, things that we associate with deception through clusters, this would be it. This guy comes in with iterative storytelling. He doesn't have a lot of fight or flight. He's pretty contained in the beginning because he's certain of his ability. Now, whether his ability is good or not, it's another story. He rambles at times. He conditions questions. He takes holy high ground, whatever you want to call it. He stammers and stutters. His cadence changes at hard facts. He has conversations with people in the middle of the most emotional things on earth without any emotion. And when he's trying to convince the jury of how horrible this was, he almost melts down as long as he's on direct and there's no threat. This to me is a beacon of deception. We know he lies because he set, had three different stories. So one of those is a lie. I'm guessing this is it. That's my my vote. Scott, what do you got? All right, I agree. I think, like I said earlier, this is a great study for the person just getting into body language and deception. If you want to know what the basics are, you just saw them. So go back over this a couple of times because the things we're pointing out are just the first things when you go in and so like one of us goes, okay, here's what you're looking for. Here's the section on deception. Let's start here. And we've just gone straight down the line doing that. So this is like a, a 101 for the basics of deception and body language. All right, fellas, thinks this is a good one. We'll see you next time. See you. The behavior panel. I had to signal you because it was just too good. Oh, oh man. <laughs> good one. Wow. Good wow. one. I want you to now lean way harder into you guys than you just did on me. Right now, I would I'd go another two minutes on that. Wow, that's too bad. Okay. Sorry. All right, let's give it another shot. Here we go. Today, Today we're going to talk. Go ahead. You go because I'm just going to take me a couple of shots anyway. What do you got?
You do it. Nothing. You want me to do the intro? Yeah, you do it this time. Let's see if you can do it without laughing. Go. Well, today we're going to talk about Ted Bundy, a serial killer, 30 known victims so far. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, 30 confessions. They, God knows how many others they think. And this is Dr. James Dobson, who ran a show and a, a, a foundation call focused on the family. He is a psychologist. He's also a conservative and an evangelical Christian. He had been in communication with Ted Bundy for a year before this thing is is um, recorded. So that's what you need to know. All right. We've all talked with Mark. <laughs> I got nothing. This is a message I'm going to get across. But as a young, uh, a young boy, and I mean the boy of uh, 12, 13, certainly, uh, that I encountered outside the home again uh, in um, the local grocery store, the local uh, uh, drugstore, the softcore pornography, what people call softcore. Um, but as I think I, I explained to you last night, Dr. Dobson, in an anecdote, uh, that as young boys do, we explored the the back roads and sideways and byways of our neighborhood and oftentimes people would dump the garbage and whatever they were cleaning out of their house and from time to time we'd come across so pornographic books of a harder nature than uh, more uh, graphic you might say more explicit nature than we would encounter let's say in your local grocery store and this also included such things as let's say detective magazines and uh, more hard those that involve violence then. yes yes yeah. and I, I and this is something I think I want to emphasize is the the, the, the most damaging uh, uh, kinds of pornography and my again I'm talking from personal experience uh, hard real personal experience the most damaging kinds of pornography are those that involve violence uh, and sexual violence because the wedding of those two forces, as, as I know only too well, brings about behavior that is just, uh, mm. is just uh, too terrible to describe. No. All right, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, if you want to know how somebody secretly feels, ask them how they think most people feel about a certain issue. You'll get their truthful response. What we're seeing is that he thinks most people are like him. And we're seeing him kind of selling that. He uses the word we to describe antisocial behavior at the beginning here. We're going to see this come up again. And when with these critical moments, you can see how he was seen as charming. These eyebrow flashes to the interviewer at these key points. And when he wants to be self-deprecating in order to get you to like him. And he uses the term wedding to talk about violence and pornography coming together. And I think this is a key element here. This reveals more than if he would say something like joining or meaning or meeting those two things together. And this is a wedding he's referring to, a union of things that were destined to be together or maybe a joining of two things that should always be together. And I think that's what we're really hearing. And each one of these videos, I'm going to share with you a fun fact about this, uh, some research that was done at the University of Kentucky, which is the largest research project on Ted Bundy. So according to these clinical and forensic psychologists, the one of the leads was named Daryl Turner, Dr. Daryl Turner. Ted Bundy is basically textbook definition of a prototypical psychopath, in, end quote. Greg, what do you got? I'm yeah, laughing. So, I'm sorry because you said fun fact about psychopaths. Sorry, dude. That, that totally well, you talk about you talk about psychopaths all the time, so it's fun. That's okay. Oh, yeah. Cool. You want to hand it off? Or you want to just go from there? No, go ahead. Okay, good. Go ahead. Yeah. So, guys, here's the thing, Chase. I'm with you. What we project onto other people is what we want them to be, or what we perceive ourselves to be in those cases. And you see a little bit of that here. This doc, this doctor is talking to him and looking for reasons why this monster was created. And this, he's going to certainly give him that. What we're watching is a master manipulator at work. And this is probably my favorite of all the things I've seen on Ted Bundy. The only reason we did it is because this is so masterful. What we're seeing here is a psychopath at work in the same way he would work someone before he caved their head in with a stick or whatever he did to all these people. And he just doesn't get that opportunity because he's caged and his fangs are removed. So we get to watch him right here be exactly who he is, and he's doing it exactly that. Watch as he talks when he pontificates and he's here to pontificate, make no mistake. He needs to still be pertinent and still be somebody who matters because he is a horrific narcissist. You're going to see it 
all through this whole thing. We'll listen for language and we'll point it out. He starts off, I love Chasey's using your closed eye talking. Well, it's good for the environment as he's pontificating. Every time he pontificates, he closes his eyes and does that closed eye talking. And then when he wants to make a point about the story he wants this guy to buy, locked eye contact and brow up. Those are his key points in every story. There's also a lot of tongue jutting. So let's start looking at tongue jutting to see if it means anything or is it a pattern for him throughout this whole thing. And you'll see that he has a tail that he's trying to get out here as he goes through. Everything he's gonna talk about is gonna be grand. It's the reason he uses words like wedding. The reason he uses these complex words because narcissists don't want anything to be normal in their life. Their friends are cooler and faster and prettier. Everybody they don't know is smarter and they use self-aggrandizing language. And you're gonna see a lot of that as we go through here. And then when he starts talking about, oh, he does one of my favorite things that I haven't ever seen anybody do but him and maybe Casey Anthony. And that's this pop his eyes really big and look under his brows and pull his head back. It is such a weird look. And he does that every time he's trying to get something. At the very close of the video, I'll cut this short, At the very close of the video, stop and look. There's absolute disdain in that guy's face for the guy he's talking to. This is a piece of work. This is a wild animal in a cage. Thank God they found a cure for him and they cured him the next day. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm gonna say this. We're gonna see two master manipulators. We're gonna see somebody selling a lie on purpose and another person buying a lie on purpose. And I think that for me is what is most exciting about this is we're gonna see somebody spinning and the other person using that spin for their purposes as well. But we'll get to that. Um, Look, there's a lovely, a lovely set of tongue juts there, uh, but I think we're going to have to discount those all the way along because it's repetitive behavior. And also we've got to understand that along with this kind of what I would call gentlemanly behavior, we're always going to see this through the lens of Hannibal Lecter. I think. So when we when we see these things, we're going to see behaviors that we think we recognize as those of the psychopath. But that's simply because I think art has taken these and and ramped the volume up on them. So just take that as, as context uh, with we're always viewing this through somebody's performance of the quintessential psychopath anyway. Um, Okay, what I love about his imagery here is he's saying he's the product of people throwing out trash, just as you say, uh, the, 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 the wedding of two forces, violence and sex. But those two things coming together is what people have thrown out in the, in the back rows, the sideways and the highways. So that's kind of it. So often you'll find that the geography, we call it psychogeography, that the geography of a landscape or a home will have a, um, a correlation to the psychology of a person, or at least that is some traditional psychogeography. And we're going to see him use these ideas throughout. Now, why is that? Either he's incredibly up on his current psychology of the time, or he's a fully integrated human being, or he knows that's what the interviewer is looking for. That's what this interviewer will will buy from him and actually wants to buy from him. We'll come to more of that later on, but just want to put that in your mind that they, he's already planted this idea of an understanding of the way the human mind might work and also the way society might work and how somebody might be manipulated unwittingly by the by society's own trash to become that trash in in our minds scott what do you got on this one all right i think we're seeing like greg was saying y'all everybody's nailed stuff on this we're, we're watching a psychopath be a psychopath you're going to have certain feelings when you go through here when you when you watch this guy and, and listen to him and talk to him you look at him and you look at him watching this guy and the way he uses the words he describes what happened some of you all are going to feel like he might be okay you know wasn't that bad because you know all people are you know basically good that's what you're going to think 
you know, that's what that's that feeling you're going to get in here. So if you're wondering how they do it, this is how they do it. You're watching it happen and it just gets better and better. That seems a little boring as we go along, right? Because he's talking real low and all that. No, man, this is a psychopath doing what a psychopath does. And he would do it to you, too. Keep in mind, this guy's a monster. He cut people's heads off. Didn't know that, did you? Cut, he cut some of these people's heads off and did weird things with it in that with that situation happening there. I've got to be can't be too graphic. So that's what we're seeing there. We're seeing a psychopath be a psychopath. Greg's the first one to say that. All right. We're seeing a severity softening. He starts talking about it like it was long ago. Then when he was a kid, this problem happened and all that. That strong eye contact, he's trying to to gain his trust with him because the guy's there trying to find out find out what happened to him and why he's like this. And he's telling him what he thinks he wants him to hear or what he wants him to hear. So there's it's the the that huge guarding of the ego. That's what the psychopath is doing. You you have to really be careful with the ego. So that's what he's doing. He's guarding the ego because this isn't his fault, man. No, it's not his fault. There's something else that's the fault. What's fault? It was, it was pornography. That's what did it to him. So that's what he starts blaming everything on, and it just goes throughout the whole the whole set of stuff we're watching. His voice tone, his cadence, everything's very smooth. He's got that low voice going. He talks to him, and he looks away. And as he looks away, he puts this pleasant look on his face, this kind of smiley looking face because he's allowing him to look at him and watch him be a good person and explain what's happening, what his problem is. So he's allowing him to watch that and watch him be that person. Oh, this is great stuff. This is classic stuff. Then he watched throughout these videos as well. He keeps breaking the contact with this guy to see what's happening over here on the other side of the room. Something's going on. It must be a doorway or something. People coming out, in and out. But he's alert. He's on alert for that. He keeps watching that. So his brain is on alert for things to happen. So he's clicking back into that analytic part of him. But this is this is great. It's just going to get better as we go along. And I'm I'm really excited about this, as I know you guys are too. Okay, we're good. Yeah. Let's move. This is a message I'm going to get across. But as a young a young boy, and I mean the boy of. Uh, 12 or 13 certainly uh, that I encountered outside the home again uh, in um, the local grocery store the local uh, uh, drug store the softcore pornography what people call softcore um, but as I think I, I explained to you last night Dr. Dobson in an anecdote uh, that as young boys do we explored the the back roads and sideways and byways of our neighborhood and oftentimes people would dump the garbage and whatever they're cleaning out of their house and from time to time we'd come across so oh, pornographic books of a harder nature than uh, more uh, graphic you might say more explicit nature than we would encounter let's say in your local grocery store and this also included such things as let's say detective magazines and uh, more hard those that involve violence then. yes yes yeah. and I, I and this is something I think I want to emphasize is the the, the, the most damaging uh, uh, kinds of pornography and my again I'm talking from personal experience uh, hard real personal experience the most damaging kinds of pornography are those that involve violence uh, and sexual violence because the wedding of those two forces, as, as I know only too well, brings about behavior that is just, uh, mm. is just uh, too terrible to describe. Now, describe. now, walk me through that. What was going on in your mind at that time? Okay, before we go any further, I think you know, it's important to me and, uh, and that, people, that people believe what I'm saying, to, to tell you that, that I'm not blaming pornography and not saying that it caused me to go out and do certain things that I take full responsibility for whatever I've done and all the things that I've done that's not the question here the question and, and, and the issue is how this kind of literature contributed and helped mold and, and shape the kinds of violent behavior it fueled your fantasies fueled, then. well in in the beginning it fuels this kind of thought process then it, at a certain time it's instrumental in what I would say crystallizing it, making it, in, making it into something which is almost in, like a separate entity inside. And that in, at that point you're at the verge, or I was at the verge of acting out on this on this kind of these kinds of things. Uh, Mark, what do you got? 
Yeah, lovely. Okay, so he uses the metaphor there of crystallizing the personality. That's really nice. So there's the idea of personalities being almost like crystallized facets. That's not something that he's suddenly come up with, that metaphor. That's, that's a quite a common metaphor in the persona metaphor that many psychologists at that time might well be adhering to. So at this point, I start to wonder, by, by the way, I've never met this guy before. I've never seen any video of him or the guy he's talking to. I understand a little bit, but not very much about his kind of, his legend, but really nothing. But I start to think, why is he so up on his psychology here? Because um, he really is quite up. What you have to do in, in that model is integrate those facets. If you integrate those facets, you, we have different elements of our personality. And if one element doesn't know the other element is there, especially if one of those elements is quite dark and dangerous, then there's trouble. And he's really got a very good understanding of that at the time. So I start to think, who's he talking to? Who's he talking to? Why, why has he come up with this idea for this particular moment? Because me, with a bit of understanding of that analyst's point of view, I start to go, well, he's saying all the right stuff to make somebody like me go, he's either a fully integrated, you know, spent 10 years from my understanding inside, Either he's now fully integrated his personality and he totally understands and, you know, maybe we should, should you know, think about parole for this guy. Or certainly, you know, he's maybe worth yeah. a bit of a reprieve because he's, he's fully integrated himself. So um, uh, why am I starting to think that? Because is he playing me? Because if he's playing me, he's not doing a bad job of it. Like he's doing a pretty good job of playing me. Now, what he's not doing, because I don't hold the same values, his moral crusade piece isn't really hitting home with me very well. So then I start to go, oh, he's not playing me. So who is he playing? There's only one other person in the room. Uh, is that per I start to go, is that person a doctor? Is that person a psychologist? Is that person some kind of moral crusader? Because both of those would work quite well. Anyway. Good, good play because he's got his vocabulary really well on both of those, both both on the psychology uh, standpoint and on the morality moral crusade standpoint. Really good job by him. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so I'm going to take it down a little different path, but the same thing because he is using language of a psychologist everywhere you turn. But what I think he's doing is starting to weave his werewolf story. I said cat people, have you ever seen that movie? I wake up and horrible things have happened. This is what he's doing. He's starting to say, look, it's not me, it's the entity. It's the entity. Oh, it's the entity. That's handy. That's what I'm going to say next time I get pulled over for speeding. I'm going to say, I can't help it. It was the entity. I got this car. It made me drive fat. You know, that's all he's starting down that path. I agree with him, Mark. He says out loud what he is thinking for change. He says, it's important to me that people believe what I have to say. And when he does that, he goes to a modified steepling and that's power authority and he's doing the that's burns from you know from from the simpsons excellent you see him doing that but he's got amusement in his face now he also has a he has a snarky kind of a little smile naturally a little smirk but look at his face it's not this, this it's all of this in the center he's smiling his eyes are even smiling his lower face isn't so he's amused himself somehow and then he goes into that worm on a griddle movement thing as he starts talking and trying to work out what he should say. And he's working around not blaming. And you see him when he hits, hits key points to the story and Mark, he starts to talk just you can tell this is some psychology from, from prison. I need to take responsibility. There's his key point again, he's making those points. The tongue jot comes out at question here and Mark, I'm with you. We see so many tongue jots that if it's distaste, then we got a problem. Um, this is just getting you to follow down his path to believe what he believes. When he says, when Dobson says, it fueled your fantasies, you see disapproval in his face because he's trying to get a different message than that across that there's some other entity, there's some other thing. And then he, you even see a little engagement of the grief muscle and pursed lips as he's pushing that away. He's got to get across his key point. There's something else other than him. He illustrates with both hands 
and he changes his cadence and he slows is it it was instrumental and i think mark you're dead on he's trying to pr he's been talking to this guy for a year if you talk to a psychopath for a year they know more about you than you know about you because they don't have any thoughts of their own that are normal humans so they, they need to understand what you're doing and scott i'm sure somewhere in here we'll find out a little bit about sweet and sour chicken and how much they like it because that's an important part of what we're seeing here and then my this is part of the starting to be the darkest part when dobson actually says something when he says you've gone as far as you can you see him put his hands up in a regulator you got it you got it he goes mm -hmm. that spider to the fly right there come on in it'll be nice scott what do you got all right we're seeing matching and mirroring here and if you'll listen to the way to the way bundy's talking listen to the way the other guy's talking they slowly begin to to sound a lot alike listen to the words bundy uses they're really uh, these these jagged um, descriptive words that are really long words. The other guys using these really simple short words. Now, Bundy does keep up with the with the long jagged words throughout because he's got points to make, and that's the way he makes those points. He's those words, so it sounds something um, very intellectual that we're you know is the reason that he's the way he is. But listen to how they start matching up and how the how the cadence starts matching up as well. And watch the way he's sitting compared to the way the the. Uh, the interviewer is sitting because he starts doing the exact same thing this guy is doing when he starts working with his hands like this he, he may open up a couple of times with his hands like that as well but he does keep i think you're right greg he keeps that stiefling situation happening that's really really important so let's pay attention to how he's matching and mirroring what he's seeing and hearing from this guy uh especially toward the end there because it man it gets good uh chase what do you got so when he's saying I'm taking responsibility, this is kind of self-deprecating. And right here you see an eyebrow flash. And if you go through all of this and just, just pick out key moments of where the eyebrows are going up, this is during some kind of admission or self-deprecating talk. And he's continuing uh, during all of these key points in this video to do this exact same thing. All the ones we're going to see in the future, you'll see these little spikes and eyebrow flash during those key moments. This is a highly, highly intelligent guy. And this is what they call a successful psychopath because they're leveraging their capacity to use people uh, as effectively as possible. This downward eye gaze is kind of an internal dialogue spot an emotional dialogue spot where we might see. Uh, you'll see this in highly charismatic people that they actually make less eye contact then make strong powerful eye contact at key moments you'll see bill clinton do this you'll see george bush you'll see barack obama do this you'll see tom cruise do this a lot uh and at the end you can see this kind of scandal face here when he's talking about reaching a limit you can see the anthony weiner scandal face uh right there as our fact for this uh, this clip, about 95% of the psychologists at the University of Kentucky study believe that Ted Bundy also showed signs of narcissistic personality disorder, which we are very familiar with if you're a subscriber to the channel. Subscribe. Now walk me through that. What was going on in your mind at that time? Okay, before we go any further, I think I mean, it's important to me and, uh, and the people that people believe what I'm saying to tell you that that I'm not blaming pornography and not saying that it caused me to go out and do certain things and I take full responsibility for whatever I've done and all the things that I've done that's not the question here the question and, and, and the issue is how this kind of literature contributed and helped mold and and shape the kinds of violent behavior it fueled your fantasies it fueled, well in in the beginning it fuels this kind of thought process then it, at a certain time it's instrumental in what i would say crystallizing it make it in, making it into something which is almost an, like a separate entity inside and that in, at that point you're at the verge or i was at the verge of acting out on this on this kind of these kinds of now thoughts really out on this on this kind of these kinds of thoughts. now i really want to understand that you had gone about as far as you could go in your own fantasy life mm -hmm. with printed material and you made or printed and video or film Photo, or film photos, magazines yeah. what have you yeah. and and then there was the urge to take that little step or big step over to a physical right. uh, event and it happens 
it, it happened in stages, gradually. It doesn't necessarily, not to me at least, happen overnight. My experience with, I say, pornography generally, but with pornography that deals on a violent level with the sexuality, um, is that once you become addicted to it, and I look at this as a kind of addiction, uh, like other kinds of addiction, of addiction, you keep, I would keep looking for more potent, more explicit, yeah. more it's graphic kinds of material. Like an addiction, you keep craving something which is harder, harder, something which, which gives you a greater uh, sense of, uh, of, of uh, excitement. Until you reach the point where the pornography only goes so far. You reach that jumping off point where you begin to wonder if, if maybe actually doing it will give you that which is beyond just reading about it or looking at it. How long? All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, at printed material, he does a couple of things that make me want to dig in. Um, he goes, does an in-breath of apprehension, like he's going to ask something a little further. And then he says, and his blink rate increases, which is uncharacteristic for him. So something's going on. And when he says printed material, he goes down some path and says, and other and what have you. Well, hold on, hold on. That's a lead. That is a lead. When a person says, and what have you, you know, we always say intelligence hates ambiguity. You would ask, even though you might not want to know the answer in this case, you would ask, what other things did you do? Because you're probably going to find there's something more in here than what he's letting on because he has apprehension. He has a blink rate that increases and he shows some disdain. He pulls the sides of his mouth back, not just a lip compression, but a pull back. He does that tongue jut again. Mark, I'm with you. This is just what he does. Then he starts to pontificate. Here's the thing. I'll call him KP. I got it written down the same thing. Chase, we're talking about key points, sexuality and addiction. Front of mouth talking a little bit. Scotty does your fading facts as he's telling you it drifts off the end. And this is, he then tries to get his point across. I look at this as a point of addiction. He's working this guy. He knows what this guy wants to hear and he's feeding him exactly that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I think that's why you get that intake of breath on, um, on just published materials because he wants the interviewer to bring up the idea of video and cable as well because, um, because that's the bigger hit here. That's the, that's the real target here. That's how both of them can leave their mark on this. He knows it and the interviewer knows it, it's just the interviewer hasn't quite latched on to the, the way that they're both gonna go on this one. He will do eventually, he'll help him out in the end, uh, sort out what the, the biggest target is for both of them. But at this point we have, look, he's pushing all the right buttons, he's throwing all the right switches here because we've got addiction to the thrill. Now that is true for the psychopath is there's an addiction, there is a, a need for bigger and bigger and bigger uh, uh, boosts of, ad of adrenaline, uh, but also it pulls that switch on addiction. Uh, we're at the time here of Reagan, of Nancy Reagan, of Just Say No, of one of the biggest threats to, um, to conservative America is drugs. And so this person is addicted. They are a result of, of this, um, this terrible social drug situation. So this is not a perpetrator. He's now put himself in the victim role because he is a, an addict. Um, but no mention at all of the, uh, of the victims at all, nothing so far. I haven't heard a victim mentioned at all. So at the same time as him having this gentlemanly scholar air around him, which is a lovely kind of trope of, uh, of crime throughout history of the very, the highly social, antisocial person. It's the Pink Panther, essentially, the gentleman thief. It's just here we have uh, the gentleman um, psychopath, uh, extreme uh, abusive murderer. I mean, it's just one of the one of the most extreme examples. But then portraying this gentleman attitude on us at the same time, it's a beautiful play. It's exactly what we want as a TV watching public, as a video watching public. He's giving us the exact two extremes that we want. It's exactly what Sir Anthony Hopkins made Hannibal Lecter out of. He's a gentleman and he's an extreme psychological scholar 
at the same time. It's exactly what the audience want to see, to have what we call an allotropic response, which is you want to lean in and look, and at the same time, you just can't look. The two things are playing at the same time. Highly entertaining. Um, but is he really this gentleman's scholar, or is he just cold? Well, we, we know what he is in the end, but we know what he's trying to play here. And I just want you to keep noticing how this interviewer is, is a little more complicit than he's being played. Or certainly he is, the lie being told is a useful lie for this particular interviewer. And again, we'll see that play out. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? I think he gets lost in there. I think you're seeing a little bit of that that panic on him. I think is the the uh, part of what we're seeing is getting lost because he's got a lot he wants to say. He's got tons of stuff he wants to make sure he gets a specific point ac across. When he starts going down that that part where you're talking about, Greg, where he's, we see his blink rate go up, and Mark, we're talking about where things get kind of he gets kind of boxed in there. I think he gets lost and, and loses his train of thought in there. I think that's what that is because he's trying. He's he's thinking about two things at once. It's hard to keep two different things happening in your mind at the same time. Two two separate thoughts so he's trying to keep this guy on point as he charms him he's trying to get his point across at the same time so uh, go along with that ridley stroop um experiment it's tough to keep two things going at once so i think that's what we're seeing there is that that fight for one thought as it goes try to meld them into one so i think he got lost a little bit and that's where the uh, some of the panic is coming not panic but some of the stress is, is coming from that he's still trying to keep things clinical and make it sound like he's just uh, you're right mark he's just he's this guy doing this but there's this clinical thing going on with it because he's he's fine nothing wrong with this guy and you see him be that gentleman because that's his charming part he's trying to charm the pants off this guy and everybody else too but like you said earlier greg that's what happens they'll they do that to you and the next thing you know they go what's that over there man is that is that yours and you look over there and you get clocked in the head and then who knows what's gonna happen after that so i don't know i think this is getting more exciting as it goes chase what do you got yeah if if he is trying to do something and the other guy is not really following along not really picking up on it i'd say that might be an inspector clouseau uh moment right there to go with your pink panther metaphor but we saw it one time in the last video and we're seeing it again here you can hear him using the word you to talk about the journey that he took to becoming a, a serial killer he corrects it this time and he owns it so he corrects himself and now toward the end of this clip you can hear him transition to no longer talking about himself at all he is fully distanced from this behavior wanting to socialize it with a shift in the pronoun. Everything is about you, 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 you get this, you get this. This is what uh, pornography does to you. Everything's about someone else and about the person listening. But he, again, he's making these eye contact at these critical points, uh, just like highly charismatic politicians do, spending almost all of his time looking away to this, to this down to his right. Uh, and, Let's talk about Dorothy O. Lewis, who's an MD. She's a psychiatrist from the New York University Medical Center who specialized in evaluating violent offenders. She actually tried to save Bundy from death row with the argument being that he suffered from bipolar personality disorder and that he shouldn't be in jail because of that. I'll leave that to you. That's awesome. Yeah. <sighs> wow out on this on this kind of these kinds of things i really want to understand that you had gone about as far as you could go in your own fantasy life mm -hmm. with printed material and you made or printed and video or film Fol or film photos, magazines yeah. what have you yeah. and and then there was the urge to take that little step or big step over to a physical right. uh, event and it happens it, it happened in stages, gradually. It doesn't necessarily, not to me at least, happen overnight. My experience with, I say pornography generally, but with pornography that deals on a violent level with the sexuality, um, is that once you become addicted to it, and I look at this as a kind of addiction, uh, like other kinds of addiction, of addiction, you keep, I would keep looking for more potent, more explicit, more it's graphic aggressive. kinds of material. Like an addiction, you keep craving something which is harder, 
harder, something which which gives you a greater uh, sense of, of, of uh, excitement. Until you reach the point where the pornography only goes so far, you reach that jumping off point where you begin to wonder if, if maybe actually doing it will give you that which is beyond just reading about it or looking at it. How long? Reading about it or looking at it. How long did you stay at that point before you actually assaulted someone? Well, yeah, you see, <clears throat> that is a very delicate point in my own development. And we're talking about something, we're talking about having reached a point or a, a, a gray area that surrounded that point over a course of years. You don't remember years. how long that well, was? Well, I, I would say, I would say a couple of years. And what was I was dealing with there were very strong inhibitions against criminal behavior or violent behavior that had been conditioned into me, bred into me, in my environment, in my neighborhood, in my church, uh, in my school. Um, things which said, no, this is wrong. I mean, this, I mean, even to think of it is wrong, but it'll, certainly to do it is wrong. And you're on, well, I'm on that edge in these, the last, the, the, you might say, the last vestiges of restraint. Uh, the barriers to actually doing something were being tested constantly and assault uh, assailed um, through the kind of fantasy life that was fueled largely by pornography. Do you remember? Okay, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, it makes some uh, pretty strong eye contact again. Right when he's mentioning church and school, he gives this big list, but just makes eye contact when he's talking about, I go to church and I went to school. And he wants you to know that. And he corrects his pronoun shift again here when he says, you're on that edge. And he, then he says, I'm on that edge. And when he's saying this is largely fueled by pornography, there's a huge eyebrow flash for approval here to the interviewer. His cadence here is different than any other time that he's really spoken, which is few, that there's not a whole lot of video audio of him out there, but it's turned into this clinical sterility of a doctor explaining something complex to a patient who doesn't get it. And he's essentially building this in a way where he's not saying it directly, but letting you feel clever for tying the two things together. Like the, all of this is the reason for those murders. And it's kind of like when you watch the news and they talk about a woman being killed, but earlier her and her boyfriend were seen shouting at each other. They don't tie it together. They get to make you feel clever for tying those two things together. So you're more likely to watch the show later that evening. So let's go back to the University of Kentucky real quick. The majority of that same group of uh, about 100 psychologists and psychiatrists in this University of Kentucky study said that Bundy was above the diagnostic thresholds for a borderline. The and borderline personality disorder affects anywhere between uh, two to six percent of the United States population. And people with uh, borderline tend to feel emotions intensely which may be why not all of the psychologists felt that Bundy fell into this category of mental health illness. Scott, what do you got? All right. This made him uncomfortable getting in there because from what he's talking about. So he has to take a minute. That's why you hear that throat clearing and all that because it sort of brings everything to a halt and he's got to think about, oh, gosh, got a minute to set this up and deliver this right. Uh, so that's for the for all the little things we see, we see in there that let us know that he's being that he's uncomfortable. Um, this is the question he was waiting on. He's been waiting to, to, to make his point from that question at this point. So he wasn't ready for it and it caught him off guard. And this, this one's going to be short because I got so much to go here in a little while. I'm going to start making my little bit short from right here. Um, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So uh, there's a real rhythm change here from how direct he was before to how indirect he is. In fact, I, it isn't really until he lands the end of that sentence, um, that right at the end of that clip, that any of it really makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of kind of word salad in there. So I think, yeah, he's he is he is failing to find the same persona to to 
to illustrate or describe being closer to his acts of sexual violence. I think that's where the question was going is, to, is, is the question is, is getting closer to one of those acts or a first act. And as he gets closer to that act or first act, he doesn't have the erudite wordsmithing that he had because he's getting closer to the actual feelings that come over him during that, which he doesn't have words to describe. He has no, as we often don't, we don't have, you know, often we don't have words to describe even our mildest feelings. Think about the kinds of emotions that are going through somebody who's committing acts at his level. How do you describe that? And how do you describe that if your whole story is one of this is actually a clinical thing based around conditioning, based around genetics, based around clinical persona theory? He set up this whole idea of this is a bunch of psychology going on that I understand very well. And you, my specific audience in front of me, the interviewer, you could totally understand why this happens in this way the psychological medical reasoning for this he's lost reasoning because you probably don't have a great deal of social reasoning for doing what he did so he's totally in the dark right now i would suggest which is why he can't form sentences but he gets back on message because he really uh lands it uh in the pornography right at the end so he's back in there and he's back entirely with what will connect best with the Christian right at that point. So I'm getting the sense that his mark here is a is not just this person in front of him, but a whole section of society. He's marked them out as the target for his uh, for this interview because there's something instrumental that he wants them to do. And this interviewer is the conduit for that action. At this point, I'm not quite sure what it is, but I come a little surer later on. And the interviewer would like it as well. So the interviewer is gonna become more complicit as we go along on this. But I love how he loses all sense at this point, he doesn't have a description as he gets closer to the act. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, Mark, I think we're going to see a lot later of his inability to describe how that feels, but show it'll show in him. What I think here is this is exactly what made him successful as a predator. And because he can be fallible and human, you see it here, whether that's intentional, I don't know, but there's at least one or two indicators that I think he actually is intentionally stumbling through words so that he can redirect the conversation and keep it about the problem, not about him. We know that he faked arm injury, had a fake cast to lure one woman in at least, and maybe many others, so that he uses weakness as that frailty, that human frailty, as a way to get other people's sympathy. I, I think this is a clear demonstration of what made this organism successful, and he's just doing it again. When he does his key points, Chase, I'm with you. If we turn off all the sound and watch through here and see this, will have every key point to the story he wants you to believe. Now, when he does the taffy drawing, taffy pulling with his eyes, that's even more profound. And he does that in this one. When he's asked the question and he wants to redirect, Dobson is trying to take him down the path of tell me about what happened the first time. And he didn't want to go there. So he uses filler words and he pontificates and redirects instead of chaff and redirects. And he clears his voice with, <clears throat> I think this is him doing it. He avoids the question entirely and then gets back to his point of being able to talk. If you don't believe he's doing something, pay attention to his cadence. It slows at against criminal behavior, hard eye contact. Uh, then he goes to, he's talking about church. And when he does that church, he makes really hard eye contact again and his cadence is down, his brow is up. Then he uses words again, words that average people, Scott, I'm surprised you didn't say, real people don't talk like that. The last vestiges of whatever, you know, he had there. He does hard eye contact again. Then he stumbles over the words assault, assail. I think he that's a legitimate mistake on his part because you can see displeasure in his face when he does it. And then he does another source lead that I would crawl all over when he says the fantasy life that was fueled largely 
largely by porn. Hmm, largely, what does that mean? What else fueled it? What else caused that? And he, after he says pornography, he does a tongue jet. We don't think that means anything, but he also does a lip compression. When you have that much deviation, I would lean into that last sentence really hard to try to figure out, well, if it was largely fu fueled by that, what else caused it? And that's what I got. Reading about it or looking at it. How long did you stay at that point before you actually assaulted someone? Well, yeah, you see, <clears throat> that is a very delicate point in my own development. And we're talking about something, we're talking about having reached a point or a, a, a gray area that surrounded that point over a course of years. You don't remember years. how long that well, was? Well, I, I would say, I would say a couple of years. And what was I was dealing with there were very strong inhibitions against criminal behavior or violent behavior that had been conditioned into me, bred into me, in my environment, in my neighborhood, in my church, uh, in my school. Um, things which said, no, this is wrong. I mean, this, I mean even to think of it is wrong, but it, certainly to do it is wrong. And you're on, well, I'm on that edge in these, the last, the, the, you might say, the last vestiges of restraint. Uh, the barriers to actually doing something were being tested constantly and assault uh, assailed um, through the kind of fantasy life that was fueled largely by pornography. Do you remember by pornography? Do you remember what pushed you over that edge? Do you remember well, the decision to go for it? Do you remember where you decided to throw caution to the wind? Again, when you say pushed, I don't. I, I know what you're saying. I don't want to yes, infer again. I, I that, understand that. That, that I was that, 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 that I was clear. some helpless yeah. kind of a victim, and yet uh, we're talking about an influence, which that is the influence of violent types of media and violent pornography which had an was, was an indispensable link in the chain of behavior the chain of events that led to the behaviors to the to the assaults to the murders and what and what have you <laughs> it's a it's a very difficult thing to describe uh, uh, the the sensation of the of, of reaching that point where, you, where I knew that it, it was like something had, say, snapped, that I knew that, uh, that I couldn't control it anymore, that these barriers that, that I had, had been, uh, I had learned as a child uh, and had been instilled in me were not enough to hold me back with respect to seeking out and, and harming somebody. Would it be? Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I always say that when people are using charisma on you, there's a process to it. So they start off by demonstrating value. He clearly has that. He's the craziest psychopath on earth. Then they get, eventually get you down to where you belong. You create some kind of belonging with them and then let you differentiate yourself. He's creating belonging with this guy. He's working this guy pretty hard right now. Now, the guy is aware of it, and that's clear. But he's starting to differentiate him as well. He's starting to say, hey, you get it, and nobody else does. You can see it in the body language. When he starts off, you see him with that brow ridge up, like, are you getting this? This is different from the other times he's doing. He has his head kind of tilted and his brow up, like, are you getting what we're doing? That and that slight amusement is, yep, here you are. Here's what's interesting for me. It's really hard for a hardcore narcissist to ever say, I'm stupid, I'm this, I'm that. They just don't do it because they know that the minute they let that monster out of the cage, they got a problem. What we see here in him is some real dissonance, some real dissonance, because he says, uh, what words did he use exactly? Something about, and that's when you no longer could control. And then he's, he has a hell of a time trying to let that pass. He does that face of rejection. He says, it looks like he's almost saying, well, I wouldn't characterize it that way. He's got distaste in his mouth, concern in his brow, and casts his head away. That to me is him trying to figure out how do I take this next step? And then he puts his prayerful hands up, makes hard eye contact, here we are. Now he's got to figure a way to talk his way out of this. And it's the only time we see him starting to kind of do that wiggle, wiggle, wiggle in the chair. It tells me something's going on inside his head. Now, Mark, this is creep. This is creepy stuff right here. When you talk about what feeling does the person have, and he's reliving something right here is my guess. There's a whole lot of internal stuff going on, a lot of that mouth thing. 
when I see all that, I don't want to know what he's thinking, but I probably would have said, so what's going on in there now? My guess is he's reliving some of whatever joy he got from that horror, and you just don't want to hear about it. Chase, what do you got? I, you know, he goes to great lengths throughout this whole interview to protect his family uh, from negative attention which I actually think is pretty noble for a psychopath to be doing, or at least uncommon uh, to be, to be doing, but he's describing this feeling of being on the edge and his hands are out at a stop at the very beginning of this. And then he pulls it into himself. Like he's rescuing a baby and he's embracing this feeling. You can see him kind of pulling this in and, and holding it. You can see his shoulders go up and he's talking about the barriers he learned as a child. There's another eyebrow flash for acceptance. And it's kind of all I have here. Uh, but let's go back to the University of Kentucky really quick. More than 50% of the psychologists at the study labeled Bundy as having schizoid personality disorder or SPD, which you can think of as antisocial personality disorder to the extreme. And somebody with SPD has a, a kind of a lifelong pattern of indifference to other people and social isolation. And even though uh, schizoids kind of sounds like schizophrenia, they're very different. A person with uh, SPD is in touch with reality and makes sense when they speak, which Bundy, as intelligent as he was, absolutely did, which we can see in this video here. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, he wants to, uh, doesn't want to shift blame, doesn't want to shift blame, and then immediately shifts it to pornography. Okay, I, 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 I get that, but the interviewer doesn't call him out on that. So, you know, it takes two people to lie, one to lie and the other to accept the lie. And here we have somebody who shouldn't have to accept that lie, but they're going down the route of accepting it. So that causes alarm bells in me as why do you not want to call him out on this idea of pornography? Why do you want him to let him shift that blame at that point when any reasonable person watching this, knowing the legend of his background is going to go, you can't shift that responsibility. You yourself said it's all your responsibility and then you shifted it immediately. That that begs belief but we both are complicit now in taking us into what is from my point of view a quite unbelievable world for both of them he then goes to then he could not hold it back so now he's created greg as you said earlier on he's created the other entity in there now again that's that idea of the outside entity, the, the, the thing that possesses you it, at this point in history has started to become a popular cultural norm. And so we as the TV viewing public, uh, you know, if we're watching cable TV, uh, that's, that's a norm that we have, that there is the possibility, the fantasy there that you can be overcome by something external to yourself, a part of your personality or, or an outside entity, some kind of alien that, that takes you over. He's starting to tell that kind of story. Again, he's not, he's not, the interviewer doesn't pick up on that and say, well, no, hang on. Surely it was you. You did this. Doesn't pick up on that at all. Um, what interests me most about this is that for somebody again who was quite erudite, and I get Greg that he that he may be playing this stumbling on purpose, but I think you're also right that here is the point where the act is a tangible thing in front of him, full of uh, feelings for him, which his personality would not be used to being able to mediate. He has no way of describing these things. He has no way of controlling them. And they and, and, and we, though we may have many of the same feelings and the extremes when they come, we have mediators in that. We've been told by our parents and by and by many cultural entities around us. Um, and maybe we just haven't had access to the uh, to the extreme pornography that he that turned him into the monster that he is and means he doesn't have these mediators. But certainly what's interesting for me is for somebody who has been so erudite about 
psychology and psychoanalysis. At this point, he is devoid of description, which again means we're probably more into the truth here and the truth of he has no real understanding of the psychology at all. He is not integrated in any way. And there is something, I don't know how to describe it, but of an a less, an inhuman or what we might feel to be uh, inhuman passions in him, behaviors which he cannot control, he can't even describe, and the acts that come out of that are in um, unseeable and indescribable by most sane human beings. He he doesn't even know what it is. Uh, it's that for me is not an act. He doesn't know what he's really got in front of him right now. Scott, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I'm not going to go that deep. I think he's trying to get his point across here. This is really important that he gets the point across here that this isn't his fault. Again, going back to the same story he's weaving throughout this whole thing. Then he has that painful look and all that. Then he flips right back to normal. There's a flat affect as he looks at the at, at uh, the interviewer. What's the interviewer's name, Greg? What the, what's his guess? Dobson. Dr. James Dobson. Dobson. Yeah, yeah. I always call him the interviewer. Uh, as he looks right back at him. So that just... that shows us exactly he's just reset and he's nothing has changed he's staying right there trying to get his point across and all that uh he knows he he's familiar with emotions and what they look like he just doesn't know the intricacies of making that happen so it looks real so that's why it's starting to look odd a lot of people are starting to really like maybe not really like him but you're you're starting to feel like it's not so bad you know as you see him talk and you listen to him see him go through all these things and putting that problem over there that's not him he keeps telling you that's that's that over there is, is what caused it right away over there so that feeling you're getting for those of you who have fallen into this won't be very many of you that's what's happening you're seeing a psychopath be a psychopath and the whole time this guy listening is just riveted He's like, he's all up in it, man. And he's not asking anything, Mark, because he, he doesn't know to. He's he's, he's, he's going to forgive him. No matter what happens, this cat's going to forgive him for it. That's his job. That's what he does. That's what he represents is all those things. While at the same time, he, if you turn the sound down on this and watch this guy, the, the, the Dobson guys, he's, he's talking to him in this. It looks like he's asking him if he can be wormed. That's, that's how sort of painful and just open faced he is on this it just that's what it looks like to me anyway so um yeah we're just seeing a psychopath be a psychopath here and um he's getting his point across staying staying in line making sure everything happens the way it should all right we good about pornography do you remember what pushed you over that edge do you remember well, the decision to go for it do you remember where you decided to throw caution to the wind Again, when you say pushed, I don't. I, I know what you're saying. I don't want to yes. infer again. I, I that, understand that. That, that I was that, 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 that I was clear. some helpless yeah. kind of a victim, and yet uh, we're talking about an influence, which that is the influence of violent types of media and violent pornography, which had an was, was an indispensable link in the chain of behavior, the chain of events that led to the behaviors, to the, to the assaults, to the murders, and what, and what have you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to describe. Uh, we, uh, the, the sensation of, the, the, uh, of, of reaching that point where, you, where I knew that it, it was like something had, say, snapped. That I knew that uh, that I couldn't control it anymore. That these barriers that that I had had been uh, I had learned as a child uh, and had been instilled in me were not enough to hold me back with respect to seeking out and, and harming somebody. Would it be Ted after you committed your first murder? What was the emotional effect on you? What happened in the days after that? Again, this. Please understand that that even all these years later, it is very difficult to, to talk about it, and, to, and and reliving it through talking about it, to, 
it, it's uh, difficult to say the least, but I want you to understand what happened. It was like coming out of some kind of horrible trance or, or dream. Um, I can only liken it to after, you know, I, I don't want to over-dramatize it, but to have been possessed by something so awful and so alien, and then the next morning wake up from it, remember what happened, and realize that basically, I mean, in, in the eyes of the law, certainly in the eyes of God, you're responsible uh, to, have, to wake up in the morning and, and realize what I had done. And with a clear mind and all my essential moral and ethical feelings intact at that moment, uh, uh, absolutely horrified that I was capable of doing something like that. You really. All right, Chase, what do you got? I think there's an element of honesty here, believe it or not. I think there is a regret period that follows a lot of these murders with uh, psychopaths where they uh, are. The regret is mostly centered around fear of being caught and fear of, of what they did or being judged by family members and people that are close to what they did. Uh, it doesn't come across as emotional accessing here uh, because there aren't many emotions in there at all. And he's making eye contact with these very key points right in the video. You can see it. And the key points are I was in a trance. I was possessed. Eye contact right at those quick moments and then looks back down. It was like an alien encounter. And then you wake up from it. You're responsible. What I had done, my ethical feelings intact. And then finally, his last eye contact capable of doing something like that right at those little moments. And that's a pure, perfect example of a true psychopath using some kind of charisma manipulation. It's exactly what's happening there. Getting you to connect on very deep key points. In 1989, the night before his execution, Bundy had an interview with a psychologist named James Dobson, PhD. The video you're actually watching right now, during which he diagnosed himself, since I'm going on all these diagnoses, He's diagnosing himself as an addictive disorder personality or a porn addict is what he diagnosed himself as. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, we can only wish that he'd gotten like Bozo, the clown videos or something else when he was young and maybe he would have turned into a comic. Who knows? Yeah. This guy is, there's some reason for everything that happens to him. And when he starts this, you see blinking. I think he's processing for how to answer a question. And then he is calculating what to say and you hear him out breathe out pretty heavily like an exasperation for what to say and then he starts to use words that make him sound like a human being he actually starts talking about feelings and that kind of stuff my note says listen to him acting like a human being he isn't he's a monster he's a stalker he's a murderous dead murderous human being if we want to call him that he's walking the borderline here between being a hardcore narcissist and asking for pity that's a dangerous thing for those guys and they're only going to do it when they think there's a benefit to it. They don't want to be perceived as weak, for sure. Well, now he doesn't have to worry about being perceived as weak in prison because he knows the next day is going away. I have no doubt that this is kind of a, every time I've heard his story, I believe it builds up and then he kills and then he gets a break and it builds up. And I've heard him say that over and over and over when you see all the, in, all the interviews with him. But you're seeing why people trusted him because he is capable of using words that sound like a normal human being. And he puts that out there when he needs it. And then he does your, closed eye talking, Chase, and he does every time, like I said, we both are on the same page, that locked eye contact with a request for approval when he's got his key points of his story. I'm telling you, when I listen to this, all I see is a scene from Cat People or American Werewolf in London or some movie from the 80s that he watched where you wake up in the morning, there's a dead body in your hotel room, and you're like, how'd that happen? That's what he's making this out to be. Yeah, I get it. He did some monstrous stuff. He probably didn't think he was ever capable of that. But he doesn't say, I didn't do it ever. He says, I was, what was this word? I was horrified that I was capable of doing this. Well, he wasn't horrified enough to go do something about it, to do something else. And we'll hear him go further and further into more of this pushing blame off of self and onto something else as we go into here. But this is a werewolf story. Mark, what do you got? Yep. So uh, gesture wise, I love the, the steeple at the start, which is taking the high ground and then to the lips to the high ground of silence. So it is it is a a 
a status imperative. Status. <laughs> status. Thank you. Everybody can drink now. Nobody uh, jumped in with me. What happened? <laughs> I, was, I was going to. Was, it we've is been a, waiting on that. It is like, a, where do we do it? a status play. <laughs> status. 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 Uh, to, to take the silence, to, to say nothing. Of course, it isn't a status play. Status. It's, yes, status. exactly. He doesn't want to say anything because it won't play to his agenda to actually describe what really happens in this situation. Uh, and he says, you know, it's difficult to talk about. I, I don't think it's actually difficult for him to talk about the acts. I'm sure he's done that time and time again and, and quite possibly enjoyed doing that. Maybe difficult for him to describe the feelings around that because of his disconnect with feelings. But, but to, this, to talk about the acts, no, I think that's, that's a lie. But he plays the status of not talking about it. Status. Thank status. You. It's the last time you'll hear that from me. Uh, and now he is, is the victim again, and he starts playing these classic mems throughout cinema and literary history. We've got uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde there. We've got the Sonambul Sonambulist, the, 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 the first ever horror film, the, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Um, he, he plays that idea. I was in a trance. He's then got like alien abduction. He's got all of them in there. All of these possibilities, they're being taken over by an entity all these mems in popular culture that might cause us to go yeah no i totally get it you were you were you were sleepwalking there was a part of you that was a monster that you're not in control of you were taken over by an entity you were visited in the night by things from another planet all of those very very reasonable so that we can go okay uh, we let you off this is a bigger problem than just you this is a big world problem going on here. Go about your business. Um, and, and then he ends again, he really lands it at the ends of his paragraphs there, where he goes, um, ethics and morals intact, and then <laughs> checks in with the interviewer to go, you're buying this? Are you into this? Are you are we going along with this one? And of course, the interviewer uh, doesn't go, well, come on, mate ethics and morals intact. You have no morals, you have no ethics. And here's why, as we're about to find out, the ethics and morals that he have, has, or does not have, fits with the agenda of the interviewer. The interviewer just isn't some doctor. Uh, he's a very politically connected uh, individual who has a massive agenda for this whole thing. And I'll come to why psychopaths are really useful for social agendas uh, in one moment. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. This is great because he's asking about emotions and he has none. He doesn't understand it. So he doesn't know what they are. He understands what they are. He knows what they are, but he doesn't have any. So he's acting. He has to because he has no idea how to talk about emotions describe them and what they do because he's seen them he knows he's got to imitate he's got to imitate them and learn how to look like he has emotions but he doesn't know how to word it because he doesn't have those feelings he can't describe feelings because he has none and he's never had any and that long breath and he's looking for the, from his depth of pain and all that stuff he's doing it wrong he's doing it wrong that's why it looks so weird and it looks so odd and that guy keeps and Dobson keeps looking at him. And if you look when Dobson's looking at him he's it looks like again almost like a confusion of uh, of that doesn't look right to me. But then again, he's wide open. He's going to, his thing there, his mode usually is to forgive people for what they've done and move along and try to be everybody's good and all that. But he doesn't understand what a psychopath is. And he really doesn't, doesn't understand that's what he's dealing with and what's being done to him at that point. So he, he as he goes on, he describes this possession. All these things again, making sure he lets him know it's not his fault, man. No, it's he's been possessed. Something else has got him. It's not his fault at all. So we're seeing acting. He doesn't. He doesn't have feelings. Never had emotions, and he doesn't know how to describe them. So that's why it's it's odd going through there looking like that. And those emotions don't look that. His sadness emotions don't look the way they should because he doesn't know how to execute those. Ted, after you committed your first murder, what was the emotional effect on you? What happened in the days after that? Well, 
well, again, this, please understand that, that even all these years later, it's very difficult to, to talk to about talk it, about and, and, and reliving it through talking about it uh, is it, uh, difficult to say the least, but I want you to understand uh, what happened. It was like coming out of some kind of horrible trance or, or dream. Um, I can only liken it to after, you know, I, I don't want to over-dramatize it, but to have been possessed by something so awful and so alien, and then the next morning wake up from it, remember what happened and realize that basically, I mean, in, in the eyes of the law, certainly in the eyes of God, you're responsible to, have, to wake up in the morning and, and realize what I had done. And with a clear mind and all my essential moral and ethical feelings intact at that moment, uh, uh, absolutely horrified that I was capable of doing something like that. You really, something like that. You really hadn't known that before. Uh, there is just absolutely no way to describe. First, the brutal urge to do that kind of thing, and then what happens is once it, it has been more or less satisfied and recedes, you might say, or is spent, that, that sense, that kind of energy level recedes, and basically I became my, myself again. I, I want people to understand this too, and I'm not saying this gratuitously because it's important that people understand this. That basically, I was a normal person. Uh, I, I wasn't uh, some guy hanging out uh, at bars or a bum, or um, I wasn't a pervert in the sense that you know people look at somebody and say, "I know there's something wrong with him," and just tell. I mean, I I was essentially a normal person. I had good friends. I I. Uh, I led a normal life, except for this one small but very potent and very destructive segment of it that I kept very secret and very close to myself and didn't let, let anybody know about it. And part of the shock and horror for my dear friends and family when, years ago when I was first arrested was that they just, there was no clue. They looked at me and they looked at the, you know, the, um, the all-American boy, and I'm, uh, I mean, I wasn't perfect, but it's, it's, it, I want to yeah, be quite candid with you. I was, it, yeah. I was okay, okay, uh, I was. And the basic humanity and, and basic spirit that God gave me was intact, but it, unfortunately it became overwhelmed at times. And I think people need to recognize that it's not some kind of... The, 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 those of us who are, who have been so much influenced by violence in the media, in particular pornographic violence, are not some kinds of inherent monsters. We are your sons and we are your husbands. And we grew up in regular families. And pornography can reach out and snatch a kid out of any house today. He, he snatched me out of my home, it snatched me out of my home 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and as diligent as my parents were, uh, and they were diligent in protecting their children, and as good a Christian home as we had, and we had a wonderful Christian home, uh, there is no protection against the kinds that the kinds of influences that are loose in a society that, that, that tolerates. Greg, what do you got? Uh, okay, he starts off with a contemptuous smile. You can't miss that half smile. And then he goes to what you, Scott, call fading facts. I call swallowing words. They just disappear. And when he asks, that's when he's asking him, at, you really hadn't known? Then he gives this non answer, this stammering, rambling thing until he gets his feet back under him. And he starts talking about being a normal person. He's using words that Scott, you'll say, he has no understanding of. I think you're probably right. I would ask him, what does normal mean to you? Let him d define it. He even then tries quickly to say, look, I didn't hang out in bars. I wasn't a bum. I was not a pervert that anybody could tell. He even clarifies that. I think that's one of the weirdest ones of the whole thing. Nobody could look at him and think he was a pervert. Um, 
and he nose touches when he says that. Now, he has, doesn't touch his nose a lot in here. We're going to see more when he gets to some of the more profound moments in this. We'll see him manipulating his mouth and touching his nose more than usual. He raises his head again, and he looks back up. He actually turtles. We didn't see, we didn't see that much in this thing. And I've been cautious not to talk about shoulder movement because his hands are cuffed. And if you've ever dealt with cuffed people, it's hard to read shoulder movement. It's just tough. But he does turtle in this case. And he said, except for this one small Anybody else think that's a really poor choice of words to call this problem a small problem? That's, in his mind, it's okay to call it that. He says, I wasn't perfect. What does that mean? I would ask him, what is perfect? I was okay. He's using convincing language. And then he goes to this whole thing, and I'll just, I won't stay here a lot. I'll just talk about when he gets to Christian again. Chase, the same thing you and I keep bringing up. Locked eye contact and brow up when he's telling his key points to his stories. And now he's going to tell us about this virus that creates werewolves out of your brothers, sisters, whatever. And he's just looking for a way to push all that off so that he's creating some kind of humanity. And Mark, I'm with you. He knows his audience. He knows that it's not, you know, it's not atheist watching Dobson's channel. It's the conservative right. And this is the, the Reagan era. This is actually the Bush era, but Reagan Bush era. And it is a big move. And this guy had a big program. Uh, he still had the things still out there called Focus on the Family. This is tightly tied. And it was one of his crusades is anti-alcohol, anti-pornography. And so you, he will start feeding in what you need to hear. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think there's, there's so much going on here because his focus here is to really make sure he explains the problem and it's not him, how he was a normal guy. And he goes through explaining all these things. And I think what you're seeing is him being uncomfortable doing that because he's just making this, this all up. He knows what he has to say. He's thought about this before. He's got his story. I'm going to have to tell him I was normal. Everything was fine except for this one little thing, the part where he cut off people's heads and stuff. But he didn't, didn't say that. He just calls it this one little thing and, so, and, and tries to make that almost non-existent. After everything was perfect. Came from a Christian family. He was a good guy. He really was. Oh, Teddy was a good boy. He was all these things that were wonderful. And he's building this picture in his mind. So this guy will, as as is his gig, as his job to do, is forgive him for what he's done and go forward being positive with him. But he's trying to convince this guy that he's not a bad guy and it's not his fault. Um, and he's coming on like he's just this, his family just could have gone to this guy's church. Very sane. Very sane people that, that he hangs out with and, and preaches to and talks to. The same kind of folks. That's who that's who he is and where he came from and who his folks are. So as he's creating this normal person that, that has been destroyed by this outside force that came in and just and just destroyed this this normal good old boy, this good old Teddy when he was a, just a young kid and that's what it all that's what it all happened so again i'm still going down that same road he's trying to convince him that he's a normal guy everything's fine you're right that lock eye contact and and lock him with him on the most important parts he's just being a psychopath that's what they do that's what they do all right uh mark what do you got yeah so his imagery here is is brilliant uh, the all-american boy which is your sons your husbands okay imagine yourself sitting at home in a conservative Christian America and hearing that your sons, your husbands, good Christian people are liable to turn into him if you don't take out pornography, if you don't turn out and specific stuff that is on cable television. Now, it just so happens that that agenda is the exact agenda of the interviewer. That's what he funds, is the taking out of that. I get that there's a Christian idea of the forgiveness, but this person is, is, that he's being interviewed by is a moral crusader who puts money and, and action behind that crusade to take out specific media that he believes, along with uh, Bundy pretending that he believes that that is the root of all evil and that it is legion across across the media right now. So he's spinning him almost an exact copy of Dobson's own ideology. Yeah, and we know it's ideology because we can predict exactly what he's going to say next, exactly what he's going to say, say next. Now, so what's interesting for me about this and that he's he's bringing forward some of these classic Reagan, you know, family values 
ideology is that in society, some psychopaths are incredibly useful and societies do use them in order to push forward an agenda. And I'd say, unfortunately, that's what's happening now. And that's why Dobson is so accepting of the story, the lies that have been put forward by Bundy right now, because the lies are useful. Lying is one of our most important social skills. Knowing when to do it and when to tell the truth is important. But accepting a lie is a really important social skill. And if you have a specific social agenda, it's very important to accept some of the extreme lies that some people will tell. And the extreme lie here is that pornography or, or even just violent movies on um, on what we would consider now normal TV is actually the thing that will corrupt America. Very similar to a great film, go and watch it, it's called Reefer Madness. And it uses the exact same setup of ordinary kids, just ordinary good American kids, and all you need is a little toke on that and it's suddenly the whole of society falls to bits. Um, it's fantastic spin. When I f first started watching this, I didn't expect to get any of this, I didn't expect any, I didn't know what was gonna come along. I thought we were just gonna get, you know, a fairly extreme psychopath doing that kind of stuff. I didn't think we were gonna get some extreme social agenda going on and everybody impl complicit in it. I think it's fantastic. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I, I agree with you. And he starts this off by saying that the urge was brutal and not the crime. Pay attention to that. So that's some pretty powerful language. The urges were were powerful. He recoils kind of at this word pervert, like you were talking about, Greg, then kind of wrinkles his face, maybe in what he's concealing disgust or trying to overcome the expression of disgust. This is a, a, a key point for the interrogator. It's wiping his face, uncharacteristic, boom, 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 three in a row. Key point for the interrogator to use this word later in, in the interview. I know I'm going to use the word pervert later on. Maybe I'll, I'll use it to piss him off. Maybe I'm going to use it to say, I know you're not one of those X, Y, Z type of people. It just depends on where the interview goes. But here we also see the shift that we saw in video number one, when he was talking about the boys and how the boys acted, the antisocial behavior of the boys. We aren't monsters. We are your sons. We are your husbands. We grew up with these regular lives. And pornography here is described as a kidnapper. Pornography is a kidnapper. It snatched him from his home. So he normalizes this behavior in a way that anyone could do what he did. Just one drop, like Mark, you were saying, just one drop. You get one nudie mag, as they probably called it in the time of these uh, this interview here. So during one super interesting psychiatry podcast called Ted Bundy, The Dark Triad, several experts uh, that were on this podcast who are medical experts and psychology experts were commented that the serial killer showed signs of an extreme form of narcissism called Machiavellianism, which is another diagnosis since I'm talking about that so much. This personality trait named after this Renaissance Italian political philosopher named Machiavelli describes a person who's going to deceive and exploit people in order to achieve their personal goals no matter who it hurts or no matter how many people get affected or, or downtrodden in the process. Like that. You really hadn't known that before? Uh, there is just absolutely no way to describe first the brutal urge to do that kind of thing and then what happens is once it it has been more or less satisfied and recedes, you might say, or is spent that, that sense, that kind of energy level recedes. And basically, I became my, myself again. I, and I want people to understand this too, and I'm not saying this gratuitously because it's important that people understand this, that basically I was a normal person. Uh, I, I wasn't uh, some guy hanging out uh, at bars or a bum or... Um, I wasn't a pervert in the sense that, you know, people look at somebody and say, I know there's something wrong with him and just tell. I mean, I, I was essentially a normal person. I had good friends. I, I uh, 
I led a normal life, except for this one small but very potent and very destructive segment of it that I kept very secret and very close to myself and didn't let, let anybody know about it. And part of the shock and horror for my dear friends and family when, years ago when I was first arrested was that they just, there was no clue. They looked at me and they looked at the, you know, the, um, the all-American boy. And I'm, uh, I mean, I wasn't perfect, but it was, it, I yeah, want to be quite candid with you. I was, it, yeah. I was okay, okay? Uh, I was. Uh, the basic humanity and, and basic spirit that God gave me was intact, but it, unfortunately it became overwhelmed at times. And I think people need to recognize that it's not some kind of... The, 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 those of us who, are, who have been so much influenced by violence in the media, in particular pornographic violence, are not some kinds of inherent monsters. We are your sons and we are your husbands. And we grew up in regular families. And pornography can reach out and snatch a kid out of any house today. He, he snatched me out of my home, it snatched me out of my home 20, 30 years ago. And, and as diligent as my parents were, And they were diligent in protecting their children. And as good a Christian home as we had, and we had a wonderful Christian home, uh, there is no protection against the kinds that the kinds of influences that are loose in a society that, that, that tolerates. Mm -hmm. You feel this really deeply, don't you? Ted, outside these walls right now, there are several hundred reporters that wanted to talk to you. Yeah. And you asked me to come here from California because you had something you wanted to say. This hour that we have together uh, is not just an interview with a man who's scheduled to die tomorrow morning. I am here and you're here because of this message that you're talking about right here. You really feel that hardcore pornography and the doorway to it, softcore pornography, is doing untold damage to other people and causing other women to be abused and killed the way you did others. Listen. I'm no social scientist, and I haven't done a survey. I mean, I, I don't pretend that I know what John Q. Citizen thinks about this. <clears throat> but I've lived in prison for a long time now. And I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence just like me. And without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography without question, without exception deeply influenced and consumed by an addiction to pornography. There's no question about it. The FBI's own study on serial homicide shows that the most common interest among serial killers is pornography. Yeah, that's true. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I'm just going to say one thing. Who needs Ted Bundy doing this spin when the interviewer will just do it for him? The interviewer has now taken over the spin. And that's not because he's being duped by a psychopath. That's because he's useful for him. This is verbatim what, you know, it, it's no surprise. There could be a hundred other people who were chosen. Could have been a hundred other people who accepted. This is the marriage that's going on right now. This is the marriage that has happened right now before his execution. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, that, you know, Dobson felt, um, felt some sympathy for him in the end, or certainly saw how if you could keep him alive a bit longer, then you'd be able to use him even further as a tool. This, for, for Dobson's agenda, this is a really powerful tool because he doesn't pick him up on his crooked logic there, which is correlation is, is not causation. Yeah, without, without exception, every violent offender has this kind of relationship with violent pornography, 
Well, there's also a bunch of other correlations that we could put together, some of them so outlandish and some of them so possible, but potentially none of them actually relevant or none of them the actual causation of this. And the interviewer does not pick up on that. This is a psychiatrist. This is a good, you know, psychologist. Good. He understands logic. He doesn't pick him up on that logic at all. He doesn't bring that logic to his audience and, and say, look, audience, you shouldn't really pay any attention to this crooked logic going on here. Why? It's not useful for him to bring up the crooked logic that, that goes on. He's now just delivering his message. And I would say uh, he knows it. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so a long time ago, when I took one of my first corporate gigs, there was an ERP solution that had failed, and they hired a bunch of people to go in and fix it. And I remember sitting in the room my first day there, and I didn't have glasses on those days, and I was doing this. And the reason I was doing it was to avoid having to pay attention to the train wreck unraveling in front of me. I didn't know what to say. These guys all outranked me. And when finally the guy I worked for said, Greg, are you feeling stressed? I just opened my eyes and said, no, I wonder how all you people have jobs. And that was because I was trying to avoid everything. That's exactly what this guy's doing, exactly what he's doing, because he doesn't know how to feel. Scott, you're dead on. This is just a shell. This guy didn't know what to say or how to feel. If he did, when he took his hands away from his eyes, you would see disrot, you would see musculature moving in his face as he tried to come back to normal. There's nothing, nothing. It's flat, there's no affect at all, and he just opens his face. He can't cry because he doesn't know how to cry. He figures if he puts his head down, he'll look like he's crying. This is just another spider to the fly move. Come on in, come on in, I'm waiting for you. But Mark, to your point, he doesn't need to. He starts talking for him. Then he does, if you ever do reenactment, in reenactment, there's a whole group of people they would call far bees. A person who would come up and say, far be it from me to judge your kit, but boom. That's exactly what he does here. He does a disclaimer ahead of his resume statement, to use your words, Chase, and then he goes into a hell of a resume statement. He goes into, I'm no social scientist. That When somebody says something like that, that's a predecessor to, but I'm gonna tell you what a social scientist would tell you. That's exactly what they're saying. He clears his throat and he starts that diatribe. Here are my credentials. Apart from being a werewolf, I've been in prison for a long time. I conf I've confronted others like me, I've confronted myself, I've met a lot of folks, and, 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 and. Then he tells you, this is all about this. He's closing to give this guy what he wants so the guy will let him finish what he has to say next. And then he takes some sort of moral high ground as he quotes an FBI study. That's holy ground. Now I've got credentials. And he does a little compression. This guy, whether Mark, the guy's okay with him working or not, he's being worked, clearly. And if this were working, now, this is a psychologist who knows exactly what he's looking at. Imagine this is Susie Q. Homemaker. This is Susie Q. College student. This is a woman coming home from work at night, whatever it is. And you meet this guy, and he can use all these tools at his disposal and knows not to let you see that he has no emotion. Imagine how powerful that is. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, totally agree. And I will say this, I will admit this, that 15 minutes or so into meeting this guy, I probably wouldn't know he's a psychopath. I, uh, With all of my training and all of our training that we talk about a lot, we can get duped in, in sh these short-term interactions by these people as well as anybody else. When we teach, like this is how you spot a psychopath, we are looking from the outside. So it's hard to see it once you're inside of that bubble. And that's why this repetitive training to get yourself up on this just awareness is really important. There's no vaccination against these people. So you've got to be on your best game. So I just want you to know that I could be duped by this, uh, this kind of person. This message he's delivering really seems like a sincere desire to get the word out because I'm thinking he's got a day to live. Why the porno thing? But then I thought, what would a narcissist agree to do an interview for? Uh, extreme narcissist. And how would they agree to make an interview? And he sought this reporter out. So he's basically thinking, how can I do this interview and be a hero? So the only way that I can take a hero angle is to take a stance against something that lots of people don't like. And I think that's what we're really doing here. It's a battle cry against a false aggressor. So this 
I think this red herring maneuver is performed extremely well as his communication is damn near perfect on this to the average person, except for the emotional impact on things where there's not emotion to speak of. Antisocial personality disorder. Let's talk about that real quick. This group of psychologists, which is 73 in total at the University of Kentucky, uh, wanted to study Ted Bundy's mental health, and the majority of them agreed that he had antisocial personality disorder. Nearly 80% believe that Bundy was a perfect example of the disorder, checking off all of the, the DSM criteria at the time, whatever number it was, of egocentrism acting on personal gratification, this law of uh, social uh, norms, lacking empathy, antagonism, disinhibition, and antisocial personality disorder and psychopathy are not the same thing. They're not the same thing. So you can have, you can be a psychopath and have that. All of them do. You can have uh, antisocial personality without being a full-blown psychopath. Interesting fun fact for the day. Scott, what do you got? Fun facts and, fun facts and psychopaths Ted with Bundy. <laughs> Chase Hughes. All right. I agree with you completely there. We're seeing more. I'll keep this one short. We're seeing him act again like everybody's been saying. He's just acting. And that whole business of, of pressing on his tear ducts, that's where he got the tears from. You know, that that breathing in through his teeth, that sucking in through his teeth, that's just over the top. He doesn't know what he's, he doesn't know how to do that. But he is suckering this guy in. The guy's coming in. He's letting him take over. And, oh, poor pitiful me. And he doesn't know how to ask the kind of questions we would ask somebody. You know, Dobson. So he's he, so that I think that's what I agree with the Mark. I think that's what's happened there. He just he doesn't know how to he doesn't know how to do that. So he sort of let the guy take over at that point. I got nothing new on this one because it's just uh, we're seeing a psychopath be a psychopath at this point. If you are a reporter or you interview people at all for a living, even if it's like for a job interview or something, there is a book that you have to buy. It's worth about 7,000 times whatever you're going to spend on it when you order it on Amazon. It's this book right here by James Pyle and Marianne Carinch. This is the book that got me started in understanding uh, how to ask better questions and how to get information out of people. Find out anything from anyone, anytime. Fantastic book. You, you feel this really deeply, don't you? Ted, outside these walls right now, there are several hundred reporters that wanted to talk to you. Yeah. And you asked me to come here from California because you had something you wanted to say. This hour that we have together uh, is not just an interview with a man who's scheduled to die tomorrow morning. I am here and you're here because of this message that you're talking about right here. You really feel that hardcore pornography and the doorway to it, softcore pornography, is doing untold damage to other people and causing other women to be abused and killed the way you did others. Listen. I'm no social scientist, and I haven't done a survey. I mean, I, I don't pretend that I know what John Q. Citizen thinks about this. <clears throat> but I've lived in prison for a long time now. And I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence just like me. And without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography without question, without exception deeply influenced and consumed by an addiction to pornography. There's no question about it. The FBI's own study on serial homicide shows that the most common interest among serial killers is pornography. Yeah, that's true. If, you know, if I were able to ask you the questions that are being asked out there, mm -hmm. uh, one of the most important as you come down to perhaps your final hours are you thinking about all those victims out there and their families well, who are so wounded? You know, years later, their lives have not returned to normal. They will never return to normal. Absolutely. Are, are you carrying that load, that weight? Is the remorse there? Again, I, I know that people will accuse me of being self-serving, but we're beyond that now. I mean, I'm just telling you how I feel. 
but through God's help, I have been able to come to the point where I, much too late, but better late than never, feel the hurt and the pain that I am responsible for. Yes, absolutely. In the past few days, myself and a number of investigators have been talking about unsolved cases, murders that I was involved in. And it's hard to it's hard to talk about all these years later because it revives in me all those terrible feelings and those thoughts that I have steadfastly and, 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 and diligently dealt with, and I think successfully, with the love of God. And yet it's reopened that and I felt the pain and I felt the horror again of all that. And I can only hope that those who I have harmed, those who I've caused so much grief, even if they don't believe my expression of sorrow and remorse, will believe what I'm saying now, that there is loose in their towns and their communities, people like me today, whose dangerous impulses are being fueled day in and day out by violence in the media in its various forms, particularly sexualized violence. And what scares me, and let's come into the present now, because what I'm talking about happened 30, 20, 30 years ago, that is, in my formative stages. And what scares and appalls me, Dr. Dobson, is when I see what's on cable TV, some of the movies, I mean, some of the violence in the movies uh, that come into homes today was stuff that they, that they wouldn't show in yeah. X-rated adult theaters 30 years ago. This stuff... The slasher this, movies that you're talking about. That stuff <clears throat> is, I'm telling you, from personal experience, the most, that is graphic violence mm -hmm. on screen particularly as it gets into the home to children who may be unattended or, or unaware that they may be a Ted Bundy who has that, that vulnerability to that, that predisposition to be influenced by that kind of behavior, by that kind of, of, of uh, movie, that kind of violence. There are kids sitting out there switching the TV dial around and come upon these movies late at night or I don't know when they're on, but they're on and any kid can watch them. It's scary when I think what would have happened to me if I had seen. I'm scary enough. I mean, that I just ran into stuff outside the home, but to, to, to know that children are watching that kind of thing today, or can pick up their phone and dial away for it, or send away for it. Uh... Uh, Chase, what do you got? Every single ounce of pain that he describes here is about himself. He's asked about the victims. He describes the pain that he endured. And psychopathy is a personality trait that falls under antisocial. And people with antisocial disorder have kind of a long-term pattern of violating the rights of other human beings without remorse. And one of the people in the study, let's go into this study again. Dr. Thomas Whittaker says that uh, Dr. Harvey Cleckley's analysis is mostly accurate when he said, and I quote, however, Bundy would also be diagnosed with necrophilia, paraphilia, and sadism more precisely. And that's what I got here. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I was just saying, I would absolutely hire him as a speechwriter. It's, it's actually brilliant what he's done there. He started off with that the trigger for him was the trash that people were throwing out of their houses and him in the highways and byways picking up that stuff. That's mm -hmm. the thing that developed him. Now the trash is in the home and it's coming through your cable TV and Dobson helps him by going the slasher movies. He goes, yeah, the slasher movies. So he's now, he's, now you are not safe. Concerned mothers of America, it is in your home right now. Yeah, your kids, your kids would be safer walking the streets. It gets piped through your TV right now. That's how bad it is. This is utterly brilliant what he's, what he's doing here. And Dobson is not stopping him. He is not saying, hold on a moment. 
that isn't accurate, that's not true, you can't perpetrate that kind of mythology on the audience. You, it is you and you alone. You are an utterly unique uh, and, and, and outlier personality of the most extreme. He's allowing him to perpetuate this mythology of the trash is now in your home and it's called cable TV. I mean, it's just, uh, I don't know. At this point, I'm not quite sure who I'm most disgusted by. Uh, both of them, I think. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, <clears throat> my favorite part of this whole thing is he asks a question, Dobson asks a question and feeds the answer in what we would refer to as a leading question. And by that, uh, he projects and asks something about, is there remorse there for you? Did you hear a single word about remorse? in the entire now i project the answer i want you you must feel remorse never comes up once he goes on to ramble and you know he's going to because he goes and gets a good breath before he starts down that path and he delivers a sermon of sorts honestly he just goes on and on and on about the problem is this and the problem is that the problem's never me the problem is this and then he this i don't want to talk about that for fear it will revive all these terrible feelings in me i think he's that's an honest thing when he says these terrible feelings he's not talking about horror he's talking about the other feelings, all these things. The other thing to watch is now we're starting to see him manipulate his mouth and watch the times he does it. He talks about children being at home alone and he talks about horror. Those things are inside his head deep in there that caused him to do that. I would start paying attention every time I notice him touching his mouth, we'll see it increase as he starts to talk more and more closely about the actual acts. I think he's got something deep in there. And every time he touched her, I'd just start making notes and poke and prod when he did that. Reviving me all those terrible feelings. There's not a single word about remorse. I felt the pain and horror of all that. I don't think he's pontificating at this point. I think he clearly knows what he's trying to get across and he's trying to get enough message. Listen to the lilt of it. It's preacher-like almost. He's trying to get across to this, to Dobson to get him to a point. And then he uses the word believe. He's closing this out. I think it's masterful, Mark. I think it's intentional. He says, they won't believe this, but what I hope they will believe, and his volume goes up and he makes hard, hard eye contact, is when I say that I am, boom. And he's going back to that story of the wolf, of the werewolf virus, and now they're piping werewolf virus into all your homes. So everybody's gonna be a werewolf, watch out. That's what I got. Scott, what do you got? Mother. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. okay. That's a record. <laughs> wow. wow, Greg, if you hadn't moved, man, I was I would have gone and then said, okay, we're good to go. God, that's the worst. That's the worst what Bundy does. Like, takes you to the extreme, you see. Wow. Takes you to the, the that is the edge. That is so embarrassing. Of course, I can always cut all that. We've all out. done it. I've done one for about two minutes, I think. Wow, that's too bad. I think that is a record. <laughs> wow, I'll save that for the end. How's that sound? We can dub over it. You can have Bundy talking. <laughs> oh, man, Chase, the crown has been taken. Wow, that's too yes. bad. I'm sorry, fellas. <laughs> Damn it. We've all done it. <sighs> I'm just well, hearing wait. that air conditioning back there. I'm trying to make it so that doesn't happen, so you don't hear it. So I'm not used to muting anything, you know? You don't, you, need, uh, to, don't need to explain. Scott, what tip do you off? Yeah. Greg. I moved Greg. around like this at one point. No, you came up, Greg went like this or something. I was like, what's that? And then. What's that mean? Yeah, and then I looked at you, Chase. That's my go to. And you were like this. I was like, good point. <laughs> so I think I was like, okay, it's over. Good one. Damn it. Okay.
Now sure. let's find out what you actually said. Yeah, let's hear it. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. I can't That'd do it again. Good. I was up in it, That'd man. I was selling that shit. No, this is a good one. You got it. Roll it. Okay, here we go. Take two. Okay, okay. well, to, in a Can nutshell. Back to you? No, I'm good. I'm still, I'll deal with it. Okay, in a nutshell, what we're seeing is I agree with you guys. I, agree with, I, I do agree with you guys, but hear me out because uh, I think he got lost. I think he had all these things he was going to talk about. And he's trying to stay on point. And he's he's in the woods. He sees the path. He can't quite get back up to the path. So he's, he's in this big pile of stuff going, okay, yeah, kids. And then porno. And then there's this that happens. And then I got to get, let's see, we'll talk, this happened. Let me wait a minute. As he's looking around, then he comes back up with something else. He's making all of his points and trying to stay on the path, but he's not quite on the path at this point. So the being the interviewer that this guy Dobson is not, we would jump in at that point. And, and I mean, we would expect the um, the news person to jump in and start saying stuff. I think he's kind of expecting that, too. I agree with you guys. I, I think what he's doing, he's getting all of his points across and he's laying out this story. And it's making a very vivid picture with all that. But I think he's he's lost from the path there. I think he's trying to stay on it, but he keeps sliding off as he goes down down the road there. So, OK, we good. But by the way, do you think he he lays in that piece about I've been having some talks with investigators to see if he can get a last minute reprieve? He did try. Oh, That's fact. Yeah. He did. Yeah. Try. Yeah. He's wanting to do that. So he said, I've got so much more information I could tell you guys about. And this thing, oh, yeah, hang he on, there's more we may not know. You know, he he's going to try. try anything, you know, I would think. If, you know, if I were able to ask you the questions that are being asked out there. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most important as you come down to perhaps your final hours. Are you thinking about all those victims out there and their families? Well, who are so wounded, you know, years later, their lives have not returned to normal. They will never return to normal. Absolutely. Are, are you carrying that load, that weight? Is the remorse there? <sighs> Again. I know that people will accuse me of being self-serving, but we're beyond that now. I mean, I'm just telling you how I feel. But through God's help, I have been able to come to the point where I... Much too late, but better late than never, feel the hurt and the pain that I am responsible for. Yes, absolutely. In the past few days, myself and a number of investigators have been talking about unsolved cases murders that I was involved in and it's hard to it's hard to talk about all these years later because it revives in me all those terrible feelings and those thoughts that I have steadfastly and, 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 and diligently dealt with and I think successfully with the love of God and yet it's reopened that and I felt the pain and I felt the horror again of all that and I can only hope that those who I have harmed, those who I've caused so much grief, even if they don't believe my expression of sorrow and remorse, will believe what I'm saying now, that there is loose in their towns and their communities, people like me today, whose dangerous impulses are being fueled day in and day out by violence in the media in its various forms, particularly sexualized violence. And what scares me, and let's come into the present now, because what I'm talking about happened 30, 20, 30 years ago, that is in my formative stages. And what scares and appalls me, Dr. Dobson, is when I see what's on cable TV, <laughs> Some of the movies, I mean, some of the violence in the movies uh, that come into homes today was stuff that they, that they wouldn't show in yeah. X-rated adult theaters 30 years ago. This stuff... The slasher is, movies that you're talking about. That stuff <clears throat> is, I'm telling you, from personal experience, the most, that is graphic violence on screen particularly as it gets into the home yeah. to children who may be unattended or, or unaware 
that they may be a Ted Bundy who has that, that vulnerability to that, that predisposition to be influenced by that kind of behavior, by that kind of, of, of uh, movie, that kind of violence. There are kids sitting out there switching the TV dial around and come upon these movies late at night or I don't know when they're on, but they're on and any kid can watch them. It's scary when I think what would have happened to me if I had seen. I'm scary enough. <laughs> I mean, that I just ran into stuff outside the home, but to, to, be, to, to know that children are watching that kind of thing today or can pick up their phone and dial away for it or send away for it. Uh. Uh, one of the, the final uh, murders that you committed, of course, uh, was apparently little Kimberly Leach, 12 years of age. Uh, I think the, the public outcry is greater there because an innocent child was taken from a, from a playground. What did you feel after that? What was there, were there the normal emotions three days later? Where were you, Ted? I, uh, I can't really talk about that right now. That's weird. That's too painful. I would like to uh, I'd like to be able to convey to you what that that uh, that experience is like, but I can't. That I won't okay. be able to talk about that. Okay. I can't begin to understand. Well, I can try, but I'm I'm aware that I can't begin to understand the pain that the parents of these, of these children that I have and these young women that I have harmed feel. And I can't restore really much to them, if anything. And I won't pretend to, and I don't even expect them to forgive me, and I'm not asking for it. The, that kind of forgiveness is of God, and if they have it, they have it. If they don't, well, maybe they'll find it someday. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a creepy one. This is really among the creepiest. That whole manipulation of the mouth now, start paying attention. When he's talking about those children or people in their home, he's touching his mouth, he's moving his lips around. He's suddenly restless when he starts asking him about this specific question around this woman. We typically associate doing this with your mouth with mental activity. Messing with your mouth the same way. When a person's playing with their mouth, usually they're thinking there's something coming up. He gets pretty restless. Uh, this is one of the rare times I'm glad I can't read minds because what's going through that guy's mind right now has zero value to humanity. Zero, in my opinion. He's smiling and grunting. He's trying his best to hide a smile. That's all he's doing. Lip compressions. Then he says, I can't really talk about that. Trying to appear to be human. But he doesn't say I can't talk about it. He says I can't talk about it right now. That's a lead. Why can't you talk about it right now, Bundy? Because, and then, is it me or did it sound like he said, oh yeah, in there to you guys? He said, oh yeah, sounded like that in the middle of there. This is him thinking about that horrific crime, in my opinion. And then he does that horrible predatory look from under his brow, up looking at him. I use this in my classes. I used it in my class at, at the live event. You'll see his eyes are looking up over toward him with that thing. Then he starts to spout some therapy talk where he's talking about, I. Uh, I can't begin to feel like, or restore. That's the therapist talking to him. He's talking, and Mark, you said earlier, where would all this psychological stuff come from? He's been in a Skinner box for 10 years as they all mm. studied him trying to figure out what turned him into what he is. But he then shows amusement in his face and he out, he just outright looks arrogant right there at the end. But Scott, I have written down here because we're always talking about what does a psychopath have that other people don't? Are you glib? He looks glib. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what I call what he's doing right there. <laughs> Say the <laughs> yeah, I've, I have uh, two dogs. One of them is a Belgian Malinois, and she is uh, basically not a dog. She's closer to being a velociraptor uh, <laughs> than any other creature. Uh, but one thing she'll do before she attacks the other dog, she'll sniff a piece of furniture. And while she's sniffing that furniture, you can see her eyes tracking the other dog getting ready to pounce. And that's what I think we're seeing right here. We are seeing a professional predator. And the Belgian Malinois is bred to be a predator 
uh, animal. She's made for that kind of stuff. And I think he's saying that he's uh, a little bit nervous to talk about it here. And I think he's afraid to talk about it right here because discussing this would show so little emotion. He doesn't know how to fake that much emotion because he's seen how other people react to pe children getting hurt, that he doesn't know how to describe it. And he doesn't know if he could sell that well enough based on the emotions he's seen in other adult humans. Scott, what do you got? Yeah. Wow, that's good, man. You're completely right. And he can't discuss it right now because he doesn't know how to. He doesn't know how to talk about emotions. Again, we're seeing a psychopath, like everybody's always saying in this thing, we're seeing a psychopath be a psychopath. He doesn't know how to talk about emotions. He doesn't know how to describe them. And I think it goes back to what we were talking about a couple minutes ago, where he he's trying to get some time. So he says, I can't, another reason he says, I can't talk about it right now is because just in case there might be something else they want to talk about, I've got some more information that I can't give out right now. So at this point, some people may have a little have got a little bit of feeling for him at this point because you have that trigger where you start hearing about God and you go, oh, okay, well, it's talking about God. It's, that makes everything okay and all that. In this case, no. This is when you hear people talk about taking the Lord's name in vain. That's what he's doing when he starts talking about God the way he's talking about God. That's one of the way the way they take uh, the Lord's name in vain. Not saying, you know, saying specific other things that are graphic that I can't say on here. So. You may have that feeling like, you know what? He might be okay. I got to forgive him. No, you don't. No, you don't. He was cutting people's heads off and doing other things like that. I can't, again, we can't get too graphic with it. Horrible guy, monster. So he can't talk about it because he doesn't know how to talk about it at that point. But you're watching this happen. In Vegas, we talked about, one of the talks I did was was the, the difference in seeing and observing. It was our, our day one. We all talked about observing, right? How to observe something. If you'll observe this guy, just don't see him, watch him, watch everything he does, especially in this clip. You'll see, like so far, everybody said so far, everything a psychopath does is in this clip right there. He's a pro, man. You're right, Chasey. All over it, man. He's he's selling it in there. He's being he's being that predator. It's it's great. This is this is great stuff to see. To see this. See, I'm getting too worked up, but Anyway, so yeah, you're seeing you're seeing a, a psychopath be a psychopath at its highest level. This is good stuff. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I agree. Pe predatory gaze during that, checking out if he's buying it, and also targeting the victim as well. I think we see um, we see a, a classic animal instinct at the start, which is to to move around and judge everything from a number of angles, so you can really understand what's going on. We see this movement. What I love, and I think this is the closest in my mind that we get to seeing what he really is, who he really is. His guard is down, I think, the most during this, because we see, in my mind, a really great piece of antisocial behavior. In, in general, in, in most societies, it's not a good look if you're wearing handcuffs. I mean, it kind of generally says, generally says you might have done something bad, um, you know, or there might be something, you know, a little bit interesting going on with yourself and your partner at the same time. But even that is, is kind of, it's a little bit swept under the, under the carpet, a little bit taboo, maybe, still. Okay? So, you know, not a good kind of general social look. So there he is with his handcuffs on, and he decides he wants to ease, ease it a bit. Now, if it were me, and I think, you know, I'm trying to make a good effect here. I'm trying to have people think good of me. My handcuffs are not feeling so comfortable. I would just slip my hands down and just rearrange them out of sight of the camera. No, what he does is just nudge them with his chin, just nudges them with his chin. He, there is a part of him that can care about how he's seen and can manipulate. And there's another part of him that absolutely does not care about society at all. And that's, you know, that's the antisocial behavioral disorder there is, is that the norms of whatever society put forward that those boundaries, the individual just does not care about them and is willing to break them <laughs> in public or in private uh, if there's a, uh, a high enough penalty uh, for it. So, lovely to see. I don't think I've ever seen that behaviour before. That is a first for me, uh, moving your handcuffs with your chin. It's a first. You saw it here. Not for me. <laughs> uh, one of the, the final uh, 
murders that you committed, of course, uh, was apparently little Kimberly Leach, 12 years of age. Uh, I think the, the public outcry is greater there because an innocent child was taken from a, from a playground. What did you feel after that? What was there? Were there the normal emotions three days later? Where were you, Ted? I... I can't really talk about that right now. That's the way it is. That's too painful. I would like to, uh, I'd like to be able to convey to you what that, that, uh, that experience is like, but I can't, that I won't okay. be able to talk about that. Okay. I can't begin to understand. Well, I can try, but I'm, I'm aware that I can't begin to understand the pain that the parents of these, of these children that I have, and these young women that I have harmed feel. And I can't restore really much to them, if anything. I won't pretend to, and I don't even expect them to forgive me, and I'm not asking for it. The, that kind of forgiveness is of God, and if they have it, they have it. If they don't, well, maybe they'll find it someday. Do you deserve the punishment the state has inflicted upon you? <laughs> That's a very good question. And I'll answer it very, very honestly. I, I don't want to die. I'm not going to kid you. I'll kid, kid you not. Um, I deserve certainly the, the most extreme punishment society has. And I deserve, I think society deserves to be protected from me and from others like me, that's for sure. Um, I think what I, what I hope will come of our discussion is I think society deserves to be protected from itself because, because of we, as, as we've been talking, there are, there are forces that loose in, in, in this country, particularly, again, uh, this kind of violent pornography, uh, where on the one hand, well-meaning, decent people will condemn behavior of a Ted Bundy while they're walking past a, a, a magazine rack full of the very kinds of things that send young kids down the road to be Ted Bundys. That's the irony. We're talking here not just about more. We're talking, I'm, what I'm talking about is going beyond retribution, which is what people want with me, going beyond retribution and punishment, because there is no way in the world that killing me is going to restore uh, those beautiful children to their parents and, and, and correct and, 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 and soothe the pain. But I'll tell you, there are lots of other kids playing in streets around this country today who, who are going to be dead tomorrow and the next day and the next day and next month because other young people are reading the kinds of things and seeing the kinds of things that are available in the media today. All right, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so right here we're uh, seeing a what's called a punishment question. And it's sort of a tiny punishment question. It's not really real. A punishment question sounds like, what do you think should happen to the person who did this? Or what should happen to the type of person who does this crime? And it is astonishingly effective in children in adults it doesn't matter you ask a person who is a child predator uh, who's trying to pretend to be innocent in an interrogation room, what do you think should happen to the person who did this you're going to get a response like and i'm almost quoting some of these verbatim uh you what, what should happen to the person who did this and they say well Definitely not jail time. The person's obviously sick. Definitely, yes, absolutely, definitely some kind of apology to the family. Yeah, they should definitely apology to the family, but they need some serious help, you know? The person is not really in their right mind, and they definitely don't need jail, but they need some kind of help because they're obviously sick. But yes, they should apologize to the family. I'm almost paraphrasing uh, verbatim from some of the stuff that I've seen here. And that's how powerful the punishment question is. And we see it here. And I want you to imagine Scott was 
just in the last video talking about the psychopathy factor and how weird some of this stuff can be, I want you to imagine these exact same facial expressions while he's cutting someone's head off. No fear, no shame, no being grossed out or disgusted, the same smiles, same blink rate, and same facial expressions. And that'll give you an idea of what we are dealing with when it comes to some psychopaths. And we're not demonizing all psychopaths. Most psychopaths are not crazed serial killers uh, because the the stuff that came down from our ancestors to preserve our tribe and the people around us is deeply rooted in the brain. No matter if there's a, a, a damage in some kind of the part of the brain that's above that, the instinct to protect the tribe is still there. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so there's that little smile with him after he says the word status. Status. And, uh, exactly. Status. And the reason he smiles on that is because he knew in the future that whenever I said the word status, <laughs> people status. would say the word status back. <laughs> and I think that's fascinating. Fascinating that he would have that forethought around that. No, the smile there is a smile of disdain. Uh, disdain for society in general, as is disdain. It's 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 um, it's contempt for for society, for who's rained down this this punishment. And w what I like about this chase is that this punishment question, you know, what should happen, gets turned into essentially, well, society deserves me. <laughs> that is like what a brilliant again, brilliant spin doctor. Like brilliant speechwriter, because he's turned this what should the punishment for you be into no, the punishment is for society in general. I don't get punished around this. You get punished. And then he spins it into an even bigger narrative now, which I would say is like the, the narrative unstoppable, the sources apprentice, the everlasting porridge pot, the thing that keeps on cooking forever. He's now saying, look, strike me down now, but, but others will poke up everywhere. Like my type is now legion because you let that tap run on the filth of cable TV. So this is really, you know, if he's leaving us with, with anything and that's why look you might say to yourself hey you know you really need to be disgusted with ted bundy and i, and I am you know he's, he's not a nice guy but you have somebody in the room who could stop this nonsense being spouted you have somebody who can go well that's just not true it isn't true that the that good kids will be tainted by cable tv and these murderers will spout up everywhere you could have somebody who would go that's just not true um bundy says that's the irony of this whole thing well the interviewer the the, the spin doctor the other spin doctor there the other political lobbyist could go that that isn't an irony because what you're saying is just factually incorrect i know this as a psych psychologist i know this as a social scientist it isn't factually correct but he doesn't he doesn't stop him he's allowing this person to throw a hand grenade into tv land um as the whole of uh the christian right america watches this and goes damn it's come out of the mouth of one of the greatest most legendary psychopaths ever that we america is under threat right now clear and present danger through our tv sets the interviewer, the interviewer doesn't stop that. And I am disgusted by that. Bundy is terrible, but that's not good either. It's really not good either. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? Yeah, he scooches right past the full punishment thing. Just glides right by it, doesn't go in and say, and I agree, you, you, you guys have covered everything on this, but, um, the at, at that point though the interviewer should have come back in and said hey man wait a minute what about the let's talk about this one more time that wasn't the, the answer to the question i asked you didn't didn't really get his answer on that so i'm not going to add to all that is that everybody no nope, me okay go ahead greg what do you got 
Yeah, so I, a little bit of stuff here. There's outright arrogance as he responds to this. I mean, Mark, I agree that disdain, that's arrogance. That's like you, you lowly peons. And then I think there's narcissism in what he's accomplished. He doesn't talk about other serial killers as if they are somebody. He talks about them as living up to his mark, that they're going to be more of him. And I think there's some of that from him. And he's, he even says you need to protect people. You need to protect them from people like me. And he does a lip compression. Then he turns and he does. It's all your fault. It's dead on. You guys created the werewolf and you're piping it into your homes. You deserve what you get. He does a whole blame sharing thing at the end. I, I think it ties back all the stuff you guys are talking about. The last comment I would make is if you did not know this guy would be executed in 12 hours, would you have any idea in the way he's talking? Psychopath. Psychopath. Great point. Yeah. Do you deserve the punishment the state has inflicted upon you? <laughs> That's a very good question. And I'll answer very, very honestly. I, I don't want to die. I'm not going to kid you. I'll kid, kid you not. Um, I deserve certainly the, the most extreme punishment society has, and I deserve. I think society deserves to be protected from me and from others like me. That's for sure. Uh, I think what I what I hope will come of our discussion is I think society deserves to be protected from itself because because of we as as we've been talking there are there are forces that loose in in, in this country particularly again uh, this kind of violent pornography uh, where. On the one hand, well-meaning, decent people will condemn behavior of a Ted Bundy while they're walking past a, a, a magazine rack full of the very kinds of things that send young kids down the road to be Ted Bundys. That's the irony. We're talking here not just about more. We're talking. I'm, what I'm talking about is going beyond retribution, which is what people want with me, going beyond retribution and punishment, because there is no way in the world that killing me is going to restore uh, those beautiful children to their parents and, and, and correct and, 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 and soothe the pain. But I'll tell you, there are lots of other kids playing in streets around this country today who, who are going to be dead tomorrow and the next day and the next day and next month. because. Other young people are reading the kinds of things and seeing the kinds of things that are available in the media today. Ted, as you would imagine, there is tremendous cynicism about you on the outside, and I suppose for good reason. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that there's anything that you could say that people would uh, would believe. Some people would believe. Yeah. And uh, and yet, you told me last night, and I have heard this through our mutual friend John Tanner, that you have uh, accepted the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and uh, are a follower and a believer in him. Do you draw strength from that uh, as you approach these final hours? I do. I can't say that uh, it's going to be being easy. in the, the, the valley of the shadow of death is, is something that I've become all that accustomed to and that I'm, you know, and that I'm strong and uh, uh, nothing's bothering me. Uh, listen, it's no fun. It's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, gets kind of lonely, and yet, I have to remind myself that every one of us uh, will go through this someday, yes. in one way or another, so and, and, man. and countless uh, millions who have walked this earth before us have, so this is just an experience which we all share, and, yeah. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I don't have a whole lot on this one. He's got all the dedication and all the, the faith of Homer Simpson in The Simpsons when he's praying to Jeebus. I mean, this guy, I don't have any belief that he is. I think he's doing the right thing for his audience, and that's what he's after. That's all I see. I don't see any real pain, any real suffering, any real emotion. And that's what we always say is these guys are that. The guys, if you happen to have been diagnosed as a psychopath, we're not saying you are a monster. We're saying this guy was a monster. He got cured, but this guy was a monster. He turned into one of the worst possible people on earth and was executed for it. Chase, what do you got? <laughs> he, he did get cured. <laughs> so when the, when the interviewer here, Dr. Dobson, 
uh, Dr. Dobson. I'll just do that. Uh, it says mutual friend. He's assuming some kind of relationship with this person and assuming some kind of uh, co-relatedness, some community with this person, uh, with Ted. And it's disgusting to me. I'm disgusted uh, just that he would even try to do this to push a narrative. I'm going to make friends with and pretend friends with a psychopath. Mutual friends suggests that they are friends. So horrible. And right here, I just want to focus in really tightly on one line of speech when he says, listen, it was no fun. I was lonely. When he says, listen, that triggers us as interviewers to start using auditory language. I hear what you're saying. That sounds good to me. That, that guy had really loud clothing on. We're using some kind of auditory language. When he says it was no fun, he describes everything in all of his interviews as fun or not fun. Killing was fun for him. So I'm going to use that phrase as a, a person talked to him in an interview. Finally, when he says lonely, I know that he's a socially driven person. I'm definitely 100% going to be using the loneliness, social connectedness example to get this guy to confess. Scott? Yeah. I, now, again, hear me out or y'all are going to turn on me here. When he starts talking, let me say this first. Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. And that's where I sit on in, in, in this situation. When he starts bringing in Jesus and saying, you've accepted Jesus Christ as your savior and all that, like everything is going to be okay for this guy now, and we should forgive him too, and that's going to be okay. This guy's a monster. In my opinion, when I... Even if you are forgiven for things like that, there's no, you have to be a human to be forgiven for those things. I don't think there's anybody in there. And I think that when that gets taken care of, when it's all open and there's judgment day, I think when you show up up there, they go, oh yeah, you're forgiven. Well, let's talk about these girls over here. Let's, let's talk about that for a while. I think, I don't know, man, that's, it's just such a, just such a, um, he shouldn't have walked down that path with this guy, I don't think. He shouldn't have done that because he's making it look like it's okay and he's going to be just fine. He's bringing a happy ending to this. And it's not a happy ending for anybody in this, except for, like Greg was saying, except for his being cured. So outside of that, I don't think it. I don't think there's anything good in that. I shouldn't say all that stuff. Somebody's going to take it wrong and I'll get in trouble, but sure. I don't care. Scott, Scott's church. Welcome to YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But anyway, so you know what I'm saying? I'm me and Big Guns are tight, man. He loves me, and we get along great. His dad loves me, so we get along great. And he loves you, but I'm his favorite. So let's make sure we get that straight when I'm telling you about all that stuff. I think they've got something worked out for these guys who do stuff like this, even though they get forgiven. I think something's still up for that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Uh, so I had the same chase, and I put put here. Um, now they now they have mutual friends. It's like I can't <laughs> believe it. It's like wow, you're gonna do that? Like you're gonna say that you are a friend with Ted Bundy for your political agenda? That is off. I mean, I know people in politics who will do whatever it takes, but this is like beyond anything that I've seen in a lobbyist going, yeah, I'll just make, I'll say I'm friends with Ted Bundy for this one. If we can stop that filth coming down cable TV and make America scared again, like, let's do it. It's like, you, like, Dobson, my hat is off to you. I know some people will do some stuff, but you are, you take the biscuit, I tell you. Um, well, so what happens is, is Bundy runs with that one. <laughs> like he, he runs with it and he goes, I love his image of, I've not experienced being in the shadow of death. No, because you are the thing that blocks out the sunlight and casts that shadow. You've never been in that valley in the darkness. You are the monolith that stops the light that the people have looked up to in horror as that darkness has come over them. So incredible image there from my point of view and then he shifts it to well i've never experienced that but we all are going to experience that moment of death and basically he says we are all ted bundy in death i mean again like if you, that that is a speech writer because he's managed to bring us all together under one uh, agenda <laughs> i mean genius anyway i put here 
I'm speechless at the end of this. Let's power up the generators. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Ted, as you would imagine, there's tremendous cynicism about you on the outside, and I suppose for good reason. Uh, I'm not sure that there's anything that you could say that people would uh, would believe, some people would believe. Yeah. And, uh, and yet, you told me last night, and I have heard this through our mutual friend John Tanner, that you have uh, accepted the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and uh, are a follower and a believer in him. Do you draw strength from that uh, as you approach these final hours? I do. I can't say that uh, it's going to be being easy. in the, the valley of the shadow of death is, is something that I've become all that accustomed to and that I'm, you know, and that I'm strong and uh, uh, nothing's bothering me. Uh, listen, it's no fun. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it gets kind of lonely. And yet, I have to remind myself that every one of us uh, will go through this someday yes. in one way or another. So and, and, man. and countless uh, millions who have walked this earth before us have. So this is just an experience which we all share. And, yeah. All right. Well, let's throw around the room and talk about what we think we've seen here. And in 30 seconds or less, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I, I, I didn't know what I was going to get with Bundy, never seen him before, had a bit of an understanding of his legend, never seen him on, on TV being interviewed. I expected something of what I saw there. I never expected Dobson. So it's been fantastic for me because I just didn't expect to see that. That was a lesson for me. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, this was a person being fake with a person helping them be fake so that they could be more fake to help the other person be more fake so that they could sell more fake to human beings. It was a person passing a yo-yo back and forth with more spin being put on it back and forth. <laughs> I'm disgusted more by the interviewer than I am, than I am with uh, Bundy, Greg. Yeah, guys, whatever the cause behind it, whatever, this is one of those rare chances for us to see a psychopath being a psychopath. Not being able to show emotion, but being able to work and do everything that you need to get across the message that they think you want to hear so they can get you to wherever they need you to be. Now, does that mean all psychopaths are violent killers? No, there are lots of people who have psychopathy who live normal lives. But these serial killers use all of those same skills to lure people in. This guy was all kinds of sick. There was all kinds of things wrong with him. He confessed to 30 murders, who knows how many others, and God knows what else he did to people along the way. This is a, a horrible end to a horrible situation, but he's gone. That's a good thing. I think there's a value to you watching this video and learning how people work you. Because if you project onto them goodness and light, you're going to get it reflected right back at you using your words. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. I think it's a great example of being able to watch a psychopath, like you just said, watch a psychopath be a psychopath. It's like putting one in a jar and just sitting there and watching it for a while and see what, and putting, you're right, it's the spider and the fly situation, just putting them both in a jar and seeing what happens. And that's what happens. It was excellent. It was a great study, I think, a great study. And I think no matter where Ted Bundy is right now, you know, what it, what did happen to him in the end, you know, he, we knew he, he's he's gone now, but I'm sure he's looking up at us right now and saying, hey, Behavior panel, you nailed it. Datus. You know what yeah. What I meant a, a second ago? I just want to clarify. One of them didn't have a choice whether or not to feel any emotion, and the other one did. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Excellent. Yeah. All right, fellas, I think this is a good one. We'll see you next time. See you. Subscribe. Please. Please. <laughs> <laughs> The behavior panel. Oh man! I mean, dude, he would. Well, we'll talk about the. Well, well the, yeah. the sad truth is, they probably should have gone. <laughs> Scott, what? please save that. Please save well, that. Well, I've got it. I've got it. It's going. I'll put it at the end of the thing. It's what he deserves. So what do you got? Today we're going to talk about Alisa Baker, and she's the one that murdered her stepdaughter. And we're going to talk about the body language we see when she's asked questions about that. Greg, tell us about the videos we're gonna watch. Yeah, this is another one of our favorite shows, 60 Minutes Australia, and the lady is interviewing her in prison where she's serving a long sentence, and she cooperated and told where the body parts were in exchange for a plea deal. 
What kind of person dismembers a disabled child? A sick person. Does it take an evil person? Yes. It's an evil act? Yes, ma'am. Elisa Baker will sit in a prison cell at least until she's 70, after entering a plea bargain which would see her avoid death row. How do you sleep at night knowing that a little girl, a little disabled girl, was cut into pieces and thrown away? Some nights are hard, but I miss her. Do you really? Yes, ma'am. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is an interesting one because she shows emotion and we automatically want to jump to someone who does this is a psychopath. But I think we're going to see a different kind of animal here. So let's talk about who she is. First of all, in the true crime workshop that Scott and I put together, if you'll look, there's this thing we call the romancer. It's when somebody's making good, solid eye contact with you at all times rather than breaking eye contact because they want to know what you're doing. I only have eyes for you. We see that in the beginning. She's also trying to talk her way out of this. That yes, ma'am is classic of a person who's trying to plug into your receptors and get what they want. A lot of times, borderline personality disorder folks do that. Now, that doesn't mean all borderline personality folks are bad guys and going to kill you and do that. It's something we're all born with things we have to deal with. In this case, I think this is a person who needed fences and didn't get them, and we'll see it. Her husband, her third husband, by the way, just a couple of data points, she's been married more times than she has fingers, I believe. She was married to three people at the same time at one point. Her third husband said she thought she could talk her way out of everything and that she was smarter than everybody else and she never told the truth and shared a lot of good people. That's his words. So if they're looking, if borderline personality folks can plug into your receptors and then get away with stuff, she's gotten away with stuff for a long time. I'm not trying to diagnose her. She's getting away with it. When she says that's my, in my opinion, when she does a lip compression, in my opinion, that's her controlling emotion. But we're going to find it's a good portion of her baseline in what she has done. I think any time that she thinks she has no power, she's going to do some of that. We'll see it. I also expect this woman has very little governor in her personal life and that she just runs for the fences. And if you don't give her one, she's going to run over you. She's doing some emotional eye accessing downright. And she then she comes back and respiration increases when she's asked about the evil. I bet if you left this person alone, you'd get a very different person. This is her face to authority, not to people who have no power. I bet you she's a scrapper. And when you push her, you get it. And we'll see more of that a little bit later. In this case, the last time she looks downright is not eye accessing, is breaking contact. And then she does, I miss her. The water work she's used before has worked for her in the past, and the organism does what made the organism successful. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, really good. Totally agree. So um, compliant and socially polite in this situation. In fact, to the that she agrees with evil. I don't think she truly believes that. I think it's it's a compliant uh, agreement because throughout this, we're going to try and see her uh, winning the interviewer over, trying to get her story recognized. And what is her story? What does she offer? She offers a sick person. So I think her gambit here is, I'm not of sound mind. And, and that could be true or false or something in between. But I think right off the bat, I think that's the story she's trying to get across. And so she has to be compliant and socially polite and agree with the evil uh, in order to frame uh, what she's inserted in there, which is uh, not of sound mind. Now, the eyes watering uh, along it looks looks very, very convincing. The eyes are truly watering. We see the eyes uh, redden as well. Um, we also see the nose become more red and the cheeks become more red. This is these are true indicators of real feeling, real emotion here. So that's that's quite interesting that she's managing to produce 
such real indicators, or they are, you know, there's truly an emotion happening there. So I'm I'm interested to see where this goes and what's really going on here uh, in all these videos that we watch. So by the end of it, we can work out what have we actually got here? What have we truly got here? Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree with both of you guys. The question that the interviewer asks is my favorite because it's very similar to a question that's taught in interrogation schools called the punishment question. And the punishment question essentially says, what do you think should happen to the person who did this once we find them? And she says, a sick person, you're kind of that question's designed to make someone lighten their sentence or lessen their sentence a little bit. And we see a little bit of that here, but right at sick person, the forehead, lips, and eyes are all needing reassurance from the other person. Everything on the face is a need for some kind of reassurance. The eyes move downward into the emotional recall area. Our eyes move in certain directions to access different parts of our brain. This is mostly emotion. The rest of it, I'm not fully convinced. But some nights are hard, but I miss her. Right there, there's genuine movement in the chin boss. Uh, grief, genuine redness developing in the eyelids and the nose. It's a shift into chest breathing, too, instead of abdominal breathing. I think it looks pretty honest. The, the behaviors, at least, are almost impossible, if not absolutely impossible, to fake. And the potential for this to indicate that she misses her company is there in a selfish way. Like, I miss what she gave me. I miss what I got from her. And maybe not in a way that might indicate regret. Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah, I agree with all you guys so far. This is really odd behavior. We're looking at this because we're not seeing any anger here. There's no, when she asks you that question where she used severity softening and gives that answer of it's a sick, they're a sick person. What's, what's wrong with a sick person? She should be angry that this, that her stepdaughter's dead and been killed, but we don't see any of that. And she says, when she says, how do you sleep at night? No little girl was cut into pieces and thrown away. We see her lips purse for about nine seconds. Now, when somebody purses their lips, we see that as the person not agreeing with what they're saying. They're, they they don't um, agree with it, or they think the opposite of that, which is, of course, disagreement. But that says they don't agree with it. That's what it usually tells us. Now, um, the micro there's a micro expression of anger when she says, "But I miss her," and it's on miss. And just really briefly, that's what a micro expression is: leaking things, and we see anger in there. I'm under the impression coming back to the beginning here after seeing all these videos uh, together that we're seeing anger here at the little girl. So that's where we see that little uh, anger micro expression is, uh, but I miss her when she says miss. Um, and after that, she says, uh, do you really? And that's a, that's an, an odd question. I think she she was sort of taken aback by that because she didn't expect that answer from her when she said some nights i miss her but it's hard and she's like do you really miss her because who would expect somebody to answer but i miss her because that says here's your answer but i miss her so it's kind of off that's the, that doesn't seem quite right to me now I see what you're saying, Mark, about the, the nose and the mouth, and you too as well, Chase, and the nose and the mouth and the, and the chin boss and all that, and it's all red. But what we're seeing is that lip compression, which is actually, under, in my impression, that is um, an adapter because she keeps doing that over and over. So her filtrum's all red and all that. So, and you can see she used to have a, a lip ring right there too, or she's got a little hole right there. But she's doing that constantly throughout this. Sometimes she doesn't use it as an adapter. She's actually um, holding back in some information or she's a little stressed. But this is the way she's getting rid of that built up stress or tension as she's just sitting there, which she's done. Like you were saying, Greg, she's done this over and over and over again. We're not seeing the real person here. This isn't her. This is a person she's showing this, this interviewer to sit and she's playing dumb. She's, she's that whole childlike thing with her eyes all wide and all that. That's a show. She's, she, she thinks she's smarter than everybody else. And that's the show she's putting on for him because she's got him figured out and going to make him think she's stupid and just innocent. And this isn't her fault. And she didn't do it. So she's hiding who she really is at this point, in my opinion. All right. We're good. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how much pretending she has to be about being dumb, but yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> what kind of person dismembers a disabled child? A sick person. Does it take an evil person 
Yes. It's an evil act. Yes, ma'am. Elisa Baker will sit in a prison cell at least until she's 70. After entering a plea bargain, which would see her avoid death row. How do you sleep at night knowing that a little girl, a little disabled girl, was cut into pieces and thrown away? Some nights are hard, but I miss her. Do you really? Yes, ma'am. I thought I had met Prince Charming. Adam was your Prince Charming? Yeah. What drew you to him? What did you like about him? What I thought was his honesty about everything and the fact that he was a single dad and that he loved his daughter enough to raise her himself and not let his family or her family raise Zara. All right, Chase, what do you got? This interviewer is killing it. And she's doing well so far. She's using some really cool techniques. I wish you know we had the time to go into here. But right there, if you take a look, she may need to speak to a manager somewhere, if you know what I mean by looking at this interviewer. So what I see here is a genuine smile. I thought that was absolutely genuine. Every part of the face moved as it should. And if you, just to, just to show you a good way, a rule of thumb for genuine versus fake smiles is if the person wearing a ninja mask, you should still be able to know that the person is smiling if it's genuine. You should be able to see a smile in a ninja mask. We'll call that, somebody will make up a name for that. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, look, I mean, I don't think that we're seeing the real person, the real smile. People do what they've gotten away with over and over and over and what's made them successful. This woman has been married to many, many, many people, and they all must have found something interesting in her in the beginning. When you look at her here, God knows what it was because she looks like crazy. But what she does is she's engaging. She's overly emotional. My guess is she would call herself passionate, I'm starting to see those symptoms of things that come up. This is her acting like she cares, but she probably genuinely did care. My guess is she every one of her emotions is out there to the walls. Everything she does is to the walls. She might call it passionate. We'd probably call it something else. She isn't smart enough yet to figure out she can't talk her way out of this. You guys have heard me before say front of the mouth versus back of the mouth talking. This is all front of the mouth talking. Yes. Yeah. She's doing all that front of the mouth talking. It's going to make Scott laugh. I know. Her <laughs> eyes are up and up here are a light and her face is amused. She's asked the simplest question. What drew, to, drew you to him? And she has to stop and think, hmm, didn't think of that one. And she wrenches her mouth as she's thinking. Then she comes back again <clears throat> with some self-amusement at, I got this one. You can see she thinks she has it. And then she does a lip withdrawal with no response. And Scott, I think we'll find a picture of her doing this mixed messaging from the time she was a child. She's always done it. Her eyes are engaged with a person and she's doing that. Who knows what caused that? There could be something in her childhood that caused her to not be willing to be open with her messaging, but it's become, we always say, an adapter is the most common thing to become a habit. That's what we're seeing here, I think, with those lips. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, when she says, I thought I'd missed, uh, I'd met Prince Charming. I agree with you, Chase. It looks like a real smile. It really does, man, because what we're seeing is a comfortable smile. It's the, like you were saying, Greg, it's the one she's just fired off a thousand times and she's comfortable doing it. The thing that makes me think this isn't a Duchenne smile, Duchenne smile, is that even though she's squinting, it's not the right kind of squint. There's a squint we do when we squint our eyes, those little wrinkles right here. They go up and they get flat like that. But when it's a, a real Duchenne smile, they come in at an angle. And I can't see the angle in there. Later on, there's one that does that. But I see why you think that because I was like, oh, wow, this is crazy, man. This, is, this looks like a real smile to me. This is just my opinion. Shoot, dude, I could, be, I could be wrong. But I'm not seeing those things. I'm seeing them come together, but they're not coming at an angle like they're supposed to. I mean, your brain's doing it. So that's, that's the part that bugged me there. 
And when, and like you were saying, Greg, when, he, when she says, what drew you to him? She instantly purses those lips. And that's and at that point, she's trying to make something up. She's trying to structure what she's going to say. Now, when you lie, what happens is this. Your brain has to do three things. First thing it has to do is stop and say, hey, don't don't answer that. We got to hang on a second. I'm not going to give them the real answer. Then it has to make up that lie. And then once it makes up the lie, it has to deliver the lie. And that's where all the action is. So we're seeing that pause and those lips burst because she's thinking about what she's going to say next. And the smile when answering, um, that gives me the impression she wants to um, to give. She's innocent and she she doesn't see, see the monster. She wants to give all this, oh, this is all so wonderful. But, you know, I didn't see he was a monster. She's talking all this wonderful stuff about him being Prince Charming and all that. So... And then at the end, that slight little grin with the mouth open, I think she she's thinking I, it, I saw doubt in that um, the expressions of doubt. So I, maybe she's thinking maybe I shouldn't have said that. Or does this woman believe me? Because you're right, Chase. She's looking at, at her. It would be tough to keep looking at that interviewer if she's looking at you that way. No matter what you're talking about, once that starts and she looks like she's great at doing that, she gets that head tilted and that look going. And you're like, ugh. I think that's what freaks her out a lot. That's why you see a lot of that, that blank expression she's got. So, all right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Um, okay, so first of all, classic one, super low blink rate. I mean, almost no blinking going on uh, during this. So that's going to feel very, very odd to us. And it's, like, it's a kind of an odd thing to do, to have that low blink rate. So let's think about that as we move through these videos. Um, I agree, Chase. There are there's some elements there of of the true smile. It doesn't stay there long enough for me to even go. Well, are the angles right on it, Scott? I mean, it's not. It's just not there for even long enough because the eyes drift away. I mean, it, it happens really fast. First of all, and and really the smile should should um, you know the amplitude of it should glide up over over you know something less than a second maybe not snap so it kind of snaps into place and then the eyes kind of drift out for me so it, it, it feels odd as a smile it felt good at the start but too quick mm -hmm. and then it just kind of drifts away so i don't buy the smile there and especially as it comes around her her, her face gets really energized around this idea of honesty i think i think the question is as you were saying you know what did you like about this guy what attracted you she has some time to think she snaps in this smile and she goes honesty so why is that why does she really want us to understand this honesty piece i think she wants to be seen as honest it's an opportunity for her to go i can see somebody honest why because i'm an honest person and so here's her gambit for me she's not a sound mind but she is really honest and I think that's, that's her story so far that she's trying to sell to this interviewer, who I think, you're right, is doing a great job. But I think as we go through this, um, we'll start to see her not quite know what to do in this situation because I don't because she's seen some real cases in her time, I'm sure. But this one, this one is someone else. This is, this is we've, not, we've not looked at somebody like this before i don't think and i think this interviewer is even a little bit at sea about how detached from reality this particular uh, individual is i thought i had met prince charming adam was your prince charming yeah what drew you to him what did you like about him what i thought was his honesty about everything and the fact that he was a single dad and that he loved his daughter enough to raise her himself and not let his family or her family raise Zara. Did you ever stop to think that it might be right to tell him you were already married? Yes. Why didn't you tell him? Me and my husband had went through several bad years. And it was my understanding when I went to Australia that he filed for divorce. So it was my, my belief 
that I was divorced. Why did you introduce your husband as your brother? That's the way he left it, because he wanted to be in Zara's life, and he knew that Adam wouldn't let uh, him be in Zara's life if he knew that he was my husband. None of that makes sense. I know it doesn't. I know it doesn't. All right, Mark, what do you got? <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, okay, so there's there's a lip retraction. There's p- purse clips before that, a retraction. Um, uh, and... Uh, uh, almost the lips disappear. I mean, there's lots of lip movement. Let's just say there's lots of lip movement going going on there. So a whole bunch of cognition goes on. What am I going to do? What am I going to do with this question? And then the eyebrows raise on that as she sells her idea, uh, which is not accepted at all by the by the interviewer. And I think this is the start of where it starts to get really tricky because the interviewer is trying to get through uh, to the truth here uh, or some kind of semblance of, of logic. Uh, so let's get there in a second. Uh, if he knew that he w- uh, if he knew that he was my husband and there's a bit of taste in the mouth, maybe contempt as well at the same time. So probably some contempt around the idea of the of the of the partners here. My guess is is she she uh, she files through love and contempt at, at quite a rate with with partners there. Um, and then such a pleasant engagement there around I know it doesn't I know it doesn't Uh, and this is what's most frustrating I think for the interviewer is she puts down some piece of of logic the subject here says something completely illogical yeah the interviewer says look that just doesn't make sense and she goes yeah what are you going to do about it yeah and so this is the frustration is this person is an utter whirlwind and if this type of personality comes into your life you're just going to get knocked around like nobody's business because because all bets are off as to what a relationship is where it what stage it's at whether it's on off on off on off and what reality is as well so um, there is, I'm already starting to feel, and by a few videos down, and one specifically which we're not, we're not going to do because it's quite extreme, but I'm starting to get the idea that there is something quite psychotic going on here. And you might go, okay, well, that, do you mean psychopathic? And no, the two things are completely divorced from each other, and you can have all kinds of personality uh, disorders at the same time and some of them overlap but once you get a lot of them coming together it's a complete storm and i'm already starting to feel we have a complete whirlwind going on here but as always i'm willing to be convinced of something else so uh so greg what do you got on this one So, Mark, what you call a whirlwind, I call a brawler. This is all the earmarks of a brawler. If I say something and you don't challenge me because you're afraid to, I just say whatever the hell I want. And that's what I bet she's done her entire life because you're going to get from zero to 90 like that faster than your car. Chase. So it's going <laughs> to, but with a lot more noise, she's going to raise a lot of hell when you challenge her. And I think she's gotten away with that forever. If you, if you don't think something is up here, look at that picture of the little girl with mixed messaging, engaged eyes. And now children learn from people around them. So God forbid we knew what happened that caused that. Don't know. But one of my favorite things in here, it's one of my favorite looks I've ever seen. Stop the camera at nine seconds she's got this cross-eyed break eye contact look where she was like i thought i had a response and then they second guessed me and there's an absolute look of befuddlement a word i don't get to use very often but that's a word that satisfies exactly that look on her face her brow is up her chin boss is engaged her mouth the sides of her mouth are withdrawn and there's disapproval all over when she's looking like, well, you got me there when she said, why did you tell him? Because she had said, well, we were divorced. And then he said, well, why did you tell him he was your brother? Well, you got me. There's also this, there's a hard swallow, a shallow respiration and narrowing of the eyes. You could tell that, and then she eye blocks. You could tell what is happening is she's gotten the point of almost anger and she can't talk her way out of it. That's why I think we got a brawler on our hands. Somebody, and I don't mean it has to be physical. It can be a lot of drama and craziness and all that. And then she puts her chin down when she starts that, my husband and I had 
first time we see her chin drop, it's protective. Her high forehead involvement and distancing with language that is full of filler words when she says, it was my understanding instead of we filed. Because later she can come back and say, well, I said it was my understanding, not that we had done it. I think the contempt mark, instead of being for her husband, is for the interviewer. Because right. if you're a brawler and somebody's got you on the ropes, you're going to have contempt for that. So I think it's there. She exposes that left canine. If you don't know what contempt looks like, guys, it's the expose the side, one side of the mouth rises and expose that kind of a sneer, kind of the Elvis Presley thing. Show that, show that canine and you can see that. And then there's that same face after that, once she's painting in the corner and says, you got me, basically she says, no, it doesn't. The same exact face that little girl shows in the, in the picture right after. All that upper engagement, lower face disapproval. I would say we're nothing but two-year-olds covered in hair and scars. There you got it. This is the same exact person. Chase, what do you got? I agree. And uh, I think, Mark, to your point about this psychosis, one, this behavioral type, whatever you want to call it, I know everybody, we're so anxious uh, to put a diagnosis here because when we label something, we feel like we understand it, even though we don't, and we're in more control of it, even though we're not. Uh, who cares about uh, what it is? This behavioral type has a history of burning something down, blaming, and then revising history. So it's almost like a revisionist memory. And that's the type of person. This is just not burning something down like an arsonist, obviously, like a relationship or a whatever. Explodes, comes to the ground. And then there's blame. I can't believe all these other people did all this stuff. And then there's revisionist memory. Yeah, that happened, but I know I did this, but that's because. So the memory becomes rewritten. And I promise you, every time you touch one of your memories, you are rewriting it and making edits to that memory every time you touch it. And she, uh, th these types are absolute experts at this stuff. The grief here associated with the recall of this relationship with her husband, I think that's genuine. I think there was a horrible relationship and probably some really bad stuff happened. She might have caused it. And keep in mind, we are largely a product of our childhood and hers was awful to say the least. It was really awful. And she was married six times at one point, like Greg said in the uh, beginning, married to three men at the same time. There's not much important about the husband statement uh, when it comes to the case, but it's a good spot to see her baseline of kind of stress, hesitancy, and a reduced fluency. So we see the stress, we see hesitancy as a new baseline for deception, and we see a reduction in fluency or her uh, uh, ability to speak clearly or eloquently, if you want to say that. I don't even know if this woman could do the eloquent part. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. Um, well, after that second question, she says, uh, why didn't you tell him at, uh, about uh, her be, him being the brother? Then, he, then well, there's no blinking at all. She does the classic stare and blinking. Her eyes are really glassy. And they've been that way from the top, even before she did that, that crying stuff. I think, now Chase, to go back to what you were just saying, if this was a, a, a personality type like histrionic, then I would think they'd be able to call up those emotions fairly quickly. And that's why she can bring those tears up so fast because they bounce around in those things so quickly. So I, that, that really bothers me up to this, up to this point. She said, uh, wh um, why did you intro your husband as your brother? And we see this hard swallow. Her cadence speeds up a lot. And she gets that, again, the wide eyes, get those things wide open and her mouth is open. So that's almost like um, it's a combination of things. There's almost this, this uh, blend of emotions, it looks like there, because it looks like fear and a little bit of anger, because we see a micro expression of anger at the top of this thing. So there's anger there. Um, it, it, this whole thing just says something's not right here. You know, as you go through, that's why we're all getting that feel we're getting when we first see it. Um, and when she says, um, none of that makes sense. And then she says, I know it doesn't and smiles really big. What else can she say? I mean, if she's going to answer, what else can she say? I know it doesn't. That's like little kids say stuff like that. Little children talk like that. She's trying to come on like a little child, but I, I don't think she had an answer any better than that. You know, and I'd say on the, on the Scott Rouse table of that she just scored 100. Did you ever stop to think that it might be right to tell him you were already married? Yeah. 
Yes. Why didn't you tell him? Me and my husband had went through several bad years. And it was my understanding when I went to Australia that he filed for divorce. So it was my, my belief that I was divorced. Why did you introduce your husband as your brother? That's the way he left it, because he wanted to be in Zara's life and he knew that Adam wouldn't let uh, him be in Zara's life if he knew that he was my husband. None of that makes sense. I know it doesn't. I know it doesn't. How did you view yourself before coming to prison? What sort of person do you believe you were? Good person. Um, pretty much would give you the shirt off my back. Um, never met a stranger. Mm -hmm. Still don't, even in here. Elisa Baker already had three children, and when she and Adam married and moved to her hometown of Hickory in North Carolina, she became mother to Zara. Sound better than without them. Tell me about your relationship with Zara. We hit it off right from the bat. What did you like about Zara? She had spunk about her. She never gave up. Always had a smile on her face. Always. Did you have a close bond? Very close. She called me mom, and I treated her like she was my own child. She, she got no different treatment than my other kids did. Actually, my other kids got jealous of her. They really? said I treated her better. <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad. <laughs> All right, Chase, what do you got? Right here, she's saying, I'm a good person. I give you the shirt off my back. The first thing, I have it in my notes. I can't show it to you because I have it down here on the screen. But the first thing I wrote down today was romancer. That was the first thing, that little locked eye contact, uh, the little slight smile, this prolonged uh, gaze. But it's attentional gaze. I'm giving my attention out and it's kind of the cute look like the uh the child actress might look if she's trying to be cute in a disney movie that's the behavior that you're seeing here yeah. and right when you said right when she said they said i treated her better than than my other kids this is a genuine crazy shift i'm gonna let you guys talk about this in emotion i think to sadness maybe remorse Maybe there's some remorse there. And you can see when the smile just falls off the face. I think it's a really interesting clip. Mark, what do you think about it? Yeah, really interesting. Um, lip, lip purse to the side before she says good person. So often we uh, relate that to some kind of withheld opinion. So maybe she doesn't truly feel that she was a good person. But of course, to us, she's straight out with it. I'm a good person. Uh, never met a stranger, she says. So everybody is a friend to her. And she, this smile, let's just call it a smile, comes across her face. There's, there's many, if not all, of the right things in that smile, but they come at different times. So take a look at that. How, you know, we'd expect a, a smile emerges over a fraction of a second, but not instantly okay and and but it emerges all together the muscles don't move all together it's extraordinary i don't think i've seen that so clearly clearly happening so that's a that's a first for me to see that so well in a video here um and i think she's trying to get the interviewer to react to this of course it, like you say chase she is she's drawing the interviewer in romancing the interviewer the interviewer isn't going with her here i don't think the interviewer has seen anything like this before i think the interviewer is, is though brilliant is a little bit out at sea even for her with with this one um they said it said i treated her better there is this hysterical 
laugh. By that, I mean it's extreme and it comes out of nowhere. All laughter comes from tension. All laughter is a release of tension. So, you know, if you tell a joke, there has to be tension already about the subject matter that the punchline causes the audience or, or whoever's watching you to release it. Or the, or the linguistics of the joke are designed to build tension in the storytelling that's then released uh, on that on that punchline into into laughter. So all laughter has tension. This is such an extreme laugh that there must be some extreme tension around this. They said I treated her better because, as as we know in hindsight, the way she treated that child is, uh, you know, it, it can't can't be talked about without uh, without getting us taken off YouTube. Um, but then this laughter, just as you say, Chase, collapses into nothing instantly. Again, I don't think I've seen on record a laugh like this. This is the point where I personally go, I think we should run. I think we should get out the room pretty quickly. I mean, there's, it's lovely, that guard at the back there. <laughs> Who knows what he's got? <laughs> he knows what he's got there. He knows her. That's Dennis. Yeah, that's Dennis. Dennis. Dennis is going, yeah, yeah, don't worry. I know when she's about to explode. I'll be there. I'll be there. Don't worry. It's not now, but it, yeah, she's a, this is a, a rare, a rare, thankfully, a rare case, I believe. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, Mark, I don't think it's as rare as you would like it to be. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, I think that there are a lot of people like this who are explosive to the walls in every direction. For sure. And my guess is where we see that there's some genuine, it looks like grief or shame with that chin boss engagement. And when she's talking about it at the end that I treated her better than my own kids, I think, I, I don't conjecture on what's in her head, but there's something related to how she's treated her kids. Look, a lot of people are volatile, explosive, and then remorseful and volatile, explosive, and then remorseful. People who have emotions that fill the room, and by that I mean to the wall in every direction, often are that way. And we're gonna see some other elements of that as well. But when they ask her who she is, look, I've used that many times in an interview, job interview or other interview, where I'll ask a person, define yourself. People know who they are. They don't have to look for those words. Good person, she's shopping for something to say to try to get some connection back to this woman you're dead on. She's doing that friend of math, good, I'm a good person and that doesn't work, and then she looks for another one. I get people's shirt off my back? Yeah, probably, and then there'd be some brawling over what how that went. It's all about her, is what I hear. And then she does she, chase your dead on. That's exactly what we mean by the romancer. No one has ever done a better one than this. This is a definition of it. Eye contact, trying to make eye contact with that smile. Look, chimps smile out of absolute terror. People don't realize when you see a chimp smiling, it's, they're terrified. Maybe that smile came out of absolute terror for her as a child. Who knows where it came from? But she's fishing for approval from this interviewer with her brows up and a lot of eye contact. And I, my note here is I love this interviewer because she's got some heartly compassion going on there. She's just got a cold, dead face looking right at her. I love it. It's beautiful. Then when they get to Zahra, I agree with you guys, that whole face change from that sm fake smile melts away as rapidly as we watched Amber Heard change rapidly, just racking through those things. Then when she says she called me mom, we have seen her use her head shaking no to be a negative to now. That's not confirming. I have little belief that there was a good relationship, but there could have been. There could have been all kinds of rattling. The other thing to notice is she never says, I didn't strike her. I didn't psychologically abuse her. I didn't do anything. That's not her bellwether or her or measuring stick. She said, I treated them like they were my, I treated her like she was my own child. Well, she might have beaten the hell out of her own kids and she might have gone too far with her. So I don't see any place where she talks in compassionate words about this girl. She talks about, she called me mom. I, it's not a good thing. I don't see any of this as good. I think she's trying to grasp this woman's attention so the woman will give her some mercy is what I think. This is a brawler waiting for an opportunity. And I think you're right, Scott, Dennis and Mark. Dennis sitting behind her is like, yep, I've seen her snap. I know when she's gonna snap, it's not here yet. Scott, what do you got? Okay, you're the one that brought the uh, Hartley emotions. So when somebody says, "Does that guy have any? What's that guy? Is he having? Is that guy Hartley having any emotions?" I always say, "Yeah, he's got one, but it's down at the mini mart picking up a pack of smokes." <laughs> we'll be back in a few minutes. Now, when she says, um, "What sort of person do you believe you were?" I, her lip pressing, as you can tell, I've been on a bunch of planes this week because all I did was read Ekman stuff. So 
the lip pursing to the right or left where it purses to, once it purses to the side, that suggests, I think in this case, that she sees a different or an alternative outcome to what she's thinking about in here. You see bowlers do that when somebody bowls and the, and the ball is going this way, they're going, mm, you see, and so it suggests a different outcome to them to what's happening or just happened. So I think that's what she's dealing with at, at this point. Then we see more of that fake Duchesne smiling at that point. And then she says, tell me about your, your relationship with, with Zara. That smile is so fake and so big, she overcorrects and it goes so big, it just gives you that uncomfortable feeling. And so watching this, when you see that and you get that weird feeling about somebody or something they've done or something's going on, listen to that because that's, that's the feeling you get when you see that, that same feeling you got. If you get that out in the wild, you listen to that because something's not right about that situation. You may not know what it is right then, but your brain telling you something's up and something's not right about that. Um, when she said she had a spunk about her, I think that's the closest thing we see to a real Duchesne smile there. That look, that looks pretty dang close. I mean, everything comes in the way it should. I, I went over it and over it and over it, and it, it, it to me, I, th I think that's that might be real. That might be a real one at that point. Um, but she's under the impression she's fooled this interviewer. She just, I think she feels good about herself and she feels like I got this man. I got this, this woman fooled. I know exactly what I'm doing. And after, um, after she says, um, they said I treated her better. That huge fake smile that, that goes away really, really quickly. It's less than two seconds. That thing disappears there at the end. I've, I've talked about Doc Watson on here before. He's, he's, he was a blind guy, guitar player, famous guitar player. He was my dad's best friend. Right. And when we tell him jokes or when I would tell him a joke and he, he would be nice and act like he thought it was funny, he'd smile real big. But then really quickly, that fast, the smile would go away because being blind, he wasn't used to seeing how long people are polite by leaving that smile on their face. And then but if something was really funny, then that face would what the smile would last a while, it would slowly go away. And in this case, even though she's been around other people and knows that that it should it should go away slowly and she should still leave that smile on there. It doesn't happen because that that's not a real emotion. So when we go from we've talked about this before a couple of videos back where someone goes from one emotion to another motion to another motion or to another one expression to another to another like that just bang, 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 bang. Those are fake expressions. It was Amber Heard. That's what it was when uh, she would do those things. She uh, one and then the other and the other. That's when you know they're fake. That's when you, you, you can count on them not being real. And that's what's happened in, in, in this case. That's why it disappears so quickly. All right. We good. Yeah. All right. Yep. Yeah, Mark got you on that one. How did you view yourself before coming to prison? What sort of person do you believe you were? Good person. Um, pretty much would give you the shirt off my back. Um, never met a stranger. Mm -hmm. Still don't, even in here. Elisa Baker already had three children, and when she and Adam married and moved to her hometown of Hickory in North Carolina, she became mother to Zara. Sound better than without them. Tell me about your relationship with Zara. We hit it off right from the bat. What did you like about Zara? She had spunk about her. She never gave up. Always had a smile on her face. Always. Did you have a close bond? Very close. She called me mom, and I treated her like she was my own child. She, she got no different treatment than my other kids did. Actually, my other kids got jealous of her. They really? said I treated her better. <laughs> Why would a school teacher give her her own personal cell number and say to her, if you ever need me, call me? That right there was out of protocol. I even said something to the principal about that. Me and Adam went because that was against the rules. They should not have ever done that. Why did you sign a piece of paper here that admitted that you have a history and a pattern of physical, verbal and psychological abuse of Zara. I never signed that paper. You did? 
the issue signature. It's no case somebody's had me sign something I shouldn't have signed because that's not so. That's not your signature? That's Along my... with your attorney? That's not your signature? That's my plea bargain, right? Yes, but you signed that you accept that you had a history and a pattern of physical, verbal and psychological abuse of Zara. That was in with my plea bargain. Yes, so you signed you signed it? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yep. Uh, once again, low blink rate. Interesting. Interesting. But more interesting for me is she is negotiating. Not even negotiating everything. She is just wiping everything that comes along and ultimately not taking any responsibility at all. It happens one, two, three, I think four, five times that I can be bothered to listen to her. She is thoroughly annoying uh, because of that zero responsibility for what's gone on here. What a, a trying person to be around. And I think it, the, the interviewer here, it's really testing the interviewer's patience around this. Australian, so she's going to be a little less... Um, uh, patient or, or polite or a little bit more aggressive. Uh, sorry, Australians, but you know, you know, that's true. You know, that's true. So, uh, so she's being tested here because this is an annoying person to interview. That's all I'll say about that one. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? <laughs> you hate this woman. I know you do. <laughs> all right. Well, the thing that bugged me about this is she didn't answer the question and she let her get away with it. She asked, she asked her, um, ask her why she signed it and she didn't, didn't get the answer. So that's the only thing that bothered me about. I don't think Gail King would let her get away with that. So, but she didn't answer the question. So that kind of, that kind of bugs me. That's really all I got on it. That's all I could focus on all of that. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so Mark, I've been looking for a homeland. You just told me where I need to move. <laughs> no patience for BS, my people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll have you in with open arms. A little put bit more direct. Get, put them on a plane, give you one seat, give your emotion one seat, and y'all yeah. go together. <laughs> yep, I'm, I'm that guy. So look, she starts off with chaff and redirect. I, I think this woman has gotten away with being an irrational actor her whole life. Chase, you talk about her re uh, whatever word you were using i forget the word but she's redesigning or re-architecting whatever happened i don't think she's even that smart i think she just blows everything away and goes oh yeah no the same thing but by obliteration not by intent i think she just doesn't have to be rational not ever had to be rational people let her get away with things and if this husband won't tolerate it well i'll marry two more at the same time what the hell that's irrational there's no other way to describe that um it's just so she does a chaff and redirect is how she gets away with it, by the way, Scott. I love that. And guys, if you've never watched us, chaff is what an aircraft releases to get missiles to follow it. She does a very artful one. And she also uses another thing I call aiming stake argument. She goes for the wall. She doesn't go and say, OK, well, I don't know why she would have done that. Maybe she misunderstood something. She goes, well, wait a minute. What were they doing overstepping their bounds by giving out that phone number? Wait a minute. That's how you get away from answering the question. This is the equivalent of me saying, hey, Chase, they found a body in your trunk. And you're saying, what the hell were they doing in my yard? Yeah. That's just, <laughs> what are you talking about? She avoided the, back of the question by challenging what happened instead of answering why. And then she denies, just outright denies with a childlike approach, just deny it and see if it goes away. That works for her or she leaves or she gets in a fight. That's a brawler approach. Because what a brawler does is just say, no, it didn't happen. And then when you challenge them again, then you're in their territory because they're ready to come back at you because aggression is their wheelhouse. We know she has a history of domestic violence and other violence, including with this child. Then when they finally get to the point, she says, oh, it is my signature. I'll concede, but I'll say I didn't know what I was, I was signing. Somebody made me sign something I shouldn't have. She's using kind of a gradation of guilt and if you saw this done by an intelligent person where they slowly shift it and make it work, it's artful where they get to a point where they're like, well, okay, I, I made a mistake, but there is not art in this woman. She's just coarse and dumb and she comes across as just that. And then she shows distaste at being required to admit that she said it. You see that thing that she does with her face. This time it's not an, an illustrator, it's controlling and trying to show that distaste. That's what I got. Uh, Chase, what do you got? 
Yeah, I agree with you guys. So if if you are ever being questioned and you really want to do this well and you want to chaff and redirect very well, use a few words from the person's question in your chaff and redirect, and it will give it the, the placebo of an answer. Let's call it a placebo answer. And when we're doing this chaff and redirect, that's what we see here. It's not answered. And I think this shows us a little about the person that she is. Her default is to point in another direction. And so the teacher violated a protocol instead of answering the real meaning of the question. And I think this shows us that she's likely to default to this behavior in times of confrontation. And if you see initial behavioral patterns like this, you can preempt these patterns by modifying the way you ask your next few questions. So if it become it really becomes a lot easier to nail somebody down when you can spot these patterns just like this. And I think she knows that this was in her plea bargain. I have no doubt. But we're seeing what Greg, you were talking about, this revisionist thing that I don't think there's a, there's a whole lot of stuff going on up here. But I do think that it could potentially happen unconsciously, that she has a habit of just unconsciously the putting dynamite in all of her memories, so to speak. So we're seeing more patterns emerge of hesitancy. Uh, yeah, just hesitancy there. And as a quick pro tip, if you see somebody routinely looking in one direction to access, in this case, you're seeing emotional, she's done this down right to her right the whole time. When you hand them a photo, a document, a piece of evidence, or anything you want them to remember or think about, hold it at a position that forces their eyes to move in their normal accessing position from their baseline. Cool pro tip. That's all I got. Hey, Greg, go through uh, chaff and redirect one time real quick, because I've got a video that I can put up that'll be perfect for that. Uh, yeah, and I've got a great photo. Yeah, so all chaff and redirect, this comes from my military days, where military aircraft, if a missile is coming, they dump flares and lots of metal and all kinds of things out the back of the aircraft, so that those missiles, if they're heat-seeking or otherwise, follow that and don't hit the plane. Now, what a person does is they just throw out useless words, and Chase had a great one there around using their words, but useless words so that you seize on one of them and follow that it's like distraction is all it is and then you redirect when they hit when they hit the piece of chaff excellent top gun maverick has some great chaff shots oh yeah it does yeah. it does yeah what a Fantastic. great movie yeah, yeah. it was that a great movie, movie. Love that movie. Yeah. better than the first one i think yeah 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 i think so too oh yeah why would a school teacher give her her own personal cell number and say to her if you ever need me call me that right there was out of protocol I even said something to the principal about that. Me and Adam went because that was against the rules. They should not have ever done that. Why did you sign a piece of paper here that admitted that you have a history and a pattern of physical, verbal, and psychological abuse of Zara? I never signed that paper. You did? There's your signature. That's no case. Somebody's had me sign something I shouldn't have signed because that's not so. That's not your signature. That's Along my, with your attorney. That's not your signature. That's my plea bargain, right? Yes, but you signed that you accept that you had a history and a pattern of physical, verbal and psychological abuse of Zara. That was in with my plea bargain. Yes, so you signed, you signed it? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. By this time, it was like three, three, somewhere around in there. And um, she was laying on her bed. And I said, Zara, are you okay? And I walked over to the bed and I said, Zara, she still didn't move. I put my hand on her and I could tell she wasn't breathing. And my 
My first thought was CPR. And so I immediately started CPR. I worked on her for probably about 30 minutes and couldn't get her back. Begging the whole time for God not to take her, you know. Right then, I should have called 911. But I got scared. Of what? I didn't know what to do. I've never been faced with anything like that. I've never... If you'd done CPR, you'd dial 911, wouldn't you? Some, most people would have, yes. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, let's make this quick because uh, it's just too full of fillers for me to pay any attention to. Let's go through them. By this time, like, somehow, around there, and... Um, and, and, and I, and, and so I, you know, but. I mean, what happens is, is she says it at such a pace and with some details in there that you might think there is something of truth going on there, but the amount of fillers and the repetition of filler in there just says to me immediately, this didn't go down anything like what she's talking about. And look, we know that in hindsight, but if this was somebody telling me this story right in front of me, I wouldn't buy it at all simply because of the amount of fillers going on there. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so God bless this child for, you know, you can't pick your parents or your step parents. So I cannot imagine uh, that lifestyle before everything happened even. And Mark, uh, you're a bastard. I had those same <laughs> words counted. I had the same words counted. Uh, so right off the bat in this, we're seeing these hallmark patterns that you've probably identified already since you've been listening to the previous uh, profiling videos. There's chest breathing, hesitancy, and loss of fluency. These are the hallmarks for her, especially. And right when she says she's talking about Zara, are you okay? No more recall movement to her normal downright movement. None. There's down middle, down and middle, which is a hard deviation from baseline, I would call it. And when she says, I could tell she wasn't breathing, this is a shift into bad writing mode. So let me give you a quick example. Think about reading these phrases in a book. Which one is more powerful? She could tell. She wasn't alone in the room, and he saw there was a knife in the drawer. So think about those two. If you're speaking in true first person, the bad parts are removed. She wasn't alone in the room. There was a knife in the drawer that he saw, she realized, she discovered, go away when you're in true first person. So now think about her statement through this lens where I could tell she wasn't breathing. I could tell would be removed in true first person there. And when, the same thing, my first thought was CPR. And so I started doing CPR. That's not true first person. There's hesitancy, loss of fluency. Lip licking is a 900% increase from her baseline, which is a what we deem as a potential deception indicator. So it's deviation from emotional accessing as well, which is her usual downright movement. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I I know for sure at least three of us have, have um, applied CPR when the time came more than once. And when she said I was working on her, if you when you do CPR, five minutes is a long time. That's a, on a hell bed. of a long time. Yeah, on a bed. Oh, on a bed. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Any, I mean, it's there's it's harder. There's it's more harder. work. Yep. Yeah. Well, she's supposed to pull her off the bed. You know, if she if she had. Which goes to my point, if she had done the training, which I don't think she did, she doesn't know how to do CPR. She, no, she just thinks no. she does. You don't do it on a bed. Same way uh, Michael Jackson's uh, doctor did him on the bed. Are you kidding me? You pull him off the bed and you get him on the floor, right? 
it's hard to do that for five minutes. It's I had to do it for 12 minutes once and, and, and they almost had to do me. That's how bad it was. It takes a lot to do that the right way. It takes a lot. And five minutes is an eternity when you're waiting on somebody to come and come and help you. And she wasn't even waiting on somebody. She said she worked on her for 30 minutes. What should you do? Go outside and smoke a cigarette and then come back and go, well, she would have known if how long that child had been there because she would have been cold when she touched her if she was doing any of that and she would have felt that when she put her hands on her she would have known that so that whole thing to me is again that's that's none of that's true in there i don't think anything like that ever happened at all i agree with you mark didn't happen nothing like that happened whatsoever and and thousand bucks says she's never had cpr training at all how what you know she's heard somebody on tv say i worked on him or whatever no she didn't work on anybody she just worked on the stuff she did before she buried that kid so yeah okay getting all worked up greg what do you got i'm gonna give her the benefit of a doubt and even assume that she did do cpr i'm just gonna give a benefit of a doubt because it would seem like 30 minutes i agree with you you know, I've given CPR before, and it's never a pleasant thing. First of all, if you care about the person, it has to be a lot worse. Now, not that I'm saying she cares. I think she's a brawler. I think she does all kinds of stuff. Let's assume for a minute that she did something she didn't intend to do in one of those states. The kid is hurt. Maybe she would do CPR. So I'll give her the benefit of the doubt. And, and that I'm thinking of what to say next, just like she is. The first thing that we see out of her is concern in her brow. And we haven't seen it yet when she's talking about time. That immediately makes me think she's navigating and figuring out how they're gonna perceive this. I gotta figure out where it was. Then she says weird word patterns. Maybe it's a Hickory, North Carolina thing. I don't know. But she says she was laid out on the bed. Those are words that mean something. When you think of a transitive or intransitive verb, lying down on the bed or laying out on the bed is one thing, but being laid out on the bed sounds like somebody put you there to me. So my immediate question would be, well, hold on. How did she get there? Then we get to, and the interviewer by now has absolutely lost all interest in her. That interview has absolute contempt in her face when she's looking at her. And we see, and we see her do that lip withdrawal again. That's an illustrator still here. But listen to the difference in her cadence as she goes into that and 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 mark you pointed out all the different filler words she slows down and all those long vowels are not in her baseline mark she does some verbal clicking you always bring up and at each milestone of her story she makes hard eye contact and romances again to see if you're buying it after that she does that brow down after the i pray to god that she would come back I almost wonder when we see a brow down we almost think anger you know we associate that with anger when we see the brow down did something happen and she's angry because she couldn't bring her back? Don't know, can't tell, but something is up here. And I'm with you, Scott. She might have done something akin to CPR. I doubt she's had any training in that. And we'll just say, where did she go from there? But most people, when they ask her, most people would say, how do I, I would then respond to her when she said, well, most people, I would say, tell me what you did and tell me why you didn't do it. I wouldn't let her away with that. When she told me she did CPR, I would have said, tell me what you did so I could get all the in input. Here we have to depend on what we believe and what we think and what we feel. But in the case of her, I would push her and ask her how she did the CPR and all that. And she would come apart because her ends would get longer and longer and longer and longer because she's lost cognitive ability. That's all I got. I think the anger you're seeing is towards is towards the child. That's what I think she was mad about. Could and I be. think whatever happened was happened. That's what she's thinking about when she did the yeah, kid. I, I, and Scott, I think it could be that she blew up. Did that's something. what I'm saying. The kid got whacked, got hurt and fell and then or whatever. And then she was trying to do something to rescue the kid. But too late. That's what I'm saying is because there's yeah. anger. There's surely anger. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, Chase. What are you saying, Chase? I'd just ask her, how are you different than most people? Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's good. differentiating good. himself herself from the people who would call 911, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Why didn't you? Yeah. 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 I got no good, room good. for this. By this time, it was like three, three, somewhere around in there. And, um, 
she was laying on her bed. And I said, Zara, are you okay? And I walked over to the bed and I said, Zara, she still didn't move. I put my hand on her and I could tell she wasn't breathing. And my first thought was CPR. And so I immediately started CPR. I worked on her for probably about 30 minutes and couldn't get her back. Begging the whole time for God not to take her, you know. Right then, I should have called 911. But I got scared. Of what? I didn't know what to do. I've never been faced with anything like that. I've never... If you'd done CPR, you'd dial 911, wouldn't you? Some, most people would have, yes. Elisa alleges she called Zara's father, Adam, and that it was he who dismembered Zara. If we're going to believe anything you say, why would you ring the police and say, I'm not having a part of this. That is the most heinous thing to do. He was my husband. Please. <laughs> That's not good enough. It's not. It's just not good enough. You know that. I know. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'll keep this one short. This is why I know this is a brawler. She's starting to show here. Look at her. She's not taking it lightly that she's being locked down and she's forcing her to, to respond to this. This first time we've seen that leg bounce and we see her turn her head away. If you've ever been around redneck fighters, pub fighters, Mark, maybe is what you'd say somewhere in the mm. UK. A lot of times the first indication there's about to be violence is that head withdrawal and then coming back. And you see her leg bounce, just about guarantee you this woman has a short fuse and blows up. Now she's making hard eye contact and this is not romance her. This is stare down. This is hard condemning eye contact. When she admits this, she goes, I know. She throws those words away or fading facts, whatever you would like to call it here. And this just shows me she's had a pattern of people being too afraid to say anything because she would blow up. I just about guarantee you we're seeing precursors to violence in her in there. And I was looking to see if our guy in the back was going, wait a minute, wait a minute. Gonna get on the edge of his chair. <laughs> no. Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah, I agree with you completely. That with that head down and that shoulder coming up over there and that lip person that mm, she's a brawler, man. She's she said she's been more than one fight in her time. But now when you're observing body language, you have to take into put into context everything going around what's happening, what you see in that picture. What's happening? What's the what are the people doing around you? Is there, are there cars going by? Is there something else going on in the room? And having said that, my favorite part of this whole episode, like you just alluded to, uh, Greg, was Dennis back there, because at one point you can see him check the sound guy when she says that's just not good enough. He looks over at the sound guy, then he looks back. He's like, dude, are you listen to this. And you can see that in his face. He wants to talk so bad. We see him compress his lips and take that big deep breath because he wants to jump in and say something about that because he knows her he's around her a lot apparently because in in that prison because he's he's a that's what he does for a living he keeps an eye on those people so he knows what she is he knows what she's about and you're right greg that's why she's he's so close to her i think mark might have said that earlier as well he did. he's yep. so close to her because she's liable to pop off and swing at that lady you know we've all experienced that one time or another somebody just popping off at the wrong time but that's what i think's happening there and and of course she doesn't see that and I think that for me, for this one section was the most interesting was watching him 
and keep an eye on what he's doing. You can see how these emotions run through his face because he's sitting there wanting to say something so bad because he knows what kind of person she is. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, and right away when you guys were talking about this like backward head movement and the, the eye contact going away, the, the head moving away, if a person's head moves to their left, you're going to get hit with their right hand 99% of the time. So it's a good, just a good little uh, rule of thumb. Teach your kids that are going off to college this year. And when she says he was my husband, there's a shoulder shrug here, a, a double shoulder shrug, which we typically do in our culture as almost a nonverbal apology to accompany whatever we're saying. Uh, maybe it's an apology for, I don't know. I don't have anything else for you. I'm sorry. There's a head shake. There's a deviation from baseline accessing location. And the interviewer obviously just wanting to probably go back to her hotel uh, is saying this is not good enough. You can see here the interviewer is now just unconsciously capitalizing. I think capitalizing on the fact that Elisa, this person here, Eliza, is now not only in retreat, but seems to be hyper responsive to authority. So we're seeing a little more responsive to authority here. And she, I think, in my opinion, she's regressing. And just to cover that really fast, regression is a defense mechanism where people kind of return to an earlier developmental stage. And when some, when some people are emotionally overwhelmed, they might revert to some childhood strategy to have their needs met. And you'd also see that if she's prone to do this, she may have regressed to a similar coping mechanism from childhood during the crime. Maybe one that got rid of toys, got rid of people, got rid of things that were no longer serving her needs during a time of conflict or stress. So we might see a pattern of regression here. Just a bit quick uh, behavior profiling tip for you. Uh, Mark, what do you think? Yeah, so much, all the same stuff, nothing new here. Double shoulder shrug, as you said there, Chase. He was my husband, eye block, turn of the head, leg movement there. Yeah, it looks like some pre-violence for me. But Dennis, just as you were saying, I, I saw Dennis in the background there. Um, not enough for Dennis to uh, move forward in his chair like Dennis is there going, no, it's not going to kick off yet. <laughs> but I've got a little, uh, yeah, and, and, and the interviewer there, that's not good enough. Yeah, I think she's been triggered into an authoritative stance on this. I don't think she's got anywhere to go at this point, apart from say, that's not good enough. I think she's at the end of her tether here, Chase. And like you say, the sooner she gets into a hotel room and if she's a drinker, you know, knocks a couple back, the better, because I think she's short of usual good strategies around this particular personality type. Uh, you, you know, I've got a little story in my mind, uh, Scott, about what Dennis is thinking here. This is just imaginative, but I think he looks off to the side. As, as the interviewer goes, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. He looks off to the side and says to himself, well, you took the interview. Like, you know, this is just, like, this is just the, there's more where this came from. There's so much more where this came from. I think Dennis is slightly incredulous about what did you think you were getting here? I, I live with her. I live with her. Like, this is nothing compared to what she can deliver. So nothing new there, but, but great stuff. What a, what a, what an earthquake she is. There, that's you all I got. Big shout out to Dennis. Big shout out. Yeah, to man. Yeah, keep hey, man. up the good work. If you're work, watching, <laughs> how bad he is. Emails. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, since you picked your chase. <laughs> <laughs> Elisa alleges she called Zara's father Adam, and that it was he who dismembered Zara. If we're going to believe anything you say, why would you ring the police and say, "I'm not having a part of this"? That is the most heinous thing to do. He was my husband. Please. <laughs> That's not good enough. It's not. It's just not good enough. You know that. I know. Of course, the evidence doesn't show that what you're saying is the truth, does it? It, it does to, to a point, but there's a little bit not even to a point 
the phone records show that on the day the body was disposed of, the day that you told police it was disposed of, there were something like nine calls, and many of those calls were to Adam. Why would you call him if he's right beside you? He was he was calling my phone. I wasn't calling his because he kept losing my phone. No, you were calling him. I wasn't calling him. Phone records show that he was 20 miles away. He wasn't with you, was he? Yes, ma'am. I don't think so. That's the truth, isn't it? No, ma'am. Phone records confirm Adam was at work, not in the area where Zara's body was disposed of, but that Elisa's cell phone was. Did you murder Zara? No, ma'am. Why do you deny this when the evidence is overwhelmingly that you did? Because I'll continue to stand by my story. You'll continue to lie? No, I'll stand by my story. Uh, Scott Riley, your lawyer, said that the evidence was overwhelmingly against you. I think he said that the evidence was such that it would take a jury something like five minutes to convict you. Something like that. Well, if your own lawyer says that, what does it say about you? That nobody was listening to what I was saying. They were going by circumstantial evidence. They weren't going by anything I was saying. All right, uh, Mark, what do you got? Yep. Uh, she is just belligerent with her lies when the facts are placed in front of her. It is so frustrating when somebody does that. It's so frustrating because it's completely belligerent and, and, uh, and you know, slightly detached from the reality that everybody uh, knows to be factual out there how annoying um and then the second annoying thing is uh, what does that say about you which is a great question because it's a self-reflective question great question where does she go with that well it says that other people weren't listening to me it's like what a great deflection out to it being everybody else's fault everybody else's fault i mean i'm going to give credit to the interviewer here for not just standing up and, and knocking her own head against the wall on this one. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this I, my note says little Elisa is still lying like she's five years old. This is yeah. a child style of lie. I know you are, but what am I? You know, that kind of thing. It's that kind of childish, stupid response. She tries to lawyer what I would call a, a barracks lawyer. I'll clean up my language. I call a barracks lawyer when she starts off with, it does to a point. Well, no, it doesn't. And when she says not even to a point, you get, this is not adapting, this is disapproval. She pulls her mouth back and then she does an eye lock. And there is no romancer. Again, this is eye lock. This is aggression. Her upper lids fluctuate and open up and show more of her upper eye. We usually associate that with anger. She does that, I know who you are, but what am I? I call this the farce defense. Anytime somebody says something, you say no, 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 until they get to fact. And then you just say, maybe, but so what? Well, you can't discuss anything logically with a person like that. People who argue feelings argue like this, and people who are not accustomed to being challenged do this. So if they're the big fish in the, their pond, they may say, so what? Or walk away from something. That's what she's doing. Habitual liars do it all the time. And if she's scrappy enough that her friends are not going to break call her on it, or her acquaintances are not going to call her, then she's got a problem. At did you murder, her, her respiration increases. And then at five minutes when she's talking about what does that say about you, she starts adapting a lot, moving around. She lips, licks her lips a lot more. She does some real emotional eye accessing. And the way you can tell it's real is because she gets out of person. She goes away. There's that thousand yard stare. She goes away from contact. She's not making connections. She's gone into her own little wheelhouse there to work. It makes me wonder when she goes to emotion and she's doing all this adapting, what the relationship with the lawyer was like. Was she volatile with him as well or her? I don't know whether it was a man or a woman. Scott, they said, so assume it was a, a him. 
And then when she says, what does it say about you? I, my notes say she piled on a few more cords of wood to come up with this answer. It took her a few minutes to say, it's not about me. People just didn't understand. And it's funny because her voice gets soft for the first time, really soft, not front of the mouth talking, but her voice gets soft and her face softens back to that same thing she's done before. She's back to what made her successful and it's not working. It's just not working. Scott, what do you got? All right. Uh, after that first question, we see her, her cadence uh, slows down again. Her blink rate slows down. She stares, you know, and she says not even to a point. Then she makes the very same face, the very same face I would make if I won the $150 million Powerball. Yeah. Then after <laughs> the question about calling her husband and she's saying, no, he was calling me her her head. Let's let's look at that as an illustrator at that point. Those should be confirmation shakes no it wasn't me i didn't do it those should be hitting on words they're not they're, their heads just swimming back and forth as she say as she's saying that but they it shouldn't it should be stopping at specific points in the same rhythm as she's speaking but it's not those things are detached so that's one thing it lets us know or it suggests that that's probably deceptive or most likely deceptive and when the when the interviewer says did you murder Haz, uh uh hazara then she says uh, zahara she says, have you ever heard, have you ever seen somebody or heard of someone talking out of the side of their mouth? That's what she starts with here. The left side of her mouth opens up and then the full mouth start opens up. She starts talking. So that lets us know, or that indicates that something's probably not right here as well. She's, she doesn't want to say that. She doesn't want to, because her brain, like we talked about earlier, has to do three things. It has to make the first thing it's got to, it makes you do is, is not give the right answer. It's going to say, hey, hang on a minute. We, we don't want to give that answer. Then create an answer, create the, uh, the the lie, and then deliver it. And that's where all the action is. And that's what we're seeing at that point. And she said, uh, why do, do you deny this? Because, because I'll stand by my story. I'll continue to stand by my story. There's your answer right there. Because I'll continue to stand by my story. She didn't say, I'm not lying about it or anything. She said, I'm a, she, why are you going to keep lying about this? Why are you keep denying it? Because I'm going to stand by my story. That says everything there, you know. What, what more do you want at that point? And after the question, taking uh, the jury five minutes to convict her, and she says, what if your lawyer says that too? What about that? That's when we see again, we see that lip person to one side, which, which suggests and indicates that she sees a different outcome than what's been presented to her at this point. So that's where I'm sitting with that. Chase, what do you got? <laughs> oh, man. I thought we had this one there. Uh, it's been months. I thought you were been been months. Oh, the Hulk and then man. just escape. Through Shane's smile. Yeah. Close. <laughs> what a shame. How'd you know? Uh, I don't know. I just got a feeling. I don't know. Oh. Huh. All right. All right, go ahead. And good thing we're going to edit that out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this defense strategy is all about innocence. I fully agree with you guys. She's reverting to what worked for her at a younger age here. Greg, you were talking about this kind of childlike behavior. I, in my notes, I wrote playground defense mechanisms at play here. I didn't write the at play here part. But this constantly raised eyebrows here, uh, this need to make the eyes bigger is something we tend to do by default when we're trying to appear really innocent. So you see your kids do this all the time, I'm sure. And it makes the face look more like a baby. And unconsciously, we are more protective of babies. We're more believing of babies. And in essence, since the perception of this is unconscious and the sending of this is probably unconscious. This is one unconscious trying to trick another one unconsciously. So I think that's pretty interesting here. So we're seeing this war of innocence and contempt at the same time and still trying to win over contempt by using innocence instead of fact, story, reasoning, innocence, is what will save her in her own mind. That's Who the hell are you, saying. Mark Bowden? <laughs> well, this whole idea of innocence. Evil and innocence. <laughs> oh, man. That's all I got. All right. Nice. I, 
There's no leaning. Oh, Greg, right. you nailed it. Sit in the back. Yeah. Of course, the evidence doesn't show that what you're saying is the truth, does it? It, it does to, to a point, but there's a little bit. Not even to a point. The phone records show that on the day the body was disposed of, the day that you told police it was disposed of, there were something like nine calls, and many of those calls were to Adam. Why would you call him if he's right beside you? He was he was calling my phone. I wasn't calling his because he kept losing my phone. No, you were calling him. I wasn't calling him. Phone records show that he was 20 miles away. He wasn't with you, was he? Yes, ma'am. I don't think so. That's the truth, isn't it? No, ma'am. Phone records confirm Adam was at work, not in the area where Zara's body was disposed of, but that Elisa's cell phone was. Did you murder Zara? No, ma'am. Why do you deny this when the evidence is overwhelmingly that you did? Because I'll continue to stand by my story. You'll continue to lie? No, I'll stand by my story. Uh, Scott Riley, your lawyer, said that the evidence was overwhelmingly against you. I think he said that the evidence was such that it would take a jury something like five minutes to convict you. Something like that. Well, if your own lawyer says that, what does it say about you? That nobody was listening to what I was saying. They were going by circumstantial evidence. They weren't going by anything I was saying. You're innocent. Fight it. Why didn't you? You heard the evidence against me. Well, that means from what I could see, you are as guilty as sin. You are a guilty woman. And you will not take responsibility for your actions. There again, that's your opinion. It's the opinion of the state. It's an opinion of the lawmakers. It is the opinion of your own family. Some of my family. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, just one thing on this. Um, there is a, on uh, some of my family, very quick, but let's see if we can stop it and see that moment. There's a snarl of anger there and contempt, disdain, and disdain, actually, because it's about, some of my family. So aggressive, very aggressive disdain there. I would not want to be one of the family members that she is disdainfully angry at there because that is a very, very violent look that you get for just a moment there. Imagine if you saw that look sustained over time that's the explosive one. That's when you'd want to be moving to the door and getting out the way of that whirlwind. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I think this one sums her up. She's contrarian in this case. She's just going back at it. Oddly enough, it's the first time we see her use a fact to, de to deflect any kind of blame. But watch her. There's a really interesting one we rarely see here. When she is being berated, watch her upper lid pulse. It opens, it pulses, it moves a little bit and then back down more than one time. You just have to pay really close attention. As that's going on, that indicates anger. When your eyes are flexing open, that's indicating anger. She mills her jaw, her mouth narrows. When I say milling her jaw, she's gripping her teeth. Her, her jaw then, or she then braces in the chair. She mills her jaw again, her breathing pattern changes and her mouth gets narrow and square. Then she uses the only time she's used a fact and that was, she was emphatic with all that language, some of my family. That's her only fact we've seen in the entire thing. I agree with you, Mark. You're getting close to pulling who we're going to see. If you pushed her a little bit more right here, you probably would, Scott, this is one of those people who would punch you in the mouth in the interrogation room if you, if you push them a little bit too far. Scott, what do you got? 
Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Mark, where, where are you talking about that uh, micro expression? Where are you seeing that? Um, it is it on place. some of my family. It's around yep. that area. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I got yeah, you'll, see the, you'll see the lip go up. Okay. It's I got very, that. very fast. Lip go up. Um, yeah. I got one after that first question uh, on against me. That's where we're seeing one. Um, and that obviously, with that question, that made her mad. We see it there because she's angry that she got convicted. That's my impression or my, my opinion anyway. Um, then after that, she says, you're, you're as guilty as sin. And you won't and you won't take responsibility for your actions she waits six seconds to reply takes forever again why is that because she's structuring her answers she, get, she doesn't want to answer but she's having to make up something which she probably has one loaded back there but she's still waiting to unload it at that point um it just it, this whole thing again it just scores really big on my meter on my table of elements for <laughs> you know, just scumbag meter. Yeah, it stinks. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, you guys covered everything. I fully agree with you. So let me just offer a quick pro tip here. This childlike demeanor, you're going to see this response in employees and uh, children and people you work with, people that are working for you. You're going to see this every once in a while and if you see this in somebody you're ever interviewing or speaking to there are a few things that you can do to trigger this even more why would you want to do that you're going to make them hyper responsive to authority you're going to make them behave differently in a way that you can predict the future of behavior if i know a person is using some kind of behavioral script I can predict it. The further I can push them down into that script, the more I can predict future behavior. So here's a couple of tips on how to push them further down if you see this kind of behavior in a person. Number one, use their name with an upward tone. So like if Scott was doing this and I was interviewing Scott, I might say, now Scott, that, that little upward tone, almost like an elementary school teacher, pushes them further into that thing. Uh, number two, don't ever let them interrupt. So big hand up. Anytime they try to interrupt, don't let it happen. Number three, interrupt them on occasion with a very parental figure tone, a parent figure tone that's uh, not condescending, but it's a parent calmly talking to a child who's spun up. That's going to trigger every single part of them that sends them into that mode or that reminds them of that mode, and it makes their behavior predictable. This can help to make them more compliant. But the downside of this is that the entire strategy of the interview then has to change to adapt to the vulnerabilities of this behavior. You're innocent. Fight it. Why didn't you, you heard the evidence against me? Boom. That means, from what I could see, you are as guilty as sin. You are a guilty woman. And you will not take responsibility for your actions. There again, that's your opinion. It's the opinion of the state. It's an opinion of the lawmakers. It is the opinion of your own family. Some of my family. The wife he never really had considers her fate. You have to accept that the evidence is against you. Yes, ma'am, I know that. Why then am I not looking at one of the most reviled evil women in America? Probably in your eyes you think you are. No remorse? I have remorse. What is it? I wish things would have been different. Well, you have a long time to consider it. Yes, ma'am, I do. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a really interesting one because listen to her tone. All that front of mouth talking goes away. When she's attacked, when she starts to ask her questions about what kind of a person does that make you, what, who you are, she talks differently. She says, I think I'm looking at one of the most evil people in America. 
if I were from your point of view, I'm certain you are. Her voice tone is not at all what we've heard up to now. And then she drops into that, I feel remorse, and it goes back into that same thing. What I think we're seeing here is I, I believe she feels remorse, but I think she feels remorse for being where she's at and locked up because she gets emotional when you say you got a long time to think about it. I think what we're seeing is the real person come out for just a second there in this authority face that she's been using the whole time comes back out when she gets down to the point where she has sadness. That's what I see. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. So um, so she's taking this argument of, you know, that's just your point of view. And, you know, you're like this, Greg. I think this particular subject is just living her truth. That's all. She's just, <laughs> she's just living her truth. And what does this remind us of is that when when some people are living their truth, it is their truth is so abstract, so different from the rest of society's truth that we call it an antisocial personality disorder, that there is something so devoid of of the general locus, you know, of 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 the rest of society's idea that that you know it's no good for them to live their truth anymore you have to give them some help or lock them up if that's uh if that's if they're violent and and often you know they are um so uh and to this point on actually i'll leave the the, the remorse piece because i'm sure others have have something to say on on that uh chase what do you got on that one pass it to scott <laughs> I was just, I was just gonna say oh, that. What are you on that one? I don't think she knows what remorse means. I don't think she yeah. has any earthly idea. She no. means, do you? Feel, she thinks it means, do you feel bad? She yeah. doesn't. She doesn't understand the definition of remorse. Now I'm gonna make that short because I can't wait to see what Chase has to say. I know it's gonna be funny. What do you got, Chase? Yeah, I think if the interviewer said, "What is remorse?" She said, "Well, if you morse and you do it again, you're remorse." You, you're going to just you remorse. remorse. You morse and then you remorse. But then... That, it, was, that was worth waiting for. That was. Is that like remorse code? <laughs> oh, this is getting worse. And this is right down the commode, you guys. Yeah, this yeah. is bad. Good it's the Lord. worst episode ever. I'm so just sorry. Throw it around. Nobody watches I'm, I'm so sorry. Chase Please will not be with us next week. Nobody wants to watch anyway. <laughs> Nobody's going to be watching this late into it. We won't do this episodes. again. <laughs> Nobody's watching right now. We do anything we want here. to. Of a wife he never really had considers her fate. You have to accept that the evidence is against you. Yes, ma'am, I know that. Why then am I not looking at one of the most reviled evil women? in America. Probably in your eyes you think you are. No remorse? I have remorse. What is it? I wish things would have been different. Well, you have a long time to consider it. Yes, ma'am, I do. Well, we were going to throw it around the room and see what everybody Let's thought. Let's do it. <laughs> right, here we go. Around the room. Got it. I got it. Got it. Room. Yeah. It's All right. Friday. Uh, so let's throw it around the room and see what everybody thinks. 30 seconds or less. What do you got, Mark? Uh, yeah, I think what we have here is a collision of different personality disorders. Um, and and that is, uh, it's a, I've, no, I've not seen anything like this uh, before uh, to the level of, of this violence as well and violence on on a on a minor so i think this is this is a new one uh for me uh chase what do you think yeah i think elisa lived a hard life i think r rougher than most of us could possibly even imagine and this for me is a powerful reminder of the power of parents and making kids feel confident and socially connected from a very young age i'm not making any excuses here for her you saw the same things here today that you can immediately apply in your life. You saw a whole lot of stuff here in this video that you can you can use at work. You can use it with your kids. And a lot of probably new behaviors that we probably didn't speak about before. So great episode. Greg. 
Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, parenting is where it starts. But then there are other people have to put up fences too. Life is about entitlement and expectations. You, everybody has entitlements. Some people have expectations, but you should draw lines around what people are allowed to do to you and against you. This is like one of those dogs who just has never found a fence and they just run all along. If you put up an invisible fence, one of those that shocks a dog when they run out, some dogs are strong-willed enough to run through it and get out and then can't get back in. Might be the case, but if you start putting up fences, you'll slow down some of that movement. And this person needed that desperately. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with all you guys. And I think this is a great study in seeing someone who thinks they're smarter than someone else. And we're seeing a per the, and showing us the person that they're not. Showing us the person they throw up to jump behind to do their bidding or to do whatever it is to tell the story they need they need told. For, and in this case, you put up this childlike person, which I'm sure, like you said, Greg, I'm sure she's done this a million times throughout her life because she did it with such ease. Sometimes she would go too far and sometimes she wouldn't go far enough with it. That's why we're seeing sometimes she would overcorrect with her smiles and those types of things. And I agree with you, uh, Mark. This, this there's so many personality types going on. There's not like tons of them, but there are a lot. There are quite a few things going on in that situation. I don't think we're looking at a psychopath here. I think we're, we're probably looking at an antisocial personality type, but I don't think it goes as far as psychopathy in this case. Um, I think it's all the things that build up. To, to, that would make a, a psychopath if there were actually problems with the, the amygdala, which I don't think there are, but I don't think we're talking about a psychopath here. I think we're just looking at a, a, a criminal, somebody who's really mean and bad person. And like you said, Chase, raised horribly in a horrible situation, in horrible surroundings, obvious in this kind of, in this kind of thing. All right, fellas, I think this was a good one and uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah. The behavior panel. That's great. Wow. That's Good. too yeah. bad. Uh, you, it's automatically saved. Give it a new title. Then hit share. Allow sharing and send the it's link back to, to Ariel on the email. He's talking to the dog. That's how smart it is. Share the link <laughs> with Ariel in the email. Share the Google link to the Google Doc with Ariel in the email. So what do you got? I'll be sad and 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 I'